The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 9, Side 2. Originally, he seems to have been a god of thunder, dwelling in the hills and worshipped for the same reason that the youthful Gorky was a believer when it thundered. The authors of the Pentateuch, to whom religion was an instrument of statesmanship, formed this Vulcan into Mars, so that in their energetic hands Yahweh became predominantly an imperialistic expansionist god of hosts, who fights for his people as fiercely as the gods of the Iliad. The Lord is a man of war, says Moses, and David echoes him. He teacheth my hands to war. Yahweh promises to destroy all the people to whom the Jews shall come, and to drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite by little and little. And he claims as his own all the territory conquered by the Jews. He will have no pacifist nonsense. He knows that even a promised land can be won and held only by the sword. He is a god of war because he has to be. It will take centuries of military defeat, political subjugation, and moral development to transform him into the gentle and loving father of Hillel and Christ. He is as vain as a soldier. He drinks up praise with a bottomless appetite, and he is anxious to display his prowess by drowning the Egyptians. They shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh. To gain successes for his people, he commits or commands brutalities as repugnant to our taste as they were acceptable to the morals of the age. He slaughters whole nations with the naive pleasure of a Gulliver fighting for Lilliput. Because the Jews commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, he bids Moses take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun. It is the morality of Ashurbanipal and Ashur. He offers to show mercy to those who love him and keep his commandments, but, like some resolute germ, he will punish children for the sins of their fathers, their grandfathers, even their great-great-grandfathers. He is so ferocious that he thinks of destroying all the Jews for worshipping the golden calf, and Moses has to argue with him that he should control himself. Turn from thy fierce wrath, the man tells his God, and repent of this evil against thy people. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Again, Yahweh proposes to exterminate the Jews root and branch for rebelling against Moses, but Moses appeals to his better nature and bids him think what people will say when they hear of such a thing. He asks a cruel test, human sacrifice of the bitterest sort, from Abraham. Like Moses, Abraham teaches Yahweh the principles of morals and persuades him not to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there shall be found fifty, forty, thirty, twenty, ten good men in those cities. Bit by bit he lures his God towards decency and illustrates the manner in which the moral development of man compels the periodical recreation of his deities. The curses with which Yahweh threatens his chosen people if they disobey him are models of vituperation and inspired those who burned heretics in the Inquisition or excommunicated Spinoza. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, tumors and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. Also every sickness, and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee, until thou be destroyed. Yahweh was not the only God whose existence was recognized by the Jews, or by himself. All that he asked in the first commandment was that he should be placed above the rest. I am a jealous God, he confesses, and he bids his followers utterly overthrow his rivals and quite break down their images. The Jews before Isaiah seldom thought of Yahweh as the God of all tribes, even of all Hebrews. The Moabites had their god, Chemosh, to whom Naomi thought it right that Ruth should remain loyal. Beelzebub was the god of Ekron. Milcom was the god of Ammon. The economic and political separatism of these peoples naturally resulted in what we might call their theological independence. Moses sings in his famous song, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? And Solomon says, Great is our God above all gods. Not only was Tammuz accepted as a real god by all but the most educated Jews, but his cult was at one time so popular in Judea that Ezekiel complained that the ritual wailing for Tammuz's death could be heard in the temple. So distinct and autonomous were the Jewish tribes that even in the time of Jeremiah many of them had their own deities. According to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. And the gloomy prophet goes on to protest, 
against the worship of Baal and Moloch by his people. With the growth of political unity under David and Solomon and the centering of worship in the temple at Jerusalem, theology reflected history and politics, and Yahweh became the sole god of the Jews. Beyond this henotheism, they made no further progress towards monotheism until the prophets. Henotheism is a clumsy but useful word coined by Max Müller to designate the worship of a god as supreme, combined with the explicit, as in India, or tacit, as in Judea, admission of other gods. Even in the Yahvistic stage, the Hebraic religion came closer to monotheism than any other pre-prophetic faith, except the ephemeral sun-worship of Ichnaton. At least equal as sentiment and poetry to the polytheism of Babylonia and Greece, Judaism was immensely superior to the other religions of the time in majesty and power, in philosophic unity and grasp, in moral fervor and influence. This intense and somber religion never took on any of the ornate ritual and joyous ceremonies that marked the worship of the Egyptian and Babylonian gods. A sense of human nothingness before an arbitrary deity darkened all ancient Jewish thought. Despite the efforts of Solomon to beautify the cult of Yahweh with color and sound, the worship of this awful divinity remained for many centuries a religion of fear rather than of love. One wonders, in looking back upon these faiths, whether they brought as much consolation as terror to humanity. Religions of hope and love are a luxury of security and order. The need for striking fear into a subject or rebellious people made most primitive religions cults of mystery and dread. The Ark of the Covenant, containing the sacred scrolls of the law, symbolized by its untouchability the character of the Jewish creed. When the pious Uzzah, to prevent the Ark from falling into the dust, caught it for a moment in his hands, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died. The central idea in Judaic theology was that of sin. Never has another people been so fond of virtue, unless it was those Puritans who seemed to step out of the Old Testament with no interruption of Catholic centuries. Since the flesh was weak and the law complex, sin was inevitable, and the Jewish spirit was often overcast with the thought of sin's consequences, from the withholding of rain to the ruin of all Israel. There was no hell in this faith as a distinctive place of punishment, but almost as bad was the Sheol, or land of darkness under the earth, which received all the dead, good and wicked alike, except such divine favorites as Moses, Enoch, and Elijah. The Jews, however, made little reference to a life beyond the grave. Their creed said nothing of personal immortality, and confined its rewards and punishments to this mundane life. Not until the Jews had lost hope of earthly triumph did they take over, probably from Persia and perhaps also from Egypt, the notion of personal resurrection. It was out of this spiritual denouement that Christianity was born. The threat and consequence of sin might be offset by prayer or sacrifice. Semitic, like Aryan sacrifice, began by offering human victims. Then it offered animals, the first fruits of the flocks, and food from the fields. Finally, it compromised by offering praise. At first, no animal might be eaten unless killed and blessed by the priest and offered for a moment to the god. Circumcision partook of the nature of a sacrifice and perhaps of a commutation. The god took a part for the whole. Menstruation and childbirth, like sin, made a person spiritually unclean and necessitated ritual purification by priestly sacrifice and prayer. At every turn, taboos hedged in the faithful. Sin lay potential in almost every desire, and donations were required in atonement for almost every sin. Only the priests could offer sacrifice properly or explain correctly the ritual and mysteries of the faith. The priests were a closed caste, to which none but the descendants of Levi could belong. They could not inherit property, but they were exempt from all taxation, toll, or tribute. They levied a tithe upon the harvests of the flocks and turned to their own use such offerings to the temple as were left unused by the god. After the exile, the wealth of the clergy grew with that of the renaissance community. And since this sacerdotal wealth was well administered, augmented and preserved, it finally made the priests of the second temple in Jerusalem, as in Thebes and Babylon, more powerful than the king. Nevertheless, the growth of clerical power and religious education never quite sufficed to win the Hebrews from superstition and idolatry. The hilltops and groves continued to harbor alien gods and to witness secret rites. A substantial minority of the people prostrated themselves before sacred stones, or worshipped Baal or Astarte, or practiced divination in the Babylonian manner, or set up images and burned incense to them, or knelt before the brazen serpent or the golden calf, or filled the temple with the noise of heathen feasting, or made their children pass through the fire in sacrifice. 
even some of the kings like Solomon and Ahab went a-whoring after foreign gods. Holy men like Elijah and Elisha arose who, without necessarily becoming priests, preached against these practices and tried by the example of their lives to lead their people into righteousness. Out of these conditions and beginnings and out of the rise of poverty and exploitation in Israel came the supreme figures in Jewish religion, those passionate prophets who purified and elevated the creed of the Jews and prepared it for its vicarious conquest of the Western world. 4. The First Radicals The Class War, Origin of the Prophets, Amos at Jerusalem, Isaiah, His Attacks Upon the Rich, His Doctrine of a Messiah, The Influence of the Prophets. Since poverty is created by wealth and never knows itself poor until riches stare it in the face, so it required the fabulous fortune of Solomon to mark the beginning of the class war in Israel. Solomon, like Peter and Lenin, tried to move too quickly from an agricultural to an industrial state. Not only did the toil and taxes involved in his enterprises impose great burdens upon his people, but when those undertakings were complete after twenty years of industry, a proletariat had been created in Jerusalem which, lacking sufficient employment, became a source of political faction and corruption in Palestine, precisely as it was to become in Rome. Slums developed step by step with the rise of private wealth and the increasing luxury of the court. Exploitation and usury became recognized practices among the owners of great estates and the merchants and moneylenders who flocked about the temple. The landlords of Ephraim, said Amos, sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. This growing gap between the needy and the affluent and the sharpening of that conflict between the city and the country which always accompanies an industrial civilization had something to do with the division of Palestine into two hostile kingdoms after the death of Solomon. A northern kingdom of Ephraim, with its capital at Samaria, and a southern kingdom of Judah, with its capital at Jerusalem. From that time on, the Jews were weakened by fraternal hatred and strife, breaking out occasionally into bitter war. Shortly after the death of Solomon, Jerusalem was captured by Sheshank, pharaoh of Egypt, and surrendered to appease the conqueror nearly all the gold that Solomon had gathered in his long career of taxation. It was in this atmosphere of political disruption, economic war, and religious degeneration that the prophets appeared. The men to whom the word, in Hebrew, Nabi, was first applied were not quite of the character that our reverence would associate with Amos and Isaiah. Some were diviners who could read the secrets of the heart and the past and foretell the future according to remuneration. Some were fanatics who worked themselves into a frenzy by weird music, strong drink, or dervish-like dances, and spoke in trances words which their hearers considered inspired, that is, breathed into them by some spirit other than their own. Jeremiah speaks with professional scorn of every man that is mad and maketh himself a prophet. Some were gloomy recluses like Elijah. Many of them lived in schools or monasteries near the temples, but most of them had private property and wives. From this motley crowd of fakirs, the prophets developed into responsible and consistent critics of their age and their people, magnificent street-corner statesmen who were all thoroughgoing anti-clericals and the most uncompromising of anti-Semites, a cross between soothsayers and socialists. We misunderstand them if we take them as prophets in the weather sense. Their predictions were hopes or threats or pious interpolations or prognostications after the event. The prophets themselves did not pretend to foretell so much as to speak out. They were eloquent members of the opposition. In one phase they were Tolstoyans, incensed at industrial exploitation and ecclesiastical chicanery. They came up from the simple countryside and hurled damnation at the corrupt wealth of the towns. Amos described himself not as a prophet but as a simple village shepherd. Having left his herds to see Bethel, he was horrified at the unnatural complexity of the life which he discovered there the inequality of fortune, the bitterness of competition, the ruthlessness of exploitation. So he stood in the gate and lashed the conscienceless rich and their luxuries. For as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion! that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments. I despise your feast days, saith the Lord.
Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. This is a new note in the world's literature. It is true that Amos dulls the edge of his idealism by putting into the mouth of his god a Mississippi of threats, whose severity and accumulation make the reader sympathize for a moment with the drinkers of wine and the listeners to music. But here, for the first time in the literature of Asia, the social conscience takes definite form and pours into religion a content that lifts it from ceremony and flattery to a whip of morals and a call to nobility. With Amos begins the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of his bitterest predictions seems to have been fulfilled while Amos was still alive. Thus saith the Lord, As the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed, and in Damascus in a couch, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end. The reference is apparently to the room made entirely of ivory in the palace at Samaria where King Ahab lived with his painted queen Jezebel, circa 875 to 850 B.C. Several fine ivories have been found by the Harvard Library Expedition in the ruins of a palace tentatively identified with Ahab. About the same time, another prophet threatened Samaria with destruction in one of those myriads of vivid phrases which King James's translators minted for the currency of our speech out of the wealth of the Bible. The calf of Samaria, said Hosea, shall be broken into pieces, for they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. In 733, the young king of Judah, threatened by Ephraim in alliance with Syria, appealed to Assyria for help. Assyria came, took Damascus, subjected Syria, Tyre, and Palestine to tribute, made note of Jewish efforts to secure Egyptian aid, invaded again, captured Samaria, indulged in unprintable diplomatic exchanges with the king of Judah, failed to take Jerusalem, and retired to Nineveh laden with booty and 200,000 Jewish captives doomed to Assyrian slavery. It was during this siege of Jerusalem that the prophet Isaiah became one of the great figures of Hebrew history. The book that bears his name is a collection of prophecies, that is, sermons, by two or more authors ranging in time from 710 to 300 B.C. Chapters 1 through 39 are usually ascribed to the first Isaiah, who is here discussed. Less provincial than Amos, he thought in terms of enduring statesmanship. Convinced that little Judah could not resist the imperial power of Assyria, even with the help of distant Egypt, that broken staff which would pierce the hand that should try to use it, he pled with King Ahaz, and then with King Hezekiah to remain neutral in the war between Assyria and Ephraim. Like Amos and Hosea, he foresaw the fall of Samaria and the end of the northern kingdom. When, however, the Assyrians besieged Jerusalem, Isaiah counseled Hezekiah not to yield. The sudden withdrawal of Sennacherib's hosts seemed to justify him, and for a time his repute was high with the king and the people. Always his advice was to deal justly and then leave the issue to Yahweh, who would use Assyria as his agent for a time, but in the end would destroy her too. Indeed, all the nations known to Isaiah were, according to him, destined to be struck down by Yahweh. In a few chapters, 16 through 23, Moab, Syria, Ethiopia, Egypt, Babylon, and Tyre are dedicated to destruction. Every one shall howl. This ardor for ruination, this litany of curses, mars Isaiah's book as it mars all the prophetic literature of the Bible. Nevertheless, his denunciation falls where it belongs, upon economic exploitation and greed. Here his eloquence rises to the highest point reached in the Old Testament, in passages that are among the peaks of the world's prose. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof, for ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean ye, that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor? Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees to turn aside the needy from judgment, justice, and to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. And what will ye do in the day of visitation, and in the desolation which shall come from afar? To whom will ye flee for help, and where will ye leave your glory? He is filled with scorn of those who, while fleecing the poor, present a pious face to the world. 
To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. Your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to hear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash ye, make ye clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, justice. Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. He is bitter, but he does not despair of his people, just as Amos had ended his prophecies with a prediction, strangely apt today, of the restoration of the Jews to their native land. So Isaiah concludes by formulating the messianic hope, the trust of the Jews in some redeemer who will end their political divisions, their subjection and their misery, and bring an era of universal brotherhood and peace. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. For unto us a child is born, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. With righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. It was an admirable aspiration, but not for many generations yet would it express the mood of the Jews. The priests of the temple listened with a well-controlled sympathy to these youthful encouragements to piety. Certain sects looked back to the prophets for part of their inspiration, and perhaps these excoriations of all sensual delight had some share in intensifying the desert-born Puritanism of the Jews. But for the most part the old life of the palace and the tent, the marketplace and the field, went on as before. War took its choice of every generation, and slavery continued to be the lot of the alien. The merchant cheated with his scales and tried to atone with sacrifice and prayer. It was upon the Judaism of post-exilic days and upon the world through Judaism and Christianity that the prophets left their deepest mark. In Amos and Isaiah is the beginning of both Christianity and socialism, the spring from which has flowed a stream of utopias wherein no poverty or war shall disturb human brotherhood and peace. They are the source of the early Jewish conception of a Messiah who would seize the government, re-establish the temporal power of the Jews, and inaugurate a dictatorship of the dispossessed among mankind. Isaiah and Amos began in a military age the exaltation of those virtues of simplicity and gentleness, of cooperation and friendliness which Jesus was to make a vital element in his creed. They were the first to undertake the heavy task of reforming the God of hosts into a God of love. They conscripted Yahweh for humanitarianism as the radicals of the 19th century conscripted Christ for socialism. It was they who, when the Bible was printed in Europe, fired the Germanic mind with a rejuvenated Christianity and lighted the torch of the Reformation. It was their fierce and intolerant virtue that formed the Puritans. Their moral philosophy was based upon a theory that would bear better documentation, that the righteous man will prosper and the wicked will be struck down. But even if that should be a delusion, it is the failing of a noble mind. The prophets had no conception of freedom, but they loved justice and called for an end to the tribal limitations of morality. They offered to the unfortunate of the earth a vision of brotherhood that became the precious and unforgotten heritage of many generations. 5. The Death and Resurrection of Jerusalem The Birth of the Bible, the Destruction of Jerusalem, the Babylonian Captivity, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the Second Isaiah, the Liberation of the Jews, the Second Temple. Their greatest contemporary influence was on the writing of the Bible. As the people fell away from the worship of Yahweh to the adoration of alien gods, the priests began to wonder whether the time had not come to make a final stand. 
against the disintegration of the national faith. Taking a leaf from the prophets who attributed to Yahweh the passionate convictions of their own souls, they resolved to issue to the people a communication from God himself, a code of laws that would reinvigorate the moral life of the nation and would at the same time attract the support of the prophets by embodying the less extreme of their ideas. They readily won King Josiah to their plan, and about the eighteenth year of his reign the priest Hilkiah announced to the king that he had found in the secret archives of the temple an astonishing scroll in which the great Moses himself, at the direct dictation of Yahweh, had settled once and for all those problems of history and conduct that were being so hotly debated by prophets and priests. The discovery made a great stir. Josiah called the elders of Judah to the temple, and there read to them the Book of the Covenant, in the presence, we are told, of thousands of people. Then he solemnly swore that he would henceforth abide by the laws of this book, and he caused all that were present to stand to it. We do not know just what this book of the covenant was. It may have been Exodus, chapters 20 to 23, or it may have been Deuteronomy. We need not suppose that it had been invented on the spur of the situation. It merely formulated and put into writing decrees, demands, and exhortations which for centuries had emanated from the prophets in the temple. In any event, those who heard the reading, and even those who only heard of it, were deeply impressed. Josiah took advantage of this mood to raid the altars of Yahweh's rivals in Judah. He cast out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal. He put down the idolatrous priests, and them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets. He defiled Tophet, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Malak and he smashed the altars that Solomon had built for Chemosh, Milcom, and Astarte. These reforms did not seem to propitiate Yahweh or bring him to the aid of his people. Nineveh fell, as the prophets had foretold, but only to leave little Judah subject first to Egypt and then to Babylon. When Pharaoh Necho, bound for Syria, tried to pass through Palestine, Josiah, relying upon Yahweh, resisted him on the ancient battle site of Megiddo, only to be defeated and slain. A few years later, Nebuchadrezzar overwhelmed Necho at Carchemish and made Judah a Babylonian dependency. Josiah's successors sought by secret diplomacy to liberate themselves from the clutch of Babylon and thought to bring Egypt to their rescue, but the fiery Nebuchadrezzar, getting wind of it, poured his soldiery into Palestine, captured Jerusalem, took King Jehoiakim prisoner, put Zedekiah on the throne of Judah, and carried 10,000 Jews into bondage. But Zedekiah too loved liberty or power, and rebelled against Babylon. Thereupon Nebuchadrezzar returned, and, resolving to settle the Jewish problem once and for all, as he thought, recaptured Jerusalem, burned it to the ground, destroyed the Temple of Solomon, slew Zedekiah's sons before his face, gouged out his eyes, and carried practically all the population of the city into captivity in Babylonia. Later a Jewish poet sang one of the world's great songs about that unhappy caravan. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. In all this crisis, the bitterest and most eloquent of the prophets defended Babylon as a scourge in the hands of God, denounced the rulers of Judah as obstinate fools, and advised such complete surrender to Nebuchadrezzar that the modern reader is tempted to wonder could Jeremiah have been a paid agent of Babylonia. I have made the earth the man and the beast that are upon the ground, says Jeremiah's God, and now have I given all those lands under the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, thy servant, and all nations shall serve him. And it shall come to pass that the nation and kingdom which will not serve the same Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword and with the famine and with the pestilence until I have consumed them by his hand. He may have been a traitor, but the book of his prophecies, supposedly taken down by his disciple Baruch, is not only one of the most passionately eloquent writings in all literature, as rich in vivid imagery as in merciless abuse, but it is marked with a sincerity that begins as a diffident self-questioning, and ends with honest doubts about his own course and all human life. Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne me, a man of strife, 
and the man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. Cursed be the day wherein I was born. A flame of indignation burned in him at the sight of moral depravity and political folly in his people and its leaders. He felt inwardly compelled to stand in the gate and call Israel to repentance. All this national decay, all this weakening of the state, this obviously imminent subjection of Judah to Babylon, were, it seemed to Jeremiah, Yahweh's hand laid upon the Jews in punishment for their sins. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. Everywhere iniquity ruled, and sex ran riot. Men were as fed horses in the morning, every one neighed after his neighbor's wife. When the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem, the rich men of the city, to propitiate Yahweh, released their Hebrew slaves. But when for a time the siege was raised and the danger seemed past, the rich apprehended their former slaves and forced them into their old bondage. It was a summary of human history that Jeremiah could not bear silently. Like the other prophets, he denounced those hypocrites who with pious faces brought to the temple some part of the gains they had made from grinding the faces of the poor. The Lord, he reminded them, in the eternal lesson of all finer religion, ask not for sacrifice, but for justice. The priests and the prophets, he thinks, are almost as false and corrupt as the merchants. They, too, like the people, need to be morally reborn, to be, in Jeremiah's strange phrase, circumcised in the spirit as well as in the flesh. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. Against these abuses the prophet preached with a fury rivaled only by the stern saints of Geneva, Scotland, and England. Jeremiah cursed the Jews savagely and took some delight in picturing the ruin of all who would not heed him. Time and again he predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity in Babylon, and wept over the doomed city, whom he called the daughter of Zion, in terms anticipatory of Christ. Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. To the princes of Zedekiah's court all this seemed sheer treason. It was dividing the Jews in counsel and spirit in the very hour of war. Jeremiah tantalized them by carrying a wooden yoke around his neck, explaining that all Judah must submit, the more peaceably the better, to the yoke of Babylon. And when Hananiah tore this yoke away, Jeremiah cried out that Yahweh would make yokes of iron for all the Jews. The priests tried to stop him by putting his head into the stocks, but from even that position he continued to denounce them. They arraigned him in the temple and wished to kill him, but through some friend among the priests he escaped. Then the princes arrested him and lowered him by ropes into a dungeon filled with mire. But Zedekiah had him raised to milder imprisonment in the palace court. There the Babylonians found him when Jerusalem fell. On Nebuchadrezzar's orders they treated him well and exempted him from the general exile. In his old age, says Orthodox tradition, he wrote his Lamentations, the most eloquent of all the books of the Old Testament. He mourned now the completeness of his triumph and the desolation of Jerusalem, and raised to heaven the unanswerable questions of Job. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How she has become as a widow, she that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces? How has she become tributary? Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, Yet let us talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Meanwhile, in Babylon, another preacher was taking up the burden of prophecy. Ezekiel belonged to a priestly family that had been driven to Babylon in the first deportation from Jerusalem. He began his preaching, like the first Isaiah and Jeremiah, with fierce denunciations of idolatry and corruption in Jerusalem. At great length he compared Jerusalem to a harlot because she sold the favors of her worship to strange gods. He described Samaria and Jerusalem as twin whores. This word was as popular with him as with the dramatists of the Stuart Restoration. He made long lists of the sins of Jerusalem and then condemned her to capture and destruction. Like Isaiah, he doomed the nations impartially and announced the sins and fall of Moab, Tyre, Egypt, Assyria, even of the mysterious kingdom of Magog. But he was not as bitter as Jeremiah, in the end he relented, declared that the Lord would save a remnant of the Jews, and foretold the resurrection of their city. He described in vision the new temple that would be built there, and outlined a utopia in which the priests would be supreme, 
and in which Yahweh would dwell among his people forever. He hoped with this happy ending to keep up the spirits of the exiles and to retard their assimilation into the Babylonian culture and blood. Then as now it seemed that this process of absorption would destroy the unity, even the identity of the Jews. They flourished on Mesopotamia's rich soil, they enjoyed considerable freedom of custom and worship, they grew rapidly in numbers and wealth, and prospered in the unwanted tranquility and harmony which their subjection had brought to them. An ever-rising proportion of them accepted the gods of Babylon and the Epicurean ways of the old metropolis. When the second generation of exiles grew up, Jerusalem was almost forgotten. It was the function of the unknown author who undertook to complete the book of Isaiah to restate the religion of Israel for this backsliding generation, and it was his distinction in restating it to lift it to the loftiest plane that any religion had yet reached amid all the faiths of the Near East. We know nothing of the history of this writer who, by a literary device and license common to his time, chose to speak in the name of Isaiah. We merely guess that he wrote shortly before or after Cyrus liberated the Jews. Biblical scholarship assigns to him chapters 40 through 55 and to another and later unknown or unknowns, chapters 56 through 66. While Buddha in India was preaching the death of desire and Confucius in China was formulating wisdom for his people, this second Isaiah, in majestic and luminous prose, announced to the exiled Jews the first clear revelation of monotheism, and offered them a new god, infinitely richer in loving kindness and tender mercy than the bitter Yahweh even of the first Isaiah. In words that a later gospel was to choose as spurring on the young Christ, this greatest of prophets announced his mission, no longer to curse the people for their sins, but to bring them hope in their bondage. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. For he has discovered that Yahweh is not a God of war and vengeance, but a loving Father. The discovery fills him with happiness and inspires him to magnificent songs. He predicts the coming of the new God to rescue his people. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, he shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. The prophet then lifts the messianic hope to a place among the ruling ideas of his people, and describes the servant who will redeem Israel by vicarious sacrifice. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Modern research does not regard this servant as the prophetic portrayal of Jesus. Persia, the second Isaiah predicts, will be the instrument of this liberation. Cyrus is invincible. He will take Babylon and will free the Jews from their captivity. They will return to Jerusalem and build a new temple, a new city, a very paradise. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like a bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. Perhaps it was the rise of Persia and the spread of its power subjecting all the states of the Near East in an imperial unity vaster and better governed than any social organization men had yet known, that suggested to the prophet the conception of one universal deity. No longer does his God say, like the Yahweh of Moses, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Now it is written, I am the Lord, and there is none else, there is no God besides me. The prophet-poet describes this universal deity in one of the great passages of the Bible. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. All nations before him are as nothing and they are counted to him less than nothing, and vanity. 
To whom then will ye liken God, or what likeness will ye compare with him? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things. It was a dramatic hour in the history of Israel, when at last Cyrus entered Babylon as a world conqueror, and gave to the exiled Jews full freedom to return to Jerusalem. He disappointed some of the prophets and showed his superior civilization by leaving Babylon and its population unhurt and offering a skeptical obeisance to its gods. He restored to the Jews what remained in the Babylonian treasury of the gold and silver taken by Nebuchadrezzar from the temple and instructed the communities in which the exiles lived to furnish them with funds for their long journey home. The younger Jews were not enthusiastic at this liberation. Many of them had sunk strong roots into Babylonian soil and hesitated to abandon their fertile fields and their flourishing trade for the desolate ruins of the holy city. It was not until two years after Cyrus's coming that the first detachment of zealots set out on the long three-month journey back to the land which their fathers had left half a century before. They found themselves then as now not entirely welcome in their ancient home. For meanwhile other Semites had settled there and had made the soil their own by occupation and toil. And these tribes looked with hatred upon the apparent invaders of what seemed to them their native fields. The returning Jews could not possibly have established themselves had it not been for the strong and friendly empire that protected them. The prince Zerubbabel won permission from the Persian king Darius I to rebuild the temple. And though the immigrants were small in number and resources, and the work was hindered at every step by the attacks and conspiracies of a hostile population, it was carried to completion within some twenty-two years after the return. Slowly Jerusalem became again a Jewish city, and the temple resounded with the psalms of a rescued remnant resolved to make Judea strong again. It was a great triumph, surpassed only by that which we have seen in our own historic time. 6. The People of the Book The Book of the Law, the Composition of the Pentateuch, the Myths of Genesis, the Mosaic Code, the Ten Commandments, the Idea of God, the Sabbath, the Jewish Family, Estimate of the Mosaic Legislation. To build a military state was impossible. Judea had neither the numbers nor the wealth for such an enterprise, since some system of order was needed that, while recognizing the sovereignty of Persia, would give the Jews a natural discipline and a national unity, the clergy undertook to provide a theocratic rule based, like Josiah's, on priestly traditions and laws promulgated as divine commands. About the year 444 B.C., Ezra, a learned priest, called the Jews together in solemn assembly and read to them from morn to midday the book of the law of Moses. This book is continued on cassette 10, side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, cassette 10, side 1. About the year 444 B.C., Ezra, a learned priest, called the Jews together in solemn assembly and read to them from morn to midday the book of the law of Moses. For seven days he and his fellow Levites read from these scrolls. At the end, the priests and the leaders of the people pledged themselves to accept this body of legislation as their constitution and their conscience, and to obey it forever. From those troubled times till ours, that law has been the central fact in the life of the Jews and their loyalty to it through all wanderings and tribulations has been one of the impressive phenomena of history. What was this book of the law of Moses? Not quite the same as that book of the covenant which Josiah had read, for the latter had admitted of being completely read twice in a day, while the other needed a week. We can only guess that the larger scroll constituted a substantial part of those first five books of the Old Testament which the Jews call Torah, or the law, and which others call the Pentateuch. Torah is Hebrew for direction, guidance. Pentateuch is Greek for five roles. How, when, and where had these books been written? This is an innocent question which has caused the writing of 50,000 volumes and must here be left unanswered in a paragraph. The consensus of scholarship is that the oldest elements in the Bible are those distinct and yet similar legends of Genesis, which are called J and E, respectively, because one speaks of the Creator as Jehovah, Yahweh, while the other speaks of Him as Elohim. It is believed that the Yahvist narrative was written in Judah, the Elohist in Ephraim, 
and that the two stories fused into one after the fall of Samaria. A third element, known as D and embodying the Deuteronomic Code, is probably by a distinct author or group of authors. A fourth element, P, is composed of sections later inserted by the priests. This priestly code is probably the substance of the Book of the Law promulgated by Ezra. The four compositions appear to have taken their present form about 300 B.C. These delightful tales of the creation, the temptation, and the flood were drawn from a storehouse of Mesopotamian legend as old as 3000 B.C. We have seen some early forms of them in the course of this history. It is possible that the Jews appropriated some of these myths from Babylonian literature during the captivity. It is more likely that they had adopted them long before from ancient Semitic and Sumerian sources common to all the Near East. The Persian and the Talmudic forms of the creation myth represent God as first making a two-sexed being, a male and a female joined at the back like Siamese twins, and then dividing it as an afterthought. We are reminded of a strange sentence in Genesis. Chapter 5, verse 2. Male and female created he them and blessed them, and called their name Adam. That is, our first parent was originally both male and female, which seems to have escaped all theologians except Aristophanes. The legend of paradise appears in almost all folklore, in Egypt, India, Tibet, Babylonia, Persia, Greece, Polynesia, Mexico, etc. Most of these Edens had forbidden trees and were supplied with serpents or dragons that stole immortality from men or otherwise poisoned paradise. Both the serpent and the fig were probably phallic symbols. Behind the myth is the thought that sex and knowledge destroy innocence and happiness and are the origin of evil. We shall find this same idea at the end of the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes as here at the beginning. In most of these stories, woman was the lovely, evil agent of the serpent or the devil, whether as Eve or Pandora or the Bo Se of Chinese legend. All things, says the Shi Ching, at first were subject to man, but a woman threw us into slavery. Our misery came not from heaven, but from woman. She lost the human race. Ah, unhappy Pose, thou kindled the fire that consumes us and which is every day increasing. The world is lost. Vice overflows all things. Even more universal was the story of the flood. Hardly an ancient people went without it, and hardly a mountain in Asia but had given perch to some water-wearied Noah or Shamash Napishtim. Usually these legends were the popular vehicle or allegory of a philosophical judgment or a moral attitude summarizing long racial experience. That sex and knowledge bring more grief than joy, and that human life is periodically threatened by floods, that is, ruinous inundations of the great rivers whose waters made possible the earliest known civilizations. To ask whether these stories are true or false, whether they really happened, would be to put a trivial and superficial question. Their substance, of course, is not the tales they tell, but the judgments they convey. Meanwhile, it would be unwise not to enjoy their disarming simplicity and the vivid swiftness of their narratives. The books which Josiah and Ezra caused to be read to the people formulated that Mosaic Code on which all later Jewish life was to be built. Of this legislation, the cautious Sartan writes, its importance in the history of institutions and of law cannot be overestimated. It was the most thoroughgoing attempt in history to use religion as a basis of statesmanship and as a regulator of every detail of life. The law became, says Renan, the tightest garment into which life was ever laced. Diet, medicine, personal, menstrual, and natal hygiene, public sanitation, sexual inversion, and bestiality, all are made subjects of divine ordinance and guidance. Again, we observe how slowly the doctor was differentiated from the priest to become in time his greatest enemy. Leviticus, chapters 13 through 15, legislates carefully for the treatment of venereal disease, even to the most definite directions for segregation, disinfection, fumigation, and, if necessary, the complete burning of the house in which the disease has run its course. The ancient Hebrews were the founders of prophylaxis, but they seem to have had no surgery beyond circumcision. This rite, common among ancient Egyptians and modern Semites, 
was not only a sacrifice to God and a compulsion to racial loyalty, it was a hygienic precaution against sexual uncleanliness. Perhaps it was this code of cleanliness that helped to preserve the Jews through their long odyssey of dispersion and suffering. For the rest, the code centered about those Ten Commandments, Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, which were destined to receive the lip service of half the world. The first laid the foundation of the new theocratic community, which was to rest not upon any civil law, but upon the idea of God. He was the invisible king who dictated every law and meted out every penalty. And his people were to be called Israel, as meaning the defenders of God. The Hebrew state was dead, but the temple remained. The priests of Judea, like the popes of Rome, would try to restore what the kings had failed to save. Hence the explicitness and reiteration of the first commandment. Heresy or blasphemy must be punished with death, even if the heretic should be one's closest kin. The priestly authors of the code, like the pious inquisitors, believed that religious unity was an indispensable condition of social organization and solidarity. It was this intolerance and their racial pride that embroiled and preserved the Jews. The second commandment elevated the national conception of God at the expense of art. No graven images were ever to be made of him. It assumed a high intellectual level among the Jews, for it rejected superstition and anthropomorphism, and, despite the all-too-human quality of the Pentateuch Yahweh, tried to conceive of God as beyond every form and image. It conscripted Hebrew devotion for religion, and left nothing in ancient days for science and art. Even astronomy was neglected, lest corrupt diviners should multiply, or the stars be worshipped as divinities. In Solomon's temple there had been an almost heathen abundance of imagery. In the new temple there was none. The old images had been carried off to Babylon, and apparently had not been returned along with utensils of silver and gold. Hence we find no sculpture, painting, or bas-relief after the captivity, and very little before it except under the almost alien Solomon. Architecture and music were the only arts that the priests would allow. Song and temple ritual redeemed the life of the people from gloom. An orchestra of several instruments joined as one to make one sound, with a great choir of voices to sing the psalms that glorified the temple and its God. David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on harps, psalteries, timbrels, cornets, and cymbals. The third commandment typified the intense piety of the Jew. Not only would he not take the name of the Lord God in vain, he would never pronounce it. Even when he came upon the name of Yahweh in his prayers, he would substitute for it Adonai, Lord. Only the Hindus would rival this piety. The fourth commandment sanctified the weekly day of rest as a Sabbath and passed it down as one of the strongest institutions of mankind. The name, and perhaps the custom, came from Babylon. Shabbatu was applied by the Babylonians to taboo days of abstinence and propitiation. Besides this weekly holy day, there were great festivals. Once Canaanite vegetation rites, reminiscent of sowing and harvesting, and the cycles of moon and sun. Matzot, called Pentecost, celebrated the end of the wheat harvest. Sukkot commemorated the vintage. Pesach, or Passover, was the feast of the first fruits of the flock. Rosh Hashanah announced the new year. Only later were these festivals adapted to commemorate vital events in the history of the Jews. On the first day of the Passover, a lamb or kid was sacrificed and eaten, and its blood was sprinkled upon the doors as the portion of the god. Later the priests attached this custom to the story of Yahweh's slaughter of the firstborn of the Egyptians. The lamb was once a totem of a Canaanite clan. The Passover among the Canaanites was the oblation of a lamb to the local god. As we read in Exodus chapter 11 the story of the establishment of the Passover rite and see the Jews celebrating that same rite steadfastly today, we feel again the venerable antiquity of their worship and the strength and tenacity of their race. The fifth commandment sanctified the family as second only to the temple in the structure of Jewish society. The ideals then stamped upon the institution marked it throughout medieval and modern European history until our own disintegrative industrial revolution. The Hebrew patriarchal family was a vast economic and political organization composed of the oldest married male, his wives, his unmarried children, his married sons with their wives and children, and perhaps some slaves. 
The economic basis of the institution was its convenience for cultivating the soil. Its political value lay in its providing a system of social order so strong that it made the state, except in war, almost superfluous. The father's authority was practically unlimited. The land was his, and his children could survive only by obedience to him. He was the state. If he was poor, he could sell his daughter before her puberty as a bondservant, and though occasionally he condescended to ask her consent, he had full right to dispose of her in marriage as he wished. Boys were supposed to be products of the right testicle, girls of the left, which was believed to be smaller and weaker than the right. At first, marriage was matrilocal. The man had to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife in her clan. But this custom gradually died out after the establishment of the monarchy. Yahweh's instructions to the wife were, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Though technically subject, the woman was often a person of high authority and dignity. The history of the Jews shines with such names as Sarah, Rachel, Miriam, and Esther. Deborah was one of the judges of Israel, and it was the prophetess Hulda whom Josiah consulted about the book which the priests had found in the temple. The mother of many children was certain of security and honor. For the little nation longed to increase and multiply, feeling, as in Palestine today, its dangerous numerical inferiority to the peoples surrounding it. Therefore, the exalted motherhood, branded celibacy as a sin and a crime, made marriage compulsory after twenty, even in priests, abhorred marriageable virgins and childless women, and looked upon abortion, infanticide, and other means of limiting population as heathen abominations that stank in the nostrils of the Lord. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister, and said unto Jacob, Give me children, or else I die. The perfect wife was one who labored constantly in and about her home, and had no thought except in her husband and her children. The last chapter of Proverbs states the male ideal of woman completely. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships, she bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen, and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. The sixth commandment was a counsel of perfection. Nowhere is there so much killing as in the Old Testament. Its chapters oscillate between slaughter and compensatory reproduction. Tribal quarrels, internal factions, and hereditary vendettas broke the monotony of intermittent peace. Despite a magnificent verse about plowshares and pruning hooks, the prophets were not pacifists, and the priests, if we may judge from the speeches which they put into the mouth of Yahweh, were almost as fond of war as of preaching. Among nineteen kings of Israel, eight were assassinated. Captured cities were usually destroyed, the males put to the sword, and the soil deliberately ruined, in the fashion of the times. Perhaps the figures exaggerate the killing. It is unbelievable that, entirely without modern inventions, the children of Israel slew of the Syrians one hundred thousand footmen in one day. Belief in themselves as the chosen people intensified the pride natural in a nation conscious of superior abilities. It accentuated their disposition to segregate themselves maritally and mentally from other peoples, and deprived them of the international perspective that their descendants were to attain. But they had in high degree the virtues of their qualities. 
Their violence came of unmanageable vitality, their separatism came of their piety, their quarrelsomeness and querulousness came of a passionate sensitivity that produced the greatest literature of the Near East. Their racial pride was the indispensable prop of their courage through centuries of suffering. Men are what they have had to be. The Seventh Commandment recognized marriage as the basis of the family, as the Fifth had recognized the family as the basis of society, and it offered to marriage all the support of religion. It said nothing about sex relations before marriage, but other regulations laid upon the bride the obligation under pain of death by stoning to prove her virginity on the day of her marriage. Nevertheless, prostitution was common, and pederasty apparently survived the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. As the law did not seem to prohibit relations with foreign harlots, Syrian, Moabite, Midianite, and other strange women flourished along the highways where they lived in booths and tents and combined the trades of peddler and prostitute. Solomon, who had no violent prejudices in these matters, relaxed the laws that had kept such women out of Jerusalem. In time they multiplied so rapidly there that in the days of the Maccabees the temple itself was described by an indignant reformer as full of fornication and harlotry. Love affairs probably occurred, for there was much tenderness between the sexes. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. But love played a very small role in the choice of mates. Before the exile, marriage was completely secular, arranged by the parents or by the suitor with the parents of the bride. Vestiges of capture marriage are found in the Old Testament. Yahweh approves of it in war, and the elders, on the occasion of a shortage of women, commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards, and see and behold if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in dances. Then come ye out of the vineyards, and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the land of Benjamin. But this was exceptional. Usually the marriage was by purchase. Jacob purchased Leah and Rachel by his toil. The gentle Ruth was quite simply bought by Boaz and the prophet Hosea regretted exceedingly that he had given fifty shekels for his wife. The word for wife, Beulah, meant owned. The father of the bride reciprocated by giving his daughter a dowry, an institution admirably adapted to diminish the socially disruptive gap between the sexual and the economic maturity of children in an urban civilization. If the man was well-to-do, he might practice polygamy. If the wife was barren, like Sarah, she might encourage her husband to take a concubine. The purpose of these arrangements was prolific reproduction. It was taken as a matter of course that after Rachel and Leah had given Jacob all the children they were capable of bearing, they should offer him their maids, who would also bear him children. A woman was not allowed to remain idle in this matter of reproduction. If a husband died, his brother, however many wives he might already have, was obliged to marry her. Or if the husband had no brother, the obligation fell upon his nearest surviving male kin. Since private property was the core of Jewish economy, the double standard prevailed. The man might have many wives, but the woman was confined to one man. Adultery meant relations with the woman who had been bought and paid for by another man. It was a violation of the law of property and was punished with death for both parties. Fornication was forbidden to women, but was looked upon as a venial offense in men. Divorce was free to the man, but extremely difficult for the woman until Talmudic days. The husband does not seem to have abused his privileges unduly. He is pictured to us, all in all, as zealously devoted to his wife and his children. And though love did not determine marriage, it often flowered out of it. Isaac took Rebecca, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Probably in no other people outside of the Far East has family life reached so high a level as among the Jews. The Eighth Commandment sanctified private property and bound it up with religion and the family as one of the three bases of Hebrew society. Property was almost entirely in land. Until the days of Solomon there was little industry beyond that of the potter and the smith. Even agriculture was not completely developed. The bulk of the population devoted itself to rearing sheep and cattle and tending the vine, the olive, and the fig. They lived in tents rather than houses in order to move more easily to fresh pastures. In time, their growing economic surplus generated trade, and the Jewish merchants, by their tenacity and their skill, began to flourish in Damascus, Tyre, and Sidon, and in the precincts of the temple itself. 
There was no coinage till near the time of the captivity, but gold and silver, weighed in each transaction, became a medium of exchange, and bankers appeared in great numbers to finance commerce and enterprise. It was nothing strange that these money lenders should use the courts of the temple. It was a custom general in the Near East, and survives there in many places to this day. Yahweh beamed upon the growing power of the Hebrew financiers. Thou shalt lend unto many nations, he said, but thou shalt not borrow. A generous philosophy that has made great fortunes, though it is not seemed in our century to be divinely inspired. As in the other countries of the Near East, war captives and convicts were used as slaves, and hundreds of thousands of them toiled in cutting timber and transporting materials for such public works as Solomon's temple and palace. But the owner had no power of life and death over his slaves, and the slave might acquire property and buy his liberty. Men could be sold as bond servants for unpaid debts, or could sell their children in their place. And this continued to the days of Christ. These typical institutions of the Near East were mitigated in Judea by generous charity, and a vigorous campaign by priest and prophet against exploitation. The Code laid it down, hopefully, that ye shall not oppress one another. It asked that Hebrew bond servants should be released, and debts among Jews cancelled every seventh year. And when this was found too idealistic for the masters, the law proclaimed the institution of the Jubilee, by which every fifty years all slaves and debtors should be freed. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land, unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family." We have no evidence that this fine edict was obeyed, but we must give credit to the priests for leaving no lesson in charity untaught. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren, thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need. And take thou no usury, that is, interest, of him. The Sabbath rest was to be extended to every employee, even to animals. Stray sheaves and fruits were to be left in the fields and orchards for the poor to glean. And though these charities were largely for fellow Jews, the stranger in the gates was also to be treated with kindness. The sojourner was to be sheltered and fed and dealt with honorably. At all times the Jews were bidden to remember that they, too, had once been homeless, even bond servants, in a foreign land. The Ninth Commandment, by demanding absolute honesty of witnesses, put the prop of religion under the whole structure of Jewish law. An oath was to be a religious ceremony. Not merely was a man in swearing to place his hand on the genitals of him to whom he swore, as in the old custom. He was now to be taking God himself as his witness and his judge. False witnesses, according to the Code, were to receive the same punishment that their testimony had sought to bring upon their victims. Religious law was the sole law of Israel. The priests in the temples were the judges in the courts, and those who refused to accept the decision of the priests were to be put to death. Ordeal by the drinking of poisonous water was prescribed in certain cases of doubtful guilt. There was no other than religious machinery for enforcing the law. It had to be left to personal conscience and public opinion. Minor crimes might be atoned for by confession and compensation. Capital punishment was decreed by Yahweh's instructions for murder, kidnapping, idolatry, adultery, striking or cursing a parent, stealing a slave, or lying with a beast, but not for the killing of a servant. And thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Yahweh was quite satisfied to have the individual take the law into his own hands in case of murder. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. Certain cities, however, were to be set apart to which a criminal might flee, and in which the avenger must stay his revenge. In general, the principle of punishment was the lex talionis. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, stripe for stripe. We trust that this was a counsel of perfection never quite realized. The Mosaic Code, though written down at least 1,500 years later, shows no advance in criminal legislation upon the Code of Hammurabi. In legal organization it shows an archaic retrogression to primitive ecclesiastical control. The Tenth Commandment reveals how clearly woman was conceived under the rubric of property. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Nevertheless, it was an admirable precept. 
Could men follow it, half the fever and anxiety of our life would be removed. Strange to say, the greatest of the commandments is not listed among the ten, though it is part of the law. It occurs in Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18, lost amid a repetition of sundry laws, and reads very simply, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In general, it was a lofty code, sharing its defects with its age and rising to virtues characteristically its own. We must remember that it was only a law, indeed only a priestly utopia, rather than a description of Jewish life. Like other codes, it was honored plentifully in the breach and won new praise with every violation. But its influence upon the conduct of the people was at least as great as that of most legal or moral codes. It gave to the Jews, through the two thousand years of wandering which they were soon to begin, a portable fatherland, as Heine was to call it, an intangible and spiritual state. It kept them united despite every dispersion, proud despite every defeat, and brought them across the centuries to our own time, a strong and apparently indestructible people. 7. The Literature and Philosophy of the Bible History, Fiction, Poetry, The Psalms, The Song of Songs, Proverbs, Job, The Idea of Immortality, The Pessimism of Ecclesiastes, The Advent of Alexander. The Old Testament is not only law, it is history, poetry, and philosophy of the highest order. After making every deduction for primitive legend and pious fraud, after admitting that the historical books are not quite as accurate or as ancient as our forefathers supposed, we find in them nevertheless not merely some of the oldest historical writing known to us, but some of the best. The books of Judges, Samuel, and Kings may, as some scholars believe, have been put together hastily during or shortly after the exile, to collect and preserve the national traditions of a scattered and broken people. Nevertheless, the stories of Saul, David, and Solomon are immeasurably finer in structure and style than the other historical writing of the ancient Near East. Even Genesis, if we read it with some understanding of the function of legend, is, barring its genealogies, an admirable story told without frill or ornament, with simplicity, vividness, and force. And in a sense we have here not mere history, but philosophy of history. This is the first recorded effort of man to reduce the multiplicity of past events to a measure of unity by seeking in them some pervading purpose and significance, some law of sequence and causation, some illumination for the present and the future. The conception of history promulgated by the prophets and the priestly authors of the Pentateuch survived a thousand years of Greece and Rome to become the world view of European thinkers, from Boethius to Bossuet. Midway between the history and the poetry are the fascinating romances of the Bible. There is nothing more perfect in the realm of prose than the story of Ruth. Only less excellent are the tales of Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, Samson and Delilah, Esther, Judith and Daniel. The poetical literature begins with the Song of Moses, Exodus chapter 15, and the Song of Deborah, Judges chapter 5, and reaches finally to the heights of the Psalms. The penitential hymns of the Babylonians had prepared for these, and perhaps had given them material as well as form. Ignaton's Ode to the Sun seems to have contributed to Psalm 104, and the majority of the Psalms, instead of being the impressively united work of David, are probably the compositions of several poets writing long after the captivity, probably in the third century before Christ. But all this is as irrelevant as the name or sources of Shakespeare. What matters is that the Psalms are at the head of the world's lyric poetry. They were not meant to be read at a sitting or in a higher critic's mood. They are at their best as expressing moments of pious ecstasy and stimulating faith. They are marred for us by bitter imprecations, tiresome groanings and complaints, and endless adulation of a Yahweh who, with all his loving kindness and long suffering and compassion, pours smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth, number eight, promises that the wicked shall be turned into hell, in number nine, laps up flattery and threatens to cut off all flattering lips, number twelve. The Psalms are full of military ardor, hardly Christian, but very pilgrim. Some of them, however, are jewels of tenderness or cameos of humility. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. 
number 29 and number 103. In these songs, we feel the antistrophic rhythm of ancient Oriental poetry and almost hear the voices of majestic choirs in alternate answering. No poetry has ever excelled this in revealing metaphor or living imagery. Never has religious feeling been more intensely or vividly expressed. These poems touch us more deeply than any lyric of love. They move even the skeptical soul, for they give passionate form to the final longing of the developed mind, for some perfection to which it may dedicate its striving. Here and there in the King James Version are pithy phrases that have become almost words in our language. Out of the mouths of babes, number eight, the apple of the eye, number seventeen, put not your trust in princes, number one hundred forty-six, and everywhere in the original are similes that have never been surpassed. The rising sun is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Number 19. We can only imagine what majesty and beauty must clothe these songs in the sonorous language of their origin. When, beside these psalms, we place in contrast the Song of Solomon, we get a glimpse of that sensual and terrestrial element in Jewish life which the Old Testament, written almost entirely by prophets and priests, has perhaps concealed from us, just as Ecclesiastes reveals a skepticism not otherwise discernible in the carefully selected and edited literature of the ancient Jews. This strangely amorous composition is an open field for surmise. It may be a collection of songs of Babylonian origin, celebrating the love of Ishtar and Tammuz. It may be, since it contains words borrowed from the Greek, the work of several Hebrew anacreons touched by the Hellenistic spirit that entered Judea with Alexander. Or, since the lovers address each other as brother and sister in the Egyptian manner, it may be a flower of Alexandrian jewelry, plucked by some quite emancipated soul from the banks of the Nile. In any case, its presence in the Bible is a charming mystery, by what winking or hoodwinking of the theologians did these songs of lusty passion find room between Isaiah and the preacher? A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. Also our bed is green. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose or by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourish, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. This is the voice of youth, and that of the Proverbs is the voice of old age. Men look to love and life for everything. They receive a little less than that. They imagine that they have received nothing. These are the three stages of the pessimist. So this legendary Solomon warns youth against the evil woman, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. There be three things which are wonderful to me, yea, four which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. He agrees with St. Paul that it is better to marry than to burn. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and the pleasant roe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox with hatred therewith. Can these be the words of the husband of seven hundred wives? Next to unchastity in the way of wisdom is sloth. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. Yet will the philosopher not brook crass ambition. He that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. 
Work is wisdom, words are mere folly. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. The lesson which the sage never tires of repeating is an almost Socratic identification of virtue and wisdom, redolent of those schools of Alexandria in which Hebrew theology was mating with Greek philosophy to form the intellect of Europe. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all things thou canst desire are not to be compared with her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Job is earlier than Proverbs. Perhaps it was written during the exile, and described by allegory the captives of Babylon. I call it, says the perfervid Carlyle, one of the grandest things ever written with a pen, a noble book, all men's book. It is our first oldest statement of the never-ending problem, man's destiny and God's ways with him here on this earth. There is nothing written, I think, in the Bible or out of it, of equal literary merit. The problem arose out of the Hebrew emphasis on this world. Since there was no heaven in ancient Jewish theology, virtue had to be rewarded here or never. But often it seemed that only the wicked prospered and that the choicest sufferings are reserved for the good man. Why, as the psalmist complained, did the ungodly prosper in the world? Why did God hide himself instead of punishing the evil and rewarding the good? The author of Job now asked the same questions more resolutely and offered his hero perhaps as a symbol for his people. All Israel had worshipped Yahweh fitfully as Job had done. Babylon had ignored and blasphemed Yahweh, and yet Babylon flourished and Israel ate the dust and wore the sackcloth of desolation and captivity. What could one say of such a God? In a prologue in heaven, which some clever scribe may have inserted to take the scandal out of the book, Satan suggests to Yahweh that Job is perfect and upright only because he is fortunate. Would he retain his piety in adversity? Yahweh permits Satan to heap a variety of calamities upon Job's head. For a time the hero is as patient as Job, but at last his fortitude breaks. He ponders suicide and bitterly reproaches his God for forsaking him. Zophar, who has come out to enjoy the sufferings of his friend, insists that God is just and will yet reward the good man even on earth, but Job shuts him up sharply. No doubt but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you, but I have understanding as well as you, yea, who knoweth not these things. The tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. Lo, mine eye hath seen all this, mine ear hath heard and understood it, but ye are forgers of lies, ye are all physicians of no value. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. He reflects on the brevity of life and the length of death. Man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fall from the sea, and the flood decayeth and drieth up, so man lieth down and riseth not. If a man die, shall he live again? The debate continues vigorously, and Job becomes more and more skeptical of his God, until he calls him adversary, and wishes that this adversary would destroy himself by writing a book, perhaps some Leibnizian theodicy. The concluding words of this chapter, the words of Job are ended, suggest that this was the original termination of a discourse which, like that of Ecclesiastes, represented a strong heretical minority among the Jews. But a fresh philosopher enters at this point, Elihu, who demonstrates in 165 verses the justice of God's ways with men. Finally, in one of the most majestic passages in the Bible, a voice comes down out of the clouds. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. 
Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched his line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it brake forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the dayspring to know his place? Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breath of the earth? Declare, if thou knowest it all. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts, or who hath given understanding to the heart? Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Job humbles himself in terror before this apparition. Yahweh, appeased, forgives him, accepts his sacrifice, denounces Job's friends for their feeble arguments, and gives Job fourteen thousand sheep, six thousand camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, a thousand she-asses, seven sons, three daughters, and one hundred and forty years. It is a lame but happy ending. Job receives everything but an answer to his questions. The problem remained, and it was to have profound effects upon later Jewish thought. In the days of Daniel, circa 167 B.C., it was to be abandoned as insoluble in terms of this world. No answer could be given. Daniel and Enoch, and Kant, would say, unless one believed in some other life beyond the grave in which all wrongs would be righted, the wicked would be punished and the just would inherit infinite reward. This was one of the varied currents of thought that flowed into Christianity and carried it to victory. In Ecclesiastes the problem is given a pessimistic reply. Prosperity and misfortune have nothing to do with virtue and vice. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 10, Side 2. In Ecclesiastes, the problem is given a pessimistic reply. Prosperity and misfortune have nothing to do with virtue and vice. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and beheld the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter, and on the side of their oppressors there was power. If thou seest the oppression of the poor, and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter, for there be higher than they. It is not virtue and vice that determine a man's lot, but blind and merciless chance. I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Even wealth is insecure, and does not long bring happiness. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Remembering his relatives, he formulates Maltus in a line. When goods are increased, they are increased that eat them. Nor can he be soothed by any legend of a golden past or a utopia to come. Things have always been as they are now, and so they will always be. Say not thou what is the cause that the former days were better than these, for thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. One must choose his historians carefully. And... The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time which was before us. 
Progress, he thinks, is a delusion. Civilizations have been forgotten and will be again. In general, he feels that life is a sorry business and might well be dispensed with. It is aimless and circuitous motion without permanent result and ends where it began. It is a futile struggle in which nothing is certain except defeat. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath the man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth for ever. The sun also ariseth, and the wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers came, thither they return again. Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. For a time he seeks the answer to the riddle of life and abandonment to pleasure. Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. But, behold, this also is vanity. The difficulty with pleasure is woman, from whom the preacher seems to have received some unforgettable sting. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape her. He concludes his digression into this most obscure realm of philosophy by reverting to the advice of Solomon and Voltaire, who did not practice it. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity which God hath given thee under the sun. Even wisdom is a questionable thing. He lords it generously, but he suspects that anything more than a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Of making many books, he writes with uncanny foresight, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. It might be wise to seek wisdom if God had given it a better income. Wisdom is good with an inheritance. Otherwise it is a snare and is apt to destroy its lovers. Truth is like Yahweh, who said to Moses, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. In the end the wise man dies as thoroughly as the fool, and both come to the same odor. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold all is vanity and a chasing after the wind. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is a chasing after the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. All these darts of outrageous fortune might be borne with hope and courage if the just man could look forward to some happiness beyond the grave. But that too, Ecclesiastes feels, is a myth. Man is an animal and dies like any other beast. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence over a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. What a commentary on the wisdom so lauded in the Proverbs! Here, evidently, civilization had for a time gone to seed. The vitality of Israel's youth had been exhausted by her struggles against the empires that surrounded her. The Yahweh in whom she had trusted had not come to her aid, and in her desolation and dispersion she raised to the skies this bitterest of all voices in literature to express the profoundest doubts that ever come to the human soul. 
Jerusalem had been restored, but not as the citadel of an unconquerable god. It was a vassal city ruled now by Persia, now by Greece. In 334 B.C., the young Alexander stood at its gates and demanded the surrender of the capital. The high priest at first refused, but the next morning, having had a dream, he consented. He ordered the clergy to put on their most impressive vestments and the people to garb themselves in immaculate white. Then he led the population pacifically out through the gates to solicit peace. Alexander bowed to the high priest, expressed his admiration for the people and their God, and accepted Jerusalem. It was not the end of Judea. Only the first act had been played in this strange drama that binds forty centuries. Christ would be the second, Ahasuerus the third. Today another act is played, but it is not the last. Destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt, Jerusalem rises again, symbol of the vitality and pertinacity of an heroic race. The Jews, who are as old as history, may be as lasting as civilization. Chapter 13 Persia 1. The Rise and Fall of the Medes Their Origins, Rulers, The Blood Treaty of Sardis, Degeneration Who were the Medes that had played so vital a role in the destruction of Assyria? Their origin, of course, eludes us. History is a book that one must begin in the middle. The first mention we have of them is on a tablet recording the expedition of Shalmaneser III into a country called Parsua, in the mountains of Kurdistan, 837 B.C. There, it seems, twenty-seven chieftain kings ruled over twenty-seven states thinly populated by a people called Amadai, Madai, Medes. As Indo-Europeans, they had probably come into Western Asia about a thousand years before Christ, from the shores of the Caspian Sea. The Zendavesta, sacred scriptures of the Persians, idealized the racial memory of this ancient homeland and described it as a paradise. The scenes of our youth, like the past, are always beautiful, if we do not have to live in them again. The Medes appear to have wandered through the region of Bokhara and Samarkand, and to have migrated farther and farther south, at last reaching Persia. They found copper, iron, lead, gold, and silver, marble and precious stones in the mountains in which they made their new home. And being a simple and vigorous people, they developed a prosperous agriculture on the plains and the slopes of the hills. At Ekbatana, that is a meeting place of many ways, in a picturesque valley made fertile by the melting snows of the highlands, their first king, Diocese, founded their first capital, adorning and dominating it with a royal palace spread over an area two-thirds of a mile square. According to an uncorroborated passage in Herodotus, Diocese achieved power by acquiring a reputation for justice, and having achieved power became a despot. He issued regulations that no man should be admitted to the king's presence, but every one should consult him by means of messengers, and moreover that it should be accounted indecency for any one to laugh or spit before him. He established such ceremony about his person for this reason, that he might appear to be of a different nature to them who did not see him. Under his leadership the Medes, strengthened by their natural and frugal life, and hardened by custom and environment to the necessities of war, became a threat to the power of Assyria, which repeatedly invaded Media, thought it most instructively defeated, and found it in fact never tired of fighting for its liberty. The greatest of the Median kings, Cyaxares, settled the matter by destroying Nineveh. Inspired by this victory, his army swept through western Asia to the very gates of Sardis, only to be turned back by an eclipse of the sun. The opposing leaders, frightened by this apparent warning from the skies, signed a treaty of peace and sealed it by drinking each other's blood. In the next year Cyaxares died, having in the course of one reign expanded his kingdom from a subject province into an empire embracing Assyria, Media, and Persia. Within a generation after his death, this empire came to an end. Its tenure was too brief to permit of any substantial contribution to civilization, except in so far as it prepared for the culture of Persia. To Persia the Medes gave their Aryan language, their alphabet of thirty-six characters, their replacement of clay with parchment and pen as writing materials, their extensive use of the column in architecture, their moral code of conscientious husbandry in time of peace and limitless bravery in time of war, their Zoroastrian religion of Ahura Mazda and Araman, their patriarchal family and polygamous marriage, and a body of law sufficiently like that of the later empire to be united with it in the famous phrase of Daniel about the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Of their literature and their art not a stone or a letter remains. 
Their degeneration was even more rapid than their rise. Astyages, who succeeded his father Cyaxares, proved again that monarchy is a gamble in whose royal succession great wits and madness are near allied. He inherited the kingdom with equanimity and settled down to enjoy it. Under his example, the nation forgot its stern morals and stoic ways. Wealth had come too suddenly to be wisely used. The upper classes became the slaves of fashion and luxury, the men wore embroidered trousers, the women covered themselves with cosmetics and jewelry, the very horses were often caparisoned in gold. These once simple and pastoral people, who had been glad to be carried in rude wagons with wheels cut roughly out of the trunks of trees, now rode in expensive chariots from feast to feast. The early kings had prided themselves on justice, but Astyages, being displeased with Harpagus, served up to him the dismembered and headless body of his own son and forced him to eat of it. Harpagus ate, saying that whatever a king did was agreeable to him, but he revenged himself by helping Cyrus to depose Astyages. When Cyrus, the brilliant young ruler of the Median dependency of Anshan in Persia, rebelled against the effeminate despot of Ecbatana, the Medes themselves welcomed Cyrus's victory and accepted him almost without protest as their king. By one engagement, Media ceased to be the master of Persia, Persia became the master of Media, and prepared to become the master of the whole Near Eastern world. 2. The Great Kings The Romantic Cyrus, his enlightened policies, Cambyses, Darius the Great, the invasion of Greece. Cyrus was one of those natural rulers at whose coronation, as Emerson said, all men rejoice. Royal in spirit and action, capable of wise administration as well as of dramatic conquest, generous to the defeated and loved by those who had been his enemies, no wonder the Greeks made him the subject of innumerable romances and, to their minds, the greatest hero before Alexander. It is a disappointment to us that we cannot draw a reliable picture of him from either Herodotus or Xenophon. The former has mingled many fables with his history, while the other has made the Cyropedia, an essay on the military art, with incidental lectures on education and philosophy. At times Xenophon confuses Cyrus and Socrates. These delightful stories being put aside, the figure of Cyrus becomes merely an attractive ghost. We can only say that he was handsome, since the Persians made him their model of physical beauty to the end of their ancient art, that he established the Achaemenid dynasty of great kings, which ruled Persia through the most famous period of its history, that he organized the soldiery of Media and Persia into an invincible army, captured Sardis and Babylon, ended for a thousand years the rule of the Semites in western Asia, and absorbed the former realms of Assyria, Babylonia, Lydia, and Asia Minor into the Persian Empire, the largest political organization of pre-Roman antiquity, and one of the best governed in history. So far as we can visualize him through the haze of legend, he was the most amiable of conquerors and founded his empire upon generosity. His enemies knew that he was lenient, and they did not fight him with that desperate courage which men show when their only choice is to kill or die. We have seen how, according to Herodotus, he rescued Croesus from the funeral pyre at Sardis and made him one of his most honored counselors. We have seen how magnanimously he treated the Jews. The first principle of his policy was that the various peoples of his empire should be left free in their religious worship and beliefs, for he fully understood the first principle of statesmanship, that religion is stronger than the state. Instead of sacking cities and wrecking temples, he showed a courteous respect for the deities of the conquered and contributed to maintaining their shrines. Even the Babylonians, who had resisted him so long, warmed towards him when they found him preserving their sanctuaries and honoring their pantheon. Wherever he went in his unprecedented career, he offered pious sacrifice to the local divinities. Like Napoleon, he accepted indifferently all religions and, with much better grace, humored all the gods. Like Napoleon, too, he died of excessive ambition. Having won all the Near East, he began a series of campaigns aimed to free Media and Persia from the inroads of Central Asia's nomadic barbarians. He seems to have carried these excursions as far as the Jaxartes on the north and India on the east. Suddenly, at the height of his curve, he was slain in battle with the Masigitai, an obscure tribe that peopled the southern shores of the Caspian Sea. Like Alexander, he conquered an empire but did not live to organize it. One great defect had sullied his character, occasional and incalculable cruelty. It was inherited, unmixed with Cyrus's generosity, by his half-mad son. 
Cambyses began by putting to death his brother and rival, Smerdis. Then, lured by the accumulated wealth of Egypt, he set forth to extend the Persian Empire to the Nile. He succeeded, but apparently at the cost of his sanity. Memphis was captured easily, but an army of fifty thousand Persians sent to annex the oasis of Ammon perished in the desert, and an expedition to Carthage failed because the Phoenician crews of the Persian fleet refused to attack a Phoenician colony. Cambyses lost his head and abandoned the wise clemency and tolerance of his father. He publicly scoffed at the Egyptian religion and plunged his dagger derisively into the bull revered by the Egyptians as the god Apis. He exhumed mummies and pried into royal tombs regardless of ancient curses. He profaned the temples and ordered their idols to be burned. He thought in this way to cure the Egyptians of superstition, but when he was stricken with illness, apparently epileptic convulsions, the Egyptians were certain that their gods had punished him, and that their theology was now confirmed beyond dispute. As if again to illustrate the inconveniences of monarchy, Cambyses, with a Napoleonic kick in the stomach, killed his sister and wife Roxana, slew his son Prexaspes with an arrow, buried twelve noble Persians alive, condemned Croesus to death, repented, rejoiced to learn that the sentence had not been carried out, and punished the officers who had delayed in executing it. On his way back to Persia he learned that a usurper had seized the throne and was being supported by widespread revolution. From that moment he disappears from history. Tradition has it that he killed himself. The usurper had pretended to be Smerdis, miraculously preserved from Cambyses's fratricidal jealousy. In reality he was a religious fanatic, a devotee of the early Magian faith who was bent upon destroying Zoroastrianism, the official religion of the Persian state. Another revolution soon deposed him, and the seven aristocrats who had organized it raised one of their number, Darius, son of Hystaspes, to the throne. In this bloody way began the reign of Persia's greatest king. Succession to the throne in Oriental monarchies was marked not only by palace revolutions in strife, for the royal power, but by uprisings in subject colonies that grasped the chance of chaos or an inexperienced ruler to reclaim their liberty. The usurpation and assassination of Smerdis gave to Persia's vassals an excellent opportunity. The governors of Egypt and Lydia refused submission, and the provinces of Susiana, Babylonia, Media, Assyria, Armenia, Sasia, and others rose in simultaneous revolt. Darius subdued them with a ruthless hand. Taking Babylon after a long siege, he crucified three thousand of its leading citizens as an inducement to obedience in the rest, and in a series of swift campaigns he pacified one after another of the rebellious states. Then, perceiving how easily the vast empire might in any crisis fall to pieces, he put off the armor of war, became one of the wisest administrators in history, and set himself to reestablish his realm in a way that became a model of imperial organization till the fall of Rome. His rule gave Western Asia a generation of such order and prosperity as that quarrelsome region had never before known. He had hoped to govern in peace, but it is the fatality of empire to breed repeated war. For the conquered must be periodically reconquered, and the conquerors must keep the arts and habits of camp and battlefield. At any moment the kaleidoscope of change may throw up a new empire to challenge the old. In such a situation wars must be invented if they do not arise of their own accord. Each generation must be inured to the rigors of campaigns, and taught by practice the sweet decorum of dying for one's country. Perhaps it was in part for this reason that Darius led his armies into southern Russia, across the Bosporus and the Danube to the Volga, to chastise the marauding Scythians, and again across Afghanistan and a hundred mountain ranges into the valley of the Indus, adding thereby extensive regions and millions of souls and rupees to his realm. More substantial reasons must be sought for his expedition into Greece. Herodotus would have us believe that Darius entered upon this historic faux pas because one of his wives, Atossa, teased him into it in bed. But it is more dignified to believe that the king recognized in the Greek city-states and their colonies a potential empire or an actual confederacy dangerous to the Persian mastery of Western Asia. When Ionia revolted and received aid from Sparta and Athens, Darius reconciled himself reluctantly to war. All the world knows the story of his passage across the Aegean, the defeat of his army at Marathon, and his gloomy return to Persia. There, amid far-flung preparations for another attempt upon Greece, he suddenly grew weak and died. 3. Persian life and industry. The empire, the people, the language, the peasants, the imperial highways, 
trade, and finance. At its greatest extent, under Darius, the Persian Empire included twenty provinces or satrapies, embracing Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Phoenicia, Lydia, Phrygia, Ionia, Cappadocia, Cilicia, Armenia, Assyria, the Caucasus, Babylonia, Media, Persia, the modern Afghanistan and Baluchistan, India west of the Indus, Sogdiana, Bactria, and the regions of the Masagetai and other Central Asiatic tribes. Never before had history recorded so extensive an area brought under one government. Persia itself, which was to rule these forty million souls for two hundred years, was not at that time the country now known to us as Persia and to its inhabitants as Iran. It was that smaller tract immediately east of the Persian Gulf, known to the ancient Persians as Pars and to the modern Persians as Fars or Farsistan. Composed almost entirely of mountains and deserts, poor in rivers, subject to severe winters and hot arid summers, it could support its two million inhabitants only through such external contributions as trade or conquest might bring. Its race of hardy mountaineers came like the Medes of Indo-European stock, perhaps from South Russia, and its language and early religion reveal its close kinship with those Aryans who crossed Afghanistan to become the ruling caste of northern India. Darius I, in an inscription at Naqsh i Rustam, described himself as a Persian, the son of a Persian, an Aryan of Aryan descent. The Zoroastrians spoke of their primitive land as Aryana Vaijo, the Aryan home. Strabo applied the name Aryana to what is now called by essentially the same word, Iran. The Persians were apparently the handsomest people of the ancient Near East. The monuments picture them as erect and vigorous, made hardy by their mountains and yet refined by their wealth, with a pleasing symmetry of features, an almost Greek straightness of nose, and a certain nobility of countenance and carriage. They adopted for the most part the Median dress and later the Median ornaments. They considered it indecent to reveal more than the face. Clothing covered them from turban, fillet or cap to sandals or leather shoes. Triple drawers, a white undergarment of linen, a double tunic with sleeves hiding the hands, and a girdle at the waist kept the population warm in winter and hot in summer. The king distinguished himself with embroidered trousers of a crimson hue and saffron-buttoned shoes. The dress of the women differed from that of the men only in a slit at the breast. The men wore long beards and hung their hair in dark curls, or later covered it with wigs. In the wealthier days of the empire, men as well as women made much use of cosmetics. Creams were employed to improve the complexion, and coloring matter was applied to the eyelids to increase the apparent size and brilliance of the eyes. A special class of adorners, called cosmetai by the Greeks, arose as beauty experts to the aristocracy. The Persians were connoisseurs in scents and were believed by the ancients to have invented cosmetic creams. The king never went to war without a case of costly unguents to ensure his fragrance in victory or defeat. Many languages have been used in the long history of Persia. The speech of the court and the nobility in the days of Darius I was Old Persian, so closely related to Sanskrit that evidently both were once dialects of an older tongue and were cousins to our own. Old Persian developed on the one hand into Zend, the language of the Zendavesta, and on the other hand into Pallavi, a Hindu tongue from which has come the Persian language of today. When the Persians took to writing, they adopted the Babylonian cuneiform for their inscriptions and the Aramaic alphabetic script for their documents. They simplified the unwieldy syllabary of the Babylonians from 300 characters to 36 signs, which gradually became letters instead of syllables and constituted a cuneiform alphabet. Writing, however, seemed to the Persians an effeminate amusement for which they could spare little time from love, war, and the chase. They did not condescend to produce literature. The common man was contentedly illiterate and gave himself completely to the culture of the soil. The Zendavesta exalted agriculture as the basic and noblest occupation of mankind, pleasing above all other labors to Ahura Mazda, the supreme god. Some of the land was tilled by peasant proprietors who occasionally joined several families in agricultural cooperatives to work extensive areas together. Part of the land was owned by feudal barons and cultivated by tenants in return for a share of the crop. Part of it was tilled by foreign, never Persian, slaves. Oxen pulled a plow of wood armed with a metal point. Artificial irrigation drew water from the mountains to the fields. 
Barley and wheat were the staple crops and foods, but much meat was eaten and much wine drunk. Cyrus served wine to his army, and Persian councils never undertook serious discussions of policy when sober, though they took care to revise their decisions the next morning. One intoxicating drink, the haoma, was offered as a pleasant sacrifice to the gods, and was believed to engender in its addicts not excitement and anger, but righteousness and piety. Industry was poorly developed in Persia. She was content to let the nations of the Near East practice the handicrafts while she bought their products with their imperial tribute. She showed more originality in the improvement of communications and transport. Engineers, under the instructions of Darius I, built great roads uniting the various capitals. One of these highways, from Susa to Sardis, was 1,500 miles long. The roads were accurately measured by parasangs, 3.4 miles. And at every fourth parasang, says Herodotus, there are royal stations and excellent inns, and the whole road is through an inhabited and safe country. At each station a fresh relay of horses stood ready to carry on the mail, so that though the ordinary traveler required ninety days to go from Susa to Sardis, the royal mail moved over the distance as quickly as an automobile party does now, that is, in a little less than a week. The larger rivers were crossed by ferries, but the engineers could, when they wished, throw across the Euphrates, even across the Hellespont, substantial bridges over which hundreds of skeptical elephants could pass in safety. Other roads led through the Afghanistan passes to India, and made Susa a halfway house to the already fabulous riches of the East. These roads were built primarily for military and governmental purposes, to facilitate central control and administration. But they served also to stimulate commerce and the exchange of customs, ideas, and the indispensable superstitions of mankind. Along these roads, for example, angels and the devil passed from Persian into Jewish and Christian mythology. Navigation was not so vigorously advanced as land transportation. The Persians had no fleet of their own, but merely engaged or conscripted the vessels of the Phoenicians and the Greeks. Darius built a great canal uniting Persia with the Mediterranean through the Red Sea and the Nile, but the carelessness of his successors soon surrendered this achievement to the shifting sands. When Xerxes royally commanded part of his naval forces to circumnavigate Africa, it turned back in disgrace shortly after passing through the pillars of Hercules. Commerce was for the most part abandoned to foreigners, Babylonians, Phoenicians, and Jews. The Persians despised trade and looked upon a marketplace as a breeding ground of lies. The wealthy classes took pride in supplying most of their wants directly from their own fields and shops, not contaminating their fingers with either buying or selling. Payments, loans, and interest were at first in the form of goods, especially cattle and grain. Coinage came later from Lydia. Darius issued gold and silver derricks, stamped with his features, and valued at a gold-to-silver ratio of 13.5 to 1. This was the origin of the bimetallic ratio in modern currencies. 4. An experiment in government. The king, the nobles, the army, law, a savage punishment, the capitals, the satrapies, an achievement in administration. The life of Persia was political and military rather than economic. Its wealth was based not on industry but on power. It existed precariously as a little governing isle in an immense and unnaturally subject sea. The imperial organization that maintained this artifact was one of the most unique and competent in history. At its head was the king, or kshatra, that is, warrior. The title indicates the military origin and character of the Persian monarchy. Since lesser kings were vassal to him, the Persian ruler entitled himself King of Kings and the ancient world made no protest against his claim. The Greeks called him simply Basilius, the king. His power was theoretically absolute. He could kill with the word without trial or reason given, after the manner of some very modern dictator. And occasionally he delegated to his mother or his chief wife this privilege of capricious slaughter. Few even of the greatest nobles dared offer any criticism or rebuke, and public opinion was cautiously impotent. The father whose innocent son had been shot before his eyes by the king merely complimented the monarch on his excellent archery. Offenders, bastinadoed by the royal order, thanked his majesty for keeping them in mind. The king might rule as well as reign, if, like Cyrus and the first Darius, he cared to bestir himself, but the later monarchs delegated most of the cares of government to noble subordinates or imperial eunuchs, and spent their time at love, dice, or the chase. The court was overrun with eunuchs who, from their coins of vantage as guards of the harem and pedagogues to the princes, 
stewed a poisonous brew of intrigue in every reign. The king had the right to choose his successor from among his sons, but ordinarily the succession was determined by assassination and revolution. The royal power was limited in practice by the strength of the aristocracy that mediated between the people and the throne. It was a matter of custom that the six families of the men who had shared with Darius I the dangers of the revolt against false Smerdis should have exceptional privileges and be consulted in all matters of vital interest. Many of the nobles attended court and served as a council for whose advice the monarch usually showed the highest regard. Most members of the aristocracy were attached to the throne by receiving their estates from the king. In return they provided him with men and materials when he took the field. Within their fiefs they had almost complete authority, levying taxes, enacting laws, executing judgment, and maintaining their own armed forces. The real basis of the royal power and imperial government was the army. An empire exists only so long as it retains its superior capacity to kill. The obligation to enlist on any declaration of war fell upon every able-bodied male from fifteen to fifty years of age. When the father of three sons petitioned Darius to exempt one of them from service, all three were put to death. And when another father, having sent four sons to the battlefield, begged Xerxes to permit the fifth son to stay behind and manage the family estate, the body of this fifth son was cut in two by royal order and placed on both sides of the road by which the army was to pass. The troops marched off to war amid the blare of martial music and the plaudits of citizens above the military age. The spearhead of the army was the royal guard, two thousand horsemen and two thousand infantry, all nobles, whose function it was to guard the king. The standing army consisted exclusively of Persians and Medes, and from this permanent force came most of the garrisons stationed as centers of persuasion at strategic points in the empire. The complete force consisted of levies from every subject nation, each group with its own distinct language, weapons, and habits of war. Its equipment and retinue was as varied as its origin. Bows and arrows, scimitars, javelins, daggers, pikes, slings, knives, shields, helmets, leather cuirasses, coats of mail, horses, elephants, heralds, scribes, eunuchs, prostitutes, concubines, and chariots armed on each hub with great steel scythes. The whole mass, though vast in number and amounting in the expedition of Xerxes to one million eight hundred thousand men, never achieved unity, and at the first sign of a reverse it became a disorderly mob. It conquered by mere force of numbers, by an elastic capacity for absorbing casualties. It was destined to be overthrown as soon as it should encounter a well-organized army speaking one speech and accepting one discipline. This was the secret of Marathon and Plataea. In such a state the only law was the will of the king and the power of the army. No rights were sacred against these, and no precedents could avail except an earlier decree of the king. For it was a proud boast of Persia that its laws never changed, and that a royal promise or decree was irrevocable. In his edicts and judgments the king was supposed to be inspired by the god Ahura Mazda himself. Therefore the law of the realm was the divine will, and any infraction of it was an offense against the deity. The king was the supreme court, but it was his custom to delegate this function to some learned elder in his retinue. Below him was a high court of justice with seven members, and below this were local courts scattered through the realm. The priests formulated the law and for a long time acted as judges. In later days laymen, even lay women, sat in judgment. Bail was accepted in all but the most important cases, and a regular procedure of trial was followed. The court occasionally decreed rewards as well as punishments, and in considering a crime weighed against it the good record and services of the accused. The law's delays were mitigated by fixing a time limit for each case, and by proposing to all disputants an arbitrator of their own choice who might bring them to a peaceable settlement. As the law gathered precedence and complexity, a class of men arose called speakers of the law, who offered to explain it to litigants and help them conduct their cases. Oaths were taken, and use was occasionally made of the ordeal. Bribery was discouraged by making the tender or acceptance of it a capital offense. Cambyses improved the integrity of the courts by causing an unjust judge to be flayed alive and using his skin to upholster the judicial bench, to which he then appointed the dead judge's son. Minor punishments took the form of flogging, from five to two hundred blows with a horsewhip. The poisoning of a shepherd dog received two hundred strokes, manslaughter ninety. The administration of the law was partly financed by commuting stripes into fines at the rate of six rupees to a stripe. 
More serious crimes were punished with branding, maiming, mutilation, blinding, imprisonment, or death. The letter of the law forbade anyone, even the king, to sentence a man to death for a simple crime, but it could be decreed for treason, rape, sodomy, murder, self-pollution, burning or burying the dead, intrusion upon the king's privacy, approaching one of his concubines, accidentally sitting upon his throne, or for any displeasure to the ruling house. Death was procured in such cases by poisoning, impaling, crucifixion, hanging, usually with the head down, stoning, burying the body up to the head, crushing the head between huge stones, smothering the victim in hot ashes, or by the incredibly cruel rite called the boats. Because the soldier Mithridates in his cups blurted out the fact that it was he and not the king who should have received credit for slaying Cyrus the Younger at the Battle of Punaxa, Artaxerxes II, says Plutarch, decreed that Mithridates should be put to death in boats, which execution is after the following manner. Taking two boats framed exactly to fit and answer each other, they lay down in one of them the malefactor that suffers upon his back, then covering it with the other, and so setting them together that the head, hands, and feet of him are left outside, and the rest of his body lies shut up within, they offer him food and if he refuse to eat it, they force him to do it by pricking his eyes. Then, after he has eaten, they drench him with a mixture of milk and honey, pouring it not only into his mouth, but all over his face. They then keep his face continually turned toward the sun, and it becomes completely covered up and hidden by the multitude of flies that settle upon it. And as within the boats he does what those that eat and drink must do, creeping things and vermin spring out of the corruption of the excrement, and these entering into the bowels of him, his body is consumed. When the man is manifestly dead, the uppermost boat being taken off, they find his flesh devoured, and swarms of such noisome creatures preying upon, and, as it were, growing to his innards. In this way Mithridates, after suffering for seventeen days, at last expired. Some of these barbarous punishments were bequeathed to the invading Turks of a later age, and passed down into the heritage of mankind. With these laws and this army, the king sought to govern his twenty satrapies from his many capitals. Originally, Pasargadi, occasionally Persepolis, in summer, Ecbatana, usually Susa. Here in the ancient capital of Elam, the history of the ancient Near East came full circle, binding the beginning and the end. Susa had the advantage of inaccessibility and the disadvantages of distance. Alexander had to come two thousand miles to take it, but it had to send its troops fifteen hundred miles to suppress revolts in Lydia or Egypt. Ultimately, the great roads merely paved the way for the physical conquest of Western Asia by Greece and Rome, and the theological conquest of Greece and Rome by Western Asia. The empire was divided into provinces or satrapies for convenience of administration and taxation. Each province was governed in the name of the king of kings, sometimes by a vassal prince, ordinarily by a satrap, ruler, royally appointed for as long a time as he could retain favor at the court. To keep the satraps in hand, Darius sent to each province a general to control its armed forces independently of the governor, and to make matters trebly sure, he appointed in each province a secretary, independent of both satrap and general, to report their behavior to the king. As a further precaution, an intelligence service known as the king's eyes and ears might appear at any moment to examine the affairs, records, and finances of the province. Sometimes the satrap was deposed without trial, sometimes he was quietly poisoned by his servants at the order of the king. Underneath the satrap and the secretary was a horde of clerks who carried on so much of the government as had no direct need of force. This body of clerks carried over from one administration to another, even from reign to reign. The king dies, but the bureaucracy is immortal. Salaries of these provincial officials were paid not by the king, but by the people whom they ruled. The remuneration was ample enough to provide the satraps with palaces, harems, and extensive hunting parks to which the Persians gave the historic name of Paradise. In addition, each satrapy was required to send the king, annually, a fixed amount of money and goods by way of taxation. India sent 4,680 talents, Assyria and Babylonia 1,000, Egypt 700, the four satrapies of Asia Minor, 1,760, etc., making a total of some 14,560 talents, variously estimated as equivalent to from 160 to 218 million dollars a year. Furthermore, each province was expected to contribute to the king's needs in goods and supplies. Egypt had to furnish corn annually for 120,000 men, 
The Medes provided 100,000 sheep, the Armenians 30,000 foals, the Babylonians 500 young eunuchs. Other sources of wealth swelled the central revenue to such a point that when Alexander captured the Persian capitals after 150 years of Persian extravagance, after a hundred expensive revolts and wars, and after Darius III had carried off 8,000 talents with him in his flight, he found 180,000 talents left in the royal treasuries, some $2,700,000,000. Despite these high charges for its services, the Persian Empire was the most successful experiment in imperial government that the Mediterranean world would know before the coming of Rome, which was destined to inherit much of the earlier empire's political structure and administrative forms. The cruelty and dissipation of the later monarchs, the occasional barbarism of the laws, and the heavy burdens of taxation were balanced, as human governments go, by such order and peace as made the provinces rich despite these levies, and by such liberty as only the most enlightened empires have accorded to subject states. Each region retained its own language, laws, customs, morals, religion, and coinage, and sometimes its native dynasty of kings. Many of the tributary nations, like Babylonia, Phoenicia, and Palestine, were well satisfied with the situation, and suspected that their own generals and tax-gatherers would have plucked them even more ferociously. Under Darius I, the Persian Empire was an achievement in political organization. Only Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonines would equal it. 5. Zarathustra The Coming of the Prophet Persian Religion Before Zarathustra The Bible of Persia Ahura Mazda The Good and the Evil Spirits their struggle for the possession of the world. Persian legend tells how, many hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, a great prophet appeared in Ariana Vaijo, the ancient home of the Aryans. This book is continued on Cassette 11, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 11, Side 1. Persian legend tells how many hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, a great prophet appeared in Aryana Vaijo, the ancient home of the Aryans. His people called him Zarathustra, but the Greeks, who could never bear the orthography of the barbarians patiently, called him Zoroastres. His conception was divine. His guardian angel entered into an haoma plant and passed with its juice into the body of a priest as the latter offered divine sacrifice. At the same time, a ray of heaven's glory entered the bosom of a maid of noble lineage. The priest espoused the maid, the imprisoned angel mingled with the imprisoned ray, and Zarathustra began to be. He laughed aloud on the very day of his birth, and the evil spirits that gather around every life fled from him in tumult and terror. Out of his great love for wisdom and righteousness, he withdrew from the society of men and chose to live in a mountain wilderness on cheese and the fruits of the soil. The devil tempted him, but to no avail. His breast was pierced with a sword, and his entrails were filled with molten lead. He did not complain, but clung to his faith in Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Light, as supreme God. Ahura Mazda appeared to him and gave into his hands the Avesta, or Book of Knowledge and Wisdom, and bade him preach it to mankind. For a long time all the world ridiculed and persecuted him, but at last a high prince of Iran, Vishtaspa, or Histaspes, heard him gladly and promised to spread the new faith among his people. Thus was the Zoroastrian religion born. Zarathustra himself lived to a very old age, was consumed in a flash of lightning, and ascended into heaven. We cannot tell how much of his story is true. Perhaps some Josiah discovered him. The Greeks accepted him as historical and honored him with an antiquity of 5,500 years before their time. Barosus the Babylonian brought him down to 2000 B.C. Modern historians, when they believe in his existence, assign to him any century between the 10th and the 6th before Christ. When he appeared among the ancestors of the Medes and the Persians, he found his people worshipping animals, ancestors, the earth, and the sun, in a religion having many elements and deities in common with the Hindus of the Vedic age. The chief divinities of this pre-Zoroastrian faith were Mithra, god of the sun, and Anaita, goddess of fertility and the earth, and Haoma, the bull god who, dying, rose again and gave mankind his blood as a drink that would confer immortality. 
Him the early Iranians worshipped by drinking the intoxicating juice of the haoma herb found on their mountain slopes. Zarathustra was shocked at these primitive deities and this Dionysian ritual. He rebelled against the magi, or priests, who prayed and sacrificed to them. And with all the bravery of his contemporaries Amos and Isaiah, he announced to the world one god. Here, Ahura Mazda, the Lord of light and heaven, of whom all other gods were but manifestations and qualities. Perhaps Darius I, who accepted the new doctrine, saw in it a faith that would both inspire his people and strengthen his government. From the moment of his accession, he declared war upon the old cults and the Magian priesthood, and made Zoroastrianism the religion of the state. The Bible of the new faith was the collection of books in which the disciples of the Master had gathered his sayings and his prayers. Later followers called these books Avesta. By the error of a modern scholar, they are known to the Occidental world as the Zend Avesta. The contemporary non-Persian reader is terrified to find that the substantial volumes that survive, though much shorter than our Bible, are but a small fraction of the revelation vouchsafed to Zarathustra by his God. What remains is, to the foreign and provincial observer, a confused mass of prayers, songs, legends, prescriptions, ritual and morals, brightened now and then by noble language, fervent devotion, ethical elevation, or lyric piety. Like our Old Testament, it is a highly eclectic composition. The student discovers here and there the gods, the ideas, sometimes the very words and phrases of the Rig Veda, to such an extent that some Indian scholars consider the Avesta to have been inspired not by Ahura Mazda, but by the Vedas. At other times one comes upon passages of ancient Babylonian provenance, such as the creation of the world in six periods, the heavens, the waters, the earth, plants, animals, man, the descent of all men from two first parents, the establishment of an earthly paradise, the discontent of the Creator with His creation and His resolve to destroy all but a remnant of it by a flood. But the specifically Iranian elements suffice abundantly to characterize the whole. The world is conceived in dualistic terms as the stage of a conflict lasting twelve thousand years between the god Ahura Mazda and the devil Ahriman. Purity and honesty are the greatest of the virtues and will lead to everlasting life. The dead must not be buried or burned as by the obscene Greeks or Hindus, but must be thrown to the dogs or to birds of prey. The god of Zarathustra was first of all the whole circle of the heavens themselves. Ahura Mazda clothes himself with the solid vault of the firmament as his raiment. His body is the light and the sovereign glory. The sun and the moon are his eyes. In later days, when the religion passed from prophets to politicians, the great deity was pictured as a gigantic king of imposing majesty. As creator and ruler of the world, he was assisted by a legion of lesser divinities, originally pictured as forms and powers of nature, fire and water, sun and moon, wind and rain. But it was the achievement of Zarathustra that he conceived his God as supreme over all things, in terms as noble as the book of Job. This I ask thee, tell me truly, O Ahura Mazda, who determined the paths of suns and stars? Who is it by whom the moon waxes and wanes? Who from below sustained the earth and the firmament from falling? Who sustained the waters and plants? Who yoked swiftness with the winds and the clouds? Who, Ahura Mazda, called forth the good mind? This good mind meant not any human mind, but a divine wisdom, almost a logos, used by Ahura Mazda as an intermediate agency of creation. Zarathustra had interpreted Ahura Mazda as having seven aspects or qualities, light, good mind, right, dominion, piety, well-being, and immortality. His followers, habituated to polytheism, interpreted these attributes as persons, called by them Ameshaspenta, or immortal holy ones, who, under the leadership of Ahura Mazda, created and managed the world. In this way, the majestic monotheism of the founder became, as in the case of Christianity, the polytheism of the people. In addition to these holy spirits were the guardian angels, of which Persian theology supplied one for every man, woman, and child. But just as these angels and the immortal holy ones helped men to virtue, so according to the pious Persian, influenced presumably by Babylonian demonology, seven divas or evil spirits hovered in the air, always tempting men to crime and sin, and forever engaged in a war upon Ahura Mazda and every form of righteousness. The leader of these devils was Angromagnus, or Araman, prince of darkness and ruler of the netherworld, prototype of that busy Satan whom the Jews appear to have adopted from Persia and bequeathed to Christianity. 
It was Araman, for example, who had created serpents, vermin, locusts, ants, winter, darkness, crime, sin, sodomy, menstruation, and the other plagues of life. And it was these inventions of the devil that had ruined the paradise in which Ahura Mazda had placed the first progenitors of the human race. Zarathustra seems to have regarded these evil spirits as spurious deities, popular and superstitious incarnations of the abstract forces that resist the progress of man. His followers, however, found it easier to think of them as living beings, and personified them in such abundance that in after times the devils of Persian theology were numbered in millions. As this system of belief came from Zarathustra, it bordered upon monotheism. Even with the intrusion of Araman and the evil spirits, it remained as monotheistic as Christianity was to be with its Satan, its devils, and its angels. Indeed, one hears in early Christian theology as many echoes of Persian dualism as of Hebrew Puritanism or Greek philosophy. The Zoroastrian conception of God might have satisfied as particular a spirit as Matthew Arnold. Ahura Mazda was the sum total of all those forces in the world that make for righteousness. And morality lay in cooperation with those forces. Furthermore, there was in this dualism a certain justice to the contradictoriness and perversity of things, which monotheism never provided. And though the Zoroastrian theologians, after the manner of Hindu mystics and scholastic philosophers, sometimes argued that evil was unreal, they offered, in effect, a theology well adapted to dramatize for the average mind the moral issues of life. The last act of the play, they promised, would be, for the just man, a happy ending, after four epics of three thousand years each, in which Ahura Mazda and Araman would alternately predominate, the forces of evil would be finally destroyed. Right would triumph everywhere, and evil would forever cease to be. Then all good men would join Ahura Mazda in paradise, and the wicked would fall into a gulf of outer darkness, where they would feed on poison eternally. 6. Zoroastrian Ethics Man is a battlefield, the undying fire, hell, purgatory, and paradise, the cult of Mithra, the Magi, the Parsis. By picturing the world as the scene of a struggle between good and evil, the Zoroastrians established in the popular imagination a powerful supernatural stimulus and sanction for morals. The soul of man, like the universe, was represented as a battleground of beneficent and maleficent spirits. Every man was a warrior, whether he liked it or not, in the army of either the Lord or the devil. Every act or omission advanced the cause of Ahura Mazda or of Araman. It was an ethic even more admirable than the theology, if men must have supernatural supports for their morality. It gave to the common life a dignity and significance grander than any that could come to it from a world view that looked upon man, in medieval phrase, as a helpless worm, or in modern terms, as a mechanical automaton. Human beings were not, to Zarathustra's thinking, mere pawns in this cosmic war. They had free will, since Ahura Mazda wished them to be personalities in their own right. They might freely choose whether they would follow the light or the lie. For Araman was the living lie, and every liar was his servant. Out of this general conception emerged a detailed but simple code of morals, centered about the golden rule. That nature alone is good, which shall not do unto another whatever is not good unto its own self. Man's duty, says the Avesta, is threefold. To make him who is an enemy a friend, to make him who is wicked righteous, and to make him who is ignorant learned. The greatest virtue is piety, second only to that is honor and honesty in action and speech. Interest was not to be charged to Persians, but loans were to be looked upon as almost sacred. The worst sin of all, in the Avestan as in the Mosaic Code, is unbelief. We may judge from the severe punishments with which it was honored that skepticism existed among the Persians. Death was to be visited upon the apostate without delay. The generosity and kindliness enjoined by the Master did not apply in practice to infidels that is, foreigners. These were inferior species of men, whom Ahura Mazda had deluded into loving their own countries only in order that they should not invade Persia. The Persians, says Herodotus, esteem themselves to be far the most excellent of men in every respect. They believe that other nations approach to excellence according to their geographical proximity to Persia, but that they are the worst who live farthest from them. The words have a contemporary ring and a universal application. Piety being the greatest virtue, the first duty of life was the worship of God with purification, sacrifice, and prayer. Zoroastrian Persia tolerated neither temples nor idols. Altars were erected on hilltops, in palaces, or in the center of the city, and fires were kindled upon them in honor of Ahura Mazda or some lesser divinity. 
Fire itself was worshipped as a god, Attar, the very son of the Lord of Light. Every family centered round the hearth. To keep the home fire burning, never to let it be extinguished, was part of the ritual of faith. And the undying fire of the skies, the sun, was adored as the highest and most characteristic embodiment of Ahura Mazda, or Mithra, quite as Ignaton had worshipped it in Egypt. The morning sun, says the scriptures, must be reverenced till midday, and that of midday must be reverenced till the afternoon, and that of the afternoon must be reverenced till evening. While men reverence not the sun, the good works which they do that day are not their own. To the sun, to fire, to Ahura Mazda, sacrifice was offered of flowers, bread, fruit, perfumes, oxen, sheep, camels, horses, asses, and stags. Anciently, as elsewhere, human victims had been offered too. The gods received only the odor, the edible portions were kept for the priests and the worshippers, for, as the Magi explained, the gods required only the soul of the victim. Though the Master abominated it, and there is no mention of it in the Avesta, the old Aryan offering of the intoxicating Haoma juice to the gods continued far into Zoroastrian days. The priest drank part of the sacred fluid and divided the remainder among the faithful in Holy Communion. When people were too poor to offer such tasty sacrifices, they made up for it by adulatory prayer. Ahura Mazda, like Yahweh, liked to sip his praise, and made for the pious an imposing list of his accomplishments, which became a favorite Persian litany. Given a life of piety and truth, the Persian might face death unafraid. This, after all, is one of the secret purposes of religion. Astabahad, the god of death, finds everyone, no matter where. He is the confident seeker from whom not one of mortal men can escape, not those who go down deep like Afrasiab the Turk, who made himself an iron palace under the earth, a thousand times the height of a man, with a hundred columns. In that palace he made the stars, the moon, and the sun go round, making the light of day. In that palace he did everything at his pleasure, and he lived the happiest life. With all his strength and witchcraft he could not escape from Astavahad nor he who dug this wide round earth with extremities that lie afar, like Dahak, who went from the east to the west searching for immortality and did not find it. With all his strength and power he could not escape from Astavahad. To everyone comes the unseen, deceiving Astavahad, who accepts neither compliments nor bribes, who is no respecter of persons, and ruthlessly makes men perish. And yet, for it is in the nature of religion to threaten and terrify as well as to console, the Persian could not look upon death unafraid unless he had been a faithful warrior in Ahura Mazda's cause. Beyond that most awful of all mysteries lay a hell and a purgatory as well as a paradise. All dead souls would have to pass over a sifting bridge. The good soul would come on the other side to the abode of song, where it would be welcomed by a young maiden radiant and strong, with well-developed bust, and would live in happiness with Ahura Mazda to the end of time. But the wicked soul, failing to get across, would fall into as deep a level of hell as was adjusted to its degree of wickedness. This hell was no mere Hades, to which, as in earlier religions, all the dead descended, whether good or bad. It was an abyss of darkness and terror, in which condemned souls suffered torments to the end of the world. If a man's virtues outweighed his sins, he would endure the cleansing of a temporary punishment. If he had sinned much but had done good works, he would suffer for only twelve thousand years, and then would rise into heaven. Already, the good Zoroastrians tell us, the divine consummation of history approaches. The birth of Zarathustra began the last world epoch of three thousand years. After three prophets of his seed have at intervals carried his doctrine throughout the world, the last judgment will be pronounced, the kingdom of Ahura Mazda will come, and Araman and all the forces of evil will be utterly destroyed. Then all good souls will begin life anew in a world without evil, darkness, or pain. The dead shall rise, life shall return to the bodies, and they shall breathe again. The whole physical world shall become free from old age and death, from corruption and decay, forever and ever. Here again, as in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, we hear the threat of that awful last judgment which seems to have passed from Persian to Jewish eschatology in the days of the Persian ascendancy in Palestine. It was an admirable formula for frightening children into obeying their parents, since one function of religion is to ease the difficult and necessary task of disciplining the young by the old, we must grant to the Zoroastrian priests a fine professional skill in the brewing of theology. All in all, it was a splendid religion, less warlike and bloody, less idolatrous and superstitious than the other religions of its time, and it did not deserve to die so soon. For a while, under Darius I, it became the spiritual expression of a nation at its height. 
But humanity loves poetry more than logic, and without a myth, the people perish. Underneath the official worship of Ahura Mazda, the cult of Mithra and Anaita, god of the sun and goddess of vegetation and fertility, generation and sex, continued to find devotees, and in the days of Artaxerxes II their names began to appear again in the royal inscriptions. Thereafter Mithra grew powerfully in favor, and Ahura Mazda faded away until, in the first centuries of our era, the cult of Mithra as a divine youth of beautiful countenance, with a radiant halo over his head as a symbol of his ancient identity with the sun, spread throughout the Roman Empire, and shared in giving Christmas to Christianity. Christmas was originally a solar festival, celebrating at the winter solstice, about December 22nd, the lengthening of the day and the triumph of the sun over his enemies. It became a Mithraic and finally a Christian holy day. Zarathustra, had he been immortal, would have been scandalized to find statues of Anaita, the Persian Aphrodite, set up in many cities of the empire within a few centuries after his death. And surely it would not have pleased him to find so many pages of his revelation devoted to magic formulas for healing, divination, and sorcery. After his death, the old priesthood of wise men or magi conquered him as priesthoods conquer in the end every vigorous rebel or heretic, by adopting and absorbing him into their theology. They numbered him among the magi and forgot him. By an austere and monogamous life, by a thousand precise observances of sacred ritual and ceremonial cleanliness, by abstention from flesh food, and by a simple and unpretentious dress, the Magi acquired, even among the Greeks, a high reputation for wisdom, and among their own people an almost boundless influence. The Persian kings themselves became their pupils, and took no step of consequence without consulting them. The higher ranks among them were sages, the lower were diviners and sorcerers, readers of stars and interpreters of dreams. The very word magic is taken from their name. Year by year the Zoroastrian elements in Persian religion faded away. They were revived for a time under the Sassanid dynasty, 226-651 to 651 A.D., but were finally eliminated by the Muslim and Tatar invasions of Persia. Zoroastrianism survives today only among small communities in the province of Fars, and among the 90,000 Parsis of India. These devotedly preserve and study the ancient scriptures, worship fire, earth, water, and air as sacred, and expose their dead in towers of silence to birds of prey, lest burning or burial should defile the holy elements. They are a people of excellent morals and character, a living tribute to the civilizing effect of Zarathustra's doctrine upon mankind. 7. Persian Manners and Morals Violence and honor, the code of cleanliness, sins of the flesh, virgins and bachelors, marriage, women, children, Persian ideas of education. Nevertheless, it is surprising how much brutality remained in the Medes and the Persians despite their religion. Darius I, their greatest king, writes in the Behistun inscription, Favartish was seized and brought to me. I cut off his nose and ears, and I cut out his tongue, and I put out his eyes. At my court he was kept in chains. All the people saw him. Later I crucified him in Ekbatana. Ahura Mazda was my strong support. Under the protection of Ahura Mazda, my army utterly smote the rebellious army, and they seized Citron Kankara and brought him to me. Then I cut off his nose and ears and put out his eyes. He was kept in chains at my court. All the people saw him. Afterwards I crucified him. The murders retailed in Plutarch's life of Artaxerxes II offer a sanguinary specimen of the morals of the later courts. Traitors were dealt with without sentiment. They and their leaders were crucified, their followers were sold as slaves, their towns were pillaged, their boys were castrated, the girls were sold into harems. But it would be unfair to judge the people from their kings. Virtue is not news, and virtuous men like happy nations have no history. Even the kings showed on occasion a fine generosity, and were known among the faithless Greeks for their fidelity. A treaty made with them could be relied upon, and it was their boast that they never broke their word. It is a testimony to the character of the Persians that whereas anyone could hire Greeks to fight Greeks, it was rare indeed that a Persian could be hired to fight Persians. Manners were milder than the blood and iron of history would suggest. The Persians were free and open in speech, generous, warm-hearted, and hospitable. Etiquette was almost as punctilious among them as with the Chinese. When equals met, they embraced and kissed each other on the lips. To persons of higher rank, they made a deep obeisance. To those of lower rank, they offered the cheek. To commoners they bowed. 
They thought it unbecoming to eat or drink anything in the street, or publicly to spit or blow the nose. Until the reign of Xerxes, the people were abstemious in food and drink, eating only one meal per day, and drinking nothing but water. Cleanliness was rated as the greatest good after life itself. Good works done with dirty hands were worthless. For while one doth not utterly destroy corruption, germs, there is no coming of the angels to his body. Severe penalties were decreed for those who spread contagious diseases. On festal occasions the people gathered together all clothed in white. The Avestan Code, like the Brahmin and the Mosaic, heaped up ceremonial precautions and ablutions. Great arid tracts of the Zoroastrian scriptures are given over to wearisome formulas for cleansing the body and the soul. Parings of nails, cuttings of hair, and exhalations of the breath were marked out as unclean things, which the wise Persian would avoid unless they had been purified. The code was again Judaically stern against the sins of the flesh. Onanism was to be punished with flogging, and men and women guilty of sexual promiscuity or prostitution ought to be slain even more than gliding serpents, than howling wolves. That practice kept its usual distance from precept appears from an item in Herodotus. To carry off women by violence the Persians think is the act of wicked men, but to trouble oneself about avenging them when so carried off is the act of foolish men, and to pay no regard to them when carried off is the act of wise men, for it is clear that if they had not been willing they could not have been carried off. He adds elsewhere that the Persians have learnt from the Greeks a passion for boys, and though we cannot always trust this supreme reporter, we sent some corroboration of him in the intensity with which the Avesta excoriates sodomy. For that deed, it says again and again, there is no forgiveness, nothing can wash it away. Virgins and bachelors were not encouraged by the code, but polygamy and concubinage were allowed. A military society has use for many children. The man who has a wife, says the Avesta, is far above him who lives in continence. He who keeps a house is far above him who has none. He who has children is far above him who has none. He who has riches is far above him who has none. These are criteria of social standing fairly common among the nations. The family is ranked as the holiest of all institutions. O maker of the material world, Zarathustra asks Ahura Mazda, Thou holy one, which is the second place where the earth feels most happy? And Ahura Mazda answers him, It is the place whereon one of the faithful erects a house with a priest within, with cattle, with a wife, with children, and good herds within. And wherein afterwards the cattle continue to thrive, the wife to thrive, the child to thrive, the fire to thrive, and every blessing of life to thrive. The animal, above all others the dog, was an integral part of the family, as in the last commandment given to Moses. The nearest family was enjoined to take in and care for any homeless pregnant beast. Severe penalties were prescribed for those who fed unfit food to dogs or served them their food too hot, and fourteen hundred stripes were the punishment for smiting a bitch which has been covered by three dogs. The bull was honored for his procreative powers, and prayer and sacrifice were offered to the cow. Matches were arranged by the parents on the arrival of their children at puberty. The range of choice was wide for we hear of the marriage of brother and sister, father and daughter, mother and son. Concubines were for the most part a luxury of the rich. The aristocracy never went to war without them. In the later days of the empire, the king's harem contained from 329 to 360 concubines, for it had become a custom that no woman might share the royal couch twice, unless she was overwhelmingly beautiful. In the time of the prophet, the position of woman in Persia was high, as ancient manners went. She moved in public freely and unveiled, she owned and managed property, and could, like most modern women, direct the affairs of her husband in his name or through his pen. After Darius her status declined, especially among the rich. The poorer women retained their freedom of movement because they had to work, but in other cases the seclusion always enforced in the menstrual periods was extended to the whole social life of woman, and laid the foundations of the Moslem institution of Perda. Upper-class women could not venture out except in curtained litters, and were not permitted to mingle publicly with men. Married women were forbidden to see even their nearest male relatives, such as their fathers or brothers. Women are never mentioned or represented in the public inscriptions and monuments of ancient Persia. Concubines had greater freedom, since they were employed to entertain their master's guests. Even in the later reigns women were powerful at the court, rivaling the eunuchs in the persistence of their plotting and the kings in the refinements of their cruelty. Statyra was a model queen to Artaxerxes II. 
But his mother, Perisidus, poisoned her out of jealousy, encouraged the king to marry his own daughter, Atosa, played dice with him for the life of a eunuch, and winning had him played alive. When Artaxerxes ordered the execution of a Carian soldier, Perisidus bettered his instructions by having the man stretched upon the rack for ten days, his eyes torn out, and molten lead poured into his ears until he died. Children as well as marriage were indispensable to respectability. Sons were highly valued as economic assets to their parents and military assets to the king. Girls were regretted, for they had to be brought up for some other man's home and profit. Men do not pray for daughters, said the Persians, and angels do not reckon them among their gifts to mankind. The king annually sent gifts to every father of many sons, as if an advance payment for their blood. Fornication, even adultery, might be forgiven if there was no abortion. Abortion was a worse crime than the others and was to be punished with death. One of the ancient commentaries, the Bundahish, specifies means for avoiding conception, but warns the people against them. On the nature of generation, it is said in Revelation that a woman, when she cometh out from menstruation during ten days and nights, when they go near unto her, readily becometh pregnant. The child remained under the care of the women till five, and under the care of his father from five to seven. At seven he went to school. Education was mostly confined to the sons of the well-to-do, and was usually administered by priests. Classes met in the temple or the home of the priest. It was a principle never to have a school meet near a marketplace, lest the atmosphere of lying, swearing, and cheating that prevailed in the bazaars should corrupt the young. The texts were the Avesta and its commentaries. The subjects were religion, medicine, or law. The method of learning was by commission to memory and by the rote recitation of long passages. Boys of the unpretentious classes were not spoiled with letters, but were taught only three things, to ride a horse, to use the bow, and to speak the truth. Higher education extended to the age of twenty or twenty-four among the sons of the aristocracy. Some were especially prepared for public office or provincial administration. All were trained in the art of war. The life in these higher schools was arduous. The students rose early, ran great distances, rode difficult horses at high speed, swam, hunted, pursued thieves, sowed farms, planted trees, made long marches under a hot sun or in bitter cold, and learned to bear every change and rigor of climate, to subsist on coarse foods, and to cross rivers while keeping their clothes and armor dry. It was such a schooling as would have gladdened the heart of Friedrich Nietzsche in those moments when he could forget the bright and varied culture of ancient Greece. 8. Science and Art Medicine, Minor Arts, the Tombs of Cyrus and Darius, the Palaces of Persepolis, the Frieze of the Archers, Estimate of Persian Art The Persians seem to have deliberately neglected to train their children in any other art than that of life. Literature was a delicacy for which they had small use. Science was a commodity which they could import from Babylon. They had a certain relish for poetry and romantic fiction, but they left these arts to hirelings and inferiors, preferring the exhilaration of keen-witted conversation to the quiet and solitary pleasures of reading and research. Poetry was sung rather than read and perished with the singers. Medicine was at first a function of the priests, who practiced it on the principle that the devil had created 99,999 diseases, which should be treated by a combination of magic and hygiene. They resorted more frequently to spells than to drugs, on the ground that the spells, though they might not cure the illness, would not kill the patient, which was more than could be said for the drugs. Nevertheless, lay medicine developed along with the growing wealth of Persia, and in the time of Artaxerxes II there was a well-organized guild of physicians and surgeons, whose fees were fixed by law, as in Hammurabi's code, according to the social rank of the patient. Priests were to be treated free, and just as among ourselves the medical novice practices for a year or two, as intern, upon the bodies of the immigrant and the poor, so among the Persians a young physician was expected to begin his career by treating infidels and foreigners. The Lord of Light himself had decreed it. O maker of the material world, thou holy one, if a worshipper of God wish to practice the art of healing, on whom shall he first prove his skill? On the worshippers of Ahura Mazda, or on the worshippers of the Divas, the evil spirits? Ahura Mazda made answer and said, On worshippers of the Divas shall he prove himself rather than on worshippers of God. If he treat with the knife a worshipper of the divas, and he die, if he treat with the knife a second worshipper of the divas, and he die, if he treat with the knife a third worshipper of the divas, and he die, he is unfit for ever and ever. Let him never attend any worshipper of God. If he treat with the knife a worshipper of the divas, and he recover, 
If he treat with the knife a second worshipper of the divas, and he recover, if he treat with the knife a third worshipper of the divas, and he recover, then he is fit for ever and ever. He may at his will treat worshippers of God and heal them with the knife. Having dedicated themselves to empire, the Persians found their time and energies taken up with war, and like the Romans, depended largely upon imports for their art. They had a taste for pretty things, but they relied upon foreign or foreign-born artists to produce them, and upon provincial revenues to pay for them. They had beautiful homes and luxuriant gardens, which sometimes became hunting parks or zoological collections. They had costly furniture, tables plated or inlaid with silver or gold, couches spread with exotic coverlets, floors carpeted with rugs resilient in texture and rich in all the colors of earth and sky. They drank from golden goblets and adorned their tables or their shelves with vases turned by foreign hands. They liked song and dance, and the playing of the harp, the flute, the drum, and the tambourine. Jewelry abounded, from tiaras and earrings to golden anklets and shoes. Even the men flaunted jewels on necks and ears and arms. Pearls, rubies, emeralds, and lapis lazuli came from abroad, but turquoise came from the Persian mines and contributed the customary material for the aristocrat's signet ring. Gems of monstrous and grotesque form copied the supposed features of favorite devils. The king sat on a golden throne covered with golden canopies upheld with pillars of gold. Only in architecture did the Persians achieve a style of their own. Under Cyrus, Darius I, and Xerxes I, they erected tombs and palaces which archaeology has very incompletely exhumed. And it may be that those prying historians, the pick and the shovel, will in the near future raise our estimate of Persian art. At Pasargadi, Alexander spared for us with characteristic graciousness the tomb of Cyrus I. The caravan road now crosses the bare platform that once bore the palaces of Cyrus and his mad son. Of these nothing survives except a few broken columns here and there, or a door jamb bearing the features of Cyrus in bas-relief. Nearby on the plain is the tomb, showing the wear of twenty-four centuries, a simple stone chapel, quite Greek in restraint and form, rising to some thirty-five feet in height upon a terraced base. Once, surely, it was a loftier monument with some fitting pedestal. Today it seems a little bare and forlorn, having the shape but hardly the substance of beauty. The cracked and ruined stones merely chasten us with the quiet permanence of the inanimate. Far south at Nakshi Rustam, near Persepolis, is the tomb of Darius I, cut like some Hindu chapel into the face of the mountain rock. The entrance is carved to simulate a palace façade, with four slender columns about a modest portal. Above it, as if on a roof, figures representing the subject peoples of Persia support a dais on which the king is shown worshipping Ahura Mazda and the moon. It is conceived and executed with aristocratic refinement and simplicity. The rest of such Persian architecture as has survived the wars, raids, thefts, and weather of two millenniums is composed of palace ruins. At Ecbatana, the early kings built a royal residence of cedar and cypress, plated with metal, which still stood in the days of Polybius, circa 150 B.C., but of which no sign remains. The most imposing relics of ancient Persia, now rising day by day out of the grasping and secretive earth, are the stone steps, platform, and columns at Persepolis, for there each monarch from Darius onward built a palace to defer the oblivion of his name. The great external stairs that mounted from the plain to the elevation on which the buildings rested were unlike anything else in architectural records, derived presumably from the flights of steps that approached and encircled the Mesopotamian ziggurats. They had nevertheless a character specifically their own, so gradual in ascent and so spacious that ten horsemen could mount them abreast. They must have formed a brilliant approach to the vast platform, twenty to fifty feet high, fifteen hundred feet long, and one thousand feet wide, that bore the royal palaces. Underneath the platform ran a complicated system of drainage tunnels, six feet in diameter, often drilled through the solid rock. Where the two flights of steps, coming from either side, met at their summit, stood a gateway or propylaeum, flanked by winged and human-headed bulls in the worst Assyrian style. At the right stood the masterpiece of Persian architecture, the Chehil Minar, or Great Hall of Xerxes I, covering with its roomy antechambers an area of more than a hundred thousand square feet, vaster, if size mattered, than vast Karnak or any European cathedral except Milan's. Another flight of steps led to this great hall. These stairs were flanked with ornamental parapets, and their supporting sides were carved with the finest bas-reliefs yet discovered in Persia. Thirteen of the once seventy-two columns of Xerxes' palace stand among the ruins, like palm trees in some desolate oasis. And these marble columns, though mutilated, are among the nearly perfect works of man. 
They are slenderer than any columns of Egypt or Greece, and rise to the unusual height of sixty-four feet. Their shafts are fluted with forty-eight small grooves. Their bases resemble bells overlaid with inverted leaves. Their capitals, for the most part, take the form of floral, almost ionic volutes, surmounted by the forequarters of two bulls or unicorns, upon whose necks, joined back to back, rested the crossbeam or architrave. This was surely of wood, for such fragile columns so wide apart could hardly have supported a stone entablature. The door jams and window frames were of ornamented black stone that shone like ebony. The walls were of brick, but they were covered with enameled tiles painted in brilliant panels of animals and flowers. The columns, pilasters, and steps were of fine white limestone or hard blue marble. Behind or east of this Jehil Minar rose the hall of a hundred columns. Nothing remains of it but one pillar and the outlines of the general plan. Possibly these palaces were the most beautiful ever erected in the ancient or modern world. At Susa, the Artaxerxes I and II built palaces of which only the foundations survive. They were constructed of brick, redeemed by the finest glazed tiles known. From Susa comes the famous frieze of the archers, probably the faithful immortals who guarded the king. The stately bowmen seemed dressed rather for court ceremony than for war. Their tunics resound with bright colors, their hair and beards are wondrously curled, their hands bear proudly and stiffly their official staffs. In Susa, as in the other capitals, painting and sculpture were dependent arts, serving architecture, and the statuary was mostly the work of artists imported from Assyria, Babylonia, and Greece. One might say of Persian art, as perhaps of nearly every art, that all the elements of it were borrowed. The tomb of Cyrus took its form from Lydia. The slender stone columns improved upon the like pillars of Assyria. The colonnades and bas-reliefs acknowledged their inspiration from Egypt. The animal capitals were an infection from Nineveh and Babylon. It was the ensemble that made Persian architecture individual and different, an aristocratic taste that refined the overwhelming columns of Egypt and the heavy masses of Mesopotamia into the brilliance and elegance, the proportion and harmony of Persepolis. The Greeks would hear with wonder and admiration of these halls and palaces. Their busy travelers and observant diplomats would bring them stimulating word of the art and luxury of Persia. Soon they would transform the double volutes and stiff-necked animals of these graceful pillars into the smooth lobes of the ionic capital. They would shorten and strengthen the shafts to make them bear any entablature, whether of wood or of stone. Architecturally there was but a step from Persepolis to Athens. All the Near Eastern world, about to die for a thousand years, prepared to lay its heritage at the feet of Greece. 9. Decadence. How a nation may die. Xerxes. A paragraph of murders. Artaxerxes II. Cyrus the Younger. Darius the Little. Causes of decay. Political, military, moral. Alexander conquers Persia and advances upon India. The empire of Darius lasted hardly a century. The moral as well as the physical backbone of Persia was broken by Marathon, Salamis, and Plataea. The emperors exchanged Mars for Venus, and the nation descended into corruption and apathy. The decline of Persia anticipated almost in detail the decline of Rome. Immorality and degeneration among the people accompanied violence and negligence on the throne. The Persians, like the Medes before them, passed from Stoicism to Epicureanism in a few generations. Eating became the principal occupation of the aristocracy. These men, who had once made it a rule to eat but once a day, now interpreted the rule to allow them one meal, prolonged from noon to night. They stocked their larders with a thousand delicacies, and often served entire animals to their guests. They stuffed themselves with rich, rare meats, and spent their genius upon new sauces and desserts. A corrupt and corrupting multitude of menials filled the houses of the wealthy, while drunkenness became the common vice of every class. Cyrus and Darius created Persia, Xerxes inherited it, his successors destroyed it. Xerxes I was every inch a king, externally. Tall and vigorous, he was by royal consent the handsomest man in his empire. But there was never yet a handsome man who was not vain, nor any physically vain man whom some woman has not led by the nose. Xerxes was divided by many mistresses and became for his people an exemplar of sensuality. His defeat at Salamis was in the nature of things, for he was great only in his love of magnitude, not in his capacity to rise to a crisis or to be, in fact, and need, a king. After twenty years of sexual intrigue and administrative indolence, he was murdered by a courtier, Artabanus, and was buried with regal pomp and general satisfaction. Only the records of Rome after Tiberius could rival in bloodiness the royal annals of Persia. 
The murderer of Xerxes was murdered by Artaxerxes I, who, after a long reign, was succeeded by Xerxes II, who was murdered a few weeks later by his half-brother, Sogdianus, who was murdered six months later by Darius II, who suppressed the revolt of Teratuknes by having him slain, his wife cut into pieces, and his mother, brothers, and sisters buried alive. Darius II was followed by his son Artaxerxes II, who at the Battle of Cunaxa had to fight to the death his own brother, the younger Cyrus, when the youth tried to seize the royal power. Artaxerxes II enjoyed a long reign, killed his son Darius for conspiracy, and died of a broken heart on finding that another son, Ochus, was planning to assassinate him. Ochus ruled for twenty years and was poisoned by his general, Bagoas. This iron-livered Warwick placed Arces, son of Ochus, on the throne, assassinated Arces's brothers to make Arces secure, then assassinated Arces and his infant children, and gave the scepter to Codamanus, a safely effeminate friend. Codamanus reigned for eight years under the name of Darius III, and died in battle against Alexander at Arbela, in the final ruin of his country. Not even the democracies of our time have known such indiscriminate leadership. It is in the nature of an empire to disintegrate soon, for the energy that created it disappears from those who inherit it, at the very time that its subject peoples are gathering strength to fight for their lost liberty. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 11, Side 2. It is in the nature of an empire to disintegrate soon, for the energy that created it disappears from those who inherit it, at the very time that its subject peoples are gathering strength to fight for their lost liberty. Nor is it natural that nations diverse in language, religion, morals, and traditions should long remain united. There is nothing organic in such a union, and compulsion must repeatedly be applied to maintain the artificial bond. In its two hundred years of empire, Persia did nothing to lessen this heterogeneity, these centrifugal forces. She was content to rule a mob of nations, and never thought of making them into a state. Year by year the union became more difficult to preserve. As the vigor of the emperors relaxed, the boldness and ambition of the satraps grew. They purchased or intimidated the generals and secretaries who were supposed to share and limit their power. They arbitrarily enlarged their armies and revenues, and engaged in recurrent plots against the king. The frequency of revolt and war exhausted the vitality of little Persia. The braver stocks were slaughtered in battle after battle, until none but the cautious survived, and when these were conscripted to face Alexander they proved to be cowards almost to a man. No improvements had been made in the training or equipment of the troops or in the tactics of the generals. These blundered childishly against Alexander, while their disorderly ranks, armed mostly with darts, proved to be mere targets for the long spears and solid phalanxes of the Macedonians. Alexander frolicked, but only after the battle was won. The Persian leaders brought their concubines with them and had no ambition for war. The only real soldiers in the Persian army were the Greeks. From the day when Xerxes turned back defeated from Salamis, it became evident that Greece would one day challenge the empire. Persia controlled one end of the great trade route that bound Western Asia with the Mediterranean, Greece controlled the other, and the ancient acquisitiveness and ambition of men made such a situation provocative of war. As soon as Greece found a master who could give her unity, she would attack. Alexander crossed the Hellespont without opposition, having what seemed to Asia a negligible force of thirty thousand footmen and five thousand cavalry. A Persian army of forty thousand troops tried to stop him at Granicus. The Greeks lost one hundred fifteen men, the Persians twenty thousand. Alexander marched south and east, taking cities and receiving surrenders for a year. Meanwhile, Darius III gathered a horde of six hundred thousand soldiers and adventurers. Five days were required to march them over a bridge of boats across the Euphrates. Six hundred mules and three hundred camels were needed to carry the royal purse. When the two armies met at Issus, Alexander had no more than thirty thousand followers. But Darius, with all the stupidity that destiny could require, had chosen a field in which only a small part of his multitude could fight at one time. When the slaughter was over, the Macedonians had lost some 450, the Persians 110,000 men, most of these being slain in wild retreat. 
Alexander, in reckless pursuit, crossed a stream on a bridge of Persian corpses. Darius fled ignominiously, abandoning his mother, a wife, two daughters, his chariot, and his luxuriously appointed tent. Alexander treated the Persian ladies with a chivalry that surprised the Greek historians, contenting himself with marrying one of the daughters. If we may believe Quintus Curtius, the mother of Darius became so fond of Alexander that after his death she put an end to her own life by voluntary starvation. The young conqueror turned aside now with what seemed foolhardy leisureliness to establish his control over all of Western Asia. He did not wish to advance farther without organizing his conquests and building a secure line of communications. The citizens of Babylon, like those of Jerusalem, came out en masse to welcome him, offering him their city and their gold. He accepted these graciously and pleased them by restoring the temples which the unwise Xerxes had destroyed. Darius sent him a proposal of peace, saying that he would give Alexander ten thousand talents for the safe return of his mother, his wife, and his children, would offer him his daughter in marriage, and would acknowledge his sovereignty over all Asia west of the Euphrates, if only Alexander would end the war and become his friend. Parmenio, second in command among the Greeks, said that if he were Alexander he would be glad to accept such happy terms and avoid with honor the hazard of some disastrous defeat. Alexander remarked that he would do likewise, if he were Parmenio. Being Alexander, he answered Darius that his offer meant nothing, since he, Alexander, already possessed such parts of Asia as Darius proposed to cede to him, and could marry the daughter of the emperor when he pleased. Darius, despairing of peace with so reckless a logician, turned unwillingly to the task of collecting another and larger force. Meanwhile, Alexander had taken Tyre and annexed Egypt. Now he marched back across the great empire, straight to its distant capitals. In twenty days from Babylon his army reached Susa, and took it without resistance. Thence it advanced so quickly to Persepolis that the guards of the royal treasury had no time to secrete its funds. There Alexander committed one of the most unworthy acts of his incredible career. Against the council of Parmenio, and, we are told, to please the courtesan Thais, he burned the palaces of Persepolis to the ground and permitted his troops to loot the city. Then, having raised the spirits of his army with booty and gifts, he turned north to meet Darius for the last time. Darius had gathered, chiefly from his eastern provinces, a new army of a million men, Persians, Medes, Babylonians, Syrians, Armenians, Cappadocians, Bactrians, Sogdians, Arachosians, Sasai, and Hindus, and had equipped them no longer with bows and arrows, but with javelins, spears, shields, horses, elephants, and scythe-wielding chariots intended to mow down the enemy like wheat. With this vast force, old Asia would make one more effort to preserve itself from adolescent Europe. Alexander, with 7,000 cavalry and 40,000 infantry, met the motley mob at Gorgamila, and by superior weapons, generalship, and courage destroyed it in a day. Darius again chose the better part of valor, but his generals, disgusted with this second flight, murdered him in his tent. Alexander put to death such of the assassins as he could find, sent the body of Darius in state to Persepolis, and ordered it to be buried in the manner of the Achaemenid kings. The Persian people flocked readily to the standard of the conqueror, charmed by his generosity and his youth. Alexander organized Persia into a province of the Macedonian Empire, left a strong garrison to guard it, and marched on to India. Book 2 India and Her Neighbors the highest truth is this. God is present in all beings. They are His multiple forms. There is no other God to seek. It is a man-making religion that we want. Give up these weakening mysticisms and be strong. For the next fifty years let all other gods disappear from our minds. This is the only God that is awake, our own race, everywhere His hands, everywhere His feet, everywhere His ears. He covers everything." The first of all worships is the worship of those all around us. He alone serves God who serves all other beings. Vivekananda Chapter 14 The Foundations of India 1. Scene of the Drama The Rediscovery of India A Glance at the Map Climatic Influences Nothing should more deeply shame the modern student than the recency and inadequacy of his acquaintance with India. 
Here is a vast peninsula of nearly two million square miles, two-thirds as large as the United States and twenty times the size of its master Great Britain. Three hundred twenty million souls, more than in all North and South America combined, or one-fifth of the population of the earth. An impressive continuity of development and civilization, from Mohenjo-Daro, 2900 B.C., or earlier to Gandhi, Raman, and Tagore. Faiths compassing every stage, from barbarous idolatry to the most subtle and spiritual pantheism. Philosophers playing a thousand variations on one monistic theme, from the Upanishads eight centuries before Christ to Shankara eight centuries after him. Scientists developing astronomy three thousand years ago and winning Nobel Prizes in our own time. A democratic constitution of untraceable antiquity in the villages, and wise and beneficent rulers like Ashoka and Akbar in the capitals. Minstrels singing great epics almost as old as Homer, and poets holding world audiences today. Artists raising gigantic temples for Hindu gods from Tibet to Ceylon and from Cambodia to Java or carving perfect palaces by the score for mogul kings and queens. This is the India that patient scholarship is now opening up, like a new intellectual continent, to that Western mind which only yesterday thought civilization an exclusively European thing. The scene of the history is a great triangle, narrowing down from the everlasting snows of the Himalayas to the eternal heat of Ceylon. In a corner at the left lies Persia, close akin to Vedic India in people, language, and gods. Following the northern frontier eastward, we strike Afghanistan. Here is Kandahar, the ancient Gandhara, where Greek and Hindu sculpture fused for a while and then parted never to meet again. And north of it is Kabul, from which the Moslems and the Mughals made those bloody raids that gave them India for a thousand years. Within the Indian frontier, a short day's ride from Kabul, is Peshawar, where the old northern habit of invading the south still persists. Note how near to India Russia comes at the Pamirs and the passes of the Hindu Kush. Hereby will hang much politics. Directly at the northern tip of India is the province of Kashmir, whose very name recalls the ancient glory of India's textile crafts. South of it is the Punjab, that is, the land of the five rivers, with the great city of Lahore and Shimla, summer capital at the foot of the Himalayas, home of the snow. Through the western Punjab runs the mighty river Indus, a thousand miles in length. Its name came from the native word for river, Sindhu, which the Persians, changing it to Hindu, applied to all northern India in their word Hindustan, that is, land of the rivers. Out of this Persian term Hindu, the invading Greeks made for us the word India. From the Punjab, the Jumna and the Ganges flow leisurely to the southeast. The Jumna waters the new capital at Delhi and mirrors the Taj Mahal at Agra. The Ganges broadens down to the holy city, Benares, washes ten million devotees daily and fertilizes with its dozen mouths the province of Bengal and the old British capital at Calcutta. Still farther east is Burma with the golden pagodas of Rangoon and the sunlit road to Mandalay. From Mandalay back across India to the western airport at Karachi is almost as long a flight as from New York to Los Angeles. South of the Indus, on such a flight, one would pass over Rajputana, land of the heroic Rajputs, with its famed cities of Gwalior and Chittor, Jaipur, Ajmer and Udaipur. South and west is the presidency or province of Bombay, with teeming cities at Surat, Ahmedabad, Bombay and Pune. East and south lie the progressive native-ruled states of Hyderabad and Mysore, with picturesque capitals of the same names. On the west coast is Goa, on the eastern coast is Pondicherry, where the conquering British have left to the Portuguese and the French, respectively, a few square miles of territorial consolation. Along the Bay of Bengal, the Madras presidency runs, with the well-governed city of Madras as its center, and the sublime and gloomy temples of Tanjore, Trichinopoly, Madura, and Rameshwaram, adorning its southern boundaries. And then Adam's Bridge, a reef of sunken islands, beckons us across the strait to Ceylon, where civilization flourished sixteen hundred years ago. All these are a little part of India. We must conceive it then not as a nation like Egypt, Babylonia, or England, but as a continent as populous and polyglot as Europe, and almost as varied in climate and race, in literature, philosophy, and art. 
The north is harassed by cold blasts from the Himalayas and by the fogs that form when these blasts meet the southern sun. In the Punjab, the rivers have created great alluvial plains of unsurpassed fertility. But south of the river valleys, the sun rules as an unchecked despot. The plains are dry and bare and require for their fruitful tillage no mere husbandry, but an almost stupefying slavery. Englishmen do not stay in India more than five years at a time, and if a hundred thousand of them rule three thousand times their number of Hindus, it is because they have not stayed there long enough. Here and there, constituting one-fifth of the land, the primitive jungle remains, a breeding place of tigers, leopards, wolves, and snakes. In the southern third, or Deccan, the heat is drier, or is tempered with breezes from the sea. But from Delhi to Ceylon, the dominating fact in India is heat. Heat that has weakened the physique, shortened the youth, and affected the quietest religion and philosophy of the inhabitants. The only relief from this heat is to sit still, to do nothing, to desire nothing. Or in the summer months, the monsoon wind may bring cooling moisture and fertilizing rain from the sea. When the monsoon fails to blow, India starves and dreams of nirvana. 2. The Oldest Civilization Prehistoric India, Mohenjo-Daro, Its Antiquity In the days when historians supposed that history had begun with Greece, Europe gladly believed that India had been a hotbed of barbarism until the Aryan cousins of the European peoples had migrated from the shores of the Caspian to bring the arts and sciences to a savage and benighted peninsula. Recent researches have marred this comforting picture, as future researches will change the perspective of these pages. In India, as elsewhere, the beginnings of civilization are buried in the earth, and not all the spades of archaeology will ever quite exhume them. Remains of an old stone age fill many cases in the museums of Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay, and Neolithic objects have been found in nearly every state. These, however, were cultures, not yet a civilization. In 1924, the world of scholarship was again aroused by news from India. Sir John Marshall announced that his Indian aides, R.D. Banerjee in particular, had discovered at Mohenjo-Daro, on the western bank of the lower Indus, remains of what seemed to be an older civilization than any yet known to historians. There and at Harappa, a few hundred miles to the north, four or five superimposed cities were excavated, with hundreds of solidly built brick houses and shops, ranged along wide streets as well as narrow lanes, and rising in many cases to several stories. Let Sir John estimate the age of these remains. These discoveries established the existence in Sindh, the northernmost province of the Bombay Presidency, and the Punjab, during the 4th and 3rd millennium B.C., of a highly developed city life, and the presence in many of the houses of wells and bathrooms, as well as an elaborate drainage system, betoken a social condition of the citizens at least equal to that found in Sumer, and superior to that prevailing in contemporary Babylonia and Egypt. Even at Ur, the houses are by no means equal in point of construction to those of Mohenjo-Daro. Among the finds at these sites were household utensils and toilet outfits, pottery painted and plain, hand-turned and turned on the wheel, terracottas, dice and chessmen, coins older than any previously known, over a thousand seals, most of them engraved and inscribed in an unknown pictographic script, faience work of excellent quality, stone carving superior to that of the Sumerians, copper weapons and implements, and a copper model of a two-wheeled cart, one of our oldest examples of a wheeled vehicle. Gold and silver bangles, ear ornaments, necklaces, and other jewelry, so well finished and so highly polished, says Marshall, that they might have come out of a Bond Street jewelers of today rather than from a prehistoric house of five thousand years ago. Strange to say, the lowest strata of these remains showed a more developed art than the upper layers, as if even the most ancient deposits were from a civilization already hundreds, perhaps thousands of years old. Some of the implements were of stone, some of copper, some of bronze, suggesting that this Indus culture had arisen in a Chalcolithic age, that is, in a transition from stone to bronze as the material of tools. The indications are that Mohenjo-Daro was at its height when Cheops built the first great pyramid, that it had commercial, religious, and artistic connections with Sumeria and Babylonia, and that it survived over three thousand years until the third century before Christ. We cannot tell yet whether, as Marshall believes, Mohenjo-Daro represents the oldest of all civilizations known. But the exhuming of prehistoric India has just begun. 
only in our time has archaeology turned from Egypt across Mesopotamia to India. When the soil of India has been turned up like that of Egypt, we shall probably find there a civilization older than that which flowered out of the mud of the Nile. 3. The Indo-Aryans The natives, the invaders, the village community, caste, warriors, priests, merchants, workers, outcasts, Despite the continuity of the remains in Sindh and Mysore, we feel that between the heyday of Mahenjo-daro and the advent of the Aryans, a great gap stands in our knowledge, or rather, that our knowledge of the past is an occasional gap in our ignorance. Among the Indus relics is a peculiar seal, composed of two serpent heads, which was the characteristic symbol of the oldest historic people of India, those serpent-worshipping Nagas, whom the invading Aryans found in possession of the northern provinces and whose descendants still linger in the remoter hills. Farther south, the land was occupied by a dark-skinned, broad-nosed people whom, without knowing the origin of the word, we called Dravidians. They were already a civilized people when the Aryans broke down upon them. Their adventurous merchants sailed the sea even to Sumeria and Babylon, and their cities knew many refinements and luxuries. It was from them, apparently, that the Aryans took their village community and their systems of land tenure and taxation. To this day, the Deccan is still essentially Dravidian in stock and customs, in language, literature, and arts. The invasion and conquest of these flourishing tribes by the Aryans was part of that ancient process whereby, periodically, the north has swept down violently upon the settled and pacified south. This has been one of the main streams of history on which civilizations have risen and fallen like epical undulations. The Aryans poured down upon the Dravidians, the Achaeans and Dorians upon the Cretans and Aegeans, the Germans upon the Romans, the Lombards upon the Italians, the English upon the world. Forever the North produces rulers and warriors, the South produces artists and saints, and the meek inherit heaven. Who were these marauding Aryans? They themselves used the term as meaning noblemen, Sanskrit Arya, noble. But perhaps this patriotic derivation is one of those afterthoughts which cast scandalous gleams of humor into philology. Very probably they came from that Caspian region which their Persian cousins called Aryanavijo, the Aryan home. About the same time that the Aryan Kassites overran Babylonia, the Vedic Aryans began to enter India. Like the Germans invading Italy, these Aryans were rather immigrants than conquerors, but they brought with them strong physiques, a hearty appetite in both solids and liquids, a ready brutality, a skill and courage in war which soon gave them the mastery of northern India. They fought with bows and arrows, led by armored warriors and chariots, who wielded battle axes and hurled spears. They were too primitive to be hypocrites. They subjugated India without pretending to elevate it. They wanted land and pasture for their cattle. Their word for war said nothing about national honor, but simply meant a desire for more cows. Slowly they made their way eastward along the Indus and the Ganges, until all Hindustan was under their control. As they passed from armed warfare to settled tillage, their tribes gradually coalesced into petty states. Each state was ruled by a king, checked by a council of warriors. Each tribe was led by a raja, or chieftain limited in his power by a tribal council. Each tribe was composed of comparatively independent village communities, governed by assemblies of family heads. Have you heard... Ananda, Buddha is represented as asking his St. John, that the Vajians foregather often and frequent public meetings of their clans? So long, Ananda, as the Vajians foregather thus often and frequent the public meetings of their clan, so long may they be expected not to decline, but to prosper. Like all peoples, the Aryans had rules of endogamy and exogamy, forbidden marriage outside the racial group or within near degrees of kinship, from these rules came the most characteristic of Hindu institutions. Outnumbered by a subject people whom they considered inferior to themselves, the Aryans foresaw that without restrictions on intermarriage they would soon lose their racial identity. In a century or two they would be assimilated and absorbed. The first caste division, therefore, was not by status, but by color. The early Hindu word for caste is varna, color. This was translated by the Portuguese invaders as casta, from the Latin castus, pure. It divided long noses from broad noses, Aryans from Nagas and Dravidians. It was merely the marriage regulation of an endogamous group. In its later profusion of heredity, racial and occupational divisions, the caste system hardly existed in Vedic times. 
Among the Aryans themselves, marriage, except of near kin, was free, and status was not defined by birth. As Vedic India, 2000 to 1000 B.C., passed into the Heroic Age, 1000 to 500 B.C., that is, as India changed from the conditions pictured in the Vedas into those described in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, occupations became more specialized and hereditary, and caste divisions were more rigidly defined. At the top were the Kshatriyas, or fighters, who held it a sin to die in bed. Even the religious ceremonials were in the early days performed by chieftains or kings, in the fashion of Caesar playing pontifex. The Brahmins, or priests, were then mere assistants at the sacrifice. In the Ramayana, a Kshatriya protests passionately against mating a proud and peerless bride of warrior stock to a prating priest and Brahmin. The Jain books take for granted the leadership of the Kshatriyas, and the Buddhist literature goes so far as to call the Brahmins low-born. Even in India things change. But as war gradually gave way to peace, and as religion, being then largely an aid to agriculture in the face of the incalculable elements, grew in social importance and ritual complexity, and required expert intermediaries between men and gods, the Brahmins increased in number, wealth, and power. As educators of the young and oral transmitters of the race's history, literature, and laws, they were able to recreate the past and form the future in their own image, molding each generation into greater reverence for the priests and building for their caste a prestige which would, in later centuries, give them the supreme place in Hindu society. Already in Buddha's days they had begun to challenge the supremacy of the Kshatriyas. They pronounced these warriors inferior, even as the Kshatriyas pronounced the priests inferior. And Buddha felt that there was much to be said for both points of view. Even in Buddha's time, however, the Kshatriyas had not conceded intellectual leadership to the Brahmins, and the Buddhist movement itself, founded by a Kshatriya noble, contested the religious hegemony of India with the Brahmins for a thousand years. Below these ruling minorities were the Vaisyas, merchants and freemen, hardly distinct as a caste before Buddha, the Shudras, or working men, who comprised most of the native population, and finally the outcasts, or pariahs, unconverted native tribes like the Chandalas, war captives and men reduced to slavery as a punishment. Out of this originally small group of casteless men grew the forty million untouchables of India today. 4. Indo-Aryan Society Herders, tillers of the soil, craftsmen, traders, coinage and credit, morals, marriage, woman. How did these Aryan Indians live? At first by war and spoliation, then by herding, tillage, and industry, in a rural routine not unlike that of medieval Europe. For until the Industrial Revolution in which we live, the basic economic and political life of man had remained essentially the same since Neolithic days. The Indo-Aryans raised cattle, used the cow without considering it sacred, and ate meat when they could afford it, having offered a morsel to priests or gods. Buddha, after nearly starving himself in his ascetic youth, seems to have died from a hearty meal of pork. They planted barley, but apparently knew nothing of rice in Vedic times. The fields were divided by each village community among its constituent families, but were irrigated in common. The land could not be sold to an outsider and could be bequeathed only to the family heirs in direct male line. The majority of the people were yeomen owning their own soil. The Aryans held it a disgrace to work for hire. There were, we are assured, no landlords and no paupers, no millionaires and no slums. In the towns, handicrafts flourished among independent artisans and apprentices, organized half a thousand years before Christ into powerful guilds of metal workers, woodworkers, stone workers, leather workers, ivory workers, basket makers, house painters, decorators, potters, dyers, fishermen, sailors, hunters, trappers, butchers, confectioners, barbers, shampooers, florists, cooks. The very list reveals the fullness and variety of Indo-Aryan life. The guilds settled intra-guild affairs, even arbitrating difficulties between members and their wives. Prices were determined, as among ourselves, not by supply and demand, but by the gullibility of the purchaser. In the palace of the king, however, was an official valuer who, like our secretive Bureau of Standards, tested goods to be bought and dictated terms to the makers. Trade and travel had advanced to the stage of horse and two-wheeled wagon, but were still medievally difficult. Caravans were held up by taxes at every petty frontier, and as like as not by highwaymen at any turn. Transport by river and sea was more developed. 
About 860 B.C., ships with modest sails and hundreds of oars carried to Mesopotamia, Arabia, and Egypt such typical Indian products as perfumes and spices, cotton and silk, shawls and muslins, pearls and rubies, ebony and precious stones, and ornate brocades of silver and gold. Trade was stunted by clumsy methods of exchange, at first by barter, then by the use of cattle as currency. Brides like Homer's oxen-bearing maidens were bought with cows. Later, a heavy copper coinage was issued, guaranteed, however, only by private individuals. There were no banks. Hoarded money was hidden in the house or buried in the ground or deposited with a friend. Out of this, in Buddha's age, grew a credit system. Merchants in different towns facilitated trade by giving one another letters of credit. Loans could be obtained from such Rothschilds at 18%, and there was much talk of promissory notes. The coinage was not sufficiently inconvenient to discourage gambling. Already dice were essential to civilization. In many cases, gambling halls were provided for his subjects by the king, in the fashion, if not quite in the style, of Monaco, and a portion of the receipts went to the royal treasury. It seems a scandalous arrangement to us who are not quite accustomed to having our gambling institutions contribute so directly to the support of our public officials. Commercial morality stood on a high level. The kings of Vedic India, as of Homeric Greece, were not above lifting cattle from their neighbors. But the Greek historian of Alexander's campaigns describes the Hindus as remarkable for integrity, so reasonable as seldom to have recourse to lawsuits, and so honest as to require neither locks to their doors nor writings to bind their agreements. They are in the highest degree truthful. The Rig Veda speaks of incest, seduction, prostitution, abortion, and adultery, and there are some signs of homosexuality. But the general picture that we derive from the Vedas and the epics is one of high standards in the relations of the sexes and the life of the family. Marriage might be entered into by forcible abduction of the bride, by purchase of her, or by mutual consent. Marriage by consent, however, was considered slightly disreputable. Women thought it more honorable to be bought and paid for, and a great compliment to be stolen. Polygamy was permitted and was encouraged among the great. It was an act of merit to support several wives and to transmit ability. The story of Draupadi, who married five brothers at once, indicates the occasional occurrence in epic days of that strange polyandry, the marriage of one woman to several men, usually brothers, which survived in Ceylon till 1859, and still lingers in the mountain villages of Tibet. But polygamy was usually the privilege of the male, who ruled the Aryan household with patriarchal omnipotence. He held the right of ownership over his wives and his children, and might in certain cases sell them or cast them out. Nevertheless, woman enjoyed far greater freedom in the Vedic period than in later India. She had more to say in the choice of her mate than the forms of marriage might suggest. She appeared freely at feasts and dances, and joined with men in religious sacrifice. She could study and might, like Gargi, engage in philosophic disputation. If she was left a widow, there were no restrictions upon her remarriage. In the heroic age, woman seems to have lost something of this liberty. She was discouraged from mental pursuits, on the ground that for a woman to study the Vedas indicates confusion in the realm. The remarriage of widows became uncommon. Purda, the seclusion of women, began, and the practice of sati, almost unknown in Vedic times, increased. The ideal woman was now typified in the heroine of the Ramayana, that faithful Sita who follows and obeys her husband humbly through every test of fidelity and courage until her death. 5. The Religion of the Vedas Pre-Vedic religion, Vedic gods, moral gods, the Vedic story of creation, immortality, the horse sacrifice. The oldest known religion of India, which the invading Aryans found among the Nagas and which still survives in the ethnic nooks and crannies of the Great Peninsula, was apparently an animistic and totemic worship of multitudinous spirits dwelling in stones and animals, in trees and streams, in mountains and stars. Snakes and serpents were divinities, idols and ideals of virile reproductive power and the sacred Bodhi tree of Buddha's time was a vestige of the mystic but wholesome reverence for the quiet majesty of trees. Naga, the dragon god, Hanuman, the monkey god, Nandi, the divine bull, and the yakshas, or tree gods, passed down into the religion of historic India. Since some of these spirits were good and some evil, only great skill and magic could keep the body from being possessed or tortured, in sickness or mania, by one or more of the innumerable demons that filled the air. Hence the medley of incantations in the Atarva Veda, or Book of the Knowledge of Magic. 
One must recite spells to obtain children, to avoid abortion, to prolong life, to ward off evil, to woo sleep, to destroy or harass enemies. The earliest gods of the Vedas were the forces and elements of nature herself, sky, sun, earth, fire, light, wind, water, and sex. Jaus, the Greek Zeus, the Roman Jupiter, was at first the sky itself, and the Sanskrit word deva, which later was to mean divine, originally meant only bright. By that poetic license which makes so many deities, these natural objects were personified. The sky, for example, became a father, Varuna. The earth became a mother, Prithiwi. And vegetation was the fruit of their union through the rain. The rain was the god Parjanya, fire was Agni, the wind was Vayu, the pestilential wind was Rudra, the storm was Indra, the dawn was Ushas, the furrow in the field was Sita, the sun was Surya, Mitra, or Vishnu, and the sacred Soma plant, whose juice was at once holy and intoxicating to gods and men, was itself a god, a Hindu Dionysus, inspiring man by its exhilarating essence to charity, insight, and joy, and even bestowing upon him eternal life. A nation, like an individual, begins with poetry and ends with prose, and as things became persons, so qualities became objects, adjectives became nouns, epithets became deities. The life-giving sun became a new sun-god, Savitar the life-giver. The shining sun became Vivasvat, shining god. The life-generating sun became the great god Prajapati, lord of all living things. For a time the most important of the Vedic gods was Agni, fire. He was the sacred flame that lifted the sacrifice to heaven. He was the lightning that pranced through the sky. He was the fiery life and spirit of the world. But the most popular figure in the pantheon was Indra, wielder of thunder and storm. For Indra brought to the Indo-Aryans that precious rain, which seemed to them even more vital than the sun. Therefore they made him the greatest of the gods, invoked the aid of his thunderbolts in their battles, and pictured him enviously as a gigantic hero feasting on bulls by the hundred and lapping up lakes of wine. His favorite enemy was Krishna, who in the Vedas was as yet only the local god of the Krishna tribe. Vishnu, the sun who covered the earth with his strides, was also a subordinate god, unaware that the future belonged to him and to Krishna, his avatar. This is one value of the Vedas to us, that through them we see religion in the making and can follow the birth, growth, and death of gods and beliefs from animism to philosophic pantheism, and from the superstition of the Atarva Veda to the sublime monism of the Upanishads. These gods are human in figure, in motive, almost in ignorance. One of them, besieged by prayers, ponders what he should give his devotee. This is what I will do. No, not that. I will give him a cow. Or shall it be a horse? I wonder if I have really had Soma from him. Some of them, however, rose in later Vedic days to a majestic moral significance. Varuna, who began as the encompassing heaven, whose breath was the storm and whose garment was the sky, grew with the development of his worshippers into the most ethical and ideal deity of the Vedas. Watching over the world through his great eye, the sun, punishing evil, rewarding good, and forgiving the sins of those who petitioned him. In this respect, Varuna was the custodian and executor of an eternal law called Rita. This was at first the law that established and maintained the stars in their courses. Gradually, it became also the law of right, the cosmic and moral rhythm which every man must follow if he would not go astray and be destroyed. As the number of the gods increased, the question arose as to which of them had created the world. This primal role was assigned now to Agni, now to Indra, now to Soma, now to Prajapati. One of the Upanishads attributed the world to an irrepressible procreator. Verily, he had no delight. One alone had no delight. He desired a second. He was indeed as large as a woman and a man closely embraced. He caused that self to fall into two pieces. Therefrom arose a husband and a wife. Therefore, one's self is like a half fragment. Therefore, this space is filled by a wife. He copulated with her. Therefore human beings were produced. And she bethought herself, How now does he copulate with me after he has produced me just from himself? Come, let me hide myself. She became a cow. He became a bull. With her he did indeed copulate. Then cattle were born. 
She became a mare, he a stallion. She became a female ass, he a male ass. With her he copulated of a truth. Thence were born solid hoofed animals. She became a she-goat, he a he-goat. She a ewe, he a ram. With her he did barely copulate. Therefore were born goats and sheep. Thus indeed he created all, whatever pairs there are, even down to the ants. He knew, I indeed am this creation, for I emitted it all from myself. Thence arose creation. In this unique passage, we have the germ of pantheism and transmigration. The Creator is one with His creation, and all things, all forms of life are one. Every form was once another form, and is distinguished from it only in the prejudice of perception and the superficial separateness of time. This view, though formulated in the Upanishads, was not yet in Vedic days a part of the popular creed. Instead of transmigration, the Indo-Aryans, like the Aryans of Persia, accepted a simple belief in personal immortality. After death, the soul entered into eternal punishment or happiness. It was thrust by Varuna into a dark abyss, half Hades and half hell, or was raised by Yama into a heaven, where every earthly joy was made endless and complete. Like corn decays the mortal, said the Kata Upanishad. Like corn is he born again. In the earlier Vedic religion there were, so far as the evidence goes, no temples and no images. Altars were put up anew for each sacrifice, as in Zoroastrian Persia, and sacred fire lifted the offering to heaven. Vestiges of human sacrifice occur here, as at the outset of almost every civilization, but they are few and uncertain. Again, as in Persia, the horse was sometimes burnt as an offering to the gods. The strangest ritual of all was the Ashvamida, or sacrifice of the horse, in which the queen of the tribe seems to have copulated with the sacred horse after it had been killed. The usual offering was a libation of soma juice and the pouring of liquid butter into the fire. The sacrifice was conceived for the most part in magical terms. If it were properly performed, it would win its reward, regardless of the moral deserts of the worshipper. The priests charged heavily for helping the pious in the ever more complicated ritual of sacrifice. If no fee was at hand, the priest refused to recite the necessary formulas. His payment had to come before that of the god. Rules were laid down by the clergy as to what the remuneration should be for each service, how many cows or horses, how much gold. Gold was particularly efficacious in moving the priest or the god. The brahmanas, written by the brahmins, instructed the priest how to turn the prayer or sacrifice secretly to the hurt of those who had employed him if they had given him an inadequate fee. Other regulations were issued, prescribing the proper ceremony and usage for almost every occasion of life, and usually requiring priestly aid. Slowly the Brahmins became a privileged hereditary caste, holding the mental and spiritual life of India under a control that threatened to stifle all thought and change. 6. The Vedas as Literature Sanskrit and English, writing, the Four Vedas, the Rig Veda, a hymn of creation. The language of the Indo-Aryans should be of special interest to us, for Sanskrit is one of the oldest in that Indo-European group of languages to which our own speech belongs. We feel for a moment a strange sense of cultural continuity across great stretches of time and space when we observe the similarity in Sanskrit, Greek, Latin, and English of the numerals, the family terms, and those insinuating little words that, by some oversight of the moralists, have been called the copulative verb. It is quite unlikely that this ancient tongue, which Sir William Jones pronounced more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, should have been the spoken language of the Aryan invaders. What that speech was, we do not know. We can only presume that it was a near relative of the early Persian dialect in which the Avesta was composed. The Sanskrit of the Vedas and the epics is already the earmarks of a classic and literary tongue, used only by scholars and priests. The very word Sanskrit means prepared, pure, perfect, sacred. The language of the people in the Vedic age was not one but many. Each tribe had its own Aryan dialect. India has never had one language. The Vedas contain no hint that writing was known to their authors. It was not until the 8th or 9th century B.C. that Hindu, probably Dravidian, merchants brought from Western Asia a Semitic script akin to the Phoenician, and from this Brahma script, as it came to be called, all the later alphabets of India were derived. For centuries, writing seems to have been confined to commercial and administrative purposes, with little thought of using it for literature. Merchants, not priests, developed this basic art. 
Even the Buddhist canon does not appear to have been written down before the 3rd century B.C. The oldest extant inscriptions in India are those of Ashoka. We who, until the Arabatus was filled with words and music, were for centuries made eye-minded by writing in print, find it hard to understand how contentedly India, long after she had learned to write, clung to the old ways of transmitting history and literature by recitation and memory. The Vedas and the epics were songs that grew with the generations of those that recited them. They were intended not for sight, but for sound. From this indifference to writing comes our dearth of knowledge about early India. What then were these Vedas, from which nearly all our understanding of primitive India is derived? This book is continued on Cassette 12, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 12, Side 1. What then were these Vedas, from which nearly all our understanding of primitive India is derived? The word Veda means knowledge. A Veda is literally a book of knowledge. Vedas is applied by the Hindus to all the sacred lore of their early period. Like our Bible, it indicates a literature rather than a book. Nothing could be more confused than the arrangement and division of this collection. Of the many Vedas that once existed, only four have survived. The Rig Veda, or Knowledge of the Hymns of Praise, the Sama Veda, or Knowledge of the Melodies, the Yajur Veda, or Knowledge of the Sacrificial Formulas, and the Atarva Veda, or Knowledge of the Magic Formulas. Each of these four Vedas is divided into four sections, the Mantras, or Hymns, the Brahmanas, or Manuals of Ritual, Prayer, and Incantation for the Priests, the Aranyaka, or Forest Texts for Hermit Saints, and the Upanishads, or confidential conferences for philosophers. Only one of the Vedas belongs to literature rather than to religion, philosophy, or magic. The Rig Veda is a kind of religious anthology composed of 1,028 hymns, or psalms of praise to the various objects of Indo-Aryan worship. Sun, moon, sky, stars, wind, rain, fire, dawn, earth, etc. Most of the hymns are matter-of-fact petitions for herds, crops, and longevity. A small minority of them rise to the level of literature. A few of them reach to the eloquence and beauty of the Psalms. Some of them are simple and natural poetry, like the unaffected wonder of a child. One hymn marvels that white milk should come from red cows. Another cannot understand why the sun, once it begins to descend, does not fall precipitately to the earth. Another inquires how the sparkling waters of all rivers flow into one ocean without ever filling it. One is a funeral hymn, in the style of Thanatopsis, over the body of a comrade fallen in battle. From the dead hand I take the bow he wielded, to gain for us dominion, might, and glory. Thou there, we here, rich in heroic offspring, will vanquish all assaults of every foeman. Approach the bosom of the earth, the mother, this earth extending far and most propitious. Young, soft as wool to bounteous givers, may she preserve thee from the lap of dissolution. Open wide, O earth, press not heavily upon him, be easy of approach, hail him with kindly aid. As with a robe a mother hides her son, so shroud this man, O earth. Another of the poems is a frank dialogue between the first parents of mankind, the twin brother and sister, Yama and Yami. Yami tempts her brother to cohabit with her despite the divine prohibition of incest, and alleges that all she desires is the continuance of the race. Yama resists her on high moral grounds. She uses every inducement, and as a last weapon calls him a weakling. The story as we have it is left unfinished, and we may judge the issue only from circumstantial evidence. The loftiest of the poems is an astonishing creation hymn, in which a subtle pantheism, even a pious skepticism, appears in this oldest book of the most religious of peoples. Nor aught nor naught existed. Yon bright sky was not, nor heaven's broad woof, outstretched above. What covered all? What sheltered? What concealed? Was it the water's fathomless abyss? There was not death, yet there was naught immortal, there was no confine betwixt day and night. The only one breathed breathless by itself. Other than it, there nothing since has been. Darkness there was, and all at first was veiled in gloom profound, an ocean without light. The germ that still lay covered in the husk burst forth, one nature from the fervent heat. Then first came love upon it, the new spring of mind. Yea, poets in their hearts discerned, pondering this bond between created things and uncreated. Comes this spark from earth, piercing and all-pervading, or from heaven? 
Then seeds were sown, and mighty powers arose, nature below, and power and will above. Who knows the secret? Who proclaimed it here, whence, whence this manifold creation sprang? The gods themselves came later into being. Who knows from whence this great creation sprang? He from whom all this great creation came, whether his will created or was mute, the most high seer that is in highest heaven, he knows it, or perchance even he knows not. It remained for the authors of the Upanishads to take up these problems and elaborate these hints in the most typical and perhaps the greatest product of the Hindu mind. 7. The Philosophy of the Upanishads The authors, their theme, intellect versus intuition, Atman, Brahman, their identity, a description of God, salvation, influence of the Upanishads, Emerson on Brahma. In the whole world, said Schopenhauer, there is no study so beneficial and so elevating as that of the Upanishads. It has been the solace of my life. It will be the solace of my death. Here, excepting the moral fragments of Patahotep, are the oldest extant philosophy and psychology of our race, the surprisingly subtle and patient effort of man to understand the mind and the world and their relation. The Upanishads are as old as Homer and as modern as Kant. The word is composed of upa, near, and shad, to sit. From sitting near the teacher, the term came to mean the secret or esoteric doctrine confided by the master to his best and favorite pupils. There are 108 of these discourses, composed by various saints and sages between 800 and 500 B.C. They represent not a consistent system of philosophy, but the opinions, aperçus, and lessons of many men, in whom philosophy and religion were still fused in the attempt to understand, and reverently unite with, the simple and essential reality underlying the superficial multiplicity of things. They are full of absurdities and contradictions, and occasionally they anticipate all the wind of Hegelian verbiage. Sometimes they present formulas as weird as that of Tom Sawyer for curing warts. Sometimes they impress us as the profoundest thinking in the history of philosophy. We know the names of many of the authors, but we know nothing of their lives, except what they occasionally reveal in their teachings. The most vivid figures among them are Yajnavalkya, the man, and Gargi, the woman who has the honor of being among the earliest of philosophers. Of the two, Yajnavalkya has the sharper tongue. His fellow teachers looked upon him as a dangerous innovator. His posterity made his doctrine the cornerstone of unchallengeable orthodoxy. He tells us how he tried to leave his two wives in order to become a hermit sage. And in the plea of his wife, Maitreya, that he should take her with him, we catch some feeling of the intensity with which India has for thousands of years pursued religion and philosophy. And then Yajnavalkya was about to commence another mode of life. Maitreya, said Yajnavalkya, lo, I am about to wander forth from this state. Let me make a final settlement for you and that Katyayani. Then spake Maitreyi, If now, sir, this whole earth filled with wealth were mine, would I now thereby be immortal? No, no, said Yajnavalkya. Of immortality there is no hope through wealth. Then spake Maitreyi, What should I do with that through which I may not be immortal? What you know, sir, that indeed explain to me. The theme of the Upanishads is all the mystery of this unintelligible world. Whence are we born? Where do we live and whither do we go? O ye who know Brahman, tell us at whose command we abide here. Should time or nature or necessity or chance or the elements be considered the cause, or he who is called Purusha, the Supreme Spirit? India has had more than her share of men who wanted not millions but answers to their questions. In the Maitri Upanishad, we read of a king abandoning his kingdom and going into the forest to practice austerities, clear his mind for understanding, and solve the riddle of the universe. After a thousand days of the king's penances, a sage, knower of the soul, came to him. You are one who knows its true nature, says the king. Do you tell us? Choose other desires, warns the sage. But the king insists, and in a passage that must have seemed Schopenhauerian to Schopenhauer, he voices that revulsion against life, that fear of being reborn, which runs darkly through all Hindu thought. Sir, in this ill-smelling, unsubstantial body, which is a conglomerate of bone, skin, muscle, marrow, flesh, semen, blood, mucus, tears, rheum, feces, urine, wind, bile, and phlegm, what is the good of enjoyment of desire? In this body, which is afflicted with desire, anger, covetousness, delusion, fear, despondency, envy, separation from the desirable, 
Union with the undesirable, hunger, thirst, senility, death, disease, sorrow, and the like, what is the good of enjoyment of desires? And we see that this whole world is decaying like these gnats, these mosquitoes, this grass, and these trees that arise and perish. Among other things, there is the drying up of great oceans, the falling away of mountain peaks, the deviation of the fixed pole star, the submergence of the earth. In this sort of cycle of existence, what is the good of enjoyment of desires when, after a man has fed upon them, there is seen repeatedly his return here to the earth? The first lesson that the sages of the Upanishads teach their selected pupils is the inadequacy of the intellect. How can this feeble brain that aches at a little calculus ever hope to understand the complex immensity of which it is so transitory a fragment? Not that the intellect is useless. It has its modest place and serves us well when it deals with relations and things. But how it falters before the eternal, the infinite, or the elementally real. In the presence of that silent reality which supports all appearances and wells up in all consciousness, we need some other organ of perception and understanding than these senses and this reason. Not by learning is the Atman, or soul of the world, attained, not by genius and much knowledge of books. Let a Brahmin renounce learning and become as a child. Let him not seek after many words, for that is mere weariness of tongue. The highest understanding, as Spinoza was to say, is direct perception, immediate insight, and, as Bergson would say, intuition, the inward seeing of the mind that has deliberately closed, as far as it can, the portals of external sense. The self-evident Brahman pierced the openings of the senses so that they turned outwards. Therefore man looks outward, not inward into himself. Some wise man, however, with his eyes closed and wishing for immortality, saw the self behind. If on looking inward a man finds nothing at all, that may only prove the accuracy of his introspection. For no man need expect to find the eternal in himself if he is lost in the ephemeral and particular. Before that inner reality can be felt, one has to wash away from himself all evil doing and thinking, all turbulence of body and soul. For a fortnight one must fast, drinking only water. Then the mind, so to speak, is starved into tranquility and silence. The senses are cleansed and stilled. The spirit is left at peace to feel itself and that great ocean of soul of which it is a part. At last the individual ceases to be, and unity and reality appear. For it is not the individual self which the seer sees in this pure inward seeing. That individual self is but a series of brain or mental states. It is merely the body seen from within. What the seeker seeks is Atman, the self of all selves, the soul of all souls, the immaterial, formless absolute in which we bathe ourselves when we forget ourselves. This, then, is the first step in the secret doctrine, that the essence of our own self is not the body, or the mind, or the individual ego, but the silent and formless depth of being within us, Atman. The second step is Brahman, the one pervading neuter, impersonal, all-embracing, underlying, intangible essence of the world, the real of the real, the unborn soul, undecaying, undying, the soul of all things, as Atman is the soul of all souls, the one force that stands behind, beneath, and above all forces and all gods. Then Vidagda Sakaila questioned him, How many gods are there, Yajnavalkya? He answered, As many as are mentioned in the hymn to all the gods, namely three hundred and three and three thousand and three. Yes, but just how many gods are there, Yajnavalkya? Thirty-three. Yes, but just how many gods are there, Yajnavalkya? Six. Yes, but just how many gods are there, Yajnavalkya? Two. Yes, but just how many gods are there, Yajnavalkya? One and a half. Yes, but just how many gods are there, Yajnavalkya? One. The third step is the most important of all. Atman and Brahman are one. The non-individual soul or force within us is identical with the impersonal soul of the world. The Upanishads burn this doctrine into the pupil's mind with untiring, tiring repetition. Beyond all forms and veils, the subjective and the objective are one. We, in our de-individualized reality, and God as the essence of all things, are one. A teacher expresses it in a famous parable. Bring hither a fig from there. Here it is, sir. Divide it. It is divided, sir. What do you see there? These rather fine seeds, sir. Of these, please divide one. It is divided, sir. What do you see there? Nothing at all, sir. 
Verily, my dear one, that finest essence which you do not perceive, verily from that finest essence this great tree thus arises. Believe me, my dear one, that which is the finest essence, this whole world has that as its soul. That is reality, that is Atman, Tatwamasi, that thou art, Shwetaketu. Do you, sir, cause me to understand even more? So be it, my dear one. This almost Tegelian dialectic of Atman, Brahman, and their synthesis is the essence of the Upanishads. Many other lessons are taught here, but they are subordinate. We find already in these discourses the belief in transmigration and the longing for release, moksha, from this heavy chain of reincarnations. Janaka, king of the Videhas, begs Yajnavalkya to tell him how rebirth can be avoided. Yajnavalkya answers by expounding yoga. Through the ascetic elimination of all personal desires, one may cease to be an individual fragment, unite himself in supreme bliss with the soul of the world, and so escape rebirth. Whereupon the king, metaphysically overcome, says, I will give you, noble sir, the videhas, and myself also to be your slave. It is an abstruse heaven, however, that Yajnavalkya promises the devotee, for in it there will be no individual consciousness, there will only be absorption into being, the reunion of the temporarily separated part with the whole. As flowing rivers disappear in the sea, losing their name and form, thus a wise man, freed from name and form, goes to the divine person who is beyond all. Such a theory of life and death will not please Western man, whose religion is as permeated with individualism as are his political and economic institutions. But it has satisfied the philosophical Hindu mind with astonishing continuity. We shall find this philosophy of the Upanishads, this monistic theology, this mystic and impersonal immortality, dominating Hindu thought from Buddha to Gandhi, from Yajnavalkya to Tagore. To our own day, the Upanishads have remained to India what the New Testament has been to Christendom, a noble creed occasionally practiced and generally revered. Even in Europe and America, this wistful theosophy has won millions upon millions of followers, from lonely women and tired men to Schopenhauer and Emerson. Who would have thought that the great American philosopher of individualism would give perfect expression to the Hindu conviction that individuality is a delusion. Brahma If the red slayer thinks he slays, or if the slain thinks he is slain, they know not well the subtle ways I keep and pass and turn again. Far or forgot to me is near. Shadow and sunlight are the same. The vanished gods to me appear, and one to me are shame and fame. They reckon ill who leave me out. When me they fly, I am the wings, I am the doubter and the doubt, and I the hymn the Brahmin sings. Chapter 15 Buddha 1. The heretics Skeptics, nihilists, sophists, atheists, materialists, religions without a god. That there were doubters even in the days of the Upanishads appears from the Upanishads themselves. Sometimes the sages ridiculed the priests, as when the Chandogya Upanishad likens the orthodox clergy of the time to a procession of dogs, each holding the tail of its predecessor and saying piously, Om, let us eat, Om, let us drink. The Swansaved Upanishad announces that there is no God, no heaven, no hell, no reincarnation, no world, that the Vedas and Upanishads are the work of conceited fools, that ideas are illusions and all words untrue, that people deluded by flowery speech cling to gods and temples and holy men, though in reality there is no difference between Vishnu and a dog. And the story is told of Virokana, who lived as a pupil for thirty-two years with the great god Prajapati himself, received much instruction about the self which is free from evil, ageless, deathless, sorrowless, hungerless, thirstless, whose desire is the real, and then suddenly returned to earth and preached this highly scandalizing doctrine. One's self is to be made happy here on earth, one's self is to be waited upon. He who makes himself happy here on earth, who waits upon himself, obtains both worlds, this world and the next. Perhaps the good Brahmins who have preserved the history of their country have deceived us a little about the unanimity of Hindu mysticism and piety. Indeed, as scholarship unearths some of the less respectable figures in Indian philosophy before Buddha, a picture takes form in which, along with saints meditating on Brahman, we find a variety of persons who despised all priests, doubted all gods, and bore without trepidation the name of Gnostics, no-sayers, nihilists. Sangaya, the agnostic, would neither admit nor deny life after death. He questioned the possibility of knowledge and limited philosophy to the pursuit of peace. 
Purana Kashyapa refused to accept moral distinctions and taught that the soul is a passive slave to chance. Maskarin Gosala held that fate determines everything, regardless of the merits of men. Ajita Kasakambalin reduced man to earth, water, fire, and wind, and said, Fools and wise alike on the dissolution of the body are cut off, annihilated, and after death they are not. The author of the Ramayana draws a typical skeptic in Jabali, who ridicules Rama for rejecting a kingdom in order to keep a vow. Jabali, a learned Brahmin and a sophist skilled in word, questioned faith and law and duty, spake to young Ayodhya's lord. Wherefore, Rama, idle maxims cloud thy heart and warp thy mind, maxims which mislead the simple and the thoughtless humankind. Ah, I weep for erring mortals who, on erring duty bent, sacrifice this dear enjoyment till their barren life is spent, who to gods and to the fathers vainly still their offerings make. Waste of food, for God nor father doth our pious homage take. And the food by one partaken can it nourish other men? Food bestowed upon a Brahmin can it serve our fathers then? Crafty priests have forged these maxims, and with selfish objects say, Make thy gifts and do thy penance, leave thy worldly wealth and pray. There is no hereafter, Rama, vain the hope and creed of men. Seek the pleasures of the present, spurn illusions, poor and vain. When Buddha grew to manhood, he found the halls, the streets, the very woods of northern India ringing with philosophic disputation, mostly of an atheistic and materialistic trend. The later Upanishads and the oldest Buddhist books are full of references to these heretics. A large class of traveling sophists, the Paribhajaka, or wanderers, spent the better part of every year in passing from locality to locality, seeking pupils or antagonists in philosophy. Some of them taught logic as the art of proving anything and earned for themselves the titles of hair-splitters and eel-wrigglers. Others demonstrated the non-existence of God and the inexpediency of virtue. Large audiences gathered to hear such lectures and debates. Great halls were built to accommodate them, and sometimes princes offered rewards for those who should emerge victorious from these intellectual jousts. It was an age of amazingly free thought and of a thousand experiments in philosophy. Not much has come down to us from these skeptics, and their memory has been preserved almost exclusively through the diatribes of their enemies. The oldest name among them is Brihaspati, but his nihilistic sutras have perished, and all that remains of him is a poem denouncing the priests in language free from all metaphysical obscurity. No heaven exists, no final liberation, no soul, no other world, no rights of caste. The triple veda, triple self-command, and all the dust and ashes of repentance, these yield a means of livelihood for men devoid of intellect and manliness. How can this body, when reduced to dust, revisit earth? And if a ghost can pass to other worlds... Why does not strong affection for those he leaves behind attract him back? The costly rites enjoined for those who die are but a means of livelihood devised by sacerdotal cunning, nothing more. While life endures, let life be spent in ease and merriment. Let a man borrow money from all his friends and feast on melted butter. Out of the aphorisms of Brihaspati came a whole school of Hindu materialists, named, after one of them, Charvakas. They laughed at the notion that the Vedas were divinely revealed truth. Truth, they argued, can never be known except through the senses. Even reason is not to be trusted, for every inference depends for its validity not only upon accurate observation and correct reasoning, but also upon the assumption that the future will behave like the past. And of this, as Hume was to say, there can be no certainty. What is not perceived by the senses, said the Charvakas, does not exist. Therefore the soul is a delusion, and Atman is humbug. We do not observe in experience or history any interposition of supernatural forces in the world. All phenomena are natural. Only simpletons trace them to demons or gods. Matter is the one reality. The body is a combination of atoms. The mind is merely matter thinking. The body, not the soul, feels, sees, hears, thinks. Who has seen the soul existing in a state separate from the body? There is no immortality, no rebirth. Religion is an aberration, a disease, or a chicanery. The hypothesis of a god is useless for explaining or understanding the world. Men think religion necessary only because, being accustomed to it, they feel a sense of loss and an uncomfortable void when the growth of knowledge destroys this faith. Morality, too, is natural. It is a social convention and convenience, not a divine command. Nature is indifferent to good and bad, virtue and vice, and lets the sun shine indiscriminately upon knaves and saints. If nature has any ethical quality at all, it is that of transcendent immorality. 
There is no need to control instinct and passion, for these are the instructions of nature to men. Virtue is a mistake. The purpose of life is living, and the only wisdom is happiness. This revolutionary philosophy of the Charvakas put an end to the age of the Vedas and the Upanishads. It weakened the hold of the Brahmins on the mind of India, and left in Hindu society a vacuum which almost compelled the growth of a new religion. But the materialists had done their work so thoroughly that both of the new religions which arose to replace the old Vedic faith were, anomalous though it may sound, atheistic religions, devotions without a god. Both belonged to the Gnostica or nihilistic movement, and both were originated not by the Brahmin priests, but by members of the Kshatriya warrior caste, in a reaction against sacerdotal ceremonialism and theology. With the coming of Jainism and Buddhism, a new epoch began in the history of India. 2. Mahavira and the Jains The Great Hero, the Jain Creed, Atheistic Polytheism, Asceticism, Salvation by Suicide, Later History of the Jains About the middle of the 6th century BC, a boy was born to a wealthy nobleman of the Lichchavi tribe in a suburb of the city of Vaishali, in what is now the province of Bihar. His parents, though wealthy, belonged to a sect that looked upon rebirth as a curse and upon suicide as a blessed privilege. When their son had reached his thirty-first year, they ended their lives by voluntary starvation. The young man, moved to the depths of his soul, renounced the world and its ways, divested himself of all clothing, and wandered through western Bengal as an ascetic, seeking self-purification and understanding. After thirteen years of such self-denial, he was hailed by a group of disciples as a jinnah, conqueror, that is, one of the great teachers whom fate, they believed, had ordained to appear at regular intervals to enlighten the people of India. They rechristened their leader Mahavira, or the great hero, and took to themselves, from their most characteristic belief, the name of Jains. Mahavira organized a celibate clergy and an order of nuns, and when he died, aged seventy-two, left behind him fourteen thousand devotees. Gradually, this sect developed one of the strangest bodies of doctrine in all the history of religion. They began with a realistic logic in which knowledge was described as confined to the relative and temporal. Nothing is true, they taught, except from one point of view. From other points of view, it would probably be false. They were fond of quoting the story of the six blind men who laid hands on different parts of an elephant. He who held the ear thought that the elephant was a great winnowing fan. He who held the leg said the animal was a big round pillar. All judgments, therefore, are limited and conditional. Absolute truth comes only to the periodic redeemers, or jinnas. Nor can the Vedas help. They are not inspired by God, if only for the reason that there is no God. It is not necessary, said the Jains, to assume a creator or first cause. Any child can refute that assumption by showing that an uncreated creator or a causeless cause is just as hard to understand as an uncaused or uncreated world. It is more logical to believe that the universe has existed from all eternity, and that its infinite changes and revolutions are due to the inherent powers of nature, rather than to the intervention of a deity. But the climate of India does not lend itself to a persistently naturalistic creed. The Jains, having emptied the sky of God, soon peopled it again with the deified saints of Jain history and legend. These they worshipped with devotion and ceremony, but even them they considered subject to transmigration and decay, and not in any sense as the creators or rulers of the world. Nor were the Jains materialists. They accepted a dualistic distinction of mind and matter everywhere. In all things, even in stones and metals, there were souls. Any soul that achieved a blameless life became a paramatman, or supreme soul, and was spared reincarnation for a while. When its reward had equaled its merit, however, it was born into the flesh again. Only the highest and most perfect spirits could achieve complete release. These were the arhats, or supreme lords, who lived like Epicurus's deities in some distant and shadowy realm, impotent to affect the affairs of men, but happily removed from all chances of rebirth. The road to release, said the Jains, was by ascetic penances and complete ahimsa, abstinence from injury to any living thing. Every Jain ascetic must take five vows, not to kill anything, not to lie, not to take what is not given, to preserve chastity and to renounce pleasure in all external things. Sense pleasure, they thought, is always a sin. The ideal is indifference to pleasure and pain, and independence of all external objects. 
Agriculture is forbidden to the gine because it tears up the soil and crushes insects or worms. The good gine rejects honey as the life of the bee, strains water lest he destroy creatures lurking in it when he drinks, veils his mouth for fear of inhaling and killing the organisms of the air, screens his lamp to protect insects from the flame, and sweeps the ground before him as he walks lest his naked foot should trample out some life. The gine must never slaughter or sacrifice an animal, and if he is thoroughgoing, he establishes hospitals or asylums, as at Ahmedabad, for old or injured beasts. The only life that he may kill is his own. His doctrine highly approves of suicide, especially by slow starvation, for this is the greatest victory of the spirit over the blind will to live. Many giants have died in this way, and the leaders of the sect are said to leave the world even today by self-starvation. A religion based upon so profound a doubt and denial of life might have found some popular support in a country where life has always been hard. But even in India, its extreme asceticism limited its appeal. From the beginning, the Jains were a select minority, and though Yuan Chuang found them numerous and powerful in the seventh century, it was a passing zenith in a quiet career. About 79 AD, a great schism divided them on the question of nudity. From that time on, the Jains have belonged either to the Shwatambara, white-robed sect, or to the digambaras, sky-clad or nude. Today, both sects wear the usual clothing of their place and time. Only their saints go about the streets naked. These sects have further sects to divide them. The digambaras have four, the shwatambaras eighty-four. Together they number only one million three hundred thousand adherents out of a population of three hundred twenty million souls. Gandhi has been strongly influenced by the Jain sect, has accepted ahimsa as the basis of his policy and his life, contents himself with a loincloth, and may starve himself to death. The Jains may yet name him as one of their jinnas, another incarnation of the great spirit that periodically has made flesh to redeem the world. 3. The Legend of Buddha The background of Buddhism, the miraculous birth, youth, the sorrows of life, flight, ascetic years, enlightenment, a vision of nirvana— it is difficult to see across 2,500 years what were the economic, political, and moral conditions that called forth religions so ascetic and pessimistic as Jainism and Buddhism. Doubtless much material progress had been made since the establishment of the Aryan rule in India. Great cities like Pataliputra and Vaishala had been built. Industry and trade had created wealth. Wealth had generated leisure. Leisure had developed knowledge and culture. Probably it was the riches of India that produced the Epicureanism and materialism of the 7th and 6th centuries before Christ. Religion does not prosper under prosperity. The senses liberate themselves from pious restraints and formulate philosophies that will justify their liberation. As in the China of Confucius and the Greece of Protagoras, not to speak of our own day, so in Buddha's India the intellectual decay of the old religion had begotten ethical skepticism and moral anarchy. Jainism and Buddhism, though impregnated with the melancholy atheism of a disillusioned age, were religious reactions against the hedonistic creeds of an emancipated and worldly leisure class. Hindu tradition describes Buddha's father, Suddhodana, as a man of the world, member of the Gautama clan of the proud Shakya tribe, and prince or king of Kapilavastu at the foot of the Himalayan range. In truth, however, we know nothing certain about Buddha and if we give here the stories that have gathered about his name, it is not because these are history, but because they are an essential part of Hindu literature and Asiatic religion. Scholarship assigns his birth to approximately 563 B.C. and can say no more. Legend takes up the tale and reveals to us in what strange ways men may be conceived. At that time, says one of the Jataka books, In the city of Kapilavastu, the festival of the full moon had been proclaimed. Queen Maya, from the seventh day before the full moon, celebrated the festival without intoxicants and with abundance of garlands and perfumes. Rising early on the seventh day, she bathed in scented water and bestowed a great gift of four hundred thousand pieces as alms. Fully adorned, she ate of choice food, took upon herself the aposata vows, entered her adorned state bedchamber, lay down on the bed, and, falling asleep, dreamt this dream. Four great kings, it seemed, raised her together with the bed, and taking her to the Himalayas, set her on the Manasila tableland. Then their queens came, and took her to the Anotata lake, bathed her to remove human stain, robed her in heavenly clothing, anointed her with perfumes, and bedecked her with divine flowers. 
Not far away is a silver mountain, and thereon a golden mansion. There they prepared a divine bed with head to the east and laid her upon it. Now the Bodhisattva became a white elephant. Not far from there is a golden mountain, and going there he descended from it, alighted on the silver mountain, approaching it from the direction of the north. In his trunk, which was like a silver rope, he held a white lotus. Then, trumpeting, he entered the golden mansion, made a rightwise circle three times around his mother's bed, smote her right side, and appeared to enter her womb. Thus he received a new existence. The next day the queen awoke and told her dream to the king. The king summoned sixty-four eminent Brahmins, showed them honor, and satisfied them with excellent food and other presents. Then, when they were satisfied with these pleasures, he caused the dream to be told and asked what would happen. The Brahmins said, Be not anxious, O king, the queen has conceived, a male, not a female, and thou shalt have a son. And if he dwells in a house, he will become a king, a universal monarch. If he leaves his house and goes forth from the world, he will become a Buddha, a remover in the world of the veil of ignorance. Queen Maya, bearing the Bodhisattva for ten months like oil in a bowl, when her time was come, desired to go to her relative's house, and addressed King Shuddhadana, I wish, O king, to go to Devadaha, the city of my family. The king approved, and caused the road from Kapalavastu to Devadaha to be made smooth, and adorned with vessels filled with plantains, flags, and banners. And seating her in a golden palanquin, borne by a thousand courtiers, sent her with a great retinue. Between the two cities, and belonging to the inhabitants of both, is a pleasure grove of sal trees, named the Lumbini Grove. At that time, from the roots to the tips of the branches, it was one mass of flowers. When the queen saw it, a desire to sport in the grove arose. She went to the foot of a great sal tree and desired to seize a branch. The branch, like the tip of a supple reed, bent down and came within reach of her hand. Stretching out her hand, she received the branch. Thereupon she was shaken with the throes of birth. So the multitude set up a curtain for her and retired. Holding the branch and even while standing, she was delivered. And as other beings when born come forth stained with impure matter, not so the Bodhisattva. But the Bodhisattva, like a preacher of the doctrine descending from the seat of doctrine, like a man descending stairs, stretched out his two hands and feet, and standing unsoiled and unstained by any impurity, shining like a jewel laid on Benares cloth, descended from his mother. It must further be understood that at Buddha's birth a great light appeared in the sky, the deaf heard, the dumb spoke, the lame were made straight, gods bent down from heaven to assist him, and kings came from afar to welcome him. Legend paints a colorful picture of the splendor and luxury that surrounded him in his youth. He dwelt as a happy prince in three palaces, like a god, protected by his loving father from all contact with the pain and grief of human life. Forty thousand dancing girls entertained him, and when he came of age five hundred ladies were sent to him that he might choose one as his wife. As a member of the Kshatriya caste, he received careful training in the military arts, but also he sat at the feet of sages and made himself master of all the philosophical theories current in his time. He married, became a happy father, and lived in wealth, peace, and good repute. One day, says pious tradition, he went forth from his palace into the streets among the people and saw an old man, and on another day he went forth and saw a sick man, and on the third day he went forth and saw a dead man, he himself, in the holy books of his disciples, tells the tale movingly. Then, O monks, did I, endowed with such majesty and such excessive delicacy, think thus. An ignorant, ordinary person who is himself subject to old age, not beyond the sphere of old age, on seeing an old man is troubled, ashamed, and disgusted, extending the thought to himself. I, too, am subject to old age, not beyond the sphere of old age. And should I, who am subject to old age, on seeing an old man, be troubled, ashamed, and disgusted? This seemed to me not fitting. As I thus reflected, all the elation in youth suddenly disappeared. Thus, O monks, before my enlightenment, being myself subject to birth, I sought out the nature of birth. Being subject to old age, I sought out the nature of old age, of sickness, of sorrow, of impurity. Then I thought, what if I, being myself subject to birth, were to seek out the nature of birth? And having seen the wretchedness of the nature of birth, were to seek out the unborn, the supreme peace of nirvana. Death is the origin of all religions, and perhaps if there had been no death, there would have been no gods. To Buddha, these sights were the beginnings of enlightenment. Like one overcome with conversion, he suddenly resolved to leave his father, his wife, and his newborn son, and become an ascetic in the desert. 
During the night he stole into his wife's room and looked for the last time upon his son, Rahula. Just then, says the Buddhist scriptures, in a passage sacred to all followers of Gautama, a lamp of scented oil was burning. On the bed strewn with heaps of jessamine and other flowers, the mother of Rahula was sleeping with her hand on her son's head. The Bodhisattva, standing with his foot on the threshold, looked and thought, If I move aside the queen's hand and take my son, the queen will awake, and this will be an obstacle to my going. When I have become a Buddha, I will come back and see him. And he descended from the palace. In the dark of the morning he rode out of the city on his horse, Kantaka, with his charioteer Chauna clinging desperately to the tail. Then Mara, prince of evil, appeared to him and tempted him, offering him great empires. But Buddha refused, and riding on, crossed a broad river with one mighty leap. A desire to look again at his native city arose in him, but he did not turn. Then the great earth turned round, so that he might not have to look back. He stopped at a place called Urubala. There, he says, I thought to myself, truly this is a pleasant spot and a beautiful forest. Clear flows the river, and pleasant are the bathing places. All round are meadows and villages. Here he devoted himself to the severest forms of asceticism. For six years he tried the ways of the yogis who had already appeared on the Indian scene. He lived on seeds and grass, and for one period he fed on dung. Gradually he reduced his food to a grain of rice each day. He wore hair cloth, plucked out his hair and beard for torture's sake, stood for long hours or lay upon thorns. He let the dust and dirt accumulate upon his body until he looked like an old tree. He frequented a place where human corpses were exposed to be eaten by birds and beasts, and slept among the rotting carcasses. And again, he tells us, I thought, what if now I set my teeth, press my tongue to my palate, and restrain, crush, and burn out my mind with my mind? I did so. And sweat flowed from my armpits. Then I thought, what if I now practice trance without breathing? So I restrained breathing in and out from mouth and nose. And as I did so, there was a violent sound of winds issuing from my ears. Just as if a strong man were to crush one's head with the point of a sword, even so did violent winds disturb my head. Then I thought, what if I were to take food only in small amounts, as much as my hollowed palm would hold, juice of beans, vetches, chickpeas, or pulse? My body became extremely lean. The mark of my seat was like a camel's footprint through the little food. The bones of my spine, when bent and straightened, were like a row of spindles through the little food. Also in a deep well, the deep low-lying sparkling of the waters is seen, so in my eye sockets were seen the deep, low-lying sparkling of my eyes through the little food. And as a bitter gourd, cut off raw, is cracked and withered through rain and sun, so was the skin of my head withered through the little food. When I thought I would touch the skin of my stomach, I actually took hold of my spine. When I thought I would ease myself, I thereupon fell prone through the little food. To relieve my body, I stroked my limbs with my hand, and as I did so, the decayed hairs fell from my body through the little food. But one day the thought came to Buddha that self-mortification was not the way. Perhaps he was unusually hungry on that day, or some memory of loveliness stirred within him. He perceived that no new enlightenment had come to him from these austerities. By this severity I do not attain superhuman, truly noble knowledge and insight. On the contrary, a certain pride in his self-torture had poisoned any holiness that might have grown from it. He abandoned his asceticism, went to sit under a shade-giving tree, and remained there steadfast and motionless, resolving never to leave that seat until enlightenment came to him. What, he asked himself, was the source of human sorrow, suffering, sickness, old age, and death? Suddenly a vision came to him of the infinite succession of deaths and births in the stream of life. He saw every death frustrated with new birth, Every peace and joy balanced with new desire and discontent, new disappointment, new grief and pain. Thus, with mind concentrated, purified, cleansed, I directed my mind to the passing away and rebirth of beings. With divine, purified, superhuman vision, I saw beings passing away and being reborn, low and high, of good and bad color, in happy or miserable existences, according to their karma according to that universal law by which every act of good or of evil will be rewarded or punished in this life or in some later incarnation of the soul. It was the vision of this apparently ridiculous succession of deaths and births that made Buddha scorn human life. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. 
Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 12, Side 2. It was the vision of this apparently ridiculous succession of deaths and births that made Buddha scorn human life. Birth, he told himself, is the origin of all evil. And yet birth continues endlessly, forever replenishing the stream of human sorrow. If birth could be stopped, why is birth not stopped? Because the law of karma demands new reincarnations in which the soul may atone for evil done in past existences. If, however, a man could live a life of perfect justice, of unvarying patience and kindness to all, if he could tie his thoughts to eternal things, not binding his heart to those that begin and pass away, then perhaps he would be spared rebirth, and for him the fountain of evil would run dry. If one could still all desires for one's self and seek only to do good, then individuality, that first and worst delusion of mankind, might be overcome, and the soul would merge at last with unconscious infinity. What peace there would be in the heart that had cleansed itself of every personal desire, and what heart that had not so cleansed itself could ever know peace? Happiness is possible neither here, as paganism thinks, nor hereafter, as many religions think. Only peace is possible, only the cool quietude of craving ended, only nirvana. And so, after seven years of meditation, the enlightened one, having learned the cause of human suffering, went forth to the holy city of Benares, and there, in the dear park at Sarnath, preached nirvana to men. 4. The Teaching of Buddha Portrait of the Master, His Methods, The Four Noble Truths, The Eightfold Way, The Five Moral Rules, Buddha and Christ, Buddha's Agnosticism and Anti-Clericalism, His Atheism, his soulless psychology, the meaning of nirvana. Like other teachers of his time, Buddha taught through conversation lectures and parables. Since it never occurred to him any more than to Socrates or Christ to put his doctrine into writing, he summarized it in sutras, threads, designed to prompt the memory. As preserved for us in the remembrance of his followers, these discourses unconsciously portray for us the first distinct character in India's history. A man of strong will, authoritative and proud, but of gentle manner and speech, and of infinite benevolence. He claimed enlightenment, but not inspiration. He never pretended that a god was speaking through him. In controversy, he was more patient and considerate than any other of the great teachers of mankind. His disciples, perhaps idealizing him, represented him as fully practicing ahimsa. Putting away the killing of living things, Gautama the recluse holds aloof from the destruction of life. He, once a Kshatriya warrior, has laid the cudgel and the sword aside, and ashamed of roughness and full of mercy, he dwells compassionate and kind to all creatures that have life. Putting away slander, Gautama holds himself aloof from calumny. Thus does he live as a binder together of those who are divided, an encourager of those who are friends, a peacemaker, a lover of peace, impassioned for peace, a speaker of words that make for peace. Like Lao Tse and Christ, he wished to return good for evil, love for hate, and he remained silent under misunderstanding and abuse. If a man foolishly does me wrong, I will return to him the protection of my ungrudging love. The more evil comes from him, the more good shall come from me. When a simpleton abused him, Buddha listened in silence, but when the man had finished, Buddha asked him, Son, if a man declined to accept a present made to him, to whom would it belong? The man answered, To him who offered it. My son, said Buddha, I decline to accept your abuse and request you to keep it for yourself. Unlike most saints, Buddha had a sense of humor and knew that metaphysics without laughter is immodesty. His method of teaching was unique, though it owed something to the wanderers or traveling sophists of his time. He walked from town to town, accompanied by his favorite disciples, and followed by as many as twelve hundred devotees. He took no thought for the morrow, but was content to be fed by some local admirer, once he scandalized his followers by eating in the home of a courtesan. He stopped at the outskirts of a village and pitched camp in some garden or wood or on some river bank. The afternoon he gave to meditation, the evening to instruction. His discourses took the form of Socratic questioning, moral parables, courteous controversy, or succinct formulas whereby he sought to compress his teaching into convenient brevity and order. 
His favorite sutra was The Four Noble Truths, in which he expounded his view that life is pain, that pain is due to desire, and that wisdom lies in stilling all desire. 1. Now this, O monks, is the noble truth of pain. Birth is painful, sickness is painful, old age is painful. Sorrow, lamentation, dejection, and despair are painful. 2. Now this, O monks, is the noble truth of the cause of pain. That craving which leads to rebirth, combined with pleasure and lust, finding pleasure here and there, namely the craving for passion, the craving for existence, the craving for non-existence. 3. Now this, O monks, is the noble truth of the cessation of pain, the cessation without a remainder of that craving, abandonment, forsaking, release, non-attachment. 4. Now this, O monks, is the noble truth of the way that leads to the cessation of pain. This is the noble eightfold way, namely, right views, right intention, right speech, right action, right living, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Buddha was convinced that pain so overbalanced pleasure in human life that it would be better never to have been born. More tears have flowed, he tells us, than all the water that is in the four great oceans. Every pleasure seemed poisoned for him by its brevity. Is that which is impermanent, sorrow or joy? He asks one of his disciples, and the answer is, Sorrow, Lord. The basic evil, then, is tana, not all desire, but selfish desire, desire directed to the advantage of the part rather than to the good of the whole. Above all, sexual desire, for that leads to reproduction, which stretches out the chain of life into new suffering aimlessly. One of his disciples concluded that Buddha would approve of suicide, but Buddha reproved him. Suicide would be useless, since the soul, unpurified, would be reborn in other incarnations until it achieved complete forgetfulness of self. When his disciples asked him to define more clearly his conception of right living, he formulated for their guidance five moral rules, commandments, simple and brief, but perhaps more comprehensive and harder to keep than the Decalogue. 1. Let not one kill any living being. 2. Let not one take what is not given to him. 3. Let not one speak falsely. 4. Let not one drink intoxicating drinks. 5. Let not one be unchaste. Elsewhere, Buddha introduced elements into his teaching strangely anticipatory of Christ. Let a man overcome anger by kindness, evil by good. Victory breeds hatred, for the conquered is unhappy. Never in the world does hatred cease by hatred. Hatred ceases by love. Like Jesus, he was uncomfortable in the presence of women and hesitated long before admitting them into the Buddhist order. His favorite disciple, Ananda, once asked him, How are we to conduct ourselves, Lord, with regards to womankind? As not seeing them, Ananda. But if we should see them, what are we to do? No talking, Ananda. But if they should speak to us, Lord, what are we to do? Keep wide awake, Ananda. His conception of religion was purely ethical. He cared everything about conduct, nothing about ritual or worship, metaphysics or theology. When a Brahmin proposed to purify himself of his sins by bathing at Gaya, Buddha said to him, Have thy bath here, even here, O Brahmin. Be kind to all beings. If thou speakest not false, if thou killest not life, if thou takest not what is not given to thee, secure in self-denial, what wouldst thou gain by going to Gaya? Any water is Gaya to thee. There is nothing stranger in the history of religion than the sight of Buddha founding a worldwide religion and yet refusing to be drawn into any discussion about eternity, immortality, or God. The infinite is a myth, he says, a fiction of philosophers who have not the modesty to confess that an atom can never understand the cosmos. He smiles at the debate over the finity or infinity of the universe, quite as if he foresaw the futile astro-mythology of physicists and mathematicians who debate the same question today. He refuses to express any opinion as to whether the world had a beginning or will have an end, whether the soul is the same as the body or distinct from it, whether even for the greatest saint there is to be any reward in any heaven. He calls such questions the jungle, the desert, the puppet show, the writhing, the entanglement of speculation, and will have nothing to do with them. They lead only to feverish disputation, personal resentments, and sorrow. They never lead to wisdom and peace. Saintliness and content lie not in knowledge of the universe and God, but simply in selfless and beneficent living. And then, with scandalous humor, he suggests that the gods themselves, if they existed, could not answer these questions. 
Once upon a time, Kevada, there occurred to a certain brother in this very company of the brethren a doubt on the following point. Where now do these four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, pass away, leaving no trace behind? So that brother worked himself into such a state of ecstasy that the way leading to the world of the gods became clear to his ecstatic vision. Then that brother, Kevada, went up to the realm of the four great kings and said to the gods thereof, Where, my friends, do the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind? And when he had thus spoken, the gods in the heaven of the four great kings said to him, We, brother, do not know that. But there are the four great kings, more potent and more glorious than we. They will know it. Then that brother Kavada went to the four great kings, and put the same question, and was sent on by a similar reply to the thirty-three, who sent him on to their king Saka, who sent him on to the Yama gods, who sent him on to their king Suyama, who sent him on to the Tusita gods, who sent him on to their king Santusita, who sent him on to the Nimanarati gods, who sent him on to their king Sunimata, who sent him on to the Paranimata Vasavati gods, who sent him on to their king Vasavati, who sent him on to the gods of the Brahma world. Then that brother, Kevada, became so absorbed by self-concentration that the way to the Brahma world became clear to his mind, thus pacified. And he drew near to the gods of the retinue of Brahma and said, Where, my friends, to the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind? And when he had thus spoken, the gods of the retinue of Brahma replied, We, brother, do not know that. But there is Brahma, the great Brahma, the supreme one, the mighty one, the all-seeing one, the ruler, the lord of all, the controller, the creator, the chief of all, the ancient of days, the father of all that are and are to be. He is more potent and more glorious than we. He will know it. Where then is that great Brahma now? We, brother, know not where Brahma is, nor why Brahma is, nor whence. But, brother, when the signs of his coming appear, when the light ariseth and the glory shineth, then will he be manifest, for that is the portent of the manifestation of Brahma when the light ariseth and the glory shineth. And it was not long, Kevada, before that great Brahma became manifest. And that brother drew near to him and said, Where, my friend, do the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind? And when he had thus spoken, that great Brahma said to him, I, brother, and the great Brahma, the supreme, the mighty, the all-seeing, the ruler, the lord of all, the controller, the creator, the chief of all, appointing each to his place, the ancient of days, the father of all that are and are to be. Then that brother answered Brahma and said, I did not ask you, friend, as to whether you were indeed all that you now say, but I ask you where the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind. Then again, Kevara, Brahma gave the same reply. And that brother yet a third time put to Brahma his question as before. Then, Kevada, the great Brahma took that brother and led him aside and said, These gods, the retinue of Brahma, hold me, brother, to be such that there is nothing I cannot see, nothing I have not understood, nothing I have not realized. Therefore I gave no answer in their presence. I do not know, brother, where those four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind. When some students remind him that the Brahmins claim to know the solutions of these problems, he laughs them off. There are, brethren, some recluses and Brahmins who wriggle like eels, and when a question is put to them on this or that, they resort to equivocation, to eel wriggling. If ever he is sharp, it is against the priests of his time. He scorns their assumption that the Vedas were inspired by the gods, and he scandalizes the caste-proud Brahmins by accepting into his order the members of any caste. He does not explicitly condemn the caste system, but he tells his disciples plainly enough, Go into all lands and preach this gospel. Tell them that the poor and the lowly, the rich and the high are all one, and that all castes unite in this religion as do the rivers in the sea. He denounces the notion of sacrificing to the gods, and looks with horror upon the slaughter of animals for these rites. He rejects all cult and worship of supernatural beings, all mantras and incantations, all asceticism and all prayer. Quietly and without controversy, he offers a religion absolutely free of dogma and priestcraft, and proclaims a way of salvation open to infidels and believers alike. At times this most famous of Hindu saints passes from agnosticism to outright atheism. He does not go out of his way to deny deity, and occasionally he speaks as if Brahma were a reality rather than an ideal nor does he forbid the popular worship of the gods. 
but he smiles at the notion of sending up prayers to the unknowable. It is foolish, he says, to suppose that another can cause us happiness or misery. These are always the product of our own behavior and our own desires. He refuses to rest his moral code upon supernatural sanctions of any kind. He offers no heaven, no purgatory, and no hell. He is too sensitive to the suffering and killing involved in the biological process to suppose that they have been consciously willed by a personal divinity. These cosmic blunders, he thinks, outweigh the evidences of design. In this scene of order and confusion, of good and evil, he finds no principle of permanence, no center of everlasting reality, but only a whirl and flux of obstinate life, in which the one metaphysical ultimate is change. As he proposes a theology without a deity, so he offers a psychology without a soul. He repudiates animism in every form, even in the case of man. He agrees with Heraclitus and Bergson about the world, and with Hume about the mind. All that we know is our sensations. Therefore, so far as we can see, all matter is force, all substance is motion. Life is change, a neutral stream of becoming and extinction. The soul is a myth which, for the convenience of our weak brains, we unwarrantably posit behind the flow of conscious states. This transcendental unity of apperception, this mind that weaves sensations and perceptions into thought, is a ghost. All that exists is the sensations and perceptions themselves, falling automatically into memories and ideas. Even the precious ego is not an entity distinct from these mental states. It is merely the continuity of these states, the remembrance of earlier by later states, together with the mental and moral habits, the dispositions and tendencies of the organism. The succession of these states is caused not by a mythical will superadded to them, but by the determinism of heredity, habit, environment, and circumstance. This fluid mind that is only mental states, this soul or ego that is only a character or prejudice formed by helpless inheritance and transient experience, can have no immortality in any sense that implies the continuance of the individual. Even the saint, even Buddha himself, will not, as a personality, survive death. But if this is so, how can there be rebirth? If there is no soul, how can it pass into other existences to be punished for the sins of this embodiment? Here is the weakest point in Buddha's philosophy. He never quite faces the contradiction between his rationalistic psychology and his uncritical acceptance of reincarnation. This belief is so universal in India that almost every Hindu accepts it as an axiom or assumption and hardly bothers to prove it. The brevity and multiplicity of the generations there suggests irresistibly the transmigration of vital force, or to speak theologically, of the soul. Buddha received the notion along with the air he breathed. It is the one thing that he seems never to have doubted. He took the wheel of rebirth and the law of karma for granted. His one thought was how to escape from that wheel, how to achieve nirvana here and annihilation hereafter. But what is nirvana? It is difficult to find an erroneous answer to this question. For the Master left the point obscure, and his followers have given the word every meaning under the sun. In general Sanskrit use, it meant extinguished, as of a lamp or fire. The Buddhist scriptures use it as signifying, one, a state of happiness attainable in this life through the complete elimination of selfish desires, two, the liberation of the individual from rebirth, three, the annihilation of the individual consciousness, four, the union of the individual with God, five, a heaven of happiness after death. In the teaching of Buddha, it seemed to mean the extinction of all individual desire and the reward of such selflessness, escape from rebirth. In Buddhist literature, the term has often a terrestrial sense, for the arhat or saint is repeatedly described as achieving it in this life by acquiring its seven constituent parts, self-possession, investigation into the truth, energy, calm, joy, concentration, and magnanimity. These are its content, but hardly its productive cause. The cause and source of nirvana is the extinction of selfish desire, and nirvana, in most early contexts, comes to mean the painless peace that rewards the moral annihilation of the self. Now, says Buddha, this is the noble truth as to the passing of pain. Verily, it is the passing away so that no passion remains, the giving up, the getting rid of, the emancipation from, the harboring no longer of this craving thirst, this fever of self-seeking desire. In the body of the Master's teaching it is almost always synonymous with bliss, 
the quiet content of the soul that no longer worries about itself. But complete nirvana includes annihilation. The reward of the highest saintliness is never to be reborn. In the end, says Buddha, we perceive the absurdity of moral and psychological individualism. Our fretting selves are not really separate beings and powers, but passing ripples on the stream of life, little knots forming and unraveling in the wind-blown mesh of fate. When we see ourselves as parts of a whole, when we reform ourselves and our desires in terms of the whole, then our personal disappointments and defeats, our varied suffering and inevitable death, no longer sadden us as bitterly as before. They are lost in the amplitude of infinity. When we have learned to love not our separate life, but all men and all living things, then at last we shall find peace. 5. The Last Days of Buddha His Miracles He Visits His Father's House The Buddhist Monks Death. From this exalted philosophy we pass to the simple legends which are all that we have concerning Buddha's later life and death. Despite his scorn of miracles, his disciples brewed a thousand tales of the marvels that he wrought. He wafted himself magically across the Ganges in a moment. The toothpick he had let fall sprouted into a tree. At the end of one of his sermons the thousandfold world system shook. When his enemy, Devadatta, sent a fierce elephant against him, Buddha pervaded it with love, and it was quite subdued. Arguing from such pleasantries, Senart and others have concluded that the legend of Buddha has been formed on the basis of ancient sun myths. It is unimportant. Buddha means for us the ideas attributed to Buddha in the Buddhist literature, and this Buddha exists. The Buddhist scriptures paint a pleasing picture of him. Many disciples gathered around him, and his fame as a sage spread through the cities of northern India. When his father heard that Buddha was near Kapilavastu, he sent a messenger to him with an invitation to come and spend a day in his boyhood home. He went, and his father, who had mourned the loss of a prince, rejoiced, for a while, over the return of a saint. Buddha's wife, who had been faithful to him during all their separation, fell down before him, clasped his ankles, placed his feet above her head, and reverenced him as a god. Then King Shuddhodana told Buddha of her great love. Lord, my daughter-in-law, when she heard that you were wearing yellow robes as a monk, put on yellow robes. When she heard of your having one meal a day, herself took one meal. When she knew that you had given up a large bed, she lay on a narrow couch. And when she knew that you had given up garlands and scents, she gave them up. Buddha blessed her and went his way. But now his son Rahula came to him and also loved him. Pleasant is your shadow ascetic, he said. Though Rahula's mother had hoped to see the youth made king, the master accepted him into the Buddhist order. Then another prince, Nanda, was called to be consecrated as heir apparent to the throne. But Nanda, as if in a trance, left the ceremony unfinished, abandoned the kingdom, and going to Buddha, asked that he too might be permitted to join the order. When King Shuddhodana heard of this, he was sad and asked a boon of Buddha. When the Lord abandoned the world, he said, it was no small pain to me. So when Nanda went, and even more so with Rahula, the love of a son cuts through the skin, through the hide, the flesh, the sinew, the marrow. Grant, Lord, that thy noble ones may not confer the ordination on a son without the permission of his father and mother. Buddha consented and made such permission a prerequisite to ordination. Already, it seems, this religion without priestcraft had developed an order of monks dangerously like the Hindu priests. Buddha would not be long dead before they would surround themselves with all the paraphernalia of the Brahmins. Indeed, it was from the ranks of the Brahmins that the first converts came, and then from the richest youth of Benares and the neighboring towns. These bhikkhus, or monks, practiced in Buddha's days a simple rule. They saluted one another and all those to whom they spoke with an admirable phrase, Peace to all beings. They were not to kill any living thing. They were never to take anything save what was given them. They were to avoid falsehood and slander. They were to heal divisions and encourage concord. They were always to show compassion for all men and all animals. They were to shun all amusements of sense or flesh, all music, nouch dances, shows, games, luxuries, idle conversation, argument, or fortune-telling. They were to have nothing to do with business or with any form of buying or selling. Above all, they were to abandon incontinence and live apart from women in perfect chastity. Yielding to many soft entreaties, Buddha allowed women to enter the order as nuns, but he never completely reconciled himself to this move. If Ananda, he said, Women had not received permission to enter the order. The pure religion would have lasted long. The good law would, would have stood fast a thousand years. But since they have received that permission, it will now stand fast for only five hundred years. He was right. The great order, or Sangha, has survived to our own time. 
but it has long since corrupted the master's doctrine with magic, polytheism, and countless superstitions. Towards the end of his long life, his followers already began to deify him, despite his challenge to them to doubt him and to think for themselves. Now, says one of the last dialogues, the venerable Sariputta came to the place where the exalted one was, and having saluted him, took his seat respectfully at his side, and said, Lord, such faith have I in the exalted one, that methinks there never has been, nor will there be, nor is there now any other, whether wanderer or Brahman, who is greater and wiser than the exalted one, as regards the higher wisdom. Great and bold are the words of thy mouth, Sariputta, answered the master. Verily, thou hast burst forth into a song of ecstasy. Of course, then, thou hast known all the exalted ones of the past, comprehending their minds with yours, and aware what their conduct was, what their wisdom, and what the emancipation they attained to. Not so, O Lord. Of course, then, thou hast perceived all the exalted ones of the future, comprehending their whole minds with yours. Not so, O Lord. But at least, then, O Sariputta, thou knowest me, and hast penetrated my mind. Not even that, O Lord. You see, then, Sariputta, that you know not the hearts of the able awakened ones of the past and of the future. Why, therefore, are your words so grand and bold? Why do you burst forth into such a song of ecstasy? And to Ananda he taught his greatest and noblest lesson. And whosoever, Ananda, either now or after I am dead, shall be a lamp unto themselves and a refuge unto themselves, shall betake themselves to no external refuge, but holding fast to the truth as their lamp, shall not look for refuge to any one besides themselves. It is they who shall reach the very topmost height, but they must be anxious to learn. He died in 483 B.C. at the age of eighty. Now then, O monks, he said to them as his last words, I address you, subject to decay are compound things. Strive with earnestness. Chapter 16 From Alexander to Aurangzeb 1. Chandragupta Alexander in India, Chandragupta the Liberator, the people, the University of Taxila, the Royal Palace, a day in the life of a king, an older Machiavelli, administration, law, public health, transport and roads, municipal government. In the year 327 B.C., Alexander the Great, pushing on from Persia, marched over the Hindu Kush and descended upon India. For a year he campaigned among the northwestern states that had formed one of the Persian Empire's richest provinces, exacting supplies for his troops and gold for his treasury. Early in 326 B.C. he crossed the Indus, fought his way slowly through Taxila and Rawalpindi to the south and east, encountered the army of King Porus, defeated 30,000 infantry, 4,000 cavalry, 300 chariots and 200 elephants, and slew 12,000 men. When Porus, having fought to the last, surrendered, Alexander, admiring his courage, stature and fine features, bade him say what treatment he wished to receive. "'Treat me, Alexander,' he answered, "'in a kingly way.' For my own sake, said Alexander, thou shalt be so treated. For thine own sake do thou demand what is pleasing to thee. But Porus said that everything was included in what he had asked. Alexander was much pleased with this reply. He made Porus king of all conquered India as a Macedonian tributary, and found him thereafter a faithful and energetic ally. Alexander wished then to advance even to the eastern sea, but his soldiers protested. After much oratory and pouting, he yielded to them, and led them, through patriotically hostile tribes that made his wearied troops fight almost every foot of the way, down the Hydaspes and up the coast through Gedrosia to Baluchistan. When he arrived at Susa, twenty months after turning back from his conquests, his army was but a miserable fragment of that which had crossed into India with him three years before. Seven years later, all trace of Macedonian authority had already disappeared from India. The chief agent of its removal was one of the most romantic figures in Indian history— a lesser warrior but a greater ruler than Alexander. Chandragupta was a young Kshatriya noble exiled from Magadha by the ruling Nanda family, to which he was related. Helped by his subtle Machiavellian adviser, Kautilya Chanakya, the youth organized a small army, overcame the Macedonian garrisons, and declared India free. Then he advanced upon Pataliputra, capital of the Magadha kingdom, fomented a revolution, seized the throne, and established that Mauryan dynasty which was to rule Hindustan and Afghanistan for 137 years. 
Subordinating his courage to Kautilya's unscrupulous wisdom, Chandragupta soon made his government the most powerful then existing in the world. When Megasthenes came to Pataliputra as ambassador from Seleucus Nicator, king of Syria, he was amazed to find a civilization which he described to the incredulous Greeks, still near their zenith, as entirely equal to their own. The Greek gave a pleasant, perhaps a lenient, account of Hindu life in his time. It struck him as a favorable contrast with his own nation that there was no slavery in India, that though the population was divided into castes according to occupations, it accepted these divisions as natural and tolerable. They live happily enough, the ambassador reported, being simple in their manners and frugal. They never drink wine except at sacrifice. The simplicity of their laws and their contracts is proved by the fact that they seldom go to law. They have no suits about pledges and deposits, nor do they require either seals or witnesses, but make their deposits and confide in each other. Truth and virtue they hold alike in esteem. The greater part of the soil is under irrigation, and consequently bears two crops in the course of the year. It is accordingly affirmed that famine has never visited India, and that there has never been a general scarcity in the supply of nourishing food. The oldest of the two thousand cities of northern India in Chandragupta's time was Taxila, twenty miles northwest of the modern Rawalpindi. Aryan describes it as a large and prosperous city. Strabo says it is large and has most excellent laws. It was both a military and a university town, strategically situated on the main road to Western Asia and containing the most famous of the several universities possessed by India at that time. Students flocked to Taxila as in the Middle Ages they flocked to Paris. There all the arts and sciences could be studied under eminent professors, and the medical school especially was held in high repute throughout the Oriental world. Megasthenes describes Chandragupta's capital, Pataliputra, as nine miles in length and almost two miles in width. The palace of the king was of timber, but the Greek ambassador ranked it as excelling the royal residences of Susa and Ecbatana, being surpassed only by those at Persepolis. Its pillars were plated with gold and ornamented with designs of bird life and foliage. Its interior was sumptuously furnished and adorned with precious metals and stones. There was a certain oriental ostentation in this culture, as in the use of gold vessels six feet in diameter. But an English historian concludes, from the testimony of the literary, pictorial, and material remains, that in the fourth and third centuries before Christ, the command of the Maria monarch over luxuries of all kinds and skilled craftsmanship and all the manual arts was not inferior to that enjoyed by the Mughal emperors eighteen centuries later. In this palace, Chandragupta, having won the throne by violence, lived for twenty-four years as in a gilded jail. Occasionally he appeared in public clad in fine muslin embroidered with purple and gold, and carried in a gold palanquin or on a gorgeously accoutred elephant. Except when he rode out to the hunt or otherwise amused himself, he found his time crowded with the business of his growing realm. His days were divided into sixteen periods of ninety minutes each. In the first he arose and prepared himself by meditation. In the second he studied the reports of his agents and issued secret instructions. The third he spent with his counselors in the hall of private audience. In the fourth he attended to state finances and national defense. In the fifth he heard the petitions and suits of his subjects. In the sixth he bathed and dined and read religious literature. In the seventh he received taxes and tribute and made official appointments. In the eighth he again met his counsel and heard the reports of his spies, including the courtesans whom he used for this purpose. The ninth he devoted to relaxation and prayer, the tenth and eleventh to military matters, the twelfth again to secret reports, the thirteenth to the evening bath and repast, the fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth, to sleep. Perhaps the historian tells us what Chandragupta might have been or how Kautilya wished the people to picture him, rather than what he really was. Truth does not often escape from palaces. The actual direction of government was in the hands of the crafty vizier. Kautilya was a Brahmin who knew the political value of religion, but took no moral guidance from it. Like our modern dictators, he believed that every means was justifiable if used in the service of the state. He was unscrupulous and treacherous, but never to his king. He served Chandragupta through exile, defeat, adventure, intrigue, murder, and victory, and by his wily wisdom made the empire of his master the greatest that India had ever known. Like the author of The Prince, Kautilya saw fit to preserve in writing his formulas for warfare and diplomacy. Tradition ascribes to him the Arthashastra, the oldest book in extant Sanskrit literature. As an example of its delicate realism, we may take its list of means for capturing a fort. Intrigue, spies, winning over the enemy's people, siege, and assault. 
a wise economy of physical effort. The government made no pretense to democracy and was probably the most efficient that India has ever had. Akbar, greatest of the Mughals, had nothing like it, and it may be doubted if any of the ancient Greek cities were better organized. It was based, frankly, upon military power. Chandragupta, if we may trust Megasthenes, who would be as suspect as any foreign correspondent, kept an army of 600,000 foot, 30,000 horse, 9,000 elephants, and an unnamed number of chariots. The peasantry and the Brahmins were exempt from military service, and Strabo describes the farmers tilling the soil in peace and security in the midst of war. The power of the king was theoretically unlimited, but in practice it was restricted by a council which, sometimes with the king, sometimes in his absence, initiated legislation, regulated national finances and foreign affairs, and appointed all the more important officers of state. Megasthenes testifies to the high character and wisdom of Chandragupta's counselors and to their effective power. The government was organized into departments with well-defined duties and a carefully graded hierarchy of officials, managing respectively revenue, customs, frontiers, passports, communications, excise, mines, agriculture, cattle, commerce, warehouses, navigation, forests, public games, prostitution, and the mint. The superintendent of excise controlled the sale of drugs and intoxicating drinks, restricted the number and location of taverns, and the quantity of liquors which they might sell. The superintendent of mines leased mining areas to private persons, who paid a fixed rent and a share of the profits to the government. A similar system applied to agriculture, for all the land was owned by the state. The superintendent of public games supervised the gambling halls, supplied dice, charged a fee for their use, and gathered in for the treasury five percent of all money taken in by the bank. The superintendent of prostitution looked after public women, controlled their charges and expenditures, appropriated their earnings for two days of each month, and kept two of them in the royal palace for entertainment and intelligence service. Taxes fell upon every profession, occupation, and industry. And in addition, rich men were from time to time persuaded to make benevolences to the king. The government regulated prices and periodically assayed weights and measures. It carried on some manufactures in state factories, sold vegetables, and kept a monopoly of mines, salt, timber, fine fabrics, horses, and elephants. Law was administered in the village by local headmen or by panchayats, village councils of five men. In towns, districts, and provinces, by inferior and superior courts, at the capital by the royal council as a supreme court, and by the king as a court of last appeal. Penalties were severe and included mutilation, torture, and death, usually on the principle of lex talionis or equivalent retaliation. But the government was no mere engine of repression. It attended to sanitation and public health, maintained hospitals and poor relief stations, distributed in famine years the food kept in state warehouses for such emergencies, forced the rich to contribute to the assistance of the destitute, and organized great public works to care for the unemployed in depression years. The Department of Navigation regulated water transport and protected travelers on rivers and seas. It maintained bridges and harbors and provided government ferries in addition to those that were privately managed and owned, an admirable arrangement whereby public competition could check private plunder and private competition could discourage official extravagance. The Department of Communications built and repaired roads throughout the empire from the narrow wagon tracks of the villages to trade routes 32 feet and royal roads 64 feet wide. One of these imperial highways extended 1,200 miles from Pataliputra to the northwestern frontier, a distance equal to half the transcontinental spread of the United States. At approximately every mile, says Megasthenes, these roads were marked with pillars indicating directions and distances to various destinations. Shade trees, wells, police stations, and hotels were provided at regular intervals along the route. Transport was by chariots, palanquins, bullock carts, horses, camels, elephants, asses, and men. Elephants were a luxury usually confined to royalty and officialdom, and so highly valued that a woman's virtue was thought a moderate price to pay for one of them. The same method of departmental administration was applied to the government of the cities. Pataliputra was ruled by a commission of thirty men divided into six groups. One group regulated industry, another supervised strangers, assigning to them lodgings and attendance and watching their movements. Another kept a record of births and deaths. Another licensed merchants, regulated the sale of produce, and tested measures and weights. Another controlled the sale of manufactured articles. Another collected a tax of ten percent on all sales. In short, says Havel, 
Pataliputra in the 4th century BC seems to have been a thoroughly well-organized city and administered according to the best principles of social science. The perfection of the arrangements thus indicated, says Vincent Smith, is astonishing, even when exhibited in outline. Examination of the departmental details increases our wonder that such an organization could have been planned and efficiently operated in India in 300 B.C. The one defect of this government was autocracy and therefore continual dependence upon force and spies. Like every autocrat, Chandragupta held his power precariously, always fearing revolt and assassination. Every night he used a different bedroom, and always he was surrounded by guards. Hindu tradition, accepted by European historians, tells how when a long famine, Pache Megasthenes, came upon his kingdom, Chandragupta, in despair at his helplessness, abdicated his throne, lived for twelve years thereafter as a giant ascetic, and then starved himself to death. All things considered, said Voltaire, the life of a gondolier is preferable to that of a doja, but I believe the difference is so trifling that it is not worth the trouble of examining. 2. The Philosopher King, Ashoka, the Edict of Tolerance, Ashoka's missionaries, his failure, his success. Chandragupta's successor, Bindusara, was apparently a man of some intellectual inclination. He is said to have asked Antiochus, king of Syria, to make him a present of a Greek philosopher. For a real Greek philosopher, wrote Bindusara, he would pay a high price. The proposal could not be complied with since Antiochus found no philosophers for sale, but chance atoned by giving Bindusara a philosopher for his son. Ashoka Vardhana mounted the throne in 273 B.C. He found himself ruler of a vaster empire than any Indian monarch before him. Afghanistan, Baluchistan, and all of modern India but the extreme south, Tamilakam, or Tamil land. For a time he governed in the spirit of his grandfather Chandragupta, cruelly but well. Yuan Chuang, a Chinese traveler who spent many years in India in the 7th century A.D., tells us that the prison maintained by Ashoka north of the capital was still remembered in Hindu tradition as Ashoka's hell. There, said his informants, all the tortures of any orthodox inferno had been used in the punishment of criminals, to which the king added an edict that no one who entered that dungeon should ever come out of it alive. But one day, a Buddhist saint, imprisoned there without cause, and flung into a cauldron of hot water, refused to boil. The jailer sent word to Ashoka, who came, saw, and marveled. When the king turned to leave, the jailer reminded him that according to his own edict he must not leave the prison alive. The king admitted the force of the remark and ordered the jailer to be thrown into the cauldron. On returning to his palace, Ashoka, we are told, underwent a profound conversion. This book is continued on Cassette 13, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant, continued, Cassette 13, Side 1. On returning to his palace, Ashoka, we are told, underwent a profound conversion. He gave instructions that the prison should be demolished and that the penal code should be made more lenient. At the same time, he learned that his troops had won a great victory over the rebellious Kalinga tribe, had slaughtered thousands of the rebels, and had taken many prisoners. Ashoka was moved to remorse at the thought of all this violence, slaughter, and separation of captives from those whom they love. He ordered the prisoners freed, restored their lands to the Kalingas, and sent them a message of apology which had no precedents and has had few imitations. Then he joined the Buddhist order, wore for a time the garb of a monk, gave up hunting and the eating of meat, and entered upon the Eightfold Noble Way. It is at present impossible to say how much of this is myth and how much is history, nor can we discern at this distance the motives of the king. Perhaps he saw the growth of Buddhism and thought that its code of generosity and peace might provide a convenient regimen for his people, saving countless policemen. In the eleventh year of his reign, he began to issue the most remarkable edicts in the history of government, and commanded that they should be carved upon rocks and pillars in simple phrase and local dialects, so that any literate Hindu might be able to understand them. The rock edicts have been found in almost every part of India. Of the pillars, ten remain in place, and the position of twenty others has been determined. In these edicts we find the emperor accepting the Buddhist faith completely, and applying it resolutely throughout the last sphere of human affairs in which we should have expected to find it, statesmanship. It is as if some modern empire had suddenly announced that henceforth it would practice Christianity. 
Though these edicts are Buddhist, they will not seem to us entirely religious. They assume a future life and thereby suggest how soon the skepticism of Buddha had been replaced by the faith of his followers. But they express no belief in, make no mention of, a personal god. Neither is there any word in them about Buddha. The edicts are not interested in theology. The Sarnath edict asks for harmony within the church and prescribes penalties for those who weaken it with schism. But other edicts repeatedly enjoin religious tolerance. One must give alms to Brahmins as well as to Buddhist priests. One must not speak ill of other men's faiths. The king announces that all his subjects are his beloved children and that he will not discriminate against any of them because of their diverse creeds. Rock Edict 12 speaks with almost contemporary pertinence. His sacred and gracious majesty the king does reverence to men of all sects, whether ascetics or householders, by gifts and various forms of reverence. His sacred majesty, however, cares not so much for gifts or external reverence as that there should be a growth of the essence of the matter in all sects. The growth of the essence of the matter assumes various forms, but the root of it is restraint of speech. To wit, a man must not do reverence to his own sect or disparage that of another without reason. Depreciation should be for specific reasons only because the sects of other people all deserve reverence for some reason or another. By thus acting, a man exalts his own sect and at the same time does service to the sects of other people. By acting contrariwise, a man hurts his own sect and does disservice to the sects of other people. Concord is meritorious. The essence of the matter is explained more clearly in the second pillar edict. The law of piety is excellent, but wherein consists the law of piety? In these things, to wit, little impiety, many good deeds, compassion, liberality, truthfulness, purity. To set an example, Ashoka ordered his officials everywhere to regard the people as his children, to treat them without impatience or harshness, never to torture them, and never to imprison them without good cause. And he commanded the officials to read these instructions periodically to the people. Did these moral edicts have any result in improving the conduct of the people? Perhaps they had something to do with spreading the idea of ahimsa and encouraging abstinence from meat and alcoholic drinks among the upper classes of India. Ashoka himself had all the confidence of a reformer in the efficacy of his petrified sermons. In Rock Edict 4, he announces that marvelous results have already appeared, and his summary gives us a clearer conception of his doctrine. Now, by reason of the practice of piety by his sacred and gracious majesty the king, the reverberation of the war drums has become the reverberation of the law. As for many years before has not happened, now, by reason of the inculcation of the law of piety by his sacred and gracious majesty the king, there is increased abstention from the sacrificial slaughter of living creatures, abstention from the killing of animate beings, seemly behavior to relatives, seemly behavior to Brahmins, hearkening to father and mother, hearkening to elders. Thus, as in many other ways, the practice of the law of piety has increased, and his sacred and gracious majesty the king will make such practice of the law increase further. The sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons of his sacred and gracious majesty the king will cause this practice of the law to increase until the eon of universal destruction. The good king exaggerated the piety of men and the loyalty of sons. He himself labored arduously for the new religion. He made himself head of the Buddhist church, lavished gifts upon it, built 84,000 monasteries for it, and in its name established throughout his kingdom hospitals for men and animals. He sent Buddhist missionaries to all parts of India and Ceylon, even to Syria, Egypt, and Greece, where perhaps they helped to prepare for the ethics of Christ. And shortly after his death, missionaries left India to preach the gospel of Buddha in Tibet, China, Mongolia, and Japan. In addition to this activity in religion, Ashoka gave himself zealously to the secular administration of his empire. His days of labor were long, and he kept himself available to his aides for public business at all hours. His outstanding fault was egotism. It is difficult to be at once modest and a reformer. His self-respect shines out in every edict and makes him more completely the brother of Marcus Aurelius. He failed to perceive that the Brahmins hated him and only bided their time to destroy him, as the priests of Thebes had destroyed Ignaton a thousand years before. Not only the Brahmins, who had been given to slaughtering animals for themselves and their gods, but many thousands of hunters and fishermen resented the edicts that set such severe limitations upon the taking of animal life. Even the peasants growled at the command that chaff must not be set on fire along with the living things in it. 
Half the empire waited hopefully for Ashoka's death. Yuan Chuang tells us that according to Buddhist tradition, Ashoka in his last years was deposed by his grandson, who acted with the aid of court officials. Gradually, all power was taken from the old king, and his gifts to the Buddhist church came to an end. Ashoka's own allowance of goods, even of food, was cut down, until one day his whole portion was half an amalaka fruit. The king gazed upon it sadly, and then sent it to his Buddhist brethren, as all that he had to give. But in truth we know nothing of his later years, not even the year of his death. Within a generation after his passing, his empire, like Ignatan's, crumbled to pieces. As it became evident that the sovereignty of the kingdom of Magadha was maintained rather by the inertia of tradition than by the organization of force, state after state renounced its adherence to the king of kings at Pataliputra. Descendants of Ashoka continued to rule Magadha till the seventh century after Christ, but the Maurya dynasty that Chandragupta had founded came to an end when King Brihadrata was assassinated. States are built not on the ideals, but on the nature of men. In the political sense, Ashoka had failed. In another sense, he had accomplished one of the greatest tasks in history. Within two hundred years after his death, Buddhism had spread throughout India and was entering upon the bloodless conquest of Asia. If to this day, from Kandy in Ceylon to Kamakura in Japan, the placid face of Gautama bids men be gentle to one another and love peace, it is partly because a dreamer, perhaps a saint, once held the throne of India. 3. The Golden Age of India An Epoch of Invasions, the Kushan Kings, the Gupta Empire, the Travels of Fa Hien, the Revival of Letters, the Huns in India, Harsha the Generous, the Travels of Yuan Chuang. From the death of Ashoka to the Empire of the Guptas, that is, for a period of almost six hundred years, Hindu inscriptions and documents are so few that the history of this interval is lost in obscurity. It was not necessarily a dark age. Great universities like those at Taxila continued to function, and in the northwestern portion of India the influence of Persia in architecture and of Greece in sculpture produced a flourishing civilization in the wake of Alexander's invasion. In the first and second centuries before Christ, Syrians, Greeks, and Scythians poured down into the Punjab, conquered it, and established there for some three hundred years this Greco-Bactrian culture. In the first century of what we so provincially call the Christian era, the Kushans, a Central Asian tribe akin to the Turks, captured Kabul, and from that city as capital extended their power throughout northwestern India and most of Central Asia. In the reign of their greatest king, Kanishka, the arts and sciences progressed. Greco-Buddhist sculpture produced some of its fairest masterpieces. Fine buildings were reared in Peshawar, Taxila, and Mathura. Charaka advanced the art of medicine, and Nagarajuna and Ashvagosha laid the bases of that Mahayana, greater vehicle Buddhism, which was to help Gautama to win China and Japan. Kanishka tolerated many religions and experimented with various gods. Finally, he chose the new mythological Buddhism that had made Buddha into a deity and had filled the skies with bodhisattvas and arhats. He called a great council of Buddhist theologians to formulate this creed for his realms and became almost a second Ashoka in spreading the Buddhist faith. The council composed 300,000 sutras, lowered Buddha's philosophy to the emotional needs of the common soul, and raised him to divinity. Meanwhile, Chandragupta I quite distinct, despite his name and number, from Chandragupta Maurya, had established in Magadha the Gupta dynasty of native kings. His successor, Samudra Gupta, in a reign of fifty years, made himself one of the foremost monarchs in India's long history. He changed his capital from Pataliputra to Ayodhya, ancient home of the legendary Rama, sent his conquering armies and tax-gatherers into Bengal, Assam, Nepal, and southern India, and spent the treasure brought to him from vassal states in promoting literature, science, religion, and the arts. He himself, in the interludes of war, achieved distinction as a poet and a musician. His son, Vikramaditya, son of power, extended these conquests of arms and the mind, supported the great dramatist Kalidasa, and gathered a brilliant circle of poets, philosophers, artists, scientists, and scholars about him in his capital at Ujjain. Under these two kings, India reached a height of development unsurpassed since Buddha, and a political unity rivaled only under Ashoka and Akbar. 
We discern some outline of Gupta civilization from the account that Fa Hien gave of his visit to India at the opening of the 5th century of our era. He was one of many Buddhists who came from China to India during this golden age, and these pilgrims were probably less numerous than the merchants and ambassadors, who, despite her mountain barriers, now entered pacified India from east and west, even from distant Rome, and brought to her a stimulating contact with foreign customs and ideas. Fa Hien, after risking his life in passing through western China, found himself quite safe in India, traveling everywhere without encountering molestation or thievery. His journal tells how he took six years in coming, spent six years in India, and needed three years more for his return via Ceylon and Java to his Chinese home. He describes with admiration the wealth and prosperity, the virtue and happiness of the Hindu people, and the social and religious liberty which they enjoyed. He was astonished at the number, size, and population of the great cities, at the free hospitals and other charitable institutions which dotted the land, at the number of students in the universities and monasteries, at the imposing scale and splendor of the imperial palaces. His description is quite utopian, except for the matter of right hands. The people are numerous and happy. They have not to register their households or attend to any magistrates or their rules. Only those who cultivate the royal land have to pay a portion of the gain from it. If they want to go, they go. If they want to stay, they stay. The king governs without decapitation or corporal punishments. Criminals are simply fined. Even in cases of repeated attempts at wicked rebellion, they only have their right hands cut off. Throughout the whole country, the people do not kill any living creature, nor eat onions or garlic. The only exception is that of the Chandalas. In that country, they do not keep pigs and fowls and do not sell live cattle. In the markets, there are no butchers' shops and no dealers in intoxicating drinks. Fa Hien hardly noted that the Brahmins, who had been in disfavor with the Mauryan dynasty since Ashoka, were growing again in wealth and power under the tolerant rule of the Gupta kings. They had revived the religious and literary traditions of pre-Buddhist days and were developing Sanskrit into the Esperanto of scholars throughout India. It was under their influence and the patronage of the court that the great Hindu epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, were written down into their present form. Under this dynasty, too, Buddhist art reached its zenith in the frescoes of the Ajanta Caves. In the judgment of a contemporary Hindu scholar, the mere names of Kalidasa and Varaha Mihira, Gunavarman and Vashubandhu, Aryabhata and Brahmagupta, are sufficient to mark this epoch as an apogee of Indian culture. An impartial historian, says Havel, might well consider that the greatest triumph of British administration would be to restore to India all that she enjoyed in the 5th century A.D. This heyday of native culture was interrupted by a wave of those Hun invasions which now overran both Asia and Europe, ruining for a time India as well as Rome. While Attila was raiding Europe, Toromana was capturing Malwa, and the terrible Mahiragula was hurling the Gupta rulers from their throne. For a century, India relapsed into bondage and chaos. Then, a scion of the Gupta line, Harsha Vardhana, recaptured northern India, built a capital at Kanauj, and for forty-two years gave peace and security to a wide realm in which once more native arts and letters flourished. We may conjecture the size, splendor, and prosperity of Kanauj from the one unbelievable item that when the Moslems sacked it, in 1018 A.D., they destroyed 10,000 temples. Its fine public gardens and free bathing tanks were but a small part of the beneficence of the new dynasty. Harsha himself was one of those rare kings who make monarchy appear, for a time, the most admirable of all forms of government. He was a man of personal charm and accomplishments, writing poetry and dramas that are read in India to this day. But he did not allow these foibles to interfere with the competent administration of his kingdom. He was indefatigable, says Yuan Chuang, and the day was too short for him. He forgot sleep in his devotion to good works. Having begun as a worshipper of Shiva, he was later converted to Buddhism and became another Ashoka in his pious benefactions. He forbade the eating of animal food, established travelers' rests throughout his domain, and erected thousands of topes or Buddhist shrines on the banks of the Ganges. Yuan Chuang, most famous of the Chinese Buddhists who visited India, tells us that Harsha proclaimed every five years a great festival of charity, to which he invited all officials of all religions and all the poor and needy of the realm. At this gathering it was his custom to give away in public alms all the surplus brought into the state treasury since the last quinquennial feast. 
Yuan was surprised to see a great quantity of gold, silver, coins, jewelry, fine fabrics, and delicate brocades piled up in an open square, surrounded by a hundred pavilions, each seating a thousand persons. Three days were given to religious exercises. On the fourth day, if we may believe the incredible pilgrim, the distribution began. Ten thousand Buddhist monks were fed, and each received a pearl, garments, flowers, perfumes, and one hundred pieces of gold. Then the Brahmins were given alms almost as abundant, then the Jains, then other sects, then all the poor and orphaned laity that had come from every quarter of the kingdom. Sometimes the distribution lasted three or four months. At the end, Harsha divested himself of his costly robes and jewelry and added them to the alms. The memoirs of Yuan Chuang reveal a certain theological exhilaration as the mental spirit of the age. It is a pleasant picture and significant of India's repute in other lands. This Chinese aristocrat leaving his comforts and perquisites in far-off Chang'an, passing across half-civilized western China, through Tashkent and Samarkand, then a flourishing city, over the Himalayas into India, and then studying zealously for three years in the monastic university at Nalanda. His fame as a scholar and a man of rank brought him many invitations from the princes of India. When Harsha heard that Yuan was at the court of Kumara, king of Assam, he summoned Kumara to come with Yuan to Kanauj. Kumara refused, saying that Harsha could have his head, but not his guest. Harsha answered, I trouble you for your head, and Kumara came. Harsha was fascinated by Yuan's learning and fine manners, and called a convocation of Buddhist notables to hear Yuan expound the Mahayana doctrine. Yuan nailed his theses to the gateway of the pavilion in which the discourse was to be held, and added a postscript in the manner of the day. If anyone here can find a single wrong argument and can refute it, I will let him cut off my head. The discussion lasted eighteen days, but Yuan, Yuan reports, answered all objections and confounded all heretics. Another account has it that his opponents ended the conference by setting fire to the pavilion. After many adventures, Yuan found his way back to Chang'an, where an enlightened emperor enshrined in a rich temple the Buddhist relics which this holy polo had brought with him, and gave him a corps of scholars to help translate the manuscripts that he had purchased in India. All the glory of Harsha's rule, however, was artificial and precarious, for it depended upon the ability and generosity of a mortal king. When he died, a usurper seized the throne and illustrated the nether side of monarchy. Chaos ensued and continued for almost a thousand years. India, like Europe, now suffered her Middle Ages, was overrun by barbarians, was conquered, divided, and despoiled. Not until the great Akbar would she know peace and unity again. 4. Annals of Rajputana the Samurai of India, the Age of Chivalry, the Fall of Chitor. This dark age was lighted up for a moment by the epic of Rajputana. Here, in the states of Mewar, Marwar, Amber, Bikaner, and many others of melodious name, a people half native in origin and half descended from invading Scythians and Huns, had built a feudal civilization under the government of warlike Rajas, who cared more for the art of life than for the life of art. They began by acknowledging the suzerainty of the Mauryas and the Guptas. They ended by defending their independence and all India from the inroads of Moslem hordes. Their clans were distinguished by a military ardor and courage not usually associated with India. If we may trust their admiring historian, Todd, every man of them was a dauntless Kshatriya, and every woman among them was a heroine. Their very name, Rajputs, meant sons of kings. And if sometimes they called their land Rajasthan, it was to designate it as the home of royalty. All the nonsense and glamour, all the bravery, loyalty, beauty, feuds, poisons, assassinations, wars, and subjection of woman, which are traditions attached to the age of chivalry, can be found in the annals of these plucky states. The Rajput chieftains, says Todd, were imbued with all the kindred virtues of the Western cavalier, and far his superior in mental attainments. They had lovely women for whom they did not hesitate to die, and who thought it only a matter of courtesy to accompany their husbands to the grave by the right of sati. Some of these women were educated and refined, some of the Rajas were poets or scientists, and for a while a delicate genre of watercolor painting flourished among them in the medieval Persian style. For four centuries they grew in wealth until they could spend twenty million dollars on the coronation of Mewar's king. It was their pride and their tragedy that they enjoyed war as the highest art of all, the only one befitting a Rajput gentleman. This military spirit enabled them to defend themselves against the Moslems with historic valor, 
but it kept their little states so divided and weakened with strife that not all their bravery could preserve them in the end. Todd's account of the fall of Chitor, one of the Rajput capitals, is as romantic as any legend of Arthur or Charlemagne. And indeed, since it is based solely upon native historians too faithful to their fatherland to be in love with the truth, these marvelous annals of Rajasthan may be as legendary as Le Mort d'Arthur or Le Chanson de Roland. In this version, the Mohammedan invader, Alau de Din, wanted not Chitor but the Princess Pudmini, a title bestowed only on the superlatively fair. The Moslem chieftain proposed to raise the siege if the regent of Chitor would surrender the princess. Being refused, Alau de Din agreed to withdraw if he were allowed to see Pudmini. Finally, he consented to depart if he might see Pudmini in a mirror, but this too was denied him. Instead, the women of Chitor joined in defending their city, and when the Rajputs saw their wives and daughters dying beside them, they fought until every man of them was dead. When Alau de Din entered the capital, he found no sign of human life within its gates. All the males had died in battle, and their wives, in the awful rite known as the Johur, had burned themselves to death. 5. The Zenith of the South The Kingdoms of the Deccan Vijayanagar Krishnaraya A Medieval Metropolis Laws, Arts, Religion, Tragedy As the Moslems advanced into India, native culture receded farther and farther south. And towards the end of these Middle Ages, the finest achievements of Hindu civilization were those of the Deccan. For a time, the Chalyuka tribe maintained an independent kingdom reaching across central India and achieved, under Pula Keshin II, sufficient power and glory to defeat Harsha, to attract Yuan Chuang, and to receive a respectful embassy from Khosru II of Persia. It was in Pula Keshin's reign and territory that the greatest of Indian paintings, the frescoes of Ajanta, were completed. Pula Keshin was overthrown by the king of the Pallavas, who for a brief period became the supreme power in central India. In the extreme south, and as early as the first century after Christ, the Pandyas established a realm comprising Madura, Tinaveli, and parts of Travancore. They made Madura one of the finest of medieval Hindu cities and adorned it with a gigantic temple and a thousand lesser works of architectural art. In their turn they too were overthrown, first by the Cholas, and then by the Mohammedans. The Cholas ruled the region between Madura and Madras, and thence westward to Mysore. They were of great antiquity, being mentioned in the edicts of Ashoka, but we know nothing of them until the ninth century, when they began a long career of conquest that brought them tribute from all southern India, even from Ceylon. Then their power waned, and they passed under the control of the greatest of the southern states, Vijayanagar. Vijayanagar, the name both of a kingdom and of its capital, is a melancholy instance of forgotten glory. In the years of its grandeur, it comprised all the present native states of the lower peninsula, together with Mysore and the entire presidency of Madras. We may judge of its power and resources by considering that King Krishnaraya led forth to battle at Talakota 703,000 foot, 32,600 horse, 551 elephants and some hundred thousand merchants, prostitutes, and other camp followers, such as were then wont to accompany an army in its campaigns. The autocracy of the king was softened by a measure of village autonomy and by the occasional appearance of an enlightened and human monarch on the throne. Krishnaraya, who ruled Vijayanagar in the days of Henry VIII, compares favorably with that constant lover. He led a life of justice and courtesy, gave abounding alms, tolerated all Hindu faiths, enjoyed and supported literature and the arts, forgave fallen enemies and spared their cities, and devoted himself sedulously to the chores of administration. A Portuguese missionary, Domingos Paix, 1522, describes him as the most feared and perfect king that could possibly be, cheerful of disposition and very merry. He is one that seeks to honor foreigners and receives them kindly. He is a great ruler and a man of much justice, but subject to sudden fits of rage. He is by rank a greater lord than any, by reason of what he possesses in armies and territories, but it seems that he has in fact nothing compared to what a man like him ought to have, so gallant and perfect is he in all things. The capital, founded in 1336, was probably the richest city that India had yet known. Niccolo Conti, visiting it about 1420, estimated its circumference at sixty miles. Paish pronounced it as large as Rome and very beautiful to the sight. There were, he added, many groves of trees within it and many conduits of water, for its engineers had constructed a huge dam on the Tungabhadra River, 
and had formed a reservoir from which water was conveyed to the city by an aqueduct fifteen miles long, cut for several miles out of the solid rock. Abdur Razak, who saw the city in 1443, reported it as, such that eye has not seen nor ear heard of any place resembling it upon the whole earth. Paish considered it the best provided city in the world, for in this one everything abounds. The houses, he tells us, numbered over a hundred thousand, implying a population of half a million souls. He marvels at a palace in which one room was built entirely of ivory. It is so rich and beautiful that you would hardly find anywhere another such. When Firoz Shah, Sultan of Delhi, married the daughter of Vijayanagar's king in the latter's capital, the road was spread for six miles with velvet, satin, cloth of gold, and other costly stuffs. However, every traveler is a liar. Underneath this wealth, a population of serfs and laborers lived in poverty and superstition, subject to a code of laws that preserved some commercial morality by a barbarous severity. Punishment ranged from mutilation of hands or feet to casting a man to the elephants, cutting off his head, impaling him alive by a stake thrust through his belly, or hanging him on a hook under his chin until he died. Rape as well as large-scale theft was punished in this last way. Prostitution was permitted, regulated, and turned into royal revenue. Opposite the mint, says Abdur Razak, is the office of the prefect of the city, to which it is said twelve thousand policemen are attached, and their pay is derived from the proceeds of the brothels. The splendor of these houses, the beauty of the heart-ravishers, their blandishments and ogles are beyond all description. Women were of subject status, and were expected to kill themselves on the death of their husbands, sometimes by allowing themselves to be buried alive. Under the rayas or kings of Vijayanagar, literature prospered, both in classical Sanskrit and in the Telugu dialect of the South. Krishna Raya was himself a poet, as well as a liberal patron of letters, and his poet laureate, Alasani Pedana, is ranked among the highest of India's singers. Painting and architecture flourished, enormous temples were built, and almost every foot of their surface was carved into statuary or bas-relief. Buddhism had lost its hold, and the form of Brahmanism that especially honored Vishnu had become the faith of the people. The cow was holy and was never killed, but many species of cattle and fowl were sacrificed to the gods and eaten by the people. Religion was brutal, and manners were refined. In one day all this power and luxury were destroyed. Slowly the conquering Moslems had made their way south. Now the sultans of Bijapur, Ahmadnagar, Golconda, and Bidar united their forces to reduce this last stronghold of the native Hindu kings. Their combined armies met Rama Raja's half-million men at Talakota. The superior numbers of the attackers prevailed. Rama Raja was captured and beheaded in the sight of his followers, and these losing courage fled. Nearly a hundred thousand of them were slain in the retreat, until all the streams were colored with their blood. The conquering troops plundered the wealthy capital, and found the booty so abundant that every private man in the Allied army became rich in gold, jewels, effects, tents, arms, horses, and slaves. For five months the plunder continued. The victors slaughtered the helpless inhabitants in indiscriminate butchery, emptied the stores and shops, smashed the temples and palaces, and labored at great pains to destroy all the statuary and painting in the city. Then they went through the streets with flaming torches and set fire to all that would burn. When at last they retired, Vijayanagar was as completely ruined as if an earthquake had visited it and had left not a stone upon a stone. It was a destruction ferocious and absolute, typifying that terrible Moslem conquest of India which had begun a thousand years before and was now complete. 6. The Moslem Conquest The Weakening of India Mahmud of Ghazni the Sultanate of Delhi, its cultural asides, its brutal policy, the lesson of Indian history. The Mohammedan conquest of India is probably the bloodiest story in history. It is a discouraging tale, for its evident moral is that civilization is a precarious thing, whose delicate complex of order and liberty, culture and peace, may at any time be overthrown by barbarians invading from without or multiplying within. The Hindus had allowed their strength to be wasted on internal division and war. They had adopted religions like Buddhism and Jainism, which unnerved them for the tasks of life. They had failed to organize their forces for the protection of their frontiers and their capitals, their wealth and their freedom, from the hordes of Scythians, Huns, Afghans, and Turks hovering about India's boundaries and waiting for national weakness to let them in. For 400 years, 600 to 1000 AD, India invited conquest, and at last it came. 
The first Muslim attack was a passing raid upon Multan in the western Punjab in 664 AD. Similar raids occurred at the convenience of the invaders during the next three centuries, with the result that the Muslims established themselves in the Indus Valley about the same time that their Arab co-religionists in the west were fighting the Battle of Tours, 732 AD, for the mastery of Europe. But the real Muslim conquest of India did not come until the turn of the first millennium after Christ. In the year 997, a Turkish chieftain by the name of Mahmud became sultan of the little state of Ghazni in eastern Afghanistan. Mahmud knew that his throne was young and poor, and saw that India across the border was old and rich. The conclusion was obvious. Pretending a holy zeal for destroying Hindu idolatry, he swept across the frontier with a force inspired by a pious aspiration for booty. He met the unprepared Hindus at Bimnagar, slaughtered them, pillaged their cities, destroyed their temples, and carried away the accumulated treasures of centuries. Returning to Ghazni, he astonished the ambassadors of foreign powers by displaying jewels and unbored pearls and rubies shining like sparks or like wine congealed with ice, and emeralds like fresh sprigs of myrtle, and diamonds in size and weight like pomegranates. Each winter Mahmud descended into India, filled his treasure chest with spoils, and amused his men with full freedom to pillage and kill. Each spring he returned to his capital richer than before. At Mathura, on the Jumna, he took from the temple its statues of gold encrusted with precious stones, and emptied its coffers of a vast quantity of gold, silver, and jewelry. He expressed his admiration for the architecture of the great shrine, judged that its duplication would cost one hundred million dinars and the labor of two hundred years, and then ordered it to be soaked with naphtha and burned to the ground. Six years later he sacked another opulent city of northern India, Somnath, killed all of its fifty thousand inhabitants, and dragged its wealth to Ghazni. In the end he became perhaps the richest king that history has ever known. Sometimes he spared the population of the ravaged cities and took them home to be sold as slaves. But so great was the number of such captives that after some years no one could be found to offer more than a few shillings for a slave. Before every important engagement, Mahmud knelt in prayer and asked the blessing of God upon his arms. He reigned for a third of a century, and when he died full of years and honors, Muslim historians ranked him as the greatest monarch of his time, and one of the greatest sovereigns of any age. Seeing the canonization that success had brought to this magnificent thief, other Muslim rulers profited by his example, though none succeeded in bettering his instruction. In 1186 the Guri, a Turkish tribe of Afghanistan, invaded India, captured the city of Delhi, destroyed its temples, confiscated its wealth, and settled down in its palaces to establish the Sultanate of Delhi. An alien despotism fastened upon northern India for three centuries, and checked only by assassination and revolt. The first of these bloody sultans, Qutub din Aibak, was a normal specimen of his kind, fanatical, ferocious, and merciless. His gifts, as the Mohammedan historian tells us, were bestowed by hundreds of thousands, and his slaughters likewise were by hundreds of thousands. In one victory of this warrior, who had been purchased as a slave, fifty thousand men came under the collar of slavery, and the plain became black as pitch with Hindus. Another sultan, Balban punished rebels and brigands by casting them under the feet of elephants, or removing their skins, stuffing these with straw, and hanging them from the gates of Delhi. When some Mongol inhabitants who had settled in Delhi and had been converted to Islam attempted a rising, Sultan Alauddin, the conqueror of Chitor, had all the males, from fifteen to thirty thousand of them, slaughtered in one day. Sultan Mohammed bin Tughlaq, acquired the throne by murdering his father, became a great scholar and an elegant writer, dabbled in mathematics, physics, and Greek philosophy, surpassed his predecessors in bloodshed and brutality, fed the flesh of a rebel nephew to the rebel's wife and children, ruined the country with reckless inflation, and laid it waste with pillage and murder till the inhabitants fled to the jungle. He killed so many Hindus that, in the words of a Muslim historian, there was constantly in front of his royal pavilion and his civil court a mound of dead bodies and a heap of corpses, while the sweepers and executioners were wearied out by their work of dragging the victims and putting them to death in crowds. In order to found a new capital at Dalatabad, he drove every inhabitant from Delhi and left it a desert, and hearing that a blind man had stayed behind in Delhi, he ordered him to be dragged from the old to the new capital, so that only a leg remained of the wretch when his last journey was finished. The sultan complained that the people did not love him or recognize his undeviating justice. 
He ruled India for a quarter of a century and died in bed. His successor, Firoz Shah, invaded Bengal, offered a reward for every Hindu head, paid for 180,000 of them, raided Hindu villages for slaves, and died at the ripe age of 80. Sultan Ahmad Shah feasted for three days whenever the number of defenseless Hindus slain in his territories in one day reached 20,000. These rulers were often men of ability, and their followers were gifted with fierce courage and industry. Only so can we understand how they could have maintained their rule among a hostile people so overwhelmingly outnumbering them. All of them were armed with a religion militaristic in operation, but far superior in its stoical monotheism than any of the popular cults of India. They concealed its attractiveness by making the public exercise of the Hindu religions illegal and thereby driving them more deeply into the Hindu soul. Some of these thirsty despots had culture as well as ability. They patronized the arts and engaged artists and artisans, usually of Hindu origin, to build for them magnificent mosques and tombs. Some of them were scholars and delighted in converse with historians, poets, and scientists. One of the greatest scholars of Asia, Al-Biruni, accompanied Mahmud of Ghazni to India and wrote a scientific survey of India comparable to Pliny's Natural History and Humboldt's Cosmos. The Moslem historians were almost as numerous as the generals and yielded nothing to them in the enjoyment of bloodshed and war. The sultans drew from the people every rupee of tribute that could be exacted by the ancient art of taxation as well as by straightforward robbery. But they stayed in India, spent their spoils in India, and thereby turned them back into India's economic life. Nevertheless, their terrorism and exploitation advanced that weakening of Hindu physique and morale, which had been begun by an exhausting climate, an inadequate diet, political disunity, and pessimistic religions. The usual policy of the sultans was clearly sketched by Alauddin, who required his advisers to draw up rules and regulations for grinding down the Hindus and for depriving them of that wealth and property which fosters disaffection and rebellion. Half of the gross product of the soil was collected by the government. Native rulers had taken one-sixth. No Hindu, says a Muslim historian, could hold up his head, and in their houses no sign of gold or silver, or of any superfluity was to be seen. Blows, confinement in the stocks, imprisonment, and chains were all employed to enforce payment. When one of his own advisers protested against this policy, Alauddin answered, O oh, doctor, thou art a learned man, but thou hast no experience. I am an unlettered man, but I have a great deal. Be assured, then, that the Hindus will never become submissive and obedient till they are reduced to poverty. I have therefore given orders that just sufficient shall be left to them from year to year of corn, milk, and curds, but that they shall not be allowed to accumulate hordes and property. This is the secret of the political history of modern India. Weakened by division, it succumbed to invaders. Impoverished by invaders, it lost all power of resistance and took refuge in supernatural consolations. It argued that both mastery and slavery were superficial delusions and concluded that freedom of the body or the nation was hardly worth defending in so brief a life. The bitter lesson that may be drawn from this tragedy is that eternal vigilance is the price of civilization. A nation must love peace, but keep its powder dry. 7. Akbar the Great Tamerlane, Babur, Humayun, Akbar, his government, his character, his patronage of the arts, his passion for philosophy, his friendship for Hinduism and Christianity, his new religion, the last days of Akbar. It is in the nature of governments to degenerate, for power, as Shelley said, poisons every hand that touches it. The excesses of the Delhi sultans lost them the support not only of the Hindu population but of their Moslem followers. When fresh invasions came from the north, these sultans were defeated with the same ease with which they themselves had won India. Their first conqueror was Tamerlane himself, more properly Timur Ilang, a Turk who had accepted Islam as an admirable weapon and had given himself a pedigree going back to Genghis Khan in order to win the support of his Mongol horde. Having attained the throne of Samarkand and feeling the need of more gold, it dawned upon him that India was still full of infidels. His generals, mindful of Moslem courage, demurred, pointing out that the infidels who could be reached from Samarkand were already under Mohammedan rule. Mullahs, learned in the Quran, decided the matter by quoting an inspiring verse. O Prophet, make war upon infidels and unbelievers and treat them with severity. Thereupon Timur crossed the Indus in 1398, massacred or enslaved such of the inhabitants as could not flee from him, 
defeated the sources of Sultan Mahmud Tughlaq, occupied Delhi, slew a hundred thousand prisoners in cold blood, plundered the city of all the wealth that the Afghan dynasty had gathered there, and carried it off to Samarkand with a multitude of women and slaves, leaving anarchy, famine, and pestilence in his wake. The Delhi sultans remounted their throne and taxed India for another century before the real conqueror came. Babur, founder of the great Mughal dynasty, was a man every whit as brave and fascinating as Alexander. Descended from both Timur and Genghis Khan, he inherited all the ability of these scourges of Asia without their brutality. He suffered from a surplus of energy in body and mind. He fought, hunted, and traveled insatiably. It was nothing for him single-handed to kill five enemies in five minutes. In two days he rode one hundred and sixty miles on horseback and swam the Ganges twice in the bargain. And in his last years he remarked that not since the age of eleven had he kept the fast of Ramadan twice in the same place. In the twelfth year of my age, he begins his memoirs, I became the ruler in the country of Fargana. At fifteen, he besieged and captured Samarkand, lost it again when he could not pay his troops, nearly died of illness, hid for a time in the mountains, and then recaptured the city with two hundred and forty men, lost it again through treachery, hid for two years in obscure poverty, and thought of retiring to a peasant life in China, organized another force, and by the contagion of his own bravery, took Kabul in his twenty-second year overwhelmed the one hundred thousand soldiers of Sultan Ibrahim at Panipat, with twelve thousand men and some fine horses, killed prisoners by the thousands, captured Delhi, established there the greatest and most beneficent of the foreign dynasties that have ruled India, enjoyed forty years of peace, composed excellent poems and memoirs, and died at the age of forty-seven after living, in action and experience, a century. His son, Humayun, was too weak and vacillating and too addicted to opium to carry on Babur's work. Sher Shah, an Afghan chief, defeated him in two bloody battles and restored for a time the Afghan power in India. Sher Shah, though capable of slaughter in the best Islamic style, rebuilt Delhi in fine architectural taste and established governmental reforms that prepared for the enlightened rule of Akbar. This book is concluded on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Concluded. Sher Shah, though capable of slaughter in the best Islamic style, rebuilt Delhi in fine architectural taste and established governmental reforms that prepared for the enlightened rule of Akbar. Two minor shahs held the power for a decade, then Humayun, after twelve years of hardship and wandering, organized a force in Persia, re-entered India, and recaptured the throne. Eight months later, Humayun fell from the terrace of his library and died. During his exile and poverty, his wife had borne him a son whom he had piously called Muhammad, but whom India was to call Akbar, that is, very great. No effort was spared to make him great. Even his ancestry had taken every precaution for in his veins ran the blood of Babur, Timur, and Genghis Khan. Tutors were supplied him in abundance, but he rejected them and refused to learn how to read. Instead, he educated himself for kingship by incessant and dangerous sport. He became a perfect horseman, played polo royally, and knew the art of controlling the most ferocious elephants. He was always ready to set out on a lion or tiger hunt, to undergo any fatigue, and to face all dangers in the first person. Like a good Turk, he had no effeminate distaste for human blood, when at the age of fourteen he was invited to win the title of Ghazi, slayer of the infidel, by killing a Hindu prisoner, he cut off the man's head at once with one stroke of his scimitar. These were the barbarous beginnings of a man destined to become one of the wisest, most humane, and most cultured of all the kings known to history. At the age of eighteen he took over from the regent the full direction of affairs. His dominion then extended over an eighth of India, a belt of territory some three hundred miles broad, running from the northwest frontier at Multan to Benares in the east. He set out with the zeal and veracity of his grandfather to extend these borders, and by a series of ruthless wars he made himself ruler of all Hindustan except for the little Rajput kingdom of Mewar. Returning to Delhi, he put aside his armor and devoted himself to reorganizing the administration of his realm. His power was absolute, and all important offices, even in distant provinces, were filled by his appointment. His principal aides were four. 
a prime minister or bakir, a finance minister, sometimes called vizier, sometimes diwan, a master of the court or bakshi, and a primate or sadr, who was head of the Mohammedan religion in India. As his rule acquired tradition and prestige, he depended less and less upon military power and contented himself with a standing army of some 25,000 men. In time of war, this modest force was augmented with troops recruited from the provincial military governors, a precarious arrangement which had something to do with the fall of the Mughal Empire under Aurangzeb. Bribery and embezzlement throve among these governors and their subordinates, so that much of Akbar's time was spent in checking corruption. He regulated with strict economy the expenses of his court and household, fixing the prices of food and materials bought for them, and the wages of labor engaged by the state. When he died, he left the equivalent of a billion dollars in the treasury, and his empire was the most powerful on earth. Both law and taxation were severe, but far less than before. From one-sixth to one-third of the gross produce of the soil was taken from the peasants, amounting to some one hundred million dollars a year in land tax. The emperor was legislator, executive, and judge. As Supreme Court, he spent many hours in giving audience to important litigants. His law forbade child marriage and compulsory sati, sanctioned the remarriage of widows, abolished the slavery of captives and the slaughter of animals for sacrifice, gave freedom to all religions, opened career to every talent of whatever creed or race, and removed the head tax that the Afghan rulers had placed upon all Hindus unconverted to Islam. At the beginning of his reign, the law included such punishments as mutilation. At the end, it was probably the most enlightened code of any 16th century government. Every state begins with violence, and, if it becomes secure, mellows into liberty. But the strength of a ruler is often the weakness of his government. The system depended so much upon Akbar's superior qualities of mind and character that obviously it would threaten to disintegrate at his death. He had, of course, most of the virtues, since he engaged most of the historians. He was the best athlete, the best horseman, the best swordsman, one of the greatest architects, and by all odds the handsomest man in the kingdom. Actually, he had long arms, bow legs, narrow mongoloid eyes, a head drooping leftward, and a wart on his nose. He made himself presentable by neatness, dignity, serenity, and brilliant eyes that could sparkle, says a contemporary, like the sea in sunshine, or flare up in a way to make the offender tremble with terror, like Van Damme before Napoleon. He dressed simply in brocaded cap, blouse, and trousers, jewels, and bare feet. He cared little for meat and gave it up almost entirely in his later years, saying that it is not right that a man should make his stomach the grave of animals. Nevertheless, he was strong in body and will, excelled in many active sports, and thought nothing of walking thirty-six miles in a day. He liked polo so much that he invented a luminous ball in order that the game might be played at night. He inherited the violent impulses of his family, and in his youth, like his Christian contemporaries, he was capable of solving problems by assassination. Gradually he learned, in Woodrow Wilson's phrase, to sit upon his own volcano. He rose far above his time in that spirit of fair play which does not always distinguish Oriental rulers. His clemency, says Pirishta, was without bounds. This virtue he often carried beyond the line of prudence. He was generous, expending vast sums in alms. He was affable to all, but especially to the lowly. Their little offerings, says a Jesuit missionary, he used to accept with such a pleased look, handling them and putting them in his bosom, as he did not do with the most lavish gifts of the nobles. One of his contemporaries described him as an epileptic. Many said that melancholy possessed him to a morbid degree. Perhaps to put a brighter color on reality, he drank liquor and took opium in moderation. His father and his children had similar habits, without similar self-control. He had a harem suitable to the size of his empire. One gossip tells us that the king hath in Agra and Fatpur Sikri, as they do credibly report, one thousand elephants, thirty thousand horses, fourteen hundred tame deer, eight hundred concubines. But he does not seem to have had sensual ambitions or tastes. He married widely, but politically. He pleased the Rajput princes by espousing their daughters, and thereby bound them to the support of his throne, and from that time the Mughal dynasty was half native in blood. A Rajput became his leading general, and a Raja rose to be his greatest minister. His dream was a united India. His mind was not quite as realistic and coldly accurate as Caesar's or Napoleon's. He had a passion for metaphysics and might, if deposed, have become a mystic recluse. He thought constantly and was forever making inventions and suggesting improvements. Like Harun al-Rashid, he took nocturnal rambles in disguise and came back bursting with reforms. 
In the midst of his complex activity, he made time to collect a great library, composed entirely of manuscripts beautifully written and engraved by those skillful penmen whom he esteemed as artists fully equal to the painters and architects that adorned his reign. He despised print as a mechanical and impersonal thing, and soon disposed of the choice specimens of European typography presented to him by his Jesuit friends. The volumes in his library numbered only 24,000, but they were valued at $3,500,000 by those who thought that such hordes of the spirit could be estimated in material terms. He patronized poets without stint, and loved one of them, the Hindu Birbal, so much that he made him a court favorite, and finally a general whereupon Birbal made a mess of a campaign and was slaughtered in no lyric plight. Akbar had his literary aids render into Persian, which was the language of his court, the masterpieces of Hindu literature, history, and science, and himself supervised the translation of the interminable Mahabharata. Every art flourished under his patronage and stimulation. Hindu music and poetry had now one of their greatest periods, and painting, both Persian and Hindu, reached its second zenith through his encouragement. At Agra, he directed the building of the famous fort, and within its walls erected, by proxy, five hundred buildings that his contemporaries considered to be among the most beautiful in the world. They were torn down by the impetuous Shah Jahan, and can be judged only by such remnants of Akbar's architecture as the tomb of Humayun at Delhi, and the remains at Fatpur Sikri, where the mausoleum of Akbar's beloved friend, the ascetic Sheikh Salim Chisti, is among the fairest structures in India. Deeper than these interests was his penchant for speculation. This well-nigh omnipotent emperor secretly yearned to be a philosopher, much as philosophers long to be emperors, and cannot comprehend the stupidity of providence in withholding from them their rightful thrones. After conquering the world, Akbar was unhappy because he could not understand it. Although, he said, I am the master of so vast a kingdom, and all the appliances of government are at my hand, yet since true greatness consists in doing the will of God, my mind is not at ease, in this diversity of sects and creeds. And apart from this outward pomp of circumstance, with what satisfaction in this despondency can I undertake the sway of empire? I await the coming of some discreet man of principle who will resolve the difficulties of my conscience. Discourses in philosophy have such a charm for me that they distract me from all else, and I forcibly restrain myself from listening to them lest the necessary duties of the hour should be neglected. Crowds of learned men from all nations, says Badaoni, and sages of various religions and sects came to the court and were honored with private conversations. After inquiries and investigations, which were their only business and occupation day and night, they would talk about profound points of science, the subtleties of revelation, the curiosities of history, and the wonders of nature. The superiority of man, said Akbar, rests in the jewel of reason. As became a philosopher, he was profoundly interested in religion. His careful reading of the Mahabharata and his intimacy with Hindu poets and sages lured him into the study of Indian faiths. For a time, at least, he accepted the theory of transmigration and scandalized his Muslim followers by appearing in public with Hindu religious marks on his forehead. He had a flair for humoring all the creeds. He pleased the Zoroastrians by wearing their sacred shirt and girdle under his clothes, and allowed the Jains to persuade him to abandon hunting and to prohibit on certain days the killing of animals. When he learned of the new religion called Christianity, which had come into India with the Portuguese occupation of Goa, he dispatched a message to the Paulist missionaries there, inviting them to send two of their learned men to him. Later some Jesuits came to Delhi and so interested him in Christ that he ordered his scribes to translate the New Testament. He gave the Jesuits full freedom to make converts and allowed them to bring up one of his sons. While Catholics were murdering Protestants in France, and Protestants under Elizabeth were murdering Catholics in England, and the Inquisition was killing and robbing Jews in Spain, and Bruno was being burned at the stake in Italy, Akbar invited the representatives of all the religions in his empire to a conference, pledged them to peace, issued edicts of toleration for every cult and creed, and as evidence of his own neutrality, married wives from the Brahmin, Buddhist, and Mohammedan faiths. His greatest pleasure, after the fires of youth had cooled, was in the free discussion of religious beliefs. He had quite discarded the dogmas of Islam to such an extent that his Muslim subjects spread it under his impartial rule. This king, St. Francis Xavier reported with some exaggeration, has destroyed the false sect of Mohammed and wholly discredited it. In this city there is neither a mosque nor a Koran, the book of their law, and the mosques that were there have been made stables for horses and storehouses. 
The king took no stock in revelations and would accept nothing that could not justify itself with science and philosophy. It was not unusual for him to gather friends and prelates of various sects together and discuss religion with them from Thursday evening to Friday noon. When the Moslem mullahs and the Christian priests quarreled, he reproved them both, saying that God should be worshipped through the intellect and not by a blind adherence to supposed revelations. Each person, he said, in the spirit, and perhaps through the influence of the Upanishads and Kabir, according to his condition gives the supreme being a name, but in reality to name the unknowable is vain. Certain Moslems suggested an ordeal by fire as a test of Christianity versus Islam. A mullah holding the Koran and a priest holding one of the Gospels were to enter a fire, and he who should come out unhurt would be adjudged the teacher of truth. Akbar, who did not like the mullah who was proposed for this experiment, warmly seconded the suggestion, but the Jesuit rejected it as blasphemous and impious, not to say dangerous. Gradually, the rival groups of theologians shunned these conferences and left them to Akbar and his rationalist intimates. Harassed by the religious divisions in his kingdom and disturbed by the thought that they might disrupt it after his death, Akbar finally decided to promulgate a new religion, containing in simple form the essentials of the warring faiths. The Jesuit missionary Bartoli records the matter thus. He summoned a general council and invited to it all the masters of learning and the military commandants of the cities round about, excluding only Father Ridolfo, whom it was vain to expect to be other than hostile to his sacrilegious purpose. When he had them all assembled in front of him, he spoke in a spirit of astute and knavish policy, saying, For an empire ruled by one head it was a bad thing to have the members divided among themselves and at variance one with the other whence it came about that there are as many factions as religions. We ought, therefore, to bring them all into one, but in such fashion that they should be both one and all, with the great advantage of not losing what is good in any one religion, while gaining whatever is better in another. In that way, honor would be rendered to God, peace would be given to the people, and security to the empire. The council, perforce consenting, he issued a decree proclaiming himself the infallible head of the church, this was the chief contribution of Christianity to the new religion. The creed was a pantheistic monotheism in the best Hindu tradition, with a spark of sun and fire worship from the Zoroastrians and a semi jain recommendation to abstain from meat. The slaughter of cows was made a capital offense. Nothing could have pleased the Hindus more or the Moslems less. A later edict made vegetarianism compulsory on the entire population for at least a hundred days in the year and in further consideration of native ideas, garlic and onions were prohibited. The building of mosques, the fast of Ramadan, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and other Mohammedan customs were banned. Many Muslims who resisted the edicts were exiled. In the center of the peace court at Fatpur Sikri, a temple of united religion was built, and still stands there, as a symbol of the emperor's fond hope that now all the inhabitants of India might be brothers, worshipping the same god. As a religion, the Din Ilahi never succeeded. Akbar found tradition too strong for his infallibility. A few thousand rallied to the new cult, largely as a means of securing official favor. The vast majority adhered to their inherited gods. Politically, the stroke had some beneficent results. The abolition of the head tax and the pilgrim tax on the Hindus, the freedom granted to all religions, the weakening of racial and religious fanaticism, dogmatism, and division far outweighed the egotism and excesses of Akbar's novel revelation and it won him such loyalty from even the Hindus, who did not accept his creed, that his prime purpose, political unity, was largely achieved. With his own fellow Moslems, however, the Din Ilahi was a source of bitter resentment, leading at one time to open revolt, and stirring Prince Jehangir into treacherous machinations against his father. The prince complained that Akbar had reigned forty years, and had so strong a constitution that there was no prospect of his early death. Jehangir organized an army of thirty thousand horsemen, killed Abu el-Fadl, the king's court historian and dearest friend, and proclaimed himself emperor. Akbar persuaded the youth to submit and forgave him after a day. But the disloyalty of his son, added to the death of his mother and his friend, broke his spirit and left him an easy prey for the great enemy. In his last days his children ignored him and gave their energies to quarreling for his throne. Only a few intimates were with him when he died, presumably of dysentery, perhaps of poisoning by Jahangir. Mullahs came to his deathbed to reconvert him to Islam, but they failed. The king passed away without the benefit of the prayers of any church or sect. No crowd followed his simple funeral, and the sons and courtiers who had worn mourning for the event discarded it the same evening, 
and rejoiced that they had inherited his kingdom. It was a bitter death for the justest and wisest ruler that Asia has ever known. 8. The Decline of the Mughals The children of great men, Jehangir, Shah Jahan, his magnificence, his fall, Aurangzeb, his fanaticism, his death, the coming of the British. The children who had waited so impatiently for his death found it difficult to hold together the empire that had been created by his genius. Why is it that great men so often have mediocrities for their offspring? Is it because the gamble of the genes that produced them, the commingling of ancestral traits and biological possibilities, was but a chance and could not be expected to recur? Or is it because the genius exhausts in thought and toil the force that might have gone to parentage and leaves only his diluted blood to his heirs? Or is it that children decay under ease and early good fortune deprives them of the stimulus to ambition and growth? Jehangir was not so much a mediocrity as an able degenerate. Born of a Turkish father and a Hindu princess, he enjoyed all the opportunities of an heir apparent, indulged himself in alcohol and lechery, and gave full vent to that sadistic joy and cruelty which had been a recessive character in Babur, Humayun, and Akbar, but had always lurked in the Tatar blood. He took delight in seeing men flayed alive, impaled, or torn to pieces by elephants. In his memoirs he tells how, because their careless entrance upon the scene startled his quarry in a hunt, he had a groom killed, and the groom's servants hamstrung, that is, crippled for life by severing the tendons behind the knees. Having attended to this, he says, I continued hunting. When his son Kusru conspired against him, he had seven hundred supporters of the rebel impaled in a line along the streets of Lahore and he remarks with pleasure on the length of time it took these men to die. His sexual life was attended to by a harem of six thousand women, and graced by his later attachment to his favorite wife, Nur Jahan, whom he acquired by murdering her husband. His administration of justice was impartial as well as severe, but the extravagance of his expenditures laid a heavy burden upon a nation which had become the most prosperous on the globe through the wise leadership of Akbar and many years of peace. Toward the end of his reign, Jehangir took more and more to his cups and neglected the tasks of government. Inevitably, conspiracies arose to replace him. Already in 1622, his son Jehan had tried to seize the throne. When Jehangir died, Jehan hurried up from the Dakan, where he had been hiding, proclaimed himself emperor, and murdered all his brothers to ensure his peace of mind. His father passed on to him his habits of extravagance, intemperance, and cruelty. The expenses of Jehan's court and the high salaries of his innumerable officials absorbed more and more of the revenue produced by the thriving industry and commerce of the people. The religious tolerance of Akbar and the indifference of Jehangir were replaced by a return to the Moslem faith, the persecution of Christians, and the ruthless and wholesale destruction of Hindu shrines. Shah Jahan redeemed himself in some measure by his generosity to his friends and the poor, his artistic taste and passion in adorning India with the fairest architecture that it had ever seen, and his devotion to his wife, Muntaz Mahal, ornament of the palace. He had married her in his twenty-first year, when he had already had two children by an earlier consort. Muntaz gave her tireless husband fourteen children in eighteen years, and died at the age of thirty-nine in bringing forth the last. Shah Jahan built the immaculate Taj Mahal as a monument to her memory and her fertility, and relapsed into a scandalous licentiousness. The most beautiful of all the world's tombs was but one of a hundred masterpieces that Jahan erected, chiefly at Agra, and in that new Delhi which grew up under his planning. The costliness of these palaces, the luxuriousness of the court, the extravagant jewelry of the peacock throne, would suggest a rate of taxation ruinous to India. Nevertheless, though one of the worst famines in India's history occurred in Shah Jahan's reign, his thirty years of government marked the zenith of India's prosperity and prestige. The lordly Shah was a capable ruler, and though he wasted many lives in foreign war, he gave his own land a full generation of peace. As a great British administrator of Bombay, Mount Stuart Elphinstone wrote, Those who look on India in its present state may be inclined to suspect the native writers of exaggerating its former prosperity. But the deserted cities, ruined palaces, and choked-up aqueducts which we still see, with the great reservoirs and embankments in the midst of jungles, and the decayed causeways, wells, and caravanserais of the royal roads, concur with the evidence of contemporary travelers in convincing us that those historians had good grounds for their commendation. Jahan had begun his reign by killing his brothers, 
but he had neglected to kill his sons, one of whom was destined to overthrow him. In 1657, the ablest of these, Aurangzeb, led an insurrection from the Deccan. The Shah, like David, gave instructions to his generals to defeat the rebel army, but to spare, if possible, the life of his son. Aurangzeb overcame all the forces sent against him, captured his father, and imprisoned him in the fort of Agra. For nine bitter years the deposed king lingered there, never visited by his son, attended only by his faithful daughter Jahanara, and spending his days looking from the jasmine tower of his prison across to Jumna, where his once beloved Mumtaz lay in her jeweled tomb. The son who so ruthlessly deposed him was one of the greatest saints in the history of Islam, and perhaps the most nearly unique of the Mughal emperors. The mullahs who had educated him had so imbued him with religion that at one time the young prince had thought of renouncing the empire and the world and becoming a religious recluse. Throughout his life, despite his despotism, his subtle diplomacy and a conception of morals as applying only to his own sect, he remained a pious Muslim, reading prayers at great length, memorizing the entire Koran, and warring against infidelity. He spent hours in devotion and days in fasts. For the most part he practiced his religion as earnestly as he professed it. It is true that in politics he was cold and calculating, capable of lying cleverly for his country and his god. But he was the least cruel of the moguls, and the mildest. Slaughter abated in his reign, and he made hardly any use of punishment in dealing with crime. He was consistently humble in deportment, patient under provocation, and resigned in misfortune. He abstained scrupulously from all food, drink, or luxury forbidden by his faith. Though skilled in music, he abandoned it as a sensual pleasure, and apparently he carried out his resolve to spend nothing upon himself save what he had been able to earn by the labor of his hands. He was a St. Augustine on the throne. Shah Jahan had given half his revenues to the promotion of architecture and the other arts. Aurangzeb cared nothing for art, destroyed its heathen monuments with coarse bigotry, and fought through a reign of half a century to eradicate from India almost all religions but his own. He issued orders to the provincial governors and to his other subordinates to raise to the ground all the temples of either Hindus or Christians, to smash every idol, and to close every Hindu school. In one year, 1679 to 1680, 66 temples were broken to pieces in Amber alone, 63 at Chittor, 123 at Udaipur. And over the site of a Benares temple, especially sacred to the Hindus, he built, in deliberate insult, a Mohammedan mosque. He forbade all public worship of the Hindu faiths, and laid upon every unconverted Hindu a heavy capitation tax. As a result of his fanaticism, thousands of the temples which had represented or housed the art of India through a millennium were laid in ruins. We can never know, from looking at India today, what grandeur and beauty she once possessed. Aurangzeb converted a handful of timid Hindus to Islam, but he wrecked his dynasty and his country. A few Moslems worshipped him as a saint, but the mute and terrorized millions of India looked upon him as a monster, fled from his tax-gatherers, and prayed for his death. During his reign, the Mughal Empire in India reached its height, extending into the Deccan, but it was a power that had no foundation in the affection of the people, and was doomed to fall at the first hostile and vigorous touch. The emperor himself, in his last years, began to realize that by the very narrowness of his piety he had destroyed the heritage of his fathers. His deathbed letters are pitiful documents. I know not who I am, where I shall go, or what will happen to this sinner full of sins. My years have gone by profitless. God has been in my heart, yet my darkened eyes have not recognized his light. There is no hope for me in the future. The fever is gone, but only the skin is left. I have greatly sinned, and know not what torments await me. May the peace of God be upon you. He left instructions that his funeral should be ascetically simple and that no money should be spent on his shroud except the four rupees that he had made by sewing caps. The top of his coffin was to be covered with a plain piece of canvas. To the poor he left three hundred rupees earned by copying the Koran. He died at the age of eighty-nine, having long outstayed his welcome on the earth. Within seventeen years of his death his empire was broken into fragments. The support of the people, so wisely won by Akbar, had been forfeited by the cruelty of Jahangir, the wastefulness of Jahan, and the intolerance of Aurangzeb. The Muslim minority, already enervated by India's heat, had lost the military ardor and physical vigor of their prime, and no fresh recruits were coming from the north to buttress their declining power. Meanwhile, far away in the west, a little island had sent its traders to cull the riches of India. Soon it would send its guns, and take over this immense empire in which Hindu and Muslim had joined to build one of the great civilizations of history. 
This concludes the reading of The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Part 2 continues the story and is available through the books on tape service. This book was read by Alexander Adams. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Copyright 1935 by Will Durant. Copyright renewed 1963 by Will Durant. This recording of the full-length reading of Our Oriental Heritage was published by arrangement with Monica Ariel Mehel, trustee Ethel B. Durant Trust, Monica Ariel Mehel, and William James Durant Easton, and was produced in 1994 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. This book consists of 15 chapters and is 461 pages long. Chapter 17, The Life of the People. 1. The Makers of Wealth. The Jungle Background, Agriculture, Mining, Handicrafts, Commerce, Money, Taxes, Famines, Poverty, and Wealth. The soil of India had not lent itself willingly to civilization. A great part of it was jungle, the jealously guarded home of lions, tigers, elephants, serpents, and other individualists with the Rousseauian contempt for civilization. The biological struggle to free the land from these enemies had continued underneath all surface dramas of economic and political strife. Akbar shot tigers near Mathura and captured wild elephants in many places where none can be found today. In Vedic times, the lion might be met with anywhere in northwest or central India. Now it is almost extinct throughout the peninsula. The serpent and the insect, however, still carry on the war. In 1926, some 2,000 Hindus were killed by wild animals, 875 by marauding tigers, but 20,000 Hindus met death from the fangs of snakes. Gradually, as the soil was redeemed from the beast, it was turned to the cultivation of rice, pulse, millet, vegetables, and fruits. Through the greater part of Indian history, the majority of the population have lived abstemiously on these natural foods, reserving flesh, fish, and fowl for the outcasts and the rich. To render their diet more exciting, and perhaps to assist Aphrodite, the Hindus have grown and consumed an unusual abundance of curry, ginger, cloves, cinnamon, and other spices. Europeans valued these spices so highly that they stumbled upon a hemisphere in search for them. Who knows but that America was discovered for the sake of love. In Vedic times, the land belonged to the people, but from the days of Chandragupta Maria, it became the habit of the kings to claim royal ownership of all the soil and to let it out to the tiller for an annual rental and tax. Irrigation was usually a governmental undertaking. One of the dams raised by Chandragupta functioned till 150 A.D. Remains of the ancient canals can be seen everywhere today and signs still survive of the artificial lake that Raj Singh, Rajput Rana of Mewar, built as an irrigation reservoir in 1661, and which he surrounded with a marble wall twelve miles in length. The Hindus seem to have been the first people to mine gold. Herodotus and Megasthenes tell of the great gold-digging ants, in size somewhat less than dogs but bigger than foxes, which helped the miners to find the metal by turning it up in their scratching of the sand. We do not know what these ants were. They were more probably ant-eaters than ants. Much of the gold used in the Persian Empire in the 5th century before Christ came from India. Silver, copper, lead, tin, zinc, and iron were also mined, iron as early as 1500 B.C. The art of tempering and casting iron developed in India long before its known appearance in Europe. Victor Maditya, for example, erected at Delhi in circa 380 A.D. an iron pillar that stands untarnished today after 15 centuries, and the quality of metal or manner of treatment which has preserved it from rust or decay is still a mystery to modern metallurgical science. Before the European invasion, the smelting of iron in small charcoal furnaces was one of the major industries of India. 
The Industrial Revolution taught Europe how to carry out these processes more cheaply on a larger scale, and the Indian industry died under the competition. Only in our own time are the rich mineral resources of India being again exploited and explored. The growing of cotton appears earlier in India than elsewhere. Apparently it was used for cloth in Mahenjo-daro. In our oldest classical reference to cotton, Herodotus says with pleasing ignorance, Certain wild trees there bear wool instead of fruit, which in beauty and quality excels that of sheep and the Indians make their clothing from these trees. It was their wars in the Near East that acquainted the Romans with this tree-grown wool. Arabian travelers in ninth-century India reported that in this country they make garments of such extraordinary perfection that nowhere else is their like to be seen. Sewed and woven to such a degree of fineness they may be drawn through a ring of moderate size. The medieval Arabs took over the art from India and their word kutan gave us our word cotton. The name muslin was originally applied to fine cotton weaves made in Mosul from Indian models. Calico was so called because it came first in 1631 from Calicut on the southwestern shores of India. Embroidery, says Marco Polo, speaking of Gujarat in 1293 AD, is here performed with more delicacy than in any other part of the world. The shawls of Kashmir and the rugs of India bear witness even today to the excellence of Indian weaving in texture and design. But weaving was only one of the many handicrafts of India, and the weavers were only one of the many craft and merchant guilds that organized and regulated the industry of India. Europe looked upon the Hindus as experts in almost every line of manufacture. Woodwork, ivory work, Metalwork, bleaching, dyeing, tanning, soap making, glass blowing, gunpowder, fireworks, cement, etc. China imported eyeglasses from India in 1260 AD. Bernier, traveling in India in the 17th century, described it as humming with industry. Fitch in 1585 saw a fleet of 180 boats carrying a great variety of goods down the river Jumna. Internal trade flourished. Every roadside was and is a bazaar. The foreign trade of India is as old as her history. Objects found in Sumeria and Egypt indicate a traffic between these countries and India as far back as 3000 BC. Commerce between India and Babylon by the Persian Gulf flourished from 700 to 480 BC. And perhaps the ivory apes and peacocks of Solomon came by the same route from the same source. India's ships sailed the sea to Burma and China in Chandragupta's days and Greek merchants, called Yavana, Ionians, by the Hindus, thronged the markets of Dravidian India in the centuries before and after the birth of Christ. Rome, in her Epicurean days, depended upon India for spices, perfumes, and unguents, and paid great prices for Indian silks, brocades, muslins, and cloth of gold. Pliny condemned the extravagance which sent five million dollars yearly from Rome to India for such luxuries. Indian cheetahs, Tigers and elephants assisted in the gladiatorial games and sacrificial rites of the Colosseum. The Parthian Wars were fought by Rome largely to keep open the trade route to India. In the 7th century, the Arabs captured Persia and Egypt, and thereafter trade between Europe and Asia passed through Moslem hands, hence the Crusades and Columbus. Under the Mughals, foreign commerce rose again. The wealth of Venice, Genoa, and other Italian cities grew through their service as ports for European trade with India and the East. The Renaissance owed more to the wealth derived from this trade than to the manuscripts brought to Italy by the Greeks. Akbar had an admiralty which supervised the building of ships and the regulation of ocean traffic. The ports of Bengal and Sindh were famous for shipbuilding and did their work so well that the Sultan of Constantinople found it cheaper to have his vessels built there than in Alexandria. Even the East India Company had many of its ships built in Bengal docks. The development of coinage to facilitate this trade took many centuries. In Buddha's days, rough rectangular coins were issued by various economic and political authorities, but it was not until the fourth century before Christ that India, under the influence of Persia and Greece, arrived at a coinage guaranteed by the state. Sher Shah issued well-designed pieces of copper, silver, and gold, and established the rupee as the basic coin of the realm. Under Akbar and Jehangir, 
The coinage of India was superior in artistic execution and purity of metal to that of any modern European state. As in medieval Europe, so in medieval India the growth of industry and commerce was impeded by a religious antipathy to the taking of interest. The Indians, says Megasthenes, neither put out money at usury, interest, nor know how to borrow. It is contrary to established usage for an Indian either to do or to suffer wrong and therefore they neither make contracts nor require securities. When the Hindu could not invest his savings in his own economic enterprises, he preferred to hide them, or to buy jewelry as conveniently hoardable wealth. Perhaps this failure to develop a facile credit system aided the Industrial Revolution to establish the European domination of Asia. Slowly, however, despite the hostility of the Brahmins, money lending grew. The rates varied according to the caste of the borrower from 12 to 60 percent, usually ranging about 20. Bankruptcy was not permitted as a liquidation of debts. If a debtor died insolvent, his descendants to the sixth generation continued to be responsible for his obligations. Both agriculture and trade were heavily taxed to support the government. The peasant had to surrender from one-sixth to one-half of his crop, and as in medieval and contemporary Europe, many tolls were laid upon the flow and exchange of goods. Akbar raised the land tax to one-third, but abolished all other exactions. The land tax was a bitter levy, but it had the saving grace of rising with prosperity and falling with depression, and in famine years the poor could at least die untaxed. For famines occurred even in Akbar's palmy days. That of 1556 seems to have led to cannibalism and widespread desolation. Roads were bad, transportation was slow, and the surplus of one region could with difficulty be used to supply the dearth of another. As everywhere, there were extremes of poverty and wealth, but hardly so great as in India or America today. At the bottom was a small minority of slaves. Above them, the Shudras were not so much slaves as hired men, though their status, like that of almost all Hindus, was hereditary. The poverty described by Père Dubois, 1820, was the result of fifty years of political chaos. Under the Mughals, the condition of the people had been relatively prosperous. Wages were modest, ranging for manual workers from three to nine cents a day in Akbar's reign, but prices were correspondingly low. In 1600, a rupee, normally 32 and a half cents, bought 194 pounds of wheat, or 278 pounds of barley. In 1901, it bought only 29 pounds of wheat, or 44 pounds of barley. An Englishman resident in India in 1616 described the plenty of all provisions as very great throughout the whole monarchy, and added that everyone there may eat bread without scarceness. Another Englishman, touring India in the 17th century, found that his expenses averaged four cents a day. The wealth of the country reached its two peaks under Chandragupta Maurya and Shah Jahan. The riches of India under the Gupta kings became a proverb throughout the world. Yuan Chuang pictured an Indian city as beautified with gardens and pools and adorned with institutes of letters and arts. The inhabitants were well off and there were families with great wealth. Fruit and flowers were abundant. The people had a refined appearance and dressed in glossy silk attire. They were clear and suggestive in discourse. They were equally divided between orthodoxy and heterodoxy. The Hindu kingdoms overthrown by the Moslems, says Elphinstone, were so wealthy that the historians tire of telling of the immense loot of jewels and coin captured by the invaders. Niccolo Conti described the banks of the Ganges, circa 1420, as lined with one prosperous city after another, each well-designed, rich in gardens and orchards, silver and gold, commerce and industry. Shah Jahan's treasury was so full that he kept two underground strong rooms, each of some 150,000 cubic feet capacity, almost filled with silver and gold. Contemporary testimonies, says Vincent Smith, permit of no doubt that the urban population of the more important cities was well to do. Travelers described Agra and Fatpur Sikri as each greater and richer than London. Anctil du Perron, journeying through the Maratha districts in 1760, found himself in the midst of the simplicity and happiness of the Golden Age. The people were cheerful, vigorous, and in high health. Clive, visiting Murshidabad in 1759, reckoned that ancient capital of Bengal as equal in extent population and wealth to the London of his time, 
with palaces far greater than those of Europe and men richer than any individual in London. India, said Clive, was a country of inexhaustible riches. Tried by Parliament for helping himself too readily to this wealth, Clive excused himself ingeniously. He described the riches that he had found about him in India, opulent cities ready to offer him any bribe to escape indiscriminate plunder, bankers throwing open to his grasp vaults piled high with jewels and gold. He concluded, At this moment I stand astonished at my own moderation. 2. The Organization of Society The Monarchy, Law, the Code of Manu, Development of the Caste System, Rise of the Brahmins, Their Privileges and Powers, Their Obligations, in defense of caste. Because the roads were poor and communication difficult, it was easier to conquer than to rule India. Its topography ordained that this semi-continent would remain until the coming of railways, a medley of divided states. Under such conditions, a government could have security only through a competent army, and as the army required in frequent crises a dictatorial leader immune to political eloquence, the form of government which developed in India was naturally monarchical. The people enjoyed a considerable measure of liberty under the native dynasties, partly through the autonomous communities in the villages and the trade guilds in the towns, and partly through the limitations that the Brahmin aristocracy placed upon the authority of the king. The laws of Manu, though they were more a code of ethics than a system of practiced legislation, expressed the focal ideas of India about monarchy, that it should be impartially rigorous and paternally solicitous of the public good. The Mohammedan rulers paid less attention than their Hindu predecessors to these ideals and checks. They were a conquering minority and rested their rule frankly on the superiority of their guns. The army, says a Muslim historian with charming clarity, is the source and means of government. Akbar was an exception, for he relied chiefly upon the goodwill of a people prospering under his mild and benevolent despotism. Perhaps in the circumstances his was the best government possible. Its vital defect, as we have seen, lay in its dependence upon the character of the king. The supreme centralized authority that proved beneficent under Akbar proved ruinous under Aurangzeb. Having been raised up by violence, the Afghan and Mughal rulers were always subject to recall by assassination. And wars of succession were almost as expensive, though not as disturbing to economic life, as a modern election. Under the Moslems, law was merely the will of the emperor or sultan. Under the Hindu kings, it was a confused mixture of royal commands, village traditions, and caste rules. Judgment was given by the head of the family, the head of the village, the headmen of the caste, the court of the guild, the governor of the province, the minister of the king, or the king himself. Litigation was brief, judgment swift. Lawyers came only with the British. Torture was used under every dynasty until abolished by Firoz Shah. Death was the penalty for any of a great variety of crimes, such as housebreaking, damage to royal property, or theft on a scale that would now make a man a very pillar of society. Punishments were cruel, including amputation of hands, feet, nose, or ears, tearing out of eyes, pouring molten lead into the throat, crushing the bones of hands and feet with a mallet, burning the body with fire, driving nails into the hands, feet, or bosom, cutting the sinews, sawing men asunder, quartering them, impaling them, roasting them alive, letting them be trampled to death by elephants, or giving them to wild and hungry dogs. No code of laws applied to all India. In the ordinary affairs of life, the place of law was taken by the Dharma Shastras, metrical textbooks of caste regulations and duties composed by the Brahmins from a strictly Brahmin point of view. The oldest of these is the so-called Code of Manu. Manu was the mythical ancestor of the Manava tribe, or school, of Brahmins near Delhi. He was represented as the son of a god and as receiving his laws from Brahma himself. This code of 2,685 verses, once assigned to 1200 B.C., is now referred vaguely to the first centuries of our era. Originally intended as a handbook or guide to proper caste behavior for these Manava Brahmins, it was gradually accepted as a code of conduct by the entire Hindu community, and though never recognized by the Moslem kings, it acquired, within the caste system, all the force of law. Its character will appear to some extent in the course of the following analysis of Hindu society and morals. In general, it was marked by a superstitious acceptance of trial by ordeal, 
a severe application of the lex talionis, and an untiring inculcation of the virtues, rights, and powers of the Brahmin caste. Its effect was to strengthen enormously the hold of the caste system upon Hindu society. This system had grown more rigid and complex since the Vedic period, not only because it is in the nature of institutions to become stiff with age, but because the instability of the political order and the overrunning of India by alien peoples and creeds had intensified caste as a barrier to the mixture of Moslem and Hindu blood. In Vedic days, caste had been varna, or color. In medieval India, it became jati, or birth. Its essence was twofold, the heredity of status and the acceptance of dharma, that is, the traditional duties and employments of one's native caste. The head and chief beneficiaries of the system were the eight million males of the Brahmin caste, weakened for a while by the rise of Buddhism under Ashoka. The Brahmins, with that patient tenacity which characterizes priesthoods, had bided their time and had recaptured power and leadership under the Gupta line. From the second century A.D. we find records of great gifts, usually of land, to the Brahmin caste. These grants, like all Brahmin property, were exempt from taxation until the British came. The Code of Manu warns the king never to tax a Brahmin, even when all other sources of revenue have failed. For a Brahmin provoked to anger can instantly destroy the king and all his army by reciting curses and mystical texts. It was not the custom of Hindus to make wills, since their traditions required that the property of the family should be held in common, and automatically descend from the dying to the surviving males. But when, under the influence of European individualism, wills were introduced, they were greatly favored by the Brahmins, as an occasional means of securing property for ecclesiastical purposes. The most important element in any sacrifice to the gods was the fee paid to the ministrant priest, the highest summit of piety was largesse in such fees. Miracles and a thousand superstitions were another fertile source of sacerdotal wealth. For a consideration, a Brahmin might render a barren woman fecund. Oracles were manipulated for financial ends. Men were engaged to feign madness and to confess that their fate was a punishment for parsimony to the priests. In every illness, lawsuit, bad omen, unpleasant dream, or new enterprise, the advice of a Brahmin was desirable, and the adviser was worthy of his hire. The power of the Brahmins was based upon a monopoly of knowledge. They were the custodians and remakers of tradition, the educators of children, the composers or editors of literature, the experts versed in the inspired and infallible Vedas. If a Shudra listened to the reading of the scriptures, his ears, according to the Brahminical law books, were to be filled with molten lead. If he recited it, his tongue was to be split. If he committed it to memory, he was to be cut in two. Such were the threats, seldom enforced, with which the priests guarded their wisdom. Brahmanism thus became an exclusive cult, carefully hedged around against all vulgar participation. According to the Code of Manu, a Brahmin was by divine right at the head of all creatures. He did not, however, share in all the powers and privileges of the order, until after many years of preparation he was made twice born, or regenerate by solemn investiture with the triple cord. From that moment he became a holy being. His person and property were inviolate. Indeed, according to Manu, all that exists in this universe is the Brahmin's property. Brahmins were to be maintained by public and private gifts, not as charity, but as a sacred obligation. Hospitality to a Brahmin was one of the highest religious duties, and a Brahmin not hospitably received could walk away with all the accumulated merits of the householder's good deeds. Even if a Brahmin committed every crime, he was not to be killed. The king might exile him, but must allow him to keep his property. He who tried to strike a Brahmin would suffer in hell for a hundred years. He who actually struck a Brahmin would suffer in hell for a thousand years. If a Shudra debauched the wife of a Brahmin, the Shudra's property was to be confiscated, and his genitals were to be cut off. A Shudra who killed a Shudra might atone for his crime by giving ten cows to the Brahmins. If he killed a Vaishya, he must give the Brahmins a hundred cows. If he killed a Kshatriya, he must give the Brahmins a thousand cows. If he killed a Brahmin, he must die. Only the murder of a Brahmin was really murder. The functions and obligations that corresponded to these privileges were numerous and burdensome. The Brahmin not only acted as priest, but trained himself for the clerical, pedagogical, and literary professions. He was required to study law and learn the Vedas, 
Every other duty was subordinate to this. Even to repeat the Vedas entitled the Brahman to beatitude, regardless of rites or works. And if he memorized the Rig Veda, he might destroy the world without incurring any guilt. He must not marry outside his caste. If he married a Shudra, his children were to be pariahs. For, said Manu, the man who is good by birth becomes low by low associations, but the man who is low by birth cannot become high by high associations. The Brahmin had to bathe every day and again after being shaved by a barber of low caste. He had to purify with cow dung the place where he intended to sleep, and he had to follow a strict hygienic ritual in attending to the duties of nature. He was to abstain from all animal food, including eggs, and from onions, garlic, mushrooms, and leeks. He was to drink nothing but water, and it must have been drawn and carried by a Brahmin. He was to abstain from unguents, perfumes, sensual pleasure, covetousness, and wrath. If he touched an unclean thing or the person of any foreigner, even the governor-general of India, he was to purify himself by ceremonial ablutions. If he committed a crime, he had to accept a heavier punishment than would fall upon a lower caste. If, for example, a shudra stole, he was to be fined eightfold the sum or value of his theft. If a vaishya stole, he was to be fined sixteenfold. A kshatriya, thirty-twofold. A brahman, sixty-fourfold. The brahman was never to injure any living thing. Given a moderate observation of these rules, and a people too burdened with the tillage of the fields, and therefore too subject to the apparently personal whims of the elements, to rise out of superstition to education, the power of the priests grew from generation to generation, and made them the most enduring aristocracy in history. Nowhere else can we find this astonishing phenomenon, so typical of the slow rate of change in India, of an upper class maintaining its ascendancy and privileges through all conquests, dynasties, and governments for twenty-five hundred years. Only the outcast Chandalas can rival them in perpetuity. The ancient Kshatriyas, who had dominated the intellectual as well as the political field in the days of Buddha, disappeared after the Gupta age. And though the Brahmins recognized the Rajput warriors as the later equivalent of the old fighting caste, the Kshatriyas, after the fall of Rajputana, soon became extinct. At last only two great divisions remained. The Brahmins, as the social and mental rulers of India, and beneath them three thousand castes that were in reality industrial guilds. Much can be said in defense of what, after monogamy, must be the most abused of all social institutions. The caste system had the eugenic value of keeping the presumably finer strains from dilution and disappearance through indiscriminate mixture. It established certain habits of diet and cleanliness as a rule of honor which all might observe and emulate. It gave order to the chaotic inequalities and differences of men, and spared the soul the modern fever of climbing and gain. It gave order to every life by prescribing for each man a dharma, or code of conduct for his caste. It gave order to every trade and profession, elevated every occupation into a vocation, not likely to be changed, and by making every industry a caste, provided its members with a means of united action against exploitation and tyranny. It offered an escape from the plutocracy or the military dictatorship, which are apparently the only alternatives to aristocracy. It gave to a country shorn of political stability by a hundred invasions and revolutions, a social, moral, and cultural order and continuity rivaled only by the Chinese. Amid a hundred anarchic changes in the state, the Brahmins maintained, through the system of caste, a stable society and preserved, augmented, and transmitted civilization. The nation bore with them patiently, even proudly, because everyone knew that in the end, they were the one indispensable government of India. 3. Morals and Marriage Dharma, children, child marriage, the art of love, prostitution, romantic love, marriage, the family, woman, her intellectual life, her rights, perda, sati, the widow. When the caste system dies, the moral life of India will undergo a long transition of disorder, for there the moral code has been bound up almost inseparably with caste. Morality was dharma, the rule of life for each man as determined by his caste. To be a Hindu meant not so much to accept a creed as to take a place in the caste system and to accept the dharma or duties attaching to that place by ancient tradition and regulation. 
Each post had its obligations, its limitations, and its rights. With them and within them, the pious Hindu would lead his life, finding in them a certain contentment of routine, and never thinking of stepping into another caste. Better thine own work is, though done with fault, said the Bhagavad Gita, than doing others' work, even excellently. Dharma is to the individual what its normal development is to a seed, the orderly fulfillment of an inherent nature and destiny. So old is this conception of morality that even today it is difficult for all and impossible for most Hindus to think of themselves except as members of a specific caste, guided and bound by its rule. Without caste, says an English historian, Hindu society is inconceivable. In addition to the dharma of each caste, the Hindu recognized a general dharma or obligation affecting all castes and embracing chiefly respect for Brahmins and reverence for cows. Next to these duties was that of bearing children. Then only is a man a perfect man, says Manu's Code, when he is three, himself, his wife, and his son. Not only would children be economic assets to their parents and support them as a matter of course in old age, but they would carry on the household worship of their ancestors and would offer to them periodically the food without which these ghosts would starve. Consequently, there was no birth control in India, and abortion was branded as a crime equal to the murder of a Brahmin. Infanticide occurred, but it was exceptional. The father was glad to have children and proud to have many. The tenderness of the old to the young is one of the fairest aspects of Hindu civilization. The child was hardly born when the parents began to think of its marriage. For marriage in the Hindu system was compulsory. An unmarried man was an outcast, without social status or consideration, and prolonged virginity was a disgrace. Nor was marriage to be left to the whim of individual choice or romantic love. It was a vital concern of society and the race, and could not safely be trusted to the myopia of passion, or the accidents of proximity. It must be arranged by the parents before the fever of sex should have time to precipitate a union doomed, in the Hindu view, to disillusionment and bitterness. Manu gave the name of Gandharva marriage to unions by mutual choice and stigmatized them as born of desire. They were permissible but hardly respectable. The early maturity of the Hindu, making a girl of twelve as old as a girl of fourteen or fifteen in America, created a difficult problem of moral and social order. It should be added that Gandhi denies that this precocity has any physical basis. I loathe and detest child marriage, he writes. I shudder to see a child widow. I have never known a grosser superstition than that the Indian climate causes sexual precocity. What does bring about untimely puberty is the mental and moral atmosphere surrounding family life. Should marriage be arranged to coincide with sexual maturity, or should it be postponed, as in America, until the male arrives at economic maturity? The first solution apparently weakens the national physique, unduly accelerates the growth of population, and sacrifices the woman almost completely to reproduction. The second solution leaves the problems of unnatural delay, sexual frustration, prostitution, and venereal disease. The Hindus chose child marriage as the lesser evil, and tried to mitigate its dangers by establishing, between the marriage and its consummation, a period in which the bride should remain with her parents until the coming of puberty. The institution was old and therefore holy. It had been rooted in the desire to prevent intercaste marriage through casual sexual attraction. It was later encouraged by the fact that the conquering and otherwise ruthless Muslims were restrained by their religion from carrying away married women as slaves. And finally it took rigid form in the parental resolve to protect the girl from the erotic sensibilities of the male. That these were reasonably keen, and that the male might be trusted to attend to his biological functions on the slightest provocation, appears from the Hindu literature of love. The Kama Sutra, or Doctrine of Desire, is the most famous in a long list of works revealing a certain preoccupation with the physical and mental technique of sex. It was composed, the author assures us, according to the precepts of Holy Writ, for the benefit of the world, by Vatsyayana while leading the life of a religious student at Benares, and wholly engaged in the contemplation of the deity. He who neglects a girl, thinking she is too bashful, says this anchorite, is despised by her as a beast ignorant of the working of the female mind. Vatsyayana gives a delightful picture of a girl in love, but his wisdom is lavished chiefly upon the parental art of getting her married away, and the husbandly art of keeping her physically content. We must not presume that the sexual sensitivity of the Hindu led to any unusual license. 
child marriage raised a barrier against premarital relations, and the strong religious sanctions used in the inculcation of wifely fidelity made adultery far more difficult and rare than in Europe or America. Prostitution was for the most part confined to the temples. In the south, the needs of the Assyrian male were met by the providential institution of devadasis, literally servants of the gods, actually prostitutes. Each Tamil temple had a troop of sacred women engaged at first to dance and sing before the idols, and perhaps to entertain the Brahmins. Some of them seemed to have lived lives of almost conventual seclusion. Others were allowed to extend their services to all who could pay, on condition that a part of their earnings should be contributed to the clergy. Many of these temple courtesans, or notch girls, provided dancing and singing in public functions and private gatherings in the style of the geishas of Japan. Some of them learned to read and, like the hetairai of Greece, furnished cultured conversation in homes where the married women were neither encouraged to read nor allowed to mingle with the guests. In 1004 AD, as a sacred inscription informs us, the temple of the Chola king Rajaraja Tanjore had 400 devadasis. The custom acquired the sanctity of time, and no one seems to have considered it immoral. Respectable women now and then dedicated a daughter to the profession of temple prostitute in much the same spirit in which a son might be dedicated to the priesthood. Dubois, at the beginning of the 19th century, described the temples of the South as in some cases converted into mere brothels. The devadasis, whatever their original functions, were frankly called harlots by the public and were used as such. If we may believe the old abbe, who had no reason to be prejudiced in favor of India, their official duties consist in dancing and singing within the temples twice a day, and also at all public ceremonies. The first they execute with sufficient grace, although their attitudes are lascivious and their gestures indecorous. As regards their singing, it is almost always confined to obscene verses describing some licentious episode in the history of their gods. Under these circumstances of temple prostitution and child marriage, little opportunity was given for what we call romantic love. This idealistic devotion of one sex to the other appears in Indian literature, for example in the poems of Chandidas and Jayadeva, but usually as a symbol of the soul surrendering to God while in actual life it took most often the form of a complete devotion of the wife to her mate. The love poetry is sometimes of the ethereal type depicted by the Tennysons and Longfellows of our Puritan tradition. Sometimes it is the full-bodied and sensuous passion of the Elizabethan stage. One writer unites religion and love and sees in either ecstasy a recognition of identity. Another lists the 360 different emotions that fill the lover's heart and counts the patterns which his teeth have left on his beloved's flesh, or shows him decorating her breasts with painted flowers of sandal paste. And the author of the Nala and Damayanti episode in the Mahabharata describes the melancholy sighs and pale dyspepsia of the lovers in the best style of the French troubadours. Such whimsical passions were seldom permitted to determine marriage in India. Manu allowed eight different forms of marriage, in which marriage by capture and marriage from affection were ranked lowest in the moral scale and marriage by purchase was accepted as the sensible way of arranging a union. In the long run, the Hindu legislator thought, those marriages are most soundly based that rest upon an economic foundation. In the days of Dubois, to marry and to buy a wife were synonymous expressions in India. The wisest marriage was held to be one arranged by the parents with full regard for the rules of endogamy and exogamy. The youth must marry within his caste and outside his gotra, or group. He might take several wives, but only one of his own caste who was to have precedence over the rest. Preferably, said Manu, he was to be monogamous. The woman was to love her husband with patient devotion. The husband was to give his wife not romantic affection, but solicitous protection. The Hindu family was typically patriarchal, with the father full master of his wife, his children, and his slaves. Woman was a lovely but inferior being. In the beginning, says Hindu legend, when Twastri, the divine artificer, came to the creation of woman, he found that he had exhausted his materials in the making of man, and had no solid elements left. In this dilemma he fashioned her eclectically out of the odds and ends of creation. He took the rotundity of the moon and the curves of the creepers, the clinging of tendrils and the trembling of grass, and the slenderness of the reed and the bloom of flowers, and the lightness of leaves, and the tapering of the elephant's trunk and the glances of deer, and the clustering of rows of bees, and the joyous gaiety of sunbeams, 
and the weeping of clouds, and the fickleness of the winds, and the timidity of the hare, and the vanity of the peacock, and the softness of the parrot's bosom, and the hardness of adamant, and the sweetness of honey, and the cruelty of the tiger, and the warm glow of fire, and the coldness of snow, and the chattering of jays, and the cooing of the kokila, and the hypocrisy of the crane, and the fidelity of the chakravaka, and compounding all these together he made woman, and gave her to man. Nevertheless, despite all this equipment, woman fared poorly in India. Her high status in Vedic days was lost under priestly influence and Mohammedan example. The code of Manu set the tone against her in phrases reminiscent of an early stage in Christian theology. The source of dishonor is woman, the source of strife is woman, the source of earthly existence is woman, therefore avoid woman. A female, says another passage, is able to draw from the right path in this life not a fool only but even a sage, and can lead him in subjection to desire or to wrath. The law laid it down that all through her life woman should be in tutelage, first to her father, then to her husband, and finally to her son. The wife addressed her husband humbly as Master, Lord, even as my God. In public she walked some distance behind him and seldom received a word from him. She was expected to show her devotion by the most minute service, preparing the meals, eating, after they had finished, the food left by her husband and her sons, and embracing her husband's feet at bedtime. A faithful wife, said Manu, must serve her lord as if he were a god, and never do aught to pain him, whatsoever be his state, and even though devoid of every virtue. A wife who disobeyed her husband would become a jackal in her next incarnation. Like her sisters in Europe and America before our own times, the women of India received education only if they were ladies of high degree or temple prostitutes. The art of reading was considered inappropriate in a woman. Her power over men could not be increased by it, and her attractiveness would be diminished. Says Chitra in Tagore's play, When a woman is merely a woman, when she winds herself round and round men's hearts with her smiles and sobs and services and caressing endearments, then she is happy. Of what use to her? our learning and great achievements. Knowledge of the Vedas was denied to her. For a woman to study the Vedas, says the Mahabharata, is a sign of confusion in the realm. Megasthenes reported in Chandragupta's days that the Brahmins keep their wives, and they have many wives, ignorant of all philosophy. For if women learned to look upon pleasure and pain, life and death, philosophically, they would become depraved, or else no longer remain in subjection. In the code of Manu, three persons were ineligible to hold property, a wife, a son, and a slave. Whatever these might earn became the property of their master. A wife, however, could retain as her own the dowry and gifts that she received at her nuptials, and the mother of a prince might govern in his stead during his minority. The husband could divorce his wife for unchastity. The woman could not divorce her husband for any cause. A wife who drank liquor, or was deceased, or rebellious, or wasteful, or quarrelsome, might at any time be not divorced, but superseded by another wife. Passages of the Code advocate an enlightened gentleness to women. They are not to be struck even with a flower. They are not to be watched too strictly, for then their subtlety will find a way to mischief. And if they like fine raiment, it is wise to indulge them, for if the wife be not elegantly attired, she will not exhilarate her husband whereas when a wife is gaily adorned, the whole house is embellished. Way must be made for a woman as for the aged or a priest, and pregnant women, brides and damsels, shall have food before all other guests. The woman could not rule as a wife, she might rule as a mother. The greatest tenderness and respect was paid to the mother of many children, and even the patriarchal code of Manu said, The mother exceedeth a thousand fathers in the right to reverence. Doubtless the influx of Islamic ideas had something to do with the decline in the status of woman in India after Vedic days. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 1, Side 2. Doubtless the influx of Islamic ideas had something to do with the decline in the status of woman in India after Vedic days. The custom of purda, or curtain, the seclusion of married women, came into India with the Persians and the Mohammedans, and has therefore been stronger in the north than in the south. Partly to protect their wives from the Moslems, Hindu husbands developed a system of purda so rigid that a respectable woman could show herself only to her husband and her sons, 
and could move in public only under a heavy veil. Even the doctor who treated her and took her pulse had to do so through a curtain. In some circles it was a breach of good manners to inquire after a man's wife or to speak as a guest to the ladies of the house. The custom of burning widows on their husbands' pyres was also an importation into India. Herodotus describes it as practiced by the ancient Scythians and Thracians. If we may believe him, the wives of a Thracian fought for the privilege of being slain over his grave. Probably the rite came down from the almost worldwide primitive usage of immolating one or more of the wives or concubines of a prince or rich man, along with slaves and other perquisites, to take care of him in the beyond. The Atarva Veda speaks of it as an old custom, but the Rig Veda indicates that in Vedic days it had been softened to the requirement that the widow should lie on her husband's pyre for a moment before his cremation. The Mahabharata shows the institution restored and unrepentant. It gives several examples of sati, and lays down the rule that the chaste widow does not wish to survive her husband, but enters proudly into the fire. The sacrifice was effected by burning the wife in a pit, or among the Telugus in the south by burying her alive. Strabo reports that Sati prevailed in India in the time of Alexander, and that the Katiai, a Punjab tribe, had made Sati a law in order to prevent wives from poisoning their husbands. Manu makes no mention of the practice. The Brahmins opposed it at first, then accepted it, and finally lent it a religious sanction by interpreting it as bound up with the eternity of marriage. A woman once married to a man remained his forever, and would be rejoined to him in his later lives. In Rajasthan, the absolute possession of the wife by the husband took the form of the Johur, in which a Rajput, facing certain defeat, immolated his wives before advancing to his own death in battle. The usage was widespread under the Mughals, despite Moslem abhorrence, and even the powerful Akbar failed to dislodge it. On one occasion, Akbar himself tried to dissuade a Hindu bride who wished to be burned on the pyre of her dead betrothed. But though the Brahmins added their pleas to the kings, she insisted on the sacrifice. As the flames reached her, and Akbar's son Danayal continued to argue with her, she replied, Do not annoy, do not annoy. Another widow, rejecting similar pleas, held her finger in the flame of a lamp until the finger was completely burned. Giving no sign of pain, she indicated in this way her scorn of those who advised her to refuse the rite. In Vijayanagar, Sati sometimes took a wholesale form. Not one or a few, but all of the many wives of a prince or a captain followed him to death. Conti reports that the Raya, or king, had selected three thousand of his twelve thousand wives as favorites, on condition that at his death they should voluntarily burn themselves with him, which is considered to be a great honor for them. It is difficult to say how thoroughly the medieval Hindu widow was reconciled to Sati by religious inculcation and belief, and the hope of reunion with her husband in another life. Sati became less and less popular as India developed contacts with Europe, but the Hindu widow continued to suffer many disabilities. Since marriage bound a woman eternally to her husband, her remarriage after his death was a mortal offense and was bound to create confusion in his later existences. The widow was therefore required by Brahmanical law to remain unmarried, to shave her head, and live out her life, if she did not prefer sati, in the care of her children and in acts of private charity. She was not left destitute. On the contrary, she had a first lien on her husband's estate for her maintenance. These rules were followed only by the orthodox women of the middle and upper classes, that is, by some thirty percent of the population. They were ignored by Moslems, Sikhs, and the lower castes. Hindu opinion likened this second virginity of the widow to the celibacy of nuns in Christendom. In either case, some women renounced marriage and were set aside for charitable ministrations. 4. Manners, Customs, and Character Sexual modesty, hygiene, dress, appearance, the gentle art among the Hindus, faults and virtues, games, festivals, death. It will seem incredible to the provincial mind that the same people that tolerated such institutions as child marriage, temple prostitution, and sati was also preeminent in gentleness, decency, and courtesy. Aside from a few devadasis, prostitutes were rare in India, and sexual propriety was exceptionally high. It must be admitted, says the unsympathetic Dubois, that the laws of etiquette and social politeness are much more clearly laid down, and much better observed by all classes of Hindus, even by the lowest, than they are by people of corresponding social position in Europe. 
The leading role played by sex in Occidental conversation and wit was quite alien to Hindu manners, which forbade any public intimacy between men and women, and looked upon the physical contact of the sexes in dancing as improper and obscene. A Hindu woman might go anywhere in public without fear of molestation or insult. Indeed, the risks, as the Oriental saw the matter, was all on the other side. Manu warns men, Woman is by nature ever inclined to tempt man. Hence a man should not sit in a secluded place even with his nearest female relative, and he must never look higher than the ankles of a passing girl. Cleanliness was literally next to godliness in India. Hygiene was not, as Anatole France thought, la seule morale, but it was made an essential part of piety. Manu laid down many centuries ago an exacting code of physical refinement. Early in the morning, one instruction reads, let him, the Brahmin, bathe, decorate his body, clean his teeth, apply collyrium to his eyes, and worship the gods. The native schools made good manners and personal cleanliness the first courses in the curriculum. Every day the caste Hindu would bathe his body and wash the simple robe he was to wear. It seemed to him abominable to use the same garment unwashed for more than a day. The Hindus, said Sir William Huber, stand out as examples of bodily cleanliness among Asiatic races, and, we may add, among the races of the world. The ablutions of the Hindu have passed into a proverb. Yuan Chuang, thirteen hundred years ago, described thus the eating habits of the Hindus. They are pure of themselves and not from compulsion. Before every meal they must have a wash. The fragments and remains are not served up again. The food utensils are not passed on. Those which are of pottery or of wood must be thrown away after use, and those which are of gold, silver, copper, or iron get another polishing. As soon as a meal is over they chew the tooth stick and make themselves clean. Before they have finished ablutions, they do not come in contact with each other. The Brahmin usually washed his hands, feet, and teeth before and after each meal. He ate with his fingers from food on a leaf, and thought it unclean to use twice a plate, a knife, or a fork, and when finished he rinsed his mouth seven times. The toothbrush was always new, a twig freshly plucked from a tree. To the Hindu it seemed disreputable to brush the teeth with the hair of an animal, or to use the same brush twice. So many are the ways in which men may scorn one another. The Hindu chewed almost incessantly the leaf of the beetle plant, which blackened the teeth in a manner disagreeable to Europeans and agreeable to himself. This and the occasional use of opium consoled him for his usual abstention from tobacco and intoxicating drinks. Hindu law books give explicit rules for menstrual hygiene and for meeting the demands of nature. Nothing could exceed in complexity or solemnity the ritual for Brahmin defecation. The twice-born must use only his left hand in this rite, and must cleanse the parts with water, and he considered his house defiled by the very presence of Europeans who contended themselves with paper. The outcasts, however, and many shudras, were less particular, and might turn any roadside into a privy. In the quarters occupied by these classes public sanitation was confined to an open sewer line in the middle of the street. In so warm a climate clothing was a superfluity, and beggars and saints bridged the social scale in agreeing to do without it. One southern caste, like the Canadian Dukabors, threatened to migrate if its members were compelled to wear clothing. Until the late eighteenth century it was probably the custom in southern India, as still in Bali, for both sexes to go naked above the waist. Children were dressed for the most part in beads and rings. Most of the population went barefoot. If the orthodox Hindu wore shoes, they had to be of cloth, for under no circumstances would he use shoes of leather. A large number of the men contented themselves with loincloths. When they needed more covering, they bound some fabric about the waist and threw the loose end over the left shoulder. The Rajputs wore trousers of every color and shape, with a tunic girdled by a ceinture, a scarf at the neck, sandals or boots on the feet, and a turban on the head. The turban had come in with the Moslems, and had been taken over by the Hindus, who wound it carefully around the head in varying manner according to caste, but always with the generosity of a magician unfurling endless silk. Sometimes one turban unraveled reached the length of seventy feet. The women wore a flowing robe, colorful silk sari or homespun kadar, which passed over both shoulders, clasped the waist tightly, and then fell to the feet. Often a few inches of bronze flesh were left bare below the breast. Hair was oiled to guard it against the desiccating sun. Men divided theirs in the center and threw it together into a tuft behind the left ear. Women coiled a part of theirs upon their heads, 
but let the rest hang free, often decorating it with flowers or covering it with a scarf. The men were handsome, the young women were beautiful, and all presented a magnificent carriage. An ordinary Hindu in a loincloth often had more dignity than a European diplomat completely equipped. Pierre Loti thought it incontestable that the beauty of the Aryan race reaches its highest development of perfection and refinement among the upper class in India. Both sexes were adept in cosmetics, and the women felt naked without jewelry. A ring in the left nostril denoted marriage. On the forehead, in most cases, was a painted symbol of religious faith. It is difficult to go below these surface appearances and describe the character of the Hindus, for every people harbors all virtues and all vices, and witnesses tend to select such of these as will point their moral and adorn their tale. I think we may take as their greatest vice, says Père Dubois, the untrustworthiness, deceit, and double-dealing which are common to all Hindus. Certain it is that there is no nation in the world which thinks so lightly of an oath or of perjury. Lying, says Vestermark, has been called the national vice of the Hindus. Hindus are wily and deceitful, says Macaulay. According to the laws of Manu and the practice of the world, a lie told for good motives is forgivable. If, for example, the death of a priest would result from speaking the truth, falsehood is justifiable. But Yuan Chuang tells us, they do not practice deceit, and they keep their sworn obligations. They will not take anything wrongfully, and they yield more than fairness requires. Abu el Fazl, not prejudiced in favor of India, reports the Hindus of the 16th century as religious, affable, cheerful, lovers of justice, given to retirement, able in business, admirers of truth, grateful, and of unbounded fidelity. Their honesty, said honest Kier Hardy, is proverbial. They borrow and lend on word of mouth, and the repudiation of a debt is almost unknown. I have had before me, says a British judge in India, hundreds of cases in which a man's property, liberty, and life depended upon his telling a lie, and he has refused to tell it. How shall we reconcile these conflicting testimonies? Perhaps it is very simple. Some Hindus are honest, and some are not. Again, the Hindus are very cruel and gentle. The English language has derived a short and ugly word from that strange secret society, almost a caste, of tugs, or thugs, which in the 18th and 19th centuries committed thousands of atrocious murders in order, they said, to offer the victims as sacrifices to the goddess Kali. Vincent Smith writes of these thugs, literally cheats, in terms not quite irrelevant to our time. The gangs had little to fear and enjoyed almost complete immunity. They always had powerful protectors. The moral feeling of the people had sunk so low that there were no signs of general reprehension of the cold-blooded crimes committed by the thugs. They were accepted as part of the established order of things, and until the secrets of the organization were given away, it was usually impossible to obtain evidence against even the most notorious thugs. Nevertheless, there is comparatively little crime in India and little violence. By universal admission, the Hindus are gentle to the point of timidity too worshipful and good-natured, too long broken upon the wheel of conquest and alien despotisms, to be good fighters except in the sense that they can bear pain with unequaled bravery. Their greatest faults are probably listlessness and laziness, but in the Hindus these are not faults but climatic necessities and adaptations, like the dolce farniente of the Latin peoples and the economic fever of the Americans. The Hindus are sensitive, emotional, temperamental, imaginative, Therefore, they are better artists and poets than rulers or executives. They can exploit their fellows with the same zest that characterizes the entrepreneur everywhere. Yet they are given to limitless charity, and are the most hospitable hosts this side of barbarism. Even their enemies admit their courtesy, and a generous Britisher sums up his long experience by ascribing to the higher classes in Calcutta polished manners, clearness and comprehensiveness of understanding, liberality of feeling, and independence of principle that would have stamped them gentlemen in any country in the world. The Hindu genius to an outsider seems somber, and doubtless the Hindus have not had much cause for laughter. The dialogues of Buddha indicate a great variety of games, including one that strangely resembles chess, but neither these nor their successors exhibit the vivacity and joyousness of Western games. Akbar in the sixteenth century, introduced into India the game of polo, which had apparently come from Persia and was making its way across Tibet to China and Japan. And it pleased him to play Pachisi, the modern Parchisi, on squares cut in the pavement of the palace quadrangle at Agra, with pretty slave girls as living pieces. 
Frequent religious festivals lent color to public life. Greatest of all was the Durga Puja, in honor of the great goddess mother Kali. For weeks before its approach, the Hindus feasted and sang, but the culminating ceremonial was a procession in which every family carried an image of the goddess to the Ganges, flung it into the river, and returned homeward with all merriness spent. The Holi festival, celebrated in honor of the goddess Vasanti, took on a Saturnalian character. Phallic emblems were carried in parade and were made to simulate the motions of coitus. In Chotanagpur, the harvest was the signal for general license. Men set aside all conventions, women all modesty, and complete liberty was given to the girls. The Parganite, a caste of peasants in the Raj Mahal hills, held an annual agricultural festival in which the unmarried were allowed to indulge freely in promiscuous relations. Doubtless we have here again relics of vegetation magic intended to promote the fertility of families and the fields. More decorous were the wedding festivals that marked the great event in the life of every Hindu. Many a father brought himself to ruin in providing a sumptuous feast for the marriage of his daughter or his son. At the other end of life was the final ceremony, cremation. In Buddha's days, the Zoroastrian exposure of the corpse to birds of prey was the usual mode of departure, but persons of distinction were burned after death on a pyre, and their ashes were buried under a tope or stupa, that is, a memorial shrine. In later days, cremation became the privilege of every man. Each night one might see faggots being brought together for the burning of the dead. In Yuan Chuang's time, it was not unusual for the very old to take death by the forelock and have themselves rowed by their children to the middle of the Ganges, where they threw themselves into the saving stream. Suicide, under certain conditions, has always found more approval in the East than in the West. It was permitted under the laws of Akbar to the old or the incurably diseased, and to those who wished to offer themselves as sacrifices to the gods. Thousands of Hindus have made their last oblation by starving themselves to death, or burying themselves in snow, or covering themselves with cow dung and setting it on fire, or allowing crocodiles to devour them at the mouths of the Ganges. Among the Brahmins, a form of harakiri arose, by which suicide was committed to avenge an injury or point a wrong. When one of the Rajput kings levied a subsidy upon the priestly caste, several of the wealthiest Brahmins stabbed themselves to death in his presence, laying upon him the supposedly most terrible and effective curse of all, that of a dying priest. The Brahmanical law books required that he who had resolved to die by his own hand should fast for three days, and that he who attempted suicide and failed should perform the severest penances. Life is a stage with one entrance, but many exits. Chapter 18 The Paradise of the Gods In no other country is religion so powerful or so important as in India. If the Hindus have permitted alien governments to be set over them again and again, it is partly because they did not care much who ruled or exploited them, natives or foreigners. The crucial matter was religion, not politics, the soul, not the body, endless later lives rather than this passing one. When Ashoka became a saint and Akbar almost adopted Hinduism, the power of religion was revealed over even the strongest men. In our century it is a saint rather than a statesman who for the first time in history has unified all India. 1. The Later History of Buddhism The Zenith of Buddhism The Two Vehicles Mahayana Buddhism, Stoicism, and Christianity The Decay of Buddhism Its Migrations Ceylon, Burma, Turkestan, Tibet, Cambodia, China, Japan Two hundred years after Ashoka's death, Buddhism reached the peak of its curve in India. The period of Buddhist growth from Ashoka to Hasha was in many ways the climax of Indian religion, education, and art. But the Buddhism that prevailed was not that of Buddha. We might better describe it as that of his rebellious disciple Subhadda, who on hearing of the Master's death said to the monks, Enough, sirs, weep not, neither lament. We are well rid of the great Samana. We used to be annoyed by being told, This beseems you, this beseems you not. But now we shall be able to do whatever we like and what we do not like, that we shall not have to do. The first thing they did with their freedom was to split into sects. Within two centuries of Buddha's death, eighteen varieties of Buddhistic doctrine had divided the Master's heritage. 
The Buddhists of South India and Ceylon held fast for a time to the simpler and purer creed of the founder, which came to be called Hinayana, or the lesser vehicle. They worshipped Buddha as a great teacher, but not as a god, and their scriptures were the Pali texts of the more ancient faith. But throughout northern India, Tibet, Mongolia, China, and Japan, the Buddhism that prevailed was the Mahayana, or the greater vehicle, defined and propagated by Kanishka's council. These politically inspired theologians announced the divinity of Buddha, surrounded him with angels and saints, adopted the yoga asceticism of Patanjali, and issued in Sanskrit a new set of holy writ, which, though it lent itself readily to metaphysical and scholastic refinements, proclaimed and certified a more popular religion than the austere pessimism of Shakyamuni. The Mahayana was Buddhism softened with Brahmanical deities, practices, and myths, and adapted to the needs of the Kushan Tatars and the Mongols of Tibet, over whom Kanishka had extended his rule. A heaven was conceived in which there were many Buddhas, of whom Amida Buddha, the Redeemer, came to be the best beloved by the people. This heaven and a corresponding hell were to be the reward or punishment of good or evil done on earth, and would thereby liberate some of the king's militia for other services. The greatest of the saints in this new theology were the Bodhisattvas, or future Buddhas, who voluntarily refrained from achieving the nirvana, here freedom from rebirth, that was within their merit and power, in order to be reborn into life after life, and to help others on earth to find the way. As in Mediterranean Christianity, these saints became so popular that they almost crowded out the head of the pantheon in worship and art. The veneration of relics, the use of holy water, candles, incense, the rosary, clerical vestments, a liturgical dead language, monks and nuns, monastic tonsure and celibacy, confession, fast days, the canonization of saints, purgatory, and masses for the dead flourished in Buddhism as in medieval Christianity, and seemed to have appeared in Buddhism first. Mahayana became to Hinayana, or primitive Buddhism, what Catholicism was to Stoicism and primitive Christianity. Buddha, like Luther, had made the mistake of supposing that the drama of religious ritual could be replaced with sermons and morality, and the victory of a Buddhism rich in myths, miracles, ceremonies, and intermediating saints corresponds to the ancient and current triumph of a colorful and dramatic Catholicism over the austere simplicity of early Christianity and modern Protestantism. That same popular preference for polytheism, miracles, and myths which destroyed Buddha's Buddhism finally destroyed in India the Buddhism of the greater vehicle itself. For, to speak with the hindsight wisdom of the historian, if Buddhism was to take over so much of Hinduism, so many of its legends, its rites, and its gods, soon very little would remain to distinguish the two religions, and the one with the deeper roots, the more popular appeal, and the richer economic resources and political support would gradually absorb the other. Rapidly, superstition, which seems to be the very lifeblood of our race, poured over from the older faith to the younger one, until even the phallic enthusiasms of the Shakti sects found place in the ritual of Buddhism. Slowly the patient and tenacious Brahmins recaptured influence and imperial patronage, and the success of the youthful philosopher Shankara in restoring the authority of the Vedas as the basis of Hindu thought put an end to the intellectual leadership of the Buddhists in India. The final blow came from without and was in a sense invited by Buddhism itself. The prestige of the Sangha, or Buddhist order, had, after Ashoka, drawn the best blood of Magadha into a celibate and pacific clergy. Even in Buddha's time some patriots had complained that the monk Gautama causes fathers to beget no sons, and families to become extinct. The growth of Buddhism and monasticism in the first year of our era sapped the manhood of India, and conspired with political division to leave India open to easy conquest. When the Arabs came, pledged to spread a simple and stoic monotheism, they looked with scorn upon the lazy, venal, miracle-mongering Buddhist monks. They smashed the monasteries, killed thousands of monks, and made monasticism unpopular with the cautious. The survivors were reabsorbed into the Hinduism that had begotten them. The ancient orthodoxy received the penitent heresy, and Brahmanism killed Buddhism by a fraternal embrace. Brahmanism had always been tolerant. In all the history of the rise and fall of Buddhism and a hundred other sects, we find much disputation, but no instance of persecution. On the contrary, Brahmanism eased the return of the prodigal by proclaiming Buddha a god, as an avatar of Vishnu, 
ending animal sacrifice and accepting into orthodox practice the Buddhist doctrine of the sanctity of all animal life. Quietly and peacefully, after half a thousand years of gradual decay, Buddhism disappeared from India. Meanwhile, it was winning nearly all of the remainder of the Asiatic world. Its ideas, its literature and its art spread to Ceylon and the Malay Peninsula in the south, to Tibet and Turkestan in the north, to Burma, Siam, Cambodia, China, Korea, and Japan in the east. In this way, all of these regions except the Far East received as much civilization as they could digest, precisely as Western Europe and Russia received civilization from Roman and Byzantine monks in the Middle Ages. The cultural zenith of most of these nations came from the stimulus of Buddhism. From the time of Ashoka to its decay in the ninth century, Anura Dapura in Ceylon was one of the major cities of the Oriental world. The bow tree there has been worshipped for two thousand years, and the temple on the heights of Kandy is one of the meccas of the 150 million Buddhists of Asia. The Buddhism of Burma is probably the purest now extant, and its monks often approach the ideal of Buddha. Under their ministrations, the 13 million inhabitants of Burma have reached a standard of living considerably higher than that of India. Sven Hedden, Aurel Stein, and Peleo have unearthed from the sands of Turkestan hundreds of Buddhist manuscripts and other evidences of a culture which flourished there from the time of Kanishka to the 13th century A.D. In the 7th century of our era, the enlightened warrior Srongtsan Gampo established an able government in Tibet, annexed Nepal, built Lhasa as his capital, and made it rich as a halfway house in Chinese Indian trade. Having invited Buddhist monks to come from India and spread Buddhism and education among his people, he retired from rule for four years in order to learn how to read and write, and inaugurated the Golden Age of Tibet. Thousands of monasteries were built in the mountains and on the Great Plateau, and a voluminous Tibetan canon of Buddhist books was published in 333 volumes, which preserved for modern scholarship many works whose Hindu originals have long been lost. Here, aromatically sealed from the rest of the world, Buddhism developed into a maze of superstitions, monasticism and ecclesiasticism rivaled only by early medieval Europe, and the Dalai Lama, or all-embracing priest, hidden away in the great Potala monastery that overlooks the city of Lhasa, is still believed by the good people of Tibet to be the living incarnation of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. In Cambodia, or Indochina, Buddhism conspired with Hinduism to provide the religious framework for one of the richest ages in the history of Oriental art. Buddhism, like Christianity, won its greatest triumphs outside the land of its birth, and it won them without shedding a drop of blood. 2. The New Divinities Hinduism, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Krishna, Kali, Animal Gods, the Sacred Cow, Polytheism, and Monotheism the Hinduism that now replaced Buddhism was not one religion, nor was it only religion. It was a medley of faiths and ceremonies whose practitioners had only four qualities in common. They recognized the caste system and the leadership of the Brahmins. They reverenced the cow as especially representative of divinity. They accepted the law of karma and the transmigration of souls, and they replaced with new gods the deities of the Vedas. These faiths had in part antedated and survived Vedic nature worship, in part, they had grown from the connivance of the Brahmins at rites, divinities, and beliefs unknown to the scriptures and largely contrary to the Vedic spirit. They had boiled in the cauldron of Hindu religious thought even while Buddhism maintained a passing intellectual ascendancy. The gods of Hinduism were characterized by a kind of anatomical superabundance, vaguely symbolizing extraordinary knowledge, activity, or power. The new Brahma had four faces, Kartikeya, six, Shiva had three eyes, Indra a thousand, and nearly every deity had four arms. At the head of this revised pantheon was Brahma, chivalrously neuter, acknowledged master of the gods, but no more noticed in actual worship than a constitutional monarch in modern Europe. Combined with him and Shiva in a triad, not a trinity, of dominant deities was Vishnu, a god of love who repeatedly became man in order to help mankind. His greatest incarnation was Krishna. As such, he was born in a prison, had accomplished many marvels of heroism and romance, healed the deaf and the blind, helped lepers, championed the poor, and raised men from the grave. He had a beloved disciple, Arjuna, before whom he was transfigured. He died, some say, by an arrow, others say by a crucifixion on a tree. 
He descended into hell, rose to heaven, and will return on the last day to judge the quick and the dead. To the Hindu there are three chief processes in life and the universe, creation, preservation, and destruction. Hence divinity takes for him three main forms, Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer. These are the Trimurti, or three shapes, which all Hindus but the Jains adore. Popular devotion is divided between Vaishnavism, the religion of Vishnu, and Shivaism, the religion of Shiva. The two cults are peaceful neighbors and sometimes hold sacrifices in the same temple, and the wise Brahmins, followed by a majority of the people, pay equal honor to both these gods. Pious Vaishnavites paint upon their foreheads every morning with red clay the trident sign of Vishnu. Pious Shivaites trace horizontal lines across their brows with cow dung ashes, or wear the linga, symbol of the male organ, fastened on their arms or hung from their necks. The worship of Shiva is one of the oldest, most profound, and most terrible elements in Hinduism. Sir John Marshall reports unmistakable evidence of the cult of Shiva at Mohenjo-daro, partly in the form of a three-headed Shiva, partly in the form of little stone columns, which he presumes to be as phallic as their modern counterparts. Shivaism, he concludes, is therefore the most ancient living faith in the world. The name of the god is a euphemism. Literally it means propitious, whereas Shiva himself is viewed chiefly as a god of cruelty and destruction, the personification of that cosmic force which destroys one after another all the forms that reality takes, all cells, all organisms, all species, all ideas, all works, all planets, and all things. Never has another people dared to face the impermanence of forms and the impartiality of nature so frankly, or to recognize so clearly that evil balances good, that destruction goes step by step with creation, and that all birth is a capital crime punishable with death. The Hindu, tortured with a thousand misfortunes and sufferings, sees in them the handiwork of a vivacious force that appears to find pleasure in breaking down everything that Brahma, the creative power in nature, has produced. Shiva dances to the tune of a perpetually forming, dissolving, and reforming world. Just as death is the penalty of birth, so birth is the frustration of death, and the same God who symbolizes destruction represents also, for the Hindu mind, that passion and torrent of reproduction which overrides the death of the individual with the continuance of the race. In some parts of India, particularly Bengal, this creative or reproductive energy, Shakti, of Shiva or nature, is personified in the figure of Shiva's wife, Kali, Parvati, Uma, Durga, and is worshipped in one of the many Shakti cults. Until the last century, this worship was a bloody ritual, often involving human sacrifice. Latterly, the goddess has been content with goats. The deity is portrayed for the populace by a black figure with gaping mouth and protruding tongue, adorned with snakes and dancing upon a corpse. Her earrings are dead men, her necklace is a string of skulls, her face and breasts are smeared with blood. Two of her four hands carry a sword and a severed head. The other two are extended in blessing and protection. For Kali Parvati is the goddess of motherhood as well as the bride of destruction and death. She can be tender as well as cruel, and can smile as well as kill. Once, perhaps, she was a mother goddess in Sumeria, and was imported into India before she became so terrible. Doubtless she and her lord are made as horrible as possible in order that timid worshippers may be frightened into decency, and perhaps into generosity to the priests. The priests of Shivaism, however, are seldom Brahmins, and the majority of the Brahmins look with scorn and regret upon the Shakti cult. These are the greater gods of Hinduism, but they are merely five of thirty million deities in the Hindu pantheon. Only to catalogue them would take a hundred volumes. Some of them are more properly angels, some are what we should call devils, some are heavenly bodies like the sun, some are mascots like Lakshmi, the goddess of good luck. Many of them are beasts of the field or fowl of the air. To the Hindu mind there is no real gap between animals and men. Animals as well as men had souls, and souls were perpetually passing from men into animals and back again. All these species were woven into one infinite web of karma and reincarnation. The elephant, for example, became the god Ganesha, and was recognized as Shiva's son. 
He personified man's animal nature, and at the same time his image served as a charm against evil fortune. Monkeys and snakes were terrible and therefore divine. The cobra, or naga, whose bite causes almost immediate death, received a special veneration. Annually the people of many parts of India celebrated a religious feast in honor of snakes and made offerings of milk and plantains to the cobras at the entrance to their holes. Temples have been erected in honor of snakes, as in eastern Mysore. Great numbers of reptiles take up their residence in these buildings and are fed and cared for by the priests. Crocodiles, tigers, peacocks, parrots, even rats receive their meed of worship. Most sacred of all animals to a Hindu is the cow. Images of bulls in every material and size appear in temples and homes, and in the city squares. The cow itself is the most popular organism in India, and has full freedom of the streets. Its dung is used as fuel or a holy ointment. Its urine is a sacred wine that will wash away all inner or outer uncleanness. Under no circumstances are these animals to be eaten by a Hindu, nor is their flesh to be worn as clothing, headgear or gloves or shoes. And when they die they are to be buried with the pomp of religious ritual. Perhaps wise statesmanship once decreed this taboo in order to preserve agricultural draft animals for the growing population of India. Today, however, they number almost one-fourth as many as the population. The Hindu view is that it is no more unreasonable to feel a profound affection for cows and a profound revulsion at the thought of eating them than it is to have similar feelings in regard to domestic cats and dogs. The cynical view of the matter is that the Brahmins believed that cows should never be slaughtered, that insects should never be injured, and that widows should be burned alive. The truth is that the worship of animals occurs in the history of every people, and that if one must deify any animal, the kind and placid cow seems entitled to her measure of devotion. We must not be too haughtily shocked by the menagerie of Hindu gods. We too have had our serpent devil of Eden, our golden calf of the Old Testament, our sacred fish of the catacombs, and our gracious Lamb of God. The secret of polytheism is the inability of the simple mind to think in impersonal terms. It can understand persons more readily than forces, wills more easily than laws. The Hindu suspects that our human senses see only the outside of the events that they report. Behind the veil of these phenomena he thinks there are countless superphysical beings whom, in Kant's phrase, we can only conceive but never perceive. A certain philosophical tolerance in the Brahmins has added to the teeming pantheon of India. Local or tribal gods have been received into the Hindu Valhalla by adoption, usually by interpreting them as aspects or avatars of accepted deities. Every faith could get its credentials if it paid its dues. In the end, nearly every god became a phase, attribute, or incarnation of another god, until all these divinities, to adult Hindu minds, merged into one. Polytheism became pantheism, almost monotheism, almost monism. Just as a good Christian may pray to the Madonna or one of a thousand saints, and yet be a monotheist in the sense that he recognizes one God as supreme, so the Hindu prays to Kali or Rama or Krishna or Ganesha, without presuming for a moment that these are supreme deities. Some Hindus recognize Vishnu as supreme, some call Shiva merely a subordinate divinity. Some call Shiva supreme and make Vishnu an angel. If only a few worship Brahma, it is because of its impersonality, its intangibility, its distance, and for the same reason that most churches in Christendom were erected to Mary or a saint, while Christianity waited for Voltaire to raise a chapel to God. 3. Beliefs The Puranas, the reincarnations of the universe, the migrations of the soul, karma, its philosophical aspects, life as evil, release. Mingled with this complex theology is a complex mythology at once superstitious and profound. The Vedas having died in the language in which they were written, and the metaphysics of the Brahmin schools being beyond the comprehension of the people, Vyasa and others over a period of a thousand years, 500 B.C. to 500 A.D., composed eighteen Puranas, old stories, in four hundred thousand couplets, expounding to the laity the exact truth about the creation of the world, its periodical evolution and dissolution, the genealogy of the gods, and the history of the heroic age. These books made no pretense to literary form, logical order, or numerical moderation. They insisted that the lovers Urvashi and Pururavas 
spent 61,000 years in pleasure and delight. But through the intelligibility of their language, the attractiveness of their parables, and the orthodoxy of their doctrine, they became the second Bible of Hinduism, the grand repository of its superstitions, its myths, even of its philosophy. Here, for example, in the Vishnu Purana is the oldest and ever-recurrent theme of Hindu thought, that individual separateness is an illusion, and that all life is one. After a thousand years came Ribu to Nidaga's city to impart further knowledge to him. He saw him outside the city, just as the king was about to enter with a great train of attendants, standing afar and holding himself apart from the crowd, his neck wizened with fasting, returning from the wood with fuel and grass. When Ribu saw him, he went to him and greeted him, and said, O Brahman, why standest thou here alone? Nidaga said, Behold the crowd pressing about the king who is just entering the city. That is why I stand alone. Ribu said, Which of these is the king, and who are the others? Tell me that, for thou seemest informed. Nidaga said, He who rides upon the fiery elephant, towering like a mountain peak, that is the king. The others are his attendants. Ribu said, these two, the king and the elephant, are pointed out by you without being separated by mark of distinction. Give me the mark of distinction between them. I would know which is here the elephant and which the king. Nidaga said, The elephant is below, the king is above him. Who does not know the relationship of born to bearer? Ribu said, That I may know, teach me. What is that which is indicated by the word below, and what is above? Straight Nidaga sprang upon the guru and said to him, here now I will tell thee what thou demandest of me. I am above like the king, you are below like the elephant. For thy instruction I give thee this example. Ribu said, If you are in the position of the king, and I in that of the elephant, so tell me this still, which of us is you, and which is I? Then swiftly Nidaga, falling down before him, clasped his feet and spake, Truly thou art Ribu, my master. By this I know that thou, my guru, art come. Ribu said, Yes, to give thee teaching. Because of thy former willingness to serve me, I, Ribu, by name, am come to thee. And what I have just taught thee, in short, heart of highest truth, that is, complete non-duality. When he had thus spoken to Nidaga, the guru Ribu departed thence. But forthwith Nidaga, taught by this symbolic teaching, turned his mind completely to non-duality. All beings from thenceforth he saw not distinct from himself, and so he saw Brahman, and thus he achieved the highest salvation. In these Puranas and kindred writings of medieval India, we find a very modern theory of the universe. This book is continued on Cassette 2, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 2, Side 1. In these Puranas and kindred writings of medieval India, we find a very modern theory of the universe. There is no creation in the sense of Genesis. The world is perpetually evolving and dissolving, growing and decaying, through cycle after cycle, like every plant in it and every organism. Brahma, or as the Creator is more often called in this literature, Prajapati, is the spiritual force that upholds this endless process. We do not know how the universe began, if it did. Perhaps, say the Puranas, Brahma laid it as an egg and then hatched it by sitting on it. Perhaps it is a passing error of the Maker, or a little joke. Each cycle, or kalpa, in the history of the universe is divided into a thousand Mahayugas, or great ages, of 4,320,000 years each. And each Mahayuga contains four yugas, or ages, in which the human race undergoes a gradual deterioration. In the present Mahayuga, three ages have now passed, totaling 3,888,888 years. We live in the fourth age, the Kali Yuga, or Age of Misery. 5,035 years of this bitter era have elapsed, but 426,965 remain. Then the world will suffer one of its periodical deaths, and Brahma will begin another day of Brahma, that is, a Kalpa, of 4,320,000,000 years. In each Kalpa cycle the universe develops by natural means and processes, and by natural means and processes decays. The destruction of the whole world is as certain as the death of a mouse, and to the philosopher not more important. There is no final purpose towards which the whole creation moves, there is no progress, 
There is only endless repetition. Through all these ages and great ages, billions of souls have passed from species to species, from body to body, from life to life, in weary transmigration. An individual is not really an individual. He is a link in the chain of life, a page in the chronicle of a soul. A species is not really a separate species, for the souls in these flowers or fleas may yesterday have been or tomorrow may be the spirits of men. All life is one. A man is only partly a man, he is also an animal. Shreds and echoes of past lower existences linger in him and make him more akin to the brute than to the sage. Man is only a part of nature, not actually its center or master. A life is only a part of a soul's career, not the entirety. Every form is transitory, but every reality is continuous and one. The many reincarnations of a soul are like years or days in a single life, and may bring the soul now to growth, now to decay. How can the individual life, so brief in the tropic torrent of generations, contain all the history of a soul, or give it due punishment and reward for its evil and its good? And if the soul is immortal, how could one short life determine its fate forever? When the Hindu is asked why we have no memory of our past incarnations, he answers that likewise we have no memory of our infancy. And as we presume our infancy to explain our maturity, so he presumes past existences to explain our place and fate in our present life. Life can be understood, says the Hindu, only on the assumption that each existence is bearing the penalty or enjoying the fruits of vice or virtue in some antecedent life. No deed, small or great, good or bad, can be without effect. Everything will out. This is the law of karma, the law of the deed, the law of causality in the spiritual world, and it is the highest and most terrible law of all. If a man does justice and kindness without sin, his reward cannot come in one mortal span. It is stretched over other lives in which, if his virtue persists, he will be reborn into loftier place and larger good fortune. But if he lives evilly, he will be reborn as an outcast or a weasel or a dog. This law of karma, like the Greek moira or fate, is above both gods and men. Even the gods do not change its absolute operation. Or, as the theologians put it, karma and the will or action of the gods are one. But karma is not fate. Fate implies the helplessness of man to determine his own lot. Karma makes him, taking all his lives as a whole, the creator of his own destiny. Nor do heaven and hell end the work of karma, or the chain of births and deaths. The soul, after the death of the body, may go to hell for special punishment, or to heaven for quick and special reward, but no soul stays in hell, and few souls stay in heaven forever. Nearly every soul that enters them must sooner or later return to earth and live out its karma in new incarnations. Biologically, there was much truth in this doctrine. We are the reincarnations of our ancestors, and will be reincarnated in our children. And the defects of the fathers are to some extent, though perhaps not as much as good conservatives suppose, visited upon the children, even through many generations. Karma was an excellent myth for dissuading the human beast from murder, theft, procrastination, or operatorial parsimony. Furthermore, it extended the sense of moral unity and obligations to all life, and gave the moral code an extent of application far greater and more logical than in any other civilization. Good Hindus do not kill insects if they can possibly avoid it. Even those whose aspirations to virtue are modest treat animals as humble brethren rather than as lower creatures over whom they have dominion by divine command. Philosophically, karma explained for India many facts otherwise obscure in meaning or bitterly unjust. All those eternal inequalities among men which so frustrate the eternal demands for equality and justice all the diverse forms of evil that blacken the earth and redden the stream of history, all the suffering that enters into human life with birth and accompanies it unto death, seemed intelligible to the Hindu who accepted karma. These evils and injustices, these variations between idiocy and genius, poverty and wealth, were the results of past existences, the inevitable working out of a law unjust for a life or a moment, but perfectly just in the end. The belief in karma and transmigration is the greatest theoretical obstacle to removal of the caste system from India, for the orthodox Hindu presumes that caste differences are decreed by the soul's conduct in past lives and are part of a divine plan which it would be sacrilegious to disturb. 
Karma is one of those many inventions by which men have sought to bear evil patiently and to face life with hope, to explain evil and to find for men some scheme in which they may accept it, if not with good cheer, then with peace of mind. This is the task that most religions have attempted to fulfill. Since the real problem of life is not suffering but undeserved suffering, the religion of India mitigates the human tragedy by giving meaning and value to grief and pain. The soul in Hindu theology has at least this consolation, that it must bear the consequences only of its own acts. Unless it questions all existence, it can accept evil as a passing punishment and look forward to tangible rewards for virtue born. But in truth, the Hindus do question all existence. Oppressed with an enervating environment, national subjection and economic exploitation, they have tended to look upon life as more a bitter punishment than an opportunity or a reward. The Vedas, written by a hardy race coming in from the north, were almost as optimistic as Whitman. Buddha, representing the same stock five hundred years later, already denied the value of life. The Puranas, five centuries later still, represented a view more profoundly pessimistic than anything known in the West except in stray moments of philosophic doubt. The East, until reached by the Industrial Revolution, could not understand the zest with which the Occident has taken life. It saw only superficiality and childishness in our merciless busyness, our discontented ambition, our nerve-racking, labor-saving devices, our progress and speed. It could no more comprehend this profound immersion in the surface of things, this clever refusal to look ultimates in the face, than the West can fathom the quiet inertia, the stagnation and hopelessness, quote-unquote, of the traditional East. Heat cannot understand cold. What is the most wonderful thing in the world? asks Yama of Yudhishthira. And Yudhishthira replies, Man after man dies. Seeing this, men still move about as if they were immortal. By death the world is afflicted, say the Mahabharata. By age it is held in bar, and the nights are the unfailing ones that are ever coming and going. When I know that death cannot halt, what can I expect from walking in a cover of lore? And in the Ramayana, Sita asks, as her reward for fidelity through every temptation and trial, only death. If in truth unto my husband I have proved a faithful wife, Mother Earth, relieve thy Sita from the burden of this life. So the last word of Hindu religious thought is moksha, release, first from desire, then from life. Nirvana may be one release or the other, but it is fullest in both. The sage Bhartrihari expresses the first. Everything on earth gives cause for fear, and the only freedom from fear is to be found in the renunciation of all desire. Once upon a time the days seemed long to me when my heart was sorely wounded through asking favors from the rich, and yet again the days seemed all too short for me when I sought to carry out all my worldly desires and ends. But now as a philosopher I sit on the hard stone in a cave on the mountainside, and time and again I laugh when I think of my former life. Gandhi expresses the second form of release. I do not want to be reborn, he says. The highest and final aspiration of the Hindu is to escape reincarnation, to lose that fever of ego which revives with each individual body and birth. Salvation does not come by faith, nor yet by works. It comes by such uninterrupted self-denial, by such selfless intuition of the part-engulfing whole, that at last the self is dead and there is nothing to be reborn. The hell of individuality passes into the haven and heaven of unity, of complete and impersonal absorption into Brahman, the soul or force of the world. 4. Curiosities of Religion Superstitions, Astrology, Phallic Worship, Ritual, Sacrifice, Purification, the Sacred Waters. Amid all this theology of fear and suffering, superstition, first aid from the supernatural for the minor ills of life, flourished with rank fertility. Oblations, charms, exorcisms, astrology, oracles, incantations, vows, palmistry, divination, 2,728,812 priests, a million fortune tellers, a hundred thousand snake charmers, a million fakirs, yogis, and other holy men. This is one part of the historic picture of India. For 1,200 years the Hindus have had a great number of tantras, manuals, expounding mysticism, witchcraft, divination and magic, and formulating the holy mantras, 
or spells by which almost any purpose might be magically attained. The Brahmins looked with silent contempt upon this religion of magic. They tolerated it partly because they feared that superstition among the people might be essential to their own power, partly perhaps because they believed that superstition is indestructible, dying in one form only to be reborn in another. No man of sense, they felt, would quarrel with a force capable of so many reincarnations. The simple Hindu, like many cultured Americans, accepted astrology and took it for granted that every star exercised a special influence over those born under its ascendancy. Menstruating women, like Ophelia, were to keep out of the sunshine, for this might make them pregnant. The secret of material prosperity, said the Kaushitaki Upanishad, is the regular adoration of the new moon. Sorcerers, necromancers, and soothsayers, for a pittance, expounded the past and the future by studying palms, ordure, dreams, signs in the sky, or holes eaten into cloth by mice. Chanting the charms which only they know how to recite, they laid ghosts, bemused cobras, enthralled birds, and forced the gods themselves to come to the aid of the contributor. Magicians, for the proper fee, introduced a demon into one's enemy, or expelled it from one's self. They caused the enemy's sudden death, or brought him down with an incurable disease. Even a Brahmin, when he yawned, snapped his fingers to right and left to frighten away the evil spirits that might enter his mouth. At all times the Hindu, like many European peasants, was on his guard against the evil eye. At any time he might be visited with misfortune, or death magically brought upon him by his enemies. Above all, the magician could restore sexual vitality, or inspire love in any one for any one, or give children to barren women. There was nothing, not even nirvana, that the Hindu desired so intensely as children. Hence, in part, his longing for sexual power and his ritual adoration of the symbols of reproduction and fertility. Phallic worship, which has prevailed in most countries at one time or another, has persisted in India from ancient times to the twentieth century. Shiva was its deity, the phallus was its icon, the tantras were its talmud. The shakti, or energizing power of Shiva, was conceived sometimes as his consort Kali, sometimes as a female element in Shiva's nature, which included both male and female powers. And these two powers were represented by idols called linga or yoni, representing respectively the male or female organs of generation. Everywhere in India one sees signs of this worship of sex. In the phallic figures on the Nepalese and other temples in Benares, in the gigantic lingas that adorn or surround the Shivaite temples of the south, in phallic processions and ceremonies, and in the phallic images worn on the arm or about the neck. Linga stones may be seen on the highways. Hindus break upon them the coconuts which they are about to offer in sacrifice. At the Rameshvaram temple, the linga stone is daily washed with Ganges water, which is afterwards sold to the pious as holy water or mesmerized water has been sold in Europe. Usually the phallic ritual is simple and becoming. It consists in anointing the stone with consecrated water or oil and decorating it with leaves. Doubtless the lower orders in India derive some profane amusement from phallic processions, but for the most part the people appear to find no more obscene stimulus in the linga or the yoni than a Christian does in the contemplation of the Madonna nursing her child. Custom lends propriety and time lends sanctity to anything. The sexual symbolism of the objects seems long since to have been forgotten by the people. The images are now merely the traditional and sacred ways of representing the power of Shiva. Perhaps the difference between the European and the Hindu conception of this matter arose from divergence in the age of marriage. Early marriage releases those impulses which, when long frustrated, turn in upon themselves and beget prurience as well as romantic love. The sexual morals and manners of India are in general higher than those of Europe and America, and far more decorous and restrained. The worship of Shiva is one of the most austere and ascetic of all the Hindu cults, and the devoutest worshippers of the Linga are the Lingayats, the most puritanic sect in India. It has remained for our Western visitors, says Gandhi, to acquaint us with the obscenity of many practices which we have hitherto innocently indulged in. It was in a missionary book that I first learned that Shivalingam had any obscene significance at all. The use of the linga and the yoni was but one of the myriad rituals that seemed to the passing and alien eye, not merely the form, but half the essence of Indian religion. Nearly every act of life, even to washing and dressing, had its religious rite. In every pious home there were private and special gods to be worshipped and ancestors to be honoured every day. Indeed, religion to the Hindu was a matter for domestic observances rather than for temple ceremonies, which were reserved for holy days. 
But the people rejoiced in the many feasts that marked the ecclesiastical year and brought them in great processions or pilgrimages to their ancient shrines. They could not understand the service there, for it was conducted in Sanskrit, but they could understand the idol. They decked it with ornaments, covered it with paint, and encrusted it with jewels. Sometimes they treated it as a human being, awakened it, bathed it, dressed it, fed it, scolded it, and put it to bed at the close of the day. The great public rite was sacrifice or offering. The great private rite was purification. Sacrifice to the Hindu was no empty form. He believed that if no food was offered them, the gods would starve to death. When men were cannibals, human sacrifices were offered in India as elsewhere. Kali particularly had an appetite for men, but the Brahmins explained that she would eat only men of the lower castes. As morals improved, the gods had to content themselves with animals, of which great numbers were offered them. The goat was especially favored for these ceremonies. Buddhism, Jainism, and Ahimsa put an end to animal sacrifice in Hindustan, but the replacement of Buddhism with Hinduism restored the custom, which survived in diminishing extent, to our own time. It is to the credit of the Brahmins that they refused to take part in any sacrifice that involved the shedding of blood. Purification rites took many an hour of Hindu life, for fears of pollution were as frequent in Indian religion as in modern hygiene. At any moment the Hindu might be made unclean, by improper food, by offal, by the touch of a shudra, an outcast, a corpse, a menstruating woman, or in a hundred other ways. The woman herself, of course, was defiled by menstruation or childbirth. Brahmanical law required isolation in such cases and complex hygienic precautions. After all such pollutions, or as we should say possible infections, the Hindu had to undergo ritual purification, in minor cases by such simple ceremonies as being sprinkled with holy water, in major cases by more complicated methods culminating in the terrible Panchagavya. This purification was decreed as punishment for violating important caste laws, for example, for leaving India, and consisted in drinking a mixture of five substances from the sacred cow, milk, curds, ghee, urine, and dung. A little more to our taste was the religious precept to bathe daily. Here again, a hygienic measure, highly desirable in a semi-tropical climate, was clothed in a religious form for more successful inculcation. Sacred pools and tanks were built, many rivers were called holy, and men were told that if they bathed in these they would be purified in body and soul. Already in the days of Yuan Chuang, millions bathed in the Ganges every morning. From that century to ours, those waters have never seen the sunrise without hearing the prayers of the bathers seeking purity and release, lifting their arms to the holy orb, and calling out patiently, Om, Om, Om. Benares became the holy city of India, the goal of millions of pilgrims, the haven of old men and women come from every part of the country to bathe in the river, and so to face death sinless and clean. There is an element of awe, even of terror, in the thought that such men have come to Benares for two thousand years, and have gone down shivering into its waters in the winter dawn, and smelled with misgiving the flesh of the dead on the burning ghats, and uttered the same trusting prayers, century after century, to the same silent deities. The unresponsiveness of a god is no obstacle to his popularity. India believes as strongly today as ever in the gods that have so long looked down with equanimity upon her poverty and her desolation. 5. Saints and Skeptics Methods of Sanctity, Heretics, Toleration, General View of Hindu Religion Saints seem more abundant in India than elsewhere, so that at last the visitor feels that they are a natural product of the country, like the poppy or the snake. Hindu piety recognized three main avenues to sanctity. Janana Yoga, the way of meditation, Karma Yoga, the way of action, and Bhakti Yoga, the way of love. The Brahmins allowed for all three by their rule of the four ashramas, or stages of sanctity, the young Brahmin was to begin as a brahmachari, vowed to premarital chastity, to piety, study, truthfulness, and loving service of his guru or teacher. After marriage, which he should not delay beyond his eighteenth year, he was to enter the second stage of brahmanical life as grihastha, or householder, and beget sons for the care and worship of himself and his ancestors. In the third stage, now seldom practiced, the aspirant to sanctity retired with his wife to live as a vanaprasta, or jungle dweller, accepting hard conditions gladly and limiting sexual relations to the begetting of children. 
Finally, the Brahmin who wished to reach the highest stage might, in his old age, leave even his wife and become a sannyasi, or abandoner of the world. Giving up all property, all money, and all ties, he would keep only an antelope skin for his body, a staff for his hand, and a gourd of water for his thirst. He must smear his body with ashes every day, drink the five substances frequently, and live entirely by alms. He must, says the Brahmanical rule, regard all men as equals. He must not be influenced by anything that happens, and must be able to view with perfect equanimity even revolutions that overthrow empires. His one object must be to acquire that measure of wisdom and of spirituality, which shall finally reunite him to the supreme divinity, from which we are separated by our passions and our material surroundings. In the midst of all this piety, one comes occasionally upon a skeptical voice stridently out of tune with the solemnity of the normal Hindu note. Doubtless, when India was wealthy, skeptics were numerous, for humanity doubts its gods most when it prospers, and worships them most when it is miserable. We have noted the Charvakas and other heretics of Buddha's time. Almost as old as a work called, in the sesquipedalian fashion of the Hindus, Shwasam Vedyopanishad, which simplifies theology into four propositions. One, that there is no reincarnation, no God, no heaven, no hell, and no world. Two, that all traditional religious literature is the work of conceited fools. Three, that nature, the originator, and time, the destroyer, are the rulers of all things, and take no account of virtue or vice in awarding happiness or misery to men. And four, that people, deluded by flowery speech, cling to gods, temples, and priests, when in reality there is no difference between Vishnu and a dog. With all the inconsistency of a Bible harboring Ecclesiastes, the Pali canon of Buddhism offers us a remarkable treatise, probably as old as Christianity, called The Question of King Melinda, in which the Buddhist teacher Nagasena is represented as giving very disturbing answers to the religious inquiries made of him by the Greco-Bactrian King Menander, who ruled northern India at the turn of the first century before Christ. Religion, says Nagasena, must not be made a mere way of escape for suffering men. It should be an ascetic search for sanctity and wisdom, without presuming a heaven or a god. For in truth, this saint assures us, these do not exist. The Mahabharata inveighs against doubters and atheists who, it tells us, deny the reality of souls and despise immortality. Such men, it says, wander over the whole earth, and it warns them of their future punishment by the horrible example of a jackal who explains his species by admitting that in a previous incarnation he had been a rationalist, a critic of the Vedas, a reviler and opposer of priests, an unbeliever, a doubter of all. The Bhagavad Gita refers to heretics who deny the existence of a god and describe the world as none other than the house of lust. The Brahmins themselves were often skeptics, but too completely so to attack the religion of the people. And though the poets of India are as a rule assiduously pious, some of them, like Kabir and Vamana, speak in defense of a very emancipated theism. Vamana, a South Indian poet of the seventeenth century, writes scornfully of ascetic hermits, pilgrimages, and caste. The solitariness of a dog, the meditations of a crane, the chanting of an ass, the bathing of a frog. How are you the better for smearing your body with ashes? Your thoughts should be set on God alone, for the rest an ass can wallow in dirt as well as you. The books called Vedas are like courtesans, deluding men, and wholly unfathomable, but the hidden knowledge of God is like an honorable wife. Will the application of white ashes do away with the smell of a wine pot? Will a cord cast over your neck make you twice born? Why should we constantly revile the pariah? Are not his flesh and blood the same as our own? And of what caste is he who pervades the pariah? He who says, I know nothing, is the shrewdest of all. It is worthy of note that pronouncements of this kind could be made with impunity in a society mentally ruled by a priestly caste. Except for foreign repressions, and perhaps because of alien rulers indifferent to native theologies, India has enjoyed a freedom of thought far greater than that of the medieval Europe to which its civilization corresponds. And the Brahmins have exercised their authority with discrimination and lenience. They relied upon the conservatism of the poor to preserve the orthodox religion, and they were not disappointed. When heresies or strange gods became dangerously popular, they tolerated them, and then absorbed them into the capacious caverns of Hindu belief. One god, more or less, could not make much difference in India. Hence there has been comparatively little sectarian animosity within the Hindu community, 
though much between Hindus and Muslims, and no blood has been shed for religion in India except by its invaders. Intolerance came with Islam and Christianity. The Muslims proposed to buy paradise with the blood of infidels, and the Portuguese, when they captured Goa, introduced the Inquisition into India. If we look for common defining elements in this jungle of faiths, we shall find them in the practical unanimity of the Hindus in worshipping both Vishnu and Shiva, in reverencing the Vedas, the Brahmins, and the cow, and in accepting the Mahabharata and the Ramayana as no mere literary epics, but as the secondary scriptures of the race. It is significant that the deities and dogmas of India today are not those of the Vedas. In a sense, Hinduism represents the triumph of aboriginal Dravidic India over the Aryans of the Vedic age. As the result of conquest, spoliation, and poverty, India has been injured in body and soul and has sought refuge from harsh terrestrial defeat in the easy victories of myth and imagination. Despite its elements of nobility, Buddhism, like Stoicism, was a slave philosophy, even if voiced by a prince. It meant that all desire or struggle, even for personal or national freedom, should be abandoned, and that the ideal was a desireless passivity. Obviously, the exhausting heat of India spoke in this rationalization of fatigue. Hinduism continued the weakening of India by binding itself through the caste system in permanent servitude to a priesthood. It conceived its gods in unmoral terms and maintained for centuries brutal customs, like human sacrifice and sati, which many nations had long since outgrown. It depicted life as inevitably evil and broke the courage and darkened the spirit of its devotees. It turned all earthly phenomena into illusion and thereby destroyed the distinction between freedom and slavery, good and evil, corruption and betterment. In the words of a brave Hindu, Hindu religion has now degenerated into an idol worship and conventional ritualism in which the form is regarded as everything and its substance as nothing. A nation ridden with priests and infested with saints, India awaits with unformulated longing her renaissance, her reformation, and her enlightenment. We must, however, keep our historical perspective in thinking of India. We, too, were once in the Middle Ages and preferred mysticism to science, priestcraft to plutocracy, and may do likewise again. We cannot judge these mystics, for our judgments in the West are usually based upon corporeal experience and material results, which seem irrelevant and superficial to the Hindu saint. What if wealth and power, war and conquest, were only surface illusions, unworthy of a mature mind? What if this science of hypothetical atoms and genes, of whimsical protons and cells, of gases generating Shakespeare's and chemicals fusing into Christ, were only one more faith, and one of the strangest, most incredible, and most transitory of all. The East, resentful of subjection and poverty, may go in for science and industry at the very time when the children of the West, sick of machines that impoverish them and of sciences that disillusion them, may destroy their cities and their machines in chaotic revolution or war, go back beaten, weary, and starving to the soil, and forge for themselves another mystic faith to give them courage in the face of hunger, cruelty, injustice, and death. There is no humorist like history. Chapter 19 The Life of the Mind 1. Hindu Science Its Religious Origins, Astronomers, Mathematicism, the Arabic Numerals, the Decimal System, Algebra, Geometry, Physics, Chemistry, Physiology, Vedic Medicine, Physicians, Surgeons, Anesthetics, Vaccination, Hypnotism. India's work in science is both very old and very young, young as an independent and secular pursuit, old as a subsidiary interest of her priests. Religion being the core of Hindu life, those sciences were cultivated first that contributed to religion. Astronomy grew out of the worship of the heavenly bodies, and the observation of their movements aimed to fix the calendar of festival and sacrificial days. Grammar and philology developed out of the insistence that every prayer and formula, though couched in a dead language, should be textually and phonetically correct. As in our Middle Ages, the scientists of India, for better and for worse, were her priests. Astronomy was an incidental offspring of astrology and slowly emancipated itself under Greek influence. The earliest astronomical treatises, the Siddhantas, circa 425 B.C., were based on Greek science, and Varaha Mihira, whose compendium was significantly entitled Complete System of Natural Astrology, frankly acknowledged his dependence upon the Greeks. The greatest of Hindu astronomers and mathematicians, Aryabhata, discussed in verse such poetic subjects as quadratic equations, signs, 
and the value of pi. He explained eclipses, solstices, and equinoxes, announced the sphericity of the earth and its diurnal revolution on its axis, and wrote in daring anticipation of Renaissance science, The sphere of the stars is stationary, and the earth by its revolution produces the daily rising and setting of planets and stars. His most famous successor, Brahmagupta, systematized the astronomic knowledge of India, but obstructed its development by rejecting Aryabhata's theory of the revolution of the earth. These men and their followers adapted to Hindu usage the Babylonian division of the skies into zodiacal constellations. They made a calendar of twelve months, each of thirty days, each of thirty hours, inserting an intercalary month every five years. They calculated with remarkable accuracy the diameter of the moon, the eclipses of the moon and the sun, the position of the poles, and the position and motion of the major stars. They expounded the theory, though not the law, of gravity when they wrote in the Siddhantas, The earth, owing to its force of gravity, draws all things to itself. To make these complex calculations, the Hindus developed a system of mathematics superior in everything except geometry to that of the Greeks. Among the most vital parts of our Oriental heritage are the Arabic numerals and the decimal system, both of which came to us through the Arabs from India. The miscalled Arabic numerals are found on the rock edicts of Ashoka, 256 B.C., a thousand years before their occurrence in Arabic literature. Said the great and magnanimous Laplace, It is India that gave us the ingenious method of expressing all numbers by ten symbols, each receiving a value of position as well as an absolute value, a profound and important idea which appears so simple to us now that we ignore its true merit. But its very simplicity, the great ease which it has lent to all computations, puts our arithmetic in the first rank of useful inventions. And we shall appreciate the grandeur of this achievement the more when we remember that it escaped the genius of Archimedes and Apollonius, two of the greatest men produced by antiquity. The decimal system was known to Aryabhata and Brahmagupta long before its appearance in the writings of the Arabs and the Syrians. It was adopted by China from Buddhist missionaries, and Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarazmi, the greatest mathematician of his age, died circa 850 AD, seems to have introduced it into Baghdad. The oldest known use of the zero in Asia or Europe is in an Arabic document dated 873 AD, three years sooner than its first known appearance in India. But by general consent the Arabs borrowed this too from India, and the most modest and most valuable of all numerals is one of the subtle gifts of India to mankind. It was used by the Mayas of America in the first century AD. Dr. Breasted attributes a knowledge of the place value of numerals to the ancient Babylonians. Algebra was developed in apparent independence by both the Hindus and the Greeks, but our adoption of its Arabic name, al-Jabr, adjustment, indicates that it came to Western Europe from the Arabs, that is, from India, rather than from Greece. The great Hindu leaders in this field, as in astronomy, were Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, and Bhaskara. The last, born 1114 AD, appears to have invented the radical sign and many algebraic symbols. These men created the conception of a negative quantity, without which algebra would have been impossible. They formulated rules for finding permutations and combinations. They found the square root of two and solved in the 8th century AD indeterminate equations of the second degree that were unknown to Europe until the days of Euler, a thousand years later. They expressed their science in poetic form and gave to mathematical problems a grace characteristic of India's golden age. These two may serve as examples of simpler Hindu algebra. Out of a swarm of bees, one-fifth part settled on a kadamba blossom, one-third on a cylindra flower, three times the difference of those numbers flew to the bloom of a kutaja. One bee, which remained, hovered about in the air. Tell me, charming woman, the number of bees. Eight rubies, ten emeralds, and a hundred pearls, which are in thy earring, my beloved, were purchased by me for thee at an equal amount and the sum of the prices of the three sorts of gems was three less than half a hundred. Tell me the price of each auspicious woman. The Hindus were not so successful in geometry. In the measurement and construction of altars, the priests formulated the Pythagorean theorem, by which the square of the hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle equals the sum of the squares of the other sides, several hundred years before the birth of Christ. 
Aryabhata, probably influenced by the Greeks, found the area of a triangle, a trapezium and a circle, and calculated the value of pi, the relation of diameter to circumference in a circle, at 3.1416, a figure not equaled in accuracy until the days of Purbach, 1423-1461, in Europe. Bhaskara crudely anticipated the differential calculus, Aryabhata drew up a table of signs, and the Surya Siddhanta provided a system of trigonometry more advanced than anything known to the Greeks. Two systems of Hindu thought propound physical theories suggestively similar to those of Greece. Kannada, founder of the Vaisheshika philosophy, held that the world was composed of atoms as many in kind as the various elements. The Jains, more nearly approximated to Democritus, by teaching that all atoms were of the same kind, producing different effects by diverse modes of combination. Kannada believed light and heat to be varieties of the same substance. Udayana taught that all heat comes from the sun. And Vachaspati, like Newton, interpreted light as composed of minute particles emitted by substances and striking the eye. Musical notes and intervals were analyzed and mathematically calculated in the Hindu treatises on music, and the Pythagorean law was formulated by which the number of vibrations, and therefore the pitch of the note, varies inversely as the length of the string between the point of attachment and the point of touch. There is some evidence that Hindu mariners of the first century A.D. used a compass made by an iron fish floating in a vessel of oil and pointing north. Chemistry developed from two sources, medicine and industry. Something has been said about the chemical excellence of cast iron in ancient India and about the high industrial development of Gupta times when India was looked to, even by imperial Rome, as the most skilled of the nations in such chemical industries as dyeing, tanning, soap-making, glass, and cement. As early as the second century B.C., Nagarjuna devoted an entire volume to mercury. By the sixth century, the Hindus were far ahead of Europe in industrial chemistry. They were masters of calcination, distillation, sublimation, steaming, fixation, the production of light without heat, the mixing of anesthetic and soporific powders, and the preparation of metallic salts, compounds, and alloys. The tempering of steel was brought in ancient India to a perfection unknown in Europe till our own times. King Porus is said to have selected, as a specially valuable gift for Alexander, not gold or silver, but thirty pounds of steel. The Moslems took much of this Hindu chemical science and industry to the Near East and Europe. The secret of manufacturing Damascus blades, for example, was taken by the Arabs from the Persians, and by the Persians from India. Anatomy and physiology, like some aspects of chemistry, were byproducts of Hindu medicine. As far back as the 6th century B.C., Hindu physicians described ligaments, sutures, lymphatics, nerve plexus, fascia, adipose and vascular tissues, mucus and synovial membranes, and many more muscles than any modern cadaver is able to show. The doctors of pre-Christian India shared Aristotle's mistaken conception of the heart as the seat and organ of consciousness, and supposed that the nerves ascended to and descended from the heart. But they understood remarkably well the processes of digestion, the different functions of the gastric juices, the conversion of chyme into chyle, and of this into blood. Anticipating Weismann by 2400 years, Atreya, circa 500 B.C., held that the parental seed is independent of the parent's body and contains in itself in miniature the whole parental organism. Examination for virility was recommended as a prerequisite for marriage in men, and the Code of Manu warned against marrying mates affected with tuberculosis, epilepsy, leprosy, chronic dyspepsia, piles, or loquacity. Birth control in the latest theological fashion was suggested by the Hindu medical schools of 500 B.C. in the theory that during twelve days of the menstrual cycle impregnation is impossible. Fetal development was described with considerable accuracy. It was noted that the sex of the fetus remains for a time undetermined, and it was claimed that in some cases the sex of the embryo could be influenced by food or drugs. The records of Hindu medicine begin with the Atarva Veda. Here, embedded in a mass of magic and incantations, is a list of diseases with their symptoms. Medicine arose as an adjunct to magic. The healer studied and used earthly means of cure to help his spiritual formulas. Later he relied more and more upon such secular methods, continuing the magic spell, like our bedside manner, as a psychological aid. Appended to the Atarva Veda is the Ajur Veda, the science of longevity. 
In this oldest system of Hindu medicine, illness is attributed to disorder in one of the four humors, air, water, phlegm, and blood, and treatment is recommended with herbs and charms. Many of its diagnoses and cures are still used in India, with a success that is sometimes the envy of Western physicians. The Rig Veda names over a thousand such herbs and advocates water as the best cure for most diseases. Even in Vedic times, physicians and surgeons were being differentiated from magic doctors and were living in houses surrounded by gardens in which they cultivated medicinal plants. The great names in Hindu medicine are those of Sushruta in the 5th century before and Ch in the 5th century before and Charaka in the 2nd century after Christ. Sushruta, professor of medicine in the University of Benares, wrote down in Sanskrit a system of diagnosis and therapy whose elements had descended to him from his teacher, Don Wantari. His book dealt at length with surgery, obstetrics, diet, bathing, drugs, infant feeding and hygiene, and medical education. Charaka composed a Samhita, or Encyclopedia of Medicine, which is still used in India, and gave to his followers an almost Hippocratic conception of their calling. Not for self, not for the fulfillment of any earthly desire of gain, but solely for the good of suffering humanity should you treat your patients, and so excel all. Only less illustrious than these are Vagbata, 625 A.D., who prepared a medical compendium in prose and verse, and Bhava Misra, 1550 A.D., whose voluminous work on anatomy, physiology, and medicine mentioned a hundred years before Harvey, the circulation of the blood, and prescribed mercury for that novel disease, syphilis, which had recently been brought in by the Portuguese as part of Europe's heritage to India. Sushruta described many surgical operations, cataract, hernia, lithotomy, caesarean section, etc., and 121 surgical instruments, including lancets, sounds, forceps, catheters, and rectal and vaginal speculums. Despite Brahmanical prohibitions, he advocated the dissection of dead bodies as indispensable in the training of surgeons. He was the first to graft upon a torn ear portions of skin taken from another part of the body, and from him and his Hindu successors, rhinoplasty, the surgical reconstruction of the nose, descended into modern medicine. The ancient Hindus, says Garrison, performed almost every major operation except legation of the arteries. Limbs were amputated, abdominal sections were performed, fractures were set, hemorrhoids and fistulas were removed. Sushruta laid down elaborate rules for preparing an operation, and his suggestion that the wound be sterilized by fumigation is one of the earliest known efforts at antiseptic surgery. Both Sushruta and Charaka mention the use of medicinal liquors to produce insensibility to pain. In 927 AD, two surgeons trepanned the skull of a Hindu king and made him insensitive to the operation by administering a drug called Samohini. For the detection of the 1,120 diseases that he enumerated, Sushruta recommended diagnosis by inspection, palpation, and auscultation. Taking of the pulse was described in a treatise dated 1300 A.D. Urinalysis was a favorite method of diagnosis. Tibetan physicians were reputed able to cure any patient without having seen anything more of him than his water. In the time of Yuan Chuang, Hindu medical treatment began with a seven-day fast. In this interval, the patient often recovered. If the illness continued, drugs were at last employed. Even then, drugs were used very sparingly. Reliance was placed largely upon diet, baths, enemas, inhalations, urethral and vaginal injections, and bloodlettings by leeches or cups. Hindu physicians were especially skilled in concocting antidotes for poisons. They still excel European physicians in curing snake bites. Vaccination, unknown to Europe before the 18th century, was known in India as early as 550 A.D., if we may judge from a text attributed to Danwantari, one of the earliest Hindu physicians. Take the fluid of the pock on the udder of the cow, upon the point of a lancet, and lance with it the arms between the shoulders and elbows until the blood appears. Then, mixing the fluid with the blood, the fever of the smallpox will be produced." Modern European physicians believe that caste separateness was prescribed because of the Brahmin belief in invisible agents transmitting disease. Many of the laws of sanitation enjoined by Sushruta and Manu seem to take for granted what we moderns, who love new words for old things, call the germ theory of disease. Hypnotism as therapy seems to have originated among the Hindus, who often took their sick to the temples to be cured by hypnotic suggestion or temple sleep, as in Egypt and Greece. The Englishman who introduced hypnotherapy into England, 
Braid, Esdale, and Elliotson, undoubtedly got their ideas and some of their experience from contact with India. The general picture of Indian medicine is one of rapid development in the Vedic and Buddhist periods, followed by centuries of slow and cautious improvement. How much Atreya, Danwantari, and Sushruta owed to Greece, and how much Greece owed to them, we do not know. In the time of Alexander, says Garrison, Hindu physicians and surgeons enjoyed a well-deserved reputation for superior knowledge and skill, and even Aristotle is believed by some students to have been indebted to them. So, too, with the Persians and the Arabs. It is difficult to say how much Indian medicine owed to the physicians of Baghdad, and through them to the heritage of Babylonian medicine in the Near East. On the one hand, certain remedies, like opium and mercury, and some modes of diagnosis, like feeling the pulse, appear to have entered India from Persia. On the other, we find Persians and Arabs translating into their languages in the 8th century A.D. the thousand-year-old compendia of Sushruta and Charaka. The great caliph Harun al-Rashid accepted the preeminence of Indian medicine and scholarship and imported Hindu physicians to organize hospitals and medical schools in Baghdad. Lord Amphil concludes that medieval and modern Europe owes its system of medicine directly to the Arabs and through them to India. Probably this noblest and most uncertain of the sciences had an approximately equal antiquity and developed in contemporary contact and mutual influence in Sumeria, Egypt, and India. 2. The Six Systems of Brahmanical Philosophy The antiquity of Indian philosophy, its prominent role, its scholars, forms, conception of orthodoxy, the assumptions of Hindu philosophy. The priority of India is clearer in philosophy than in medicine, though here too origins are veiled, and every conclusion is an hypothesis. Some Upanishads are older than any extant form of Greek philosophy, and Pythagoras, Parmenides, and Plato seem to have been influenced by Indian metaphysics. But the speculations of Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Heraclitus, Anaxagoras, and Empedocles not only antedate the secular philosophy of the Hindus, but bear a skeptical and physical stamp suggesting any other origin than India. Victor Cousin believed that we are constrained to see in this cradle of the human race the native land of the highest philosophy. It is more probable that no one of the civilizations known to us was the originator of any of the elements of civilization. But nowhere else has the lust for philosophy been so strong as in India. It is with the Hindus not an ornament or a recreation, but a major interest and practice of life itself. And sages receive in India the honor bestowed in the West upon men of wealth or action. What other nation has ever thought of celebrating festivals with gladiatorial debates between the leaders of rival philosophical schools? We read in the Upanishads how the king of the Vedehas, as part of a religious feast, set one day apart for a philosophical disputation among Yajnavalkya, Asvala, Artabaga, and Gargi, the Aspasia of India. To the victor the king promised and gave a reward of a thousand cows and many pieces of gold. It was the usual course for a philosophical teacher in India to speak, rather than to write. Instead of attacking his opponents through the safe medium of print, he was expected to meet them in living debate and to visit other schools in order to submit himself to controversy and questioning. Leading philosophers like Shankara spent much of their time in such intellectual journeys. Sometimes kings joined in these discussions with the modesty becoming a monarch in the presence of a philosopher, if we may credit the reports of the philosophers. The victor in a vital debate was as great a hero among his people as a general returning from the bloody triumphs of war. In a Rajput painting of the eighteenth century, we see a typical Indian school of philosophy. The teacher sits on a mat under a tree, and his pupils squat on the grass before him. Such scenes were to be witnessed everywhere, for teachers of philosophy were as numerous in India as merchants in Babylonia. No other country has ever had so many schools of thought. In one of Buddha's dialogues we learn that there were sixty-two distinct theories of the soul among the philosophers of his time. This philosophical nation par excellence, says Count Kaiserling, has more Sanskrit words for philosophical and religious thought than are found in Greek, Latin, and German combined. Since Indian thought was transmitted rather by oral tradition than by writing, the oldest form in which the theories of the various schools have come down to us is that of sutras aphoristic threads which teacher or student jotted down, not as a means of explaining his thought to another, but as an aid to his own memory. 
These extant sutras are of varying age, some as old as 200 A.D., some as recent as 1400. In all cases they are much younger than the traditions of thought that they summarize, for the origin of these schools of philosophy is as old as Buddha, and some of them, like the Sankhya, were probably well established when he was born. All systems of Indian philosophy are ranged by the Hindus in two categories, astika systems, which affirm, and nastika systems, which deny. We have already studied the nastika systems, which were chiefly those of the Charvakas, the Buddhists, and the Jains. But strange to say, these systems were called nastika, heterodox and nihilist, not because they questioned or denied the existence of God, which they did, but because they questioned, denied, or ignored the authority of the Vedas. Many of the Astika systems also doubted or denied God. They were nevertheless called orthodox because they accepted the infallibility of the scriptures and the institution of caste, and no hindrance was placed against the free thought, however atheistic, of those schools that acknowledged these fundamentals of orthodox Hindu society. Since a wide latitude was allowed in interpreting the holy books, and clever dialecticians could find in the Vedas any doctrine which they sought, the only practical requirement for intellectual respectability was the recognition of caste. This being the real government of India, rejection of it was treason, and acceptance of it covered a multitude of sins. In effect, therefore, the philosophers of India enjoyed far more liberty than their scholastic analogues in Europe, though less perhaps than the thinkers of Christendom under the enlightened popes of the Renaissance. Of the orthodox systems, or darshanas, demonstrations, Six became so prominent that in time every Hindu thinker who acknowledged the authority of the Brahmins attached himself to one or another of these schools. All six make certain assumptions which are the bases of Hindu thought, that the Vedas are inspired, that reasoning is less reliable as a guide to reality and truth than the direct perception and feeling of an individual properly prepared for spiritual receptiveness and subtlety by ascetic practices and years of obedient tutelage, that the purpose of knowledge and philosophy is not control of the world so much as release from it, and that the goal of thought is to find freedom from the suffering of frustrated desire by achieving freedom from desire itself. These are the philosophies to which men come when they tire of ambition, struggle, wealth, progress, and success. 1. The Nyaya System, a Hindu logician. The first of the Brahmanical systems in the logical order of Indian thought, for their chronological order is uncertain, and they are in all essentials contemporary, is a body of logical theory extending over two millenniums. Nyaya means an argument, a way of leading the mind to a conclusion. Its most famous text is the Nyaya Sutra, ascribed without surety to a Gautama dated variously between the third century before and the first century after Christ. Like all Hindu thinkers, Gautama announces, as the purpose of his work, the achievement of nirvana, or release from the tyranny of desire, here to be reached by clear and consistent thinking. But we suspect that his simple intent was to offer a guide to the perplexed wrestlers in India's philosophical debates. He formulates for them the principles of argument, exposes the tricks of controversy, and lists the common fallacies of thought. Like another Aristotle, he seeks the structure of reasoning in the syllogism, and finds the crux of argument in the middle term. The Nyaya syllogism, however, has five propositions, theorem, reason, major premise, minor premise, and conclusion. For example, 1. Socrates is mortal, 2. For he is a man, 3. All men are mortal, 4. Socrates is a man, 5. Therefore Socrates is mortal. Like another James or Dewey, he looks upon knowledge and thought as pragmatic tools and organs of human need and will, to be tested by their ability to lead to successful action. He is a realist, and will have nothing to do with the sublime idea that the world ceases to exist when no one takes the precaution to perceive it. Gautama's predecessors in Nyaya were apparently atheists. His successors became epistemologists. His achievement was to give India an organon of investigation and thought, and a rich vocabulary of philosophical terms. 2. The Vaisheshika System Democritus in India As Gautama is the Aristotle of India, so Kannada is its Democritus. His name, which means the Atom Eater, suggests that he may be a legendary construct of the historical imagination. The date at which the Vaisheshika system was formulated has not been fixed with excessive accuracy, 
We are told that it was not before 300 B.C. and not after 800 A.D. Its name came from Vishesha, meaning particularity. The world, in Canada's theory, is full of a number of things, but they are all in some form mere combinations of atoms. The forms change, but the atoms remain indestructible. Thoroughly Democritean, Canada announces that nothing exists but atoms in the void, and that the atoms move not according to the will of an intelligent deity, but through an impersonal force or law, Ajishta, the invisible. Since there is no conservative like the child of a radical, the later exponents of Vaisheshika, unable to see how a blind force could give order and unity to the cosmos, placed a world of minute souls alongside the world of atoms, and supervised both worlds with an intelligent god. So old is the pre-established harmony of Leibniz. 3. The Sankhya system. Its high repute, metaphysics, evolution, atheism, idealism, spirit, body, mind, and soul. The goal of philosophy, influence of the Sankhya. This, says a Hindu historian, is the most significant system of philosophy that India has produced. Professor Garbe, who devoted a large part of his life to the study of Sankhya, consoled himself with the thought that, in Kapila's doctrine, for the first time in the history of the world, the complete independence and freedom of the human mind, its full confidence in its own powers, were exhibited. It is the oldest of the six systems, and perhaps the oldest philosophical system of all. Its earliest extant literature, the Sankhya Karika, of the commentator Ishvara Krishna, dates back only to the 5th century A.D., and the Sankhya Sutras, once attributed to Kapila, are not older than our 15th century. But the origins of the system apparently antedate Buddhism itself. The Buddhist texts and the Mahabharata repeatedly refer to it, and Vintanitz finds its influence in Pythagoras. Of Kapila himself nothing is known except that Hindu tradition, which has a schoolboy's scorn for dates, credits him with founding the Sankhya philosophy in the 6th century B.C. Kapila is at once a realist and a scholastic. He begins almost medically by laying it down in his first aphorism that the complete cessation of pain is the complete goal of man. He rejects as inadequate the attempt to elude suffering by physical means. He refutes with much logical prestidigitation the views of all and sundry on the matter, and then proceeds to construct, in one unintelligibly abbreviated sutra after another, his own metaphysical system. It derives its name from his enumeration, for that is the meaning of Sankhya, of the twenty-five realities, or tatwas, thatnesses, which in Kapila's judgment make up the world. He arranges these realities in a complex relationship that may possibly be clarified by the following scheme. Substance, prakriti, or producer, a universal physical principle, which, through its evolutionary powers, or gunas, produces intellect, buddhi, the power of perception, which, through its evolutionary powers, produces the five subtle elements or sensory powers of the internal world, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, mind, manas, the power of conception, the five organs of sense, eye, ear, nose, tongue, and skin, the five organs of action, larynx, hands, feet, excretory organs, and generative organs, and the five gross elements of the external world, ether, air, fire and light, water, and earth. The second category is spirit, or purusha, person, a universal psychical principle which, though unable to do anything of itself, animates and vitalizes substance and stirs its evolutionary powers to all their activities. At its outset this seems to be a purely materialistic system. The world of mind and self, as well as of body and matter, appears entirely as an evolution by natural means, a unity and continuity of elements in perpetual development and decay from the lowest to the highest and back again. There is a premonition of Lamarck in Kapila's thought. The need of the organism, the self, generates the function, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, and the function produces the organ, eye, ear, nose, tongue, and skin. There is no gap in the system and no vital distinction in any Hindu philosophy between the inorganic and the organic, between the vegetable and the animal, or between the animal and the human world. These are all links in one chain of life, spokes on the wheel of evolution and dissolution, birth and death and birth. The course of evolution is determined fatalistically by the 
three active qualities or powers, gunas of substance. Purity, activity, and blind ignorance. These powers are not prejudiced in favor of development against decay. They produce the one after the other in an endless cycle, like some stupid magician drawing an infinity of contents from a hat, putting them back again and repeating the process forever. Every state of evolution contains in itself, as Herbert Spencer was to say some time later, a tendency to lapse into dissolution as its fated counterpart and end. Coppola, like Laplace, saw no need of calling in a deity to explain creation or evolution. In this most religious and philosophical of nations it is nothing unusual to find religions and philosophies without a god. Many of the Sankhya texts explicitly deny the existence of a personal creator, Creation is inconceivable, for a thing is not made out of nothing. Creator and created are one. Coppola contents himself with writing, precisely as if he were Immanuel Kant, that a personal creator can never be demonstrated by human reason. For whatever exists, says this subtle skeptic, must be either bound or free, and God cannot be either. If God is perfect, he had no need to create a world. If he is imperfect, he is not God. If God were good and had divine powers, he could not possibly have created so imperfect a world, so rich in suffering, so certain in death. It is instructive to see with what calmness the Hindu thinkers discuss these questions, seldom resorting to persecution or abuse, and keeping the debate upon a plane reached in our time only by the controversies of the maturest scientists. Coppola protects himself by recognizing the authority of the Vedas. The Vedas, he says simply, are an authority, since the author of them knew the established truth after which he proceeds without paying any attention to the Vedas. But he is no materialist. On the contrary, he is an idealist and a spiritualist, after his own unconventional fashion. He derives reality entirely from perception. Our sense organs and our thought give to the world all the reality, form, and significance which it can ever have for us. What the world might be independently of them is an idle question that has no meaning and can never have an answer. Again, after listing twenty-four tattvas which belong in his system under physical evolution, he upsets all his incipient materialism by introducing as the last reality the strangest and perhaps the most important of them all, purusha, person, or soul. It is not like twenty-three other tattvas produced by prakriti or physical force. It is an independent psychical principle, omnipresent and everlasting, incapable of acting by itself, but indispensable to every action. For Prakriti never develops, the gunas never act, except through the inspiration of Purusha. The physical is animated, vitalized, and stimulated to evolve by the psychical principle everywhere. Here Coppola speaks like Aristotle. There is a ruling influence of the spirit, over Prakriti or the evolving world, caused by their proximity, just as the lodestone draws iron to itself. That is, the proximity of Purusha to Prakriti impels the latter to go through the steps of production. This sort of attraction between the two leads to creation, but in no other sense is spirit an agent or concerned in creation at all. Spirit is plural in the sense that it exists in each organism, but in all it is alike and does not share an individuality. Individuality is physical. We are what we are, not because of our spirit, but because of the origin, evolution, and experiences of our bodies and minds. In Sankhya, the mind is as much a part of the body as any other organ is. The secluded and untouched spirit within us is free, while the mind and body are bound by the laws and gunas, or qualities, of the physical world. It is not the spirit that acts and is determined, it is the body-mind. Nor is spirit affected by the decay and passing of the body and the personality. It is untouched by the stream of birth and death. Mind is perishable, says Kapila, but not spirit. Only the individual self, bound up with matter and body, is born, dies, and is born again in that tireless fluctuation of physical forms which constitutes the history of the external world. Kapila, capable of doubting everything else, never doubts transmigration. Like most Hindu thinkers, he looks upon life as a very doubtful good, if a good at all. Few are these days of joy, few are these days of sorrow. Wealth is like a swollen river, youth is like the crumbling bank of a swollen river, Life is like a tree on the crumbling bank. Suffering is the result of the fact that the individual self and mind are bound up with matter, caught in the blind forces of evolution. What escape is there from this suffering? Only through philosophy, answers our philosopher. 
Only through understanding that all these pains and griefs, all this division and turbulence of striving egos, are maya, illusion, the insubstantial pageantry of life and time. Bondage arises from the error of not discriminating between the self that suffers and the spirit that is immune, between the surface that is disturbed and the basis that remains unvexed and unchanged. To rise above these sufferings is only necessary to realize that the essence of us, which is spirit, is safe beyond good and evil, joy and pain, birth and death. These acts and struggles, these successes and defeats, distress us only so long as we fail to see that they do not affect or come from the Spirit. The enlightened man will look upon them as from outside them, like an impartial spectator witnessing a play. Let the soul recognize its independence of things, and it will at once be free. By that very act of understanding it will escape from the prison of space and time, of pain and reincarnation. Liberation obtained through knowledge of the twenty-five realities, says Kapila, teaches the one only knowledge, that neither I am, nor is aught mine, nor do I exist. That is to say, personal separateness is an illusion. All that exists is the vast evolving and dissolving froth of matter and mind, of bodies and selves on the one side, and on the other the quiet eternity of the immutable and imperturbable soul. Such a philosophy will bring no comfort to one who may find some difficulty in separating himself from his aching flesh and his grieving memory, but it seems to have well expressed the mood of speculative India. No other body of philosophic thought, barring the Vedanta, has so profoundly affected the Hindu mind. In the atheism and epistemological idealism of Buddha and his conception of Nirvana, we see the influence of Kapila. We see it in the Mahabharata and the Code of Manu, in the Puranas and the Tantras, which transform Purusha and Prakriti into the male and female principles of creation. Above all, in the system of yoga, which is merely a practical development of Sankhya, built upon its theories and couched in its phrases. Kapila has few explicit adherents today, since Shankara and the Vedanta have captured the Hindu mind. But an old proverb still raises its voice occasionally in India. There is no knowledge equal to the Sankhya and no power equal to the yoga. 4. The Yoga System, the Holy Men, the Antiquity of Yoga, its Meaning, the Eight Stages of Discipline, the Aim of Yoga, the Miracles of the Yogi, the Sincerity of Yoga. In a fair still spot, having fixed his abode, not too much raised, nor yet too low, let him abide, his goods a cloth, the deerskin, and the kusha grass. There, setting hard his mind upon the One, restraining heart and senses, silent, calm, let him accomplish yoga and achieve pureness of soul, holding immovable body and neck and head, his gaze absorbed upon his nose-end, wrapped from all around, tranquil in spirit, free of fear, intent upon his brahmacharya vow, devout, musing on me, lost in the thought of me. From the Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold as the Song Celestial, Brahmacharya is the vow of chastity taken by the ascetic student. Me is Krishna. On the bathing ghats, scattered here and there among reverent Hindus, indifferent Moslems and staring tourists, sit the holy men, or yogis, in whom the religion and philosophy of India find their ultimate and strangest expression. In lesser numbers one comes upon them in the woods or on the roadside, immovable and absorbed. Some are old, some are young, some wear a rag over the shoulders, some a cloth over the loins. Some are clothed only in dust of ashes, sprinkled over the body and into the mottled hair. They squat cross-legged and motionless, staring at their noses or their navels. Some of them look squarely into the face of the sun, hour after hour, day after day, letting themselves go slowly blind. Some surround themselves with hot fires during the midday heat. Some walk barefoot upon hot coals, or empty the coals upon their heads. Some lie naked for thirty-five years on beds of iron spikes. Some roll their bodies thousands of miles to a place of pilgrimage. Some chain themselves to trees or imprison themselves in cages until they die. Some bury themselves in the earth up to their necks and remain that way for years or for life. Some pass a wire through both cheeks, making it impossible to open the jaws, and so condemning themselves to live on liquids. Some keep their fists clenched so long that their nails come through the back of the hand. 
Some hold up an arm or a leg until it is withered and dead. Many of them sit quietly in one position, perhaps for years, eating leaves and nuts brought to them by the people, deliberately dulling every sense and concentrating every thought in the resolve to understand. Most of them avoid spectacular methods and pursue truth in the quiet retreat of their homes. We have had such men in our Middle Ages, but we should have to look for them today in the nooks and crannies of Europe and America. India has had them for twenty-five hundred years, possibly from the prehistoric days when perhaps they were the shamans of savage tribes. The system of ascetic meditation known as yoga existed in the time of the Vedas. The Upanishads and the Mahabharata accepted it. It flourished in the age of Buddha, and even Alexander, attracted by the ability of these gymnosophists to bear pain silently, stopped to study them, and invited one of their number to come and live with him. The yogi refused as firmly as Diogenes, saying that he wanted nothing from Alexander, being content with the nothing that he had. His fellow ascetics laughed at the Macedonian's boyish desire to conquer the earth, when, as they told him, only a few feet of it sufficed for any man, alive or dead. Another sage, Calanus, 326 B.C., accompanied Alexander to Persia, Growing ill there, he asked permission to die, saying that he preferred death to illness, and calmly mounting a funeral pyre, he allowed himself to be burned to death without uttering a sound, to the astonishment of the Greeks, who had never seen this unmurderous sort of bravery before. Two centuries later, circa 150 B.C., Patanjali brought the practices and traditions of the system together in his famous Yoga Sutras, which are still used as a text in yoga centers from Benares to Los Angeles. Yuan Chuang, in the 7th century A.D., described the system as having thousands of devotees. Marco Polo, about 1296, gave a vivid description of it. Today, after all these centuries, its more extreme followers, numbering from one to three million in India, still torture themselves to find the peace of understanding. It is one of the most impressive and touching phenomena in the history of man. What is yoga? Literally, a yoke not so much a yoking or a union of the soul with the supreme being, as the yoke of ascetic discipline and abstinence which the aspirant puts upon himself in order to cleanse his spirit of all material limitations and achieve supernatural intelligence and powers. Matter is the root of ignorance and suffering, therefore yoga seeks to free the soul from all sense phenomena and all bodily attachment. It is an attempt to attain supreme enlightenment and salvation in one life, by atoning in one existence for all the sins of the soul's past incarnations. Such enlightenment cannot be won at a stroke. The aspirant must move towards it step by step, and no stage of the process can be understood by anyone who has not passed through the stages before it. One comes to yoga only by long and patient study and self-discipline. The stages of yoga are eight. 1. Yama, or the death of desire. Here the soul accepts the restraints of ahimsa, and brahmacharya, abandons all self-seeking, emancipates itself from all material interests and pursuits, and wishes well to all things. 2. Niyama, a faithful observance of certain preliminary rules for yoga, cleanliness, content, purification, study, and piety. 3. Asana, posture. The aim here is to still all movement as well as all sensation. The best asana for this purpose is to place the right foot upon the left thigh, and the left foot upon the right thigh, to cross the hands and grasp the two great toes, to bend the chin upon the chest and direct the eyes to the tip of the nose. 4. Pranayama, or regulation of the breath. By these exercises one may forget everything but breathing, and in this way clear his mind for the passive emptiness that must precede absorption. At the same time one may learn to live on a minimum of air, and may let himself with impunity be buried in the earth for many days. 5. Pratyahara, abstraction, now the mind controls all the senses and withdraws itself from all sense objects. 6. Dharana, or concentration, the identification or filling of the mind and the senses with one idea or object to the exclusion of everything else. The fixation of any one object long enough will free the soul of all sensation, all specific thought, and all selfish desire then the mind, abstracted from things, will be left free to feel the immaterial essence of reality. 7. Dhyana, or meditation. This is an almost hypnotic condition, resulting from dharana. It may be produced, says Patanjali, by the persistent repetition of the sacred syllable om. 
Finally, as the summit of yoga, the ascetic arrives at eight, samadhi, or trance-contemplation. Even the last thought now disappears from the mind. Empty, the mind loses consciousness of itself as a separate being. It is merged with totality and achieves a blissful and godlike comprehension of all things in one. No words can describe this condition to the uninitiate. No intellect or reasoning can find or formulate it. Through yoga must yoga be known. Nevertheless, it is not God or union with God that the yogi seeks. In the yoga philosophy, God, Ishvara, is not the creator or preserver of the universe or the rewarder and punisher of men, but merely one of several objects on which the soul may meditate as a means of achieving concentration and enlightenment. The aim, frankly, is that dissociation of the mind from the body, that removal of all material obstruction from the spirit, which brings with it, in yoga theory, supernatural understanding and capacity. If the soul is cleansed of all bodily subjection and involvement, it will not be united with Brahman, it will be Brahman. For Brahman is precisely that hidden spiritual base, that selfless and immaterial soul, which remains when all sense attachments have been exercised away. To the extent to which the soul can free itself from its physical environment and prison, it becomes Brahman, and exercises Brahman's intelligence and power. Here the magical basis of religion reappears and almost threatens the essence of religion itself, the worship of powers superior to man. In the days of the Upanishads, yoga was pure mysticism, an attempt to realize the identity of the soul with God. In Hindu legend it is said that in ancient days seven wise men, or rishis, acquired by penance and meditation complete knowledge of all things. In the later history of India, yoga became corrupted with magic and thought more of the power of miracles than of the peace of understanding. The yogi trusts that by yoga he will be able to anesthetize and control any part of his body by concentrating upon it. He will be able at will to make himself invisible, or to prevent his body from being moved, or to pass in a moment from any part of the earth, or to live as long as he desires, or to know the past and the future and the most distant stars. The skeptic must admit that there is nothing impossible in all this. Fools can invent more hypotheses than philosophers can ever refute, and philosophers often join them in the game. Ecstasy and hallucinations can be produced by fasting and self-mortification. Concentration may make one locally or generally insensitive to pain, and there is no telling what reserve energies and abilities lurk within the unknown mind. Many of the yogis, however, are mere beggars who go through their penances in the supposedly occidental hope of gold, or in the simple human hunger for notice and applause. Asceticism is the reciprocal of sensuality, or at best an attempt to control it, but the attempt itself verges upon a masochistic sensuality in which the ascetic takes an almost erotic delight in his pain. The Brahmins have wisely abstained from such practices, and have counseled their followers to seek sanctity through the conscientious performance of the normal duties of life. 5. The Purva Mimansa to step from yoga to the purva mimansa is to pass from the most renowned to the least known and least important of the six systems of Brahmanical philosophy. And as yoga is magic and mysticism rather than philosophy, so this system is less philosophy than religion. It is an orthodox reaction against the impious doctrines of the philosophers. Its author, Jaimini, protested against the disposition of Kapila and Kannada to ignore while acknowledging the authority of the Vedas. The human mind, said Jaimini, is too frail an instrument to solve the problems of metaphysics and theology. Reason is a wanton who will serve any desire. It gives us not science and truth, but merely our own rationalized sensuality and pride. The road to wisdom and peace lies not through the vain labyrinths of logic, but in the modest acceptance of tradition and the humble performance of the rituals prescribed in the scriptures. For this, too, there is something to be said. Cela vous abetira. 6. The Vedanta System. Origin, Shankara, Logic, Epistemology, Maya, Psychology, Theology, God, Ethics, Difficulties of the System, Death of Shankara. The word Vedanta meant originally the end of the Vedas, that is, the Upanishads. Today India applies it to that system of philosophy which sought to give logical structure and support to the essential doctrine of the Upanishads, the organ point that sounds throughout Indian thought that God, Brahman, and the soul, Atman, are one. 
The oldest known form of this most widely accepted of all Hindu philosophies is the Brahma Sutra of Badarayana, circa 200 BC. 555 aphorisms of which the first announces the purpose of all. Now then, a desire to know Brahman. Almost a thousand years later, Gaudapada wrote a commentary on these sutras and taught the esoteric doctrine of the system to Govinda, who taught it to Shankara, who composed the most famous of Vedanta commentaries and made himself the greatest of Indian philosophers. In his short life of thirty-two years, Shankara achieved that union of sage and saint, of wisdom and kindliness, which characterizes the loftiest type of man produced in India. Born among the studious Nambudri Brahmins of Malabar, he rejected the luxuries of the world, and while still a youth became a sannyasi, worshipping unpretentiously the gods of the Hindu pantheon, and yet mystically absorbed in a vision of an all-embracing Brahman. It seemed to him that the profoundest religion and the profoundest philosophy were those of the Upanishads. He could pardon the polytheism of the people, but not the atheism of Sankhya or the agnosticism of Buddha. Arriving in the north as a delegate of the south, he won such popularity at the University of Benares that it crowned him with its highest honors, and sent him forth with a retinue of disciples to champion Brahmanism in all the debating halls of India. At Benares, probably, he wrote his famous commentaries on the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, in which he attacked with theological ardor and scholastic subtlety all the heretics of India, and restored Brahmanism to that position of intellectual leadership from which Buddha and Kapila had deposed it. There is much metaphysical wind in these discourses, and arid deserts of textual exposition, but they may be forgiven in a man who at the age of thirty could be at once the Aquinas and the Kant of India. Like Aquinas, Shankara accepts the full authority of his country's scriptures as a divine revelation, and then sallies forth to find proofs in experience and reason for all scriptural teachings. Unlike Aquinas, however, he does not believe that reason can suffice for such a task. On the contrary, he wonders, have we not exaggerated the power and role, the clarity and reliability of reason? Jaimini was right. Reason is a lawyer and will prove anything we wish. For every argument it can find an equal and opposite argument, and its upshot is a skepticism that weakens all force of character and undermines all values of life. It is not logic that we need, says Shankara, it is insight, the faculty, akin to art, of grasping at once the essential out of the irrelevant, the eternal out of the temporal, the whole out of the part. This is the first prerequisite to philosophy. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 1. It is not logic that we need, says Shankara, it is insight, the faculty, akin to art, of grasping at once the essential out of the irrelevant, the eternal out of the temporal, the whole out of the part. This is the first prerequisite to philosophy. The second is a willingness to observe, inquire, and think for understanding's sake, not for the sake of invention, wealth, or power. It is a withdrawal of the spirit from all the excitement, bias, and fruits of action. Thirdly, the philosopher must acquire self-restraint, patience, and tranquility. He must learn to live above physical temptation or material concerns. Finally, there must burn deep in his soul the desire for moksha, for liberation from ignorance, for an end to all consciousness of a separate self, for a blissful absorption in the Brahman of complete understanding and infinite unity. In a word, the student needs not the logic of reason so much as the cleansing and deepening discipline of the soul. This, perhaps, has been the secret of all profound education. Shankara establishes the source of his philosophy at a remote and subtle point never quite clearly visioned again until, a thousand years later, Immanuel Kant wrote his Critique of Pure Reason. How, he asks, is knowledge possible? Apparently, all our knowledge comes from the senses and reveals not the external reality itself, but our sensory adaptation, perhaps transformation of that reality. By sense, then, we can never quite know the real. We can know it only in that garb of space, time, and cause, which may be a web created by our organs of sense and understanding, designed or evolved to catch and hold that fluent and elusive reality whose existence we can surmise, but whose character we can never objectively describe. Our way of perceiving will forever be inextricably mingled with the thing perceived. 
This is not the airy subjectivism of the solipsist who thinks that he can destroy the world by going to sleep. The world exists, but it is maya, not delusion, but phenomenon, an appearance created partly by our thought. Our incapacity to perceive things except through the film of space and time, or to think of them except in terms of cause and change, is an innate limitation, an avidya, or ignorance, which is bound up with the very mode of perception, and to which, therefore, all flesh is heir. Maya and avidya are the subjective and objective sides of the great illusion by which the intellect supposes that it knows the real. It is through maya and avidya, through our birthright of ignorance, that we see a multiplicity of objects and a flux of change. In truth, there is only one being, and change is a mere name for the superficial fluctuations of forms. Behind the maya or veil of change in things to be reached not by sensation or intellect, but only by the insight and intuition of the trained spirit, is the one universal reality, Brahman. This natural obscuration of sense and intellect by the organs and forms of sensation and understanding bars us likewise from perceiving the one unchanging soul that stands beneath all individual souls and minds. Our separate selves, visible to perception and thought, are as unreal as the phantasmagoria of space and time. Individual differences and distinct personalities are bound up with body and matter. They belong to the kaleidoscopic world of change, and these merely phenomenal selves will pass away with the material conditions of which they are a part. But the underlying life which we feel in ourselves when we forget space and time, cause and change, is the very essence and reality of us, that Atman which we share with all selves and things, and which, undivided and omnipresent, is identical with Brahman, God. But what is God? Just as there are two selves, the ego and the Atman, and two worlds, the phenomenal and the noumenal, so there are two deities, an Ishvara, or creator, worshipped by the people through the patterns of space, cause, time, and change, and a Brahman, or pure being, worshipped by that philosophical piety which seeks and finds, behind all separate things and selves, one universal reality, unchanging amid all changes, indivisible amid all divisions, eternal despite all vicissitudes of form, all birth and death. Polytheism, even theism, belongs to the world of Maya and Avidya. They are forms of worship that correspond to the forms of perception and thought. They are as necessary to our moral life as space, time, and cause are necessary to our intellectual life, but they have no absolute validity or objective truth. To Shankara the existence of God is no problem, for he defines God as existence and identifies all real being with God. But of the existence of a personal God, creator or redeemer, there may, he thinks, be some question. Such a deity, says this pre-plagiarist of Kant, cannot be proved by reason. He can only be postulated as a practical necessity, offering peace to our limited intellects and encouragement to our fragile morality. The philosopher, though he may worship in every temple and bow to every god, will pass beyond these forgivable forms of popular faith. Feeling the illusoriness of plurality and the monistic unity of all things, he will adore as the supreme being, being itself, indescribable, limitless, spaceless, timeless, causeless, changeless being, the source and substance of all reality. We may apply the adjectives conscious, intelligent, even happy to Brahman, since Brahman includes all selves, and these may have such qualities. But all other adjectives would be applicable to Brahman equally, since it includes all qualities of all things. Essentially, Brahman is neuter, raised above personality and gender, beyond good and evil, above all moral distinctions, all differences and attributes, all desires and ends. Brahman is the cause and effect, the timeless and secret essence of the world. The goal of philosophy is to find that secret and to lose the seeker in the secret found. To be one with God means for Shankara to rise above, or to sink beneath, the separateness and brevity of the self, with all its narrow purposes and interests, to become unconscious of all parts, divisions, things, to be placidly at one in a desireless nirvana with that great ocean of being in which there are no warring purposes, no competing selves, no parts, no change, no space, and no time. To find this blissful peace, Ananda, 
A man must renounce not merely the world, but himself. He must care nothing for possessions or goods, even for good or evil. He must look upon suffering and death as maya, surface incidents of body and matter, time and change, and he must not think of his own personal quality and fate. A single moment of self-interest or pride can destroy all his liberation. Good works cannot give a man salvation, for good works have no validity or meaning except in the maya world of space and time. Only the knowledge of the saintly seer can bring that salvation which is the recognition of the identity of self and the universe, Atman and Brahman, soul and God, and the absorption of the part in the whole. Only when this absorption is complete does the wheel of reincarnation stop, for then it is seen that the separate self and personality to which reincarnation comes is an illusion. It is Ishvara, the Maya God, that gives rebirth to the self in punishment and reward. But when the identity of Atman and Brahman has become known, then, says Shankara, the soul's existence as wanderer and Brahman's existence as creator, that is, as Ishvara, have vanished away. Ishvara and Karma, like things and selves, belong to the exoteric doctrine of Vedanta as adapted to the needs of the common man. In the esoteric or secret doctrine, soul and Brahman are one, never wandering, never dying, never changed. It is thoughtful of Shankara to confine his esoteric doctrine to philosophers, for as Voltaire believed that only a society of philosophers could survive without laws, so only a society of supermen could live beyond good and evil. Critics have complained that if good and evil are maya, part of the unreal world, then all moral distinctions fall away and devils are as good as saints. But these moral distinctions, Shankara cleverly replies, are real within the world of space and time and are binding for those who live in the world. They are not binding upon the soul that has united itself with Brahman. Such a soul can do no wrong, since wrong implies desire and action, and the liberated soul by definition does not move in the sphere of desire and self-considering action. Whoever consciously injures another lives on the plane of maya, and is subject to its distinctions, its morals, and its laws. Only the philosopher is free, only wisdom is liberty. It was a subtle and profound philosophy to be written by a lad in his twenties, Shankara not only elaborated it in writing and defended it successfully in debate, but he expressed snatches of it in some of the most sensitive religious poetry of India. When all challenges had been met, he retired to a hermitage in the Himalayas, and according to Hindu tradition, died at the age of thirty-two. Ten religious orders were founded in his name, and many disciples accepted and developed his philosophy. One of them, some say Shankara himself, wrote for the people a popular exposition of the Vedanta, the Mohammedgara, or Hammer of Folly, in which the essentials of the system were summed up with clarity and force. Fool, give up thy thirst for wealth, banish all desires from thy heart, let thy mind be satisfied with what is gained by thy karma. Do not be proud of wealth, of friends, or of youth, time takes away all in a moment. Leaving quickly all this which is full of illusion, enter into the place of Brahman. Life is tremulous, like a water drop on a lotus leaf. Time is playing, life is waning, yet the breath of hope never ceases. The body is wrinkled, the hair gray, the mouth has become toothless, the stick in the hand shakes, yet man leaves not the anchor of hope. Preserve equanimity always. In me, in me and in others there dwells Vishnu alone. It is useless to be angry with me or impatient. See every self in self, and give up all thought of difference. 3. The Conclusions of Hindu Philosophy Decadence, Summary, Criticism, Influence The Mohammedan invasions put an end to the great age of Hindu philosophy. The assaults of the Moslems and later of the Christians upon the native faith drove it for self-defense into a timid unity that made treason of all debate and stifled creative heresy in a stagnant uniformity of thought. By the twelfth century, the system of the Vedanta, which in Shankara had tried to be a religion for philosophers, was reinterpreted by such saints as Ramanuja, circa 1050, into an orthodox worship of Vishnu, Rama, and Krishna. Forbidden to think new thoughts, philosophy became not only scholastic but barren. It accepted its dogmas from the priesthood and proved them laboriously by distinctions without difference and logic without reason. Nevertheless, the Brahmins, in the solitude of their retreats and under the protection of their unintelligibility, preserved the old systems carefully in esoteric sutras and commentaries, 
and transmitted across generations and centuries the conclusions of Hindu philosophy. In all these systems, Brahmanical or other, the categories of the intellect are represented as helpless or deceptive before a reality immediately felt or seen. And all our eighteenth-century rationalism appears to the Indian metaphysician as a vain and superficial attempt to subject the incalculable universe to the concepts of a salonniere. Into blind darkness pass they who worship ignorance, into still greater darkness they who are content with knowledge. Hindu philosophy begins where European philosophy ends, with an inquiry into the nature of knowledge and the limitations of reason. It starts not with the physics of Thales and Democritus, but with the epistemology of Locke and Kant. It takes mind as that which is most immediately known, and therefore refuses to resolve it into a matter known only mediately and through mind. It accepts an external world, but does not believe that our senses can ever know it as it is. All science is a charted ignorance and belongs to Maya. It formulates in ever-changing concepts and phrases the rationale of a world in which reason is but a part, one shifting current in an interminable sea. Even the person that reasons is Maya, illusion. What is he but a temporary conjunction of events, a passing node in the curves of matter and mind through space and time? For what are his acts or his thoughts but the fulfillment of forces far antedating his birth? Nothing is real but Brahman, that vast ocean of being in which every form is a moment's wave or a fleck of froth on the wave. Virtue is not the quiet heroism of good works, nor any pious ecstasy. It is simply the recognition of the identity of the self with every other self in Brahman. Morality is such living as comes from a sense of union with all things. He who discerns all creatures in his self and his self in all creatures has no disquiet thence. What delusion, what grief, can he with him? Certain characteristic qualities which would not seem to be defects from the Hindu point of view have kept this philosophy from exercising a wider influence in other civilizations. Its method, its scholastic terminology, and its Vedic assumptions handicap it in finding sympathy among nations with other assumptions or more secularized cultures. Its doctrine of Maya gives little encouragement to morality or active virtue. Its pessimism is a confession that it has not, despite the theory of karma, explained evil, and part of the effect of these systems has been to exalt a stagnant quietism in the face of evils that might conceivably have been corrected, or of work that cried out to be done. Nonetheless, there is a depth in these meditations which by comparison casts an air of superficiality upon the activistic philosophies generated in more invigorating zones. Perhaps our Western systems, so confident that knowledge is power, are the voices of a once lusty youth exaggerating human ability and tenure. As our energies tire in the daily struggle against impartial nature and hostile time, we look with more tolerance upon Oriental philosophies of surrender and peace. Hence the influence of Indian thought upon other cultures has been greatest in the days of their weakening or decay. While Greece was winning victories, she paid little attention to Pythagoras or Parmenides. When Greece was declining, Plato and the Orphic priests took up the doctrine of reincarnation, while Zeno the Oriental preached an almost Hindu fatalism and resignation. And when Greece was dying, the Neo-Platonists and the Gnostics drank deep at Indian wells. The impoverishment of Europe by the fall of Rome and the Moslem conquest of the routes between Europe and India seemed to have obstructed for a millennium the direct interchange of Oriental and Occidental ideas. But hardly had the British established themselves in India before editions and translations of the Upanishads began to stir Western thought. Fichte conceived an idealism strangely like Shankara's. Schopenhauer almost incorporated Buddhism, the Upanishads and the Vedanta into his philosophy, and Schelling, in his old age, thought the Upanishads the maturest wisdom of mankind. Nietzsche had dwelt too long with Bismarck and the Greeks to care for India, but in the end he valued above all other ideas his haunting notion of eternal recurrence, a variant of reincarnation. In our time, Europe borrows more and more from the philosophy of the East, compare Bergson, Kaiserling, Christian science, theosophy, while the East borrows more and more from the science of the West. Another world war might leave Europe open again, as the breakup of Alexander's empire opened Greece and the fall of the Roman Republic opened Rome, to an influx of Oriental philosophies and faiths. The mounting insurrection of the Orient against the Occident, 
the loss of those Asiatic markets that have sustained the industry and prosperity of the West, the weakening of Europe by poverty, faction, and revolution, might make that divided continent ripe for a new religion of celestial hope and earthly despair. Probably it is prejudice that makes such a denouement seem inconceivable in America. Quietism and resignation do not comport with our electric atmosphere or with the vitality born of rich resources and a spacious terrain. Doubtless our weather will protect us in the end. Chapter 20. The Literature of India. 1. The Languages of India. Sanskrit, the Vernaculars, Grammar. Just as the philosophy and much of the literature of medieval Europe were composed in a dead language, unintelligible to the people, so the philosophy and classic literature of India were written in a Sanskrit that had long since passed out of common parlance, but had survived as the Esperanto of scholars having no other common tongue. Divorced from contact with the life of the nation, this literary language became a model of scholasticism and refinement. New words were formed not only by the spontaneous creations of the people, but by the needs of technical discourse in the schools, until at last the Sanskrit of philosophy lost the virile simplicity of the Vedic hymns and became an artificial monster whose sesquipedalia verba crawled like monstrous tapeworms across the page. Meanwhile, the people of northern India, about the fifth century before Christ, had transformed Sanskrit into Prakrit, very much as Italy was to change Latin into Italian. Prakrit became for a time the language of Buddhists and Jains, until it in turn was developed into Pali, the language of the oldest extant Buddhist literature. By the end of the tenth century of our era, these Middle Indian languages had given birth to various vernaculars, of which the chief was Hindi. In the twelfth century, this in turn generated Hindustani as the language of the northern half of India. Finally, the invading Muslims filled Hindustani with Persian words, thereby creating a new dialect, Urdu. All these were Indo-Germanic tongues, confined to Hindustan. The Deccan kept its old Dravidian languages, Tamil, Telugu, Canarese, and Malayalam, and Tamil became the chief literary vehicle of the South. In the 19th century, Bengali replaced Sanskrit as the literary language of Bengal. The novelist Chatterjee was its Boccaccio. The poet Tagore was its Petrarch. Even today, India has a hundred languages, and the literature of Swaraj, the movement for self-rule, uses the speech of the conquerors. At a very early date, India began to trace the roots, history, relations, and combinations of words. By the 4th century BC, she had created for herself the science of grammar, and produced probably the greatest of all known grammarians, Panini. The studies of Panini, Patanjali, circa 150 AD, and Bhartrihari, circa 650, laid the foundations of philology, and that fascinating science of verbal genetics owed almost its life in modern times to the rediscovery of Sanskrit. Writing, as we have seen, was not popular in Vedic India. About the 5th century BC, the Karosti script was adapted from Semitic models, and in the epics and the Buddhist literature we begin to hear of clerks. Palm leaves and bark served as writing material, and an iron stylus as a pen. The bark was treated to make it less fragile. The pen scratched letters into it, ink was smeared over the bark, and remained in the scratches when the rest of it was wiped away. Paper was brought in by the Moslems, circa 1000 A.D., but did not finally replace bark till the 17th century. The bark pages were kept in order by stringing them upon a cord, and books of such leaves were gathered in libraries which the Hindus termed treasure houses of the goddess of speech. Immense collections of this wooden literature have survived the devastations of time and war. Of printing there is no sign till the 19th century, possibly because, as in China, the adjustment of movable type to the native scripts was too expensive, possibly because printing was looked upon as a vulgar descent from the art of calligraphy. The printing of newspapers and books was brought by the English to the Hindus, who bettered the instruction. Today there are 1,517 newspapers in India, 3,627 periodicals, and over 17,000 new books published in an average year. 2. Education, schools, Methods, universities, Muslim education, an emperor on education. Writing continued even to the 19th century to play a very small part in Indian education. 
Perhaps it was not to the interest of the priests that the sacred or scholastic texts should become an open secret to all. As far as we can trace Indian history, we find a system of education, always in the hands of the clergy, open at first only to the sons of Brahmins, then spreading its privileges from caste to caste until in our time it excludes only the untouchables. Every Hindu village had its schoolmaster, supported out of the public funds. In Bengal alone, before the coming of the British, there were some 80,000 native schools, one to every 400 population. The percentage of literacy under Ashoka was apparently higher than in India today. Children went to the village school from September to February, entering at the age of five and leaving at the age of eight. Instruction was chiefly of a religious character, no matter what the subject. Rote memorizing was the usual method, and the Vedas were the inevitable text. The three R's were included, but were not the main business of education. Character was rated above intellect, and discipline was the essence of schooling. We do not hear of flogging or of other severe measures, but we find that stress was laid above all upon the formation of wholesome and proper habits of life. At the age of eight, the pupil passed to the more formal care of a guru or personal teacher and guide with whom the student was to live, preferably till he was twenty. Services, sometimes menial, were required of him, and he was pledged to continence, modesty, cleanliness, and a meatless diet. Instruction was now given him in the five shastras, or sciences, grammar, arts and crafts, medicine, logic, and philosophy. Finally, he was sent out into the world with the wise admonition that education came only one-fourth from the teacher, one-fourth from private study, one-fourth from one's fellows, and one-fourth from life. From his guru, the student might pass, about the age of sixteen, to one of the great universities that were the glory of ancient and medieval India, Benares, Taxila, Vidarbha, Ajanta, Ujjain, or Nalanda. Benares was the stronghold of orthodox Brahmin learning in Buddha's days as in ours. Taxila, at the time of Alexander's invasion, was known to all Asia as the leading seat of Hindu scholarship, renowned above all for its medical school. Ujjain was held in high repute for astronomy, Ajanta for the teaching of art. The facade of one of the ruined buildings at Ajanta suggests the magnificence of these old universities. Nalanda, most famous of Buddhist institutions for higher learning, had been founded shortly after the master's death, and the state had assigned for its support the revenues of a hundred villages. It had ten thousand students, one hundred lecture rooms, great libraries, and six immense blocks of dormitories four stories high. Its observatories, said Yuan Chuang, were lost in the vapors of the morning, and the upper rooms towered above the clouds. The old Chinese pilgrim loved the learned monks and shady groves of Nalanda so well that he stayed there for five years. Of those from abroad who wished to enter the schools of discussion at Nalanda, he tells us, the majority, beaten by the difficulties of the problem, withdrew, and those who were deeply versed in old and modern learning were admitted, only two or three out of ten succeeding. The candidates who were fortunate enough to gain admission were given free tuition, board, and lodging, but they were subjected to an almost monastic discipline. Students were not permitted to talk to a woman or to see one. Even the desire to look upon a woman was held a great sin, in the fashion of the hardest saying in the New Testament. The student guilty of sex relations had to wear for a whole year the skin of an ass with the tail turned upward, and had to go about begging alms and declaring his sin. Every morning the entire student body was required to bathe in the ten great swimming pools that belonged to the university. The course of study lasted for twelve years, but some students stayed thirty years, and some remained till death. The Mohammedans destroyed nearly all the monasteries, Buddhist or Brahmin, in northern India. Nalanda was burned to the ground in 1197, and all its monks were slaughtered. We can never estimate the abundant life of ancient India from what these fanatics spared. Nevertheless, the destroyers were not barbarians. They had a taste for beauty and an almost modern skill in using piety for the purposes of plunder. When the Mughals ascended the throne, they brought a high but narrow standard of culture with them. They loved letters as much as the sword, and knew how to combine a successful siege with poetry. Among the Moslems, education was mostly individual, through tutors engaged by prosperous fathers for their sons. It was an aristocratic conception of education as an ornament, occasionally an aid to a man of affairs and power, but usually an irritant and a public danger in one doomed to poverty or modest place. What the methods of the tutors were, we may judge from one of the great letters of history, 
the reply of Aurangzeb to his former teacher, who was seeking some sign cure and emolument from the king. What is it you would have of me, doctor? Can you reasonably desire that I should make you one of the chief omrahs of my court? Let me tell you, if you had instructed me as you should have done, nothing would be more just, for I am of this persuasion, that a child well educated and instructed is as much at least obliged to his master as to his father. But where are those good documents you have given me? In the first place you have taught me that all Frangistan, so it seems they call Europe, was nothing but I know not what little island, of which the greatest king was he of Portugal, and next to him he of Holland, and after him he of England. And as to the other kings, as those of France and Andalusia, you have represented them to me as our petty rajas, telling me that the kings of Indostan were far above them altogether, that they, the kings of Indostan, were the great ones, the conquerors and kings of the world and those of Persia and Uzbek, Kashgar, Tartary and Cathay, Pegu, China and Machina, did tremble at the name of the kings of Indostan. Admirable geography! You should rather have taught me to exactly distinguish all those states of the world and well to understand their strength, their way of fighting, their customs, religions, governments and interests, and by the pursuit of solid history to observe their rise, progress, decay and whence, how, and by what accidents and errors those great changes and revolutions of empires and kingdoms have happened. I have scarce learned of you the name of my grandsires, the famous founders of this empire. So far were you from having taught me the history of their life and what course they took to make such great conquest. You had a mind to teach me the Arabian tongue to read and to write. I am much obliged, forsooth, for having made me lose so much time upon a language that requires ten or twelve years to attain to its perfection, as if the son of a king should think it to be an honor to him to be a grammarian or some doctor of the law, and to learn other languages than of his neighbors when he can well be without them. He to whom time is so precious for so many weighty things, which he ought by times to learn." as if there were any spirit that did not with some reluctancy and even with a kind of debasement employ itself in so sad and dry an exercise, so longsome and tedious, as is that of learning words. Thus, says the contemporary Bernier, did Aurangzeb resent the pedantic instructions of his tutors, to which tis affirmed in that court that he added the following reproof. Know you not the childhood well governed, being a state which is ordinarily accompanied with an happy memory, is capable of thousands of good precepts and instructions, which remain deeply impressed the whole remainder of a man's life and keep the mind always raised for great actions? The law, prayers, and sciences, may they not as well be learned in our mother tongue as in Arabic? You told my father Shah Jahan that you would teach me philosophy. Tis true, I remember very well, that you have entertained me for many years with airy questions of things that afford no satisfaction at all to the mind, and are of no use in humane society, empty notions and mere fancies, that have only this in them, that they are very hard to understand and very easy to forget. I still remember that after you had thus amused me, I know not how long, with your fine philosophy, all I retained of it was a multitude of barbarous and dark words, proper to bewilder, perplex, and tire out the best wits, and only invented the better to cover the vanity and ignorance of men like yourself that would make us believe that they know all, and that under those obscure and ambiguous words are hid great mysteries which they alone are capable to understand. If you had seasoned me with that philosophy which formeth the mind to ratiocination, and insensibly accustoms it to be satisfied with nothing but solid reasons, if you had given me those excellent precepts and doctrines which raise the soul above the assaults of fortune, and reduce her to an unshakable and always equal temper, and permit her not to be lifted up by prosperity, nor debased by adversity, if you had taken care to give me the knowledge of what we are and what are the first principles of things, and had assisted me in forming in my mind a fit idea of the greatness of the universe, and of the admirable order and motion of the parts thereof. If, I say, you had instilled into me this kind of philosophy, I should think myself incomparably more obliged to you than Alexander was to his Aristotle, and believe it my duty to recompense you otherwise than he did him. Should you not, instead of your flattery, have taught me somewhat of that point so important to a king, which is, what the reciprocal duties are of a sovereign to his subjects and those of subjects to their sovereigns, and ought not you have to consider that one day I should be obliged with the sword to dispute my life and my crown with my brothers? Have you ever taken any care to make me learn what tis to besiege a town, or to set an army in array? 
for these things I am obliged to others, not at all to you. Go and return to the village whence you are come, and let nobody know who you are and what has become of you. 3. The Epics The Mahabharata, its story, its form, the Bhagavad Gita, the metaphysics of war, the price of freedom, the Ramayana, a forest idol, the rape of Sita, the Hindu epics, and the Greek. The schools and the universities were only a part of the educational system of India. Since writing was less highly valued than in other civilizations, and oral instruction preserved and disseminated the nation's history and poetry, the habit of public recitation spread among the people the most precious portions of their cultural heritage. As nameless raconteurs among the Greeks transmitted and expanded the Iliad and the Odyssey, so the reciters and declaimers of India carried down from generation to generation and from court to people the ever-growing epics into which the Brahmins crowded their legendary lore. A Hindu scholar has rated the Mahabharata as the greatest work of imagination that Asia has produced, and Sir Charles Eliot has called it a greater poem than the Iliad. In one sense there is no doubt about the latter judgment. Beginning, circa 500 B.C., as a brief narrative poem of reasonable length, the Mahabharata took on with every century additional episodes and homilies, and absorbed the Bhagavad Gita as well as parts of the story of Rama, until at last it measured 107,000 octameter couplets, seven times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. The name of the author was Legion, Vyasa, to whom tradition assigns it means the arranger, a hundred poets wrote it, a thousand singers molded it, until, under the Gupta kings, circa 400 A.D., the Brahmins poured their own religious and moral ideas into a work originally Kshatriyan, and gave the poem the gigantic form in which we find it today. The central subject was not precisely adapted to religious instruction, for it told a tale of violence, gambling, and war. Book one presents the fair Shakuntala, destined to be the heroine of India's most famous drama, and her mighty son Bharata. From his loins come those great Bharata, Mahabharata, tribes, the Kurus and the Pandavas, whose bloody strife constitutes the oft-broken thread of the tale. Yudhishthira, king of the Pandavas, gambles away his wealth, his army, his kingdom, his brothers, at last his wife, Draupadi, in a game in which his Kuru enemy plays with loaded dice. By agreement, the Pandavas are to receive their kingdom back after enduring a twelve-year banishment from their native soil. The twelve years pass, the Pandavas call upon the Kurus to restore their land, they receive no answer and declare war. Allies are brought in on either side until almost all northern India is engaged. References in the Vedas to certain characters of the Mahabharata indicate that the story of a great intertribal war in the second millennium BC is fundamentally historical. The battle rages for eighteen days and five books. All the Kurus are slain, and nearly all the Pandavas. The heroic Bhishma alone slays a hundred thousand men in ten days. Altogether, the poet statistician reports, the fallen numbered several hundred million men. Amid this bloody scene of death, Gandhari, queen consort of the blind Kuru king, Dhritarashtra, wails with horror at the sight of vultures hovering greedily over the corpse of Prince Duryodhan, her son. Stainless queen and stainless woman, ever righteous, ever good, stately in her mighty sorrow on the field Gandhari stood. Strewn with skulls and clotted tresses, darkened by the stream of gore, with the limbs of countless warriors is the red field covered o'er, and the long-drawn howl of jackals over the scene of carnage rings, and the vulture and the raven flap their dark and loathsome wings. Feasting on the blood of warriors, foul pishachas fill the air. Viewless forms of hungry rakshas, limb from limb the corpses tear. Through this scene of death and carnage was the ancient monarch led. Kuru dames with faltering footsteps stepped amidst the countless dead, and a piercing wail of anguish burst upon the echoing plain as they saw their sons or fathers, brothers, lords, amidst the slain. As they saw the wolves of jungle feed upon the destined prey, darksome wanderers of the midnight prowling in the light of day. Shriek of pain and wail of anguish o'er the ghastly field resound, and their feeble footsteps falter and they sink upon the ground. Sense and life desert the mourners as they faint in common grief. Death-like swoon succeeding sorrow yields a moment's short relief. Then a mighty sigh of anguish from Gandhari's bosom broke. 
gazing on her anguished daughters, unto Krishna thus she spoke. Mark my unconsoled daughters, widowed queens of Kuru's house, wailing for their dear departed like the osprey for her spouse. How each cold and fading feature wakes in them a woman's love, how amidst the lifeless warriors still with restless steps they rove. Mothers hug their slaughtered children, all unconscious in their sleep. Widows bend upon their husbands and in ceaseless sorrow weep. Thus to Krishna queen Gandhari strove her woeful thoughts to tell, when alas her wandering vision on her son Duryodhan fell. Sudden anguish smote her bosom, and her senses seemed to stray. Like a tree by tempest shaken, senseless on the earth she lay. Once again she waked in sorrow, once again she cast her eye where her son in blood empurpled slept beneath the open sky. And she clasped her dear Duryodhan, held him close unto her breast, sobs convulsive shook her bosom as the lifeless form she pressed, and her tears like rains of summer fell and washed his noble head, decked with garlands still untarnished, graced with nishkas bright and red. Mother, said my dear Duryodhan when he went into the war, wish me joy and wish me triumph as I mount the battle car. Son, I said to dear Duryodhan, heaven avert a cruel fate. Yatho dharma stato jaya, triumph doth on virtue wait. But he set his heart on battle, by his valor wiped his sins. Now he dwells in realms celestial which the faithful warrior wins. And I weep not for Duryodhan, like a prince he fought and fell. But my sorrow-stricken husband, who can his misfortunes tell? Hear the loathsome cry of jackals, how the wolves their vigils keep. Maidens rich in song and beauty erst were wont to watch his sleep. Hark the foul and blood-beaked vultures flap their wings upon the dead. Maidens wave their feathery pankas round Duryodhan's royal bed. Mark Duryodhan's noble widow, mother proud of Lakshman bold, queenly in her youth and beauty like an altar of bright gold. Torn from husband's sweet embraces, from her son's entwining arms, doomed to lifelong woe and anguish in her youth and in her charms. Rend my hard and stony bosom crushed beneath this cruel pain. Should Gandhari live to witness noble son and grandson slain? Mark again Duryodhan's widow, how she hugs his gory head, how with gentle hands and tender softly holds him on his bed. How from dear departed husband turns she to her dearest son, and the teardrops of the mother choke the widow's bitter groan. Like the fiber of the lotus tender golden is her frame. O oh, my lotus, O oh, my daughter, Bharat's pride and Kuru's fame. If the truth resides in Vedas, brave Duryodhan dwells above. Wherefore linger we in sadness severed from his cherished love? If the truth resides in Shastra, dwells in sky, my hero son. Wherefore linger we in sorrow, since their earthly task is done? Upon this theme of love and battle a thousand interpolations have been hung. The god Krishna interrupts the slaughter for a canto to discourse on the nobility of war and Krishna. The dying Bhishma postpones his death to expound the laws of caste, bequest, marriage, gifts, and funeral rites, to explain the philosophy of the Sankhya and the Upanishads, to narrate a mass of legends, traditions, and myths, and to lecture Yudhishthira at great length on the duties of a king. Dusty stretches of genealogy and geography, of theology and metaphysics, separate the oases of drama and action. Fables and fairy tales, love stories, and lives of the saints contribute to give the Mahabharata a formlessness worse and a body of thought richer than can be found in either the Iliad or the Odyssey. What was evidently a Kshatriyan enthronement of action, heroism, and war becomes, in the hands of the Brahmins, a vehicle for teaching the people the laws of Manu, the principles of yoga, the precepts of morality, and the beauty of nirvana. The golden rule is expressed in many forms. Moral aphorisms of beauty and wisdom abound, and pretty stories of marital fidelity, Nala and Damayanti, Savitri, convey to women listeners the Brahmin ideal of the faithful and patient wife. Embedded in the narrative of the great battle is the loftiest philosophical poem in the world's literature, the Bhagavad Gita, or Lord's Song. This is the New Testament of India, revered next to the Vedas themselves, and used in the law courts like our Bible or the Koran for the administration of oaths. Wilhelm von Humboldt pronounced it the most beautiful, perhaps the only true philosophical song existing in any known tongue, 
perhaps the deepest and loftiest thing the world has to show. Sharing the anonymity that India, careless of the individual and the particular, wraps around her creations, the Gita comes to us without the author's name and without date. It may be as old as 400 B.C. or as young as 200 A.D. The mise-en-scene of the poem is the battle between the Kurus and the Pandavas. The occasion is the reluctance of the Pandava warrior Arjuna to attack in mortal combat his own near relatives in the opposing force. To Lord Krishna, fighting by his side like some Homeric god, Arjuna speaks the philosophy of Gandhi and Christ. As I behold, come here to shed their common blood, yon concourse of our kin, my members fail, my tongue dries in my mouth. It is not good, O Keshav. Naught of good can spring from mutual slaughter. Lo, I hate triumph and domination, wealth and ease, thus sadly won. Alas, what victory can bring delight, Govinda? What rich spoils could profit? What rule recompense? What span of life itself seems sweet, bought with such blood? Thus, if we slay kinsfolk and friends for love of earthly power, ahovat, what an evil fault it were. Better I deem it, if my kinsmen strike, to face them weaponless and bear my breast to shaft and spear, than answer blow with blow. Thereupon Krishna, whose divinity does not detract from his joy in battle, explains, with all the authority of a son of Vishnu, that according to the scriptures and the best orthodox opinion, it is meet and just to kill one's relatives in war, that Arjuna's duty is to follow the rules of his kshatriya caste, to fight and slay with a good conscience and a good will, that after all only the body is slain while the soul survives. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 2. Thereupon Krishna, whose divinity does not detract from his joy in battle, explains with all the authority of a son of Vishnu, that according to the scriptures and the best orthodox opinion, it is meet and just to kill one's relatives in war, that Arjuna's duty is to follow the rules of his kshatriya caste, to fight and slay with a good conscience and a good will, that after all only the body is slain while the soul survives. And he expounds the imperishable Purusha of Sankhya, the unchanging Atman of the Upanishads. Indestructible, learn thou, the life is, spreading life through all. It cannot anywhere, by any means, be anywise diminished, stayed, or changed. But for these fleeting frames which it informs with spirit deathless, endless, infinite, they perish. Let them perish, prince, and fight. He who shall say, Lo, I have slain a man. He who shall think, Lo, I am slain. Those both know naught. Life cannot slay. Life is not slain. Never the spirit was born. The spirit shall cease to be never. Never was time, it was not. End and beginning are dreams. Birthless and deathless and changeless remaineth the spirit forever. Death hath not touched it at all, dead though the house of it seems. Krishna proceeds to instruct Arjuna in metaphysics, blending Sankhya and Vedanta in the peculiar synthesis accepted by the Vaishnavite sect. All things, he says, identify himself with the Supreme Being. Hang on me as hangs a row of pearls upon its string. I am the fresh taste of the water, I the silver of the moon, the gold of the sun, the word of worship in the beds, the thrill that passeth in the ether, and the strength of man's shed seed. I am the good sweet smell of the moistened earth, I am the fire's red light, the vital air moving in all which moves, the holiness of hallowed souls, the root undying, whence hath sprung whatever is, the wisdom of the wise, the intellect of the informed, the greatness of the great, the splendor of the splendid. To him who wisely sees, the Brahmin with his scrolls and sanctities, the cow, the elephant, the unclean dog, the outcast gorging dog's meat, all are one. It is a poem rich in complementary colors, in metaphysical and ethical contradictions that reflect the contrariness and complexity of life. We are a little shocked to find the man taking what might seem to be the higher moral stand, while the god argues for war and slaughter on the shifty ground that life is unkillable and individuality unreal. What the author had in mind to do, apparently, was to shake the Hindu soul out of the enervating quietism of Buddhist piety into a willingness to fight for India. 
It was the rebellion of a Kshatriya who felt that religion was weakening his country, and who proudly reckoned that many things were more precious than peace. All in all, it was a good lesson which, if India had learned it, might have kept her free. The second of the Indian epics is the most famous and best beloved of all Hindu books, and lends itself more readily than the Mahabharata to Occidental understanding. The Ramayana is briefer, merely running to a thousand pages of forty-eight lines each, and though it too grew by accretion from the third century B.C. to the second century A.D., the interpolations are fewer and do not much disturb the central theme. Tradition attributes the poem to one Valmiki, who, like the supposed author of the larger epic, appears as a character in the tale. But more probably it is the product of many wayside bards, like those who still recite these epics, sometimes for ninety consecutive evenings, to fascinated audiences. As the Mahabharata resembles the Iliad in being the story of a great war fought by gods and men, and partly occasioned by the loss of a beautiful woman from one nation to another, so the Ramayana resembles the Odyssey, and tells of a hero's hardships and wanderings, and of his wife's patient waiting for reunion with him. At the outset we get a picture of a golden age, when Dasaratha from his capital Ayodhya ruled the kingdom of Kosala, now Aud. Rich in royal worth and valor, rich in holy Vedic lore, Dasaratha ruled his empire in the happy days of yore. Peaceful lived the righteous people, rich in wealth, in merit, high. Envy dwelt not in their bosoms, and their accents shaped no lie. Fathers with their happy households owned their cattle, corn, and gold. Galling penury and famine in Ayodhya had no hold. Nearby was another happy kingdom, Videha, over which King Janak ruled. He himself held the plough and tilled the earth like some doughty Cincinnatus. And one day at the touch of his plough a lovely daughter, Sita, sprang up from a furrow of the soil. Soon Sita had to be married, and Janak held a contest for her suitors. He who could unbend Janak's bow of war should win the bride. To the contest came the oldest son of Dasarata, Rama, lion-chested, mighty-armored, lotus-eyed, stately as the jungle tusker, with his crown of tresses tied. Only Rama bent the bow, and Janak offered him his daughter with the characteristic formula of Hindu marriage. This is Sita, child of Janak, dearer unto him than life. Henceforth, sharer of thy virtue, be she, prince, thy faithful wife. Of thy weal and woe, partaker, be she thine in every land. Cherish her in joy and sorrow, clasp her hand within thy hand. As the shadow to the substance to her lord is faithful wife, and my Sita, best of women, follows thee in death or life. So Rama returns to Ayodhya with his princess bride, ivory brow and lip of coral, sparkling teeth of pearly sheen, and wins the love of the Kosalas by his piety, his gentleness, and his generosity. Suddenly evil enters into this Eden in the form of Dasarata's second wife, Kaikeyi. Dasarata has promised her any boon she may ask, and now, jealous of the first wife, whose son Rama is heir to the throne, she requires Dasarata to banish Rama from the kingdom for fourteen years. Dasarata, with a sense of honor which only a poet unacquainted with politics could conceive, keeps his word, and broken-hearted exiles his favorite son. Rama forgives him handsomely and prepares to go and live in the forest alone, but Sita insists upon going with him. Her speech is part of the memory of almost every Hindu bride. Car and steed and gilded palace, vain are these to woman's life. Dearer is her husband's shadow to the loved and loving wife. Happier than in father's mansions, in the woods will Sita rove, waste no thought on home or kindred, nestling in her husband's love and the wild fruit she will gather from the fresh and fragrant wood, and the food by Rama tasted shall be Sita's cherished food. Even his brother Lakshman begs leave to accompany Rama. All alone with gentle Sita thou shalt trace thy darksome way. Grant it that thy faithful Lakshman shall protect her night and day. Grant it with his bow and quiver, Lakshman shall all forests roam, and his axe shall fell the jungle, and his hands shall rear the home. The epic becomes at this point a sylvan idol, telling how Rama, Sita, and Lakshman set out for the woods, how the population of Ayodhya, mourning for them, travel with them all the first day, how the exiles steal away from their solicitous company at night, abandon all their valuables and princely raiment, dress themselves in bark and matted grass, clear away through the forest with their swords, and live on the fruits and nuts of the trees. 
Off to Rama turned his consort, pleased and curious evermore, asked the name of tree or creeper, fruit or flower unseen before. Peacocks flew around them gaily, monkeys leapt on branches bent. Rama plunged into the river neath the morning's crimson beam, Sita softly sought the waters as the lily seeks the stream. They built a hut beside the river and learned to love their life in the woods. But a southern princess, Surpanaka, wandering in the forest, meets Rama, falls in love with him, resents his virtue, and instigates her brother Ravan to come and kidnap Sita. He succeeds, snatches her away to his distant castle, and tries in vain to seduce her. Since nothing is impossible to gods and authors, Rama raises a great army, invades Ravan's realm, defeats him in battle, rescues Sita, and then, his years of exile having ended, flies with her in an airplane back to Ayodhya, where another loyal brother gladly surrenders to him the Kosala throne. In what is probably a later epilogue, Rama gives way to the skeptics who will not believe that Sita could have been so long in Ravan's palace without being occasionally in his arms. Though she passes through the ordeal of fire to prove her innocence, he sends her away to a forest hermitage with that bitter trick of heredity whereby one generation repeats upon the next the sins and errors which it suffered from its elders in its youth. In the woods, Sita meets Valmiki and bears two sons to Rama. Many years later, these sons, as traveling minstrels, sing before the unhappy Rama the epic composed about him by Valmiki from Sita's memories. He recognizes the boys as his own and sends a message begging Sita to return. But Sita, broken-hearted over the suspicion to which she has been subjected, disappears into the earth that was once her mother. Rama reigns many years in loneliness and sorrow, and under his kindly sway Ayodhya knows again the utopia of Dasarata's days. And tis told by ancient sages during Rama's happy reign, death untimely, dire diseases, came not to his subject men. Widows wept not in their sorrow for their lords untimely lost. Mothers wailed not in their anguish for their babes by Yama crossed. Robbers, cheats, and gay deceivers tempted not with lying word. Neighbor loved his righteous neighbor, and the people loved their lord. Trees their ample produce yielded as returning seasons went, and the earth in grateful gladness never failing harvest lent. Rains descended in their season, never came the blighting gale, Rich in crop and rich in pasture was each soft and smiling vale. Loom and anvil gave their produce, and the tilled and fertile soil and the nation lived rejoicing in their old ancestral toil. It is a delightful story which even a modern cynic can enjoy if he is wise enough to yield himself now and then to romance and the lilt of song. These poems, though perhaps inferior to the epics of Homer in literary quality, in logic of structure and splendor of language, in depth of portraiture and fidelity to the essence of things, are distinguished by fine feeling, a lofty idealization of woman and man, and a vigorous, sometimes realistic, representation of life. Rama and Sita are too good to be true, but Draupadi and Yudhishthira, Dhritarashtra and Gandhari are almost as living as Achilles and Helen, Ulysses and Penelope. The Hindu would rightly protest that no foreigner can judge these epics or even understand them, to him they are not mere stories, they are a gallery of ideal characters upon whom he may mold his conduct. They are a repertory of the traditions, philosophy, and theology of his people. In a sense, they are sacred scriptures to be read as a Christian reads the imitation of Christ or the lives of the saints. The pious Hindu believes that Krishna and Rama were incarnations of divinity and still prays to them, and when he reads their story in these epics he feels that he derives religious merit as well as literary delight and moral exaltation. He trusts that if he reads the Ramayana he will be cleansed of all sin and will beget a son, and he accepts with simple faith the proud conclusion of the Mahabharata. If a man reads the Mahabharata and has faith in its doctrines, he becomes free from all sin and ascends to heaven after his death. As butter is to all other food, as Brahmins are to all other men, as the ocean is to a pool of water, as the cow is to all other quadrupeds, so is the Mahabharata to all other histories. He who attentively listens to the shlokas, or couplets, of the Mahabharata, and has faith in them, enjoys a long life and solid reputation in this world, and an eternal abode in the heavens in the next. 4. Drama Origins The Clay Cart Characteristics of Hindu Drama Kalidasa The Story of Shakuntala Estimate of Indian Drama in one sense, drama in India is as old as the Vedas, 
for at least the germ of drama lies in the Upanishads. Doubtless older than these scriptures is a more active source of the drama, the sacrificial and festival ceremonies and processions of religion. A third origin was in the dance, no mere release of energy, much less a substitute for coitus, but a serious ritual imitating and suggesting actions and events vital to the tribe. Perhaps a fourth source lay in the public and animated recitation of epic verse. These factors cooperated to produce the Indian theater and gave it a religious stamp that lingered throughout the classic age in the serious nature of the drama, the Vedic or epic source of its subjects, and the benediction that always preceded the play. Perhaps the final stimulus to drama came from the intercourse established by Alexander's invasion between India and Greece. We have no evidence of Hindu dramas before Ashoka, and only uncertain evidence during his reign. The oldest extant Hindu plays are the palm-leaf manuscripts lately discovered in Chinese Turkestan. Among them were three dramas, one of which names as its author Ashvagosha, a theological luminary at Kanishka's court. The technical form of this play and the resemblance of its buffoon to the type traditionally characteristic of the Hindu theater, suggests that drama was already old in India when Ashvagosha was born. In 1910, thirteen ancient Sanskrit plays were found in Travancore, which were dubiously ascribed to Basa, circa 350 A.D., a dramatic predecessor much honored by Kalidasa. In the prologue to his Malavika, Kalidasa unconsciously but admirably illustrates the relativity of time and adjectives. Shall we, he asks, neglect the works of such renowned authors as Basa, Salmila, and Kaviputra? Can the audience feel any respect for the work of a modern poet, a Kalidasa? Until recently, the oldest Hindu play known to research was The Clay Cart. The text, which need not be believed, names as author of the play an obscure King Shudraka, who is described as an expert in the Vedas, in mathematics, in the management of elephants, and in the art of love. In any event, he was an expert in the theater. His play is by all means the most interesting that has come to us from India, a clever combination of melodrama and humor, with excellent passages of poetic fervor and description. A synopsis of its plot will serve better than a volume of commentary to illustrate the character of Indian drama. In Act I we meet Charudatta, once rich, now impoverished by generosity and bad fortune. His friend, Maitreya, a stupid Brahmin, acts as jester in the play. Charu asks Maitreya to offer an oblation to the gods, but the Brahmin refuses, saying, What's the use when the gods you have worshipped have done nothing for you? Suddenly, a young Hindu woman of high family and great wealth rushes into Charu's courtyard, seeking refuge from a pursuer who turns out to be the king's brother, Samstanaka as completely and incredibly evil as Charu is completely and irrevocably good. Charu protects the girl, sends Samstanaka off, and scorns the latter's threat of vengeance. The girl, Vasantasena, asks Charu to keep a casket of jewels in safe custody for her, lest her enemies steal it from her, and lest she may have no excuse for revisiting her rescuer. He agrees, takes the casket, and escorts her to her palatial home. Act Two is a comic interlude. A gambler, running away from two other gamblers, takes refuge in a temple. When they enter, he eludes them by posing as the idol of the shrine. The pursuing gamblers pinch him to see if he is really a stone god, but he does not move. They abandon their search and console themselves with a game of dice at the foot of the altar. The game becomes so exciting that the statue, unable to control himself, leaps off his pedestal and asks leave to take part. The others beat him. He again finds help in his heels and is saved by Vasanta Sena, who recognizes in him a former servant of Charu Datta. Act three shows Charu and Maitreya returning from a concert. A thief, Sharvilaka, breaks in and steals the casket. Charu, discovering the theft, feels disgraced and sends Vasanta Sena his last string of pearls as a substitute. In Act four, Sharvilaka is seen offering the stolen casket to Vasanta Sena's maid as a bribe for her love. Seeing that it is her mistress's casket, she berates Sharvilaka as a thief. He answers her with Schopenhauerian acerbity. A woman will for money smile or weep, according to your will. She makes a man put trust in her, but trusts him not herself. Women are as inconstant as the waves of ocean. Their affection is as fugitive as streak of sunset glow upon a cloud. They cling with eager fondness to the man who yields them wealth, 
which they squeeze out like sap out of a juicy plant, and then they leave him. The maid refutes him by forgiving him, and Vasantasena by allowing them to marry. At the opening of Act V, Vasantasena comes to Charu's house to return both his jewels and her casket. While she is there, a storm blows up, which she describes in excellent Sanskrit. An exceptional instance, usually in Hindu plays, the women speak Prakrit, on the ground that it would be unbecoming in a lady to be familiar with a dead language. The storm obligingly increases its fury and compels her, much according to her will, to spend the night under Charu's roof. Act six shows Vasanta leaving Charu's house the next morning. By mistake she steps not into the carriage she has summoned for her, but into one which belongs to the villainous Samstanaka. Act seven is concerned with a subordinate plot, inessential to the theme. Act eight finds Vasanta deposited not in her palace as she had expected, but in the home, almost in the arms of her enemy. When she again spurns his love, he chokes her and buries her. Then he goes to court and lodges against Charu a charge of murdering Vasanta for her jewels. Act nine describes the trial, in which Maitreya unwittingly betrays his master by letting Vasanta's jewels fall from his pocket. Charu is condemned to death. In Act ten, Charu is seen on his way to execution. His child pleads with the executioners to be allowed to take his place, but they refuse. At the last moment, Vasanta herself appears. Sharvalaka had seen Samstanaka bury her. He had exhumed her in time and had revived her. Now, while Vasanta rescues Charu, Sharvalaka accuses the king's brother of murder. But Charu refuses to support the charge. Samstanaka is released, and everybody is happy. Since time is more plentiful in the East, where nearly all work is done by human hands than in the West, where there are so many labor-saving devices, Hindu plays are twice as long as the European dramas of our day. The acts vary from five to ten, and each act is unobtrusively divided into scenes by the exit of one character and the entrance of another. There are no unities of time or place and no limits to imagination. Scenery is scanty, but costumes are colorful. Sometimes living animals enliven the play, and for a moment redeem the artificial with the natural. The performance begins with a prologue, in which an actor or the manager discusses the play. Goethe seems to have taken from Kalidasa the idea of a prologue for Faust. The prologue concludes by introducing the first character, who marches into the middle of things. Coincidences are innumerable, and supernatural influences often determine the course of events. A love story is indispensable, so is a jester. There is no tragedy in the Indian theatre. Happy endings are unavoidable. Faithful love must always triumph. Virtue must always be rewarded, if only to balance reality. Philosophical discourse, which obtrudes so often into Hindu poetry, is excluded from Hindu drama. Drama, like life, must teach only by action, never by words. Lyric poetry alternates with prose according to the dignity of the topic, the character, and the action. Sanskrit is spoken by the upper castes in the play, Prakrit by the women and the lower castes. Descriptive passages excel, character delineation is poor. The actors, who include women, do their work well with no occidental haste and with no far eastern fustian. The play ends with an epilogue, in which the favorite god of the author or the locality is importuned to bring prosperity to India. Ever since Sir William Jones translated it and Goethe praised it, the most famous of Hindu dramas has been the Shakuntala of Kalidasa. Nevertheless, we know Kalidasa only through three plays, and through the legends that pious memory has hung upon his name. Apparently he was one of the nine gems, poets, artists, and philosophers, who were cherished by King Vikramaditya, 380 to 413 A.D., in the Gupta capital at Ujjain. Shakuntala is in seven acts, written partly in prose, partly in vivid verse. After a prologue in which the manager invites the audience to consider the beauties of nature, the play opens upon a forest glade in which a hermit dwells with his foster daughter Shakuntala. The peace of the scene is disturbed by the noise of a chariot. Its occupant, King Dushyanta, appears and falls in love with Shakuntala with literary speed. He marries her in the first act, but is suddenly called back to his capital, he leaves her with the usual promises to return at his earliest convenience. An ascetic tells the sorrowing girl that the king will remember her as long as she keeps the ring Dushyanta has given her, but she loses the ring while bathing. About to become a mother, she journeys to the court, only to discover that the king has forgotten her after the manner of men to whom women have been generous. She tries to refresh his memory. 
Shakuntala. Do you not remember in the jasmine bower one day how you had poured the rainwater that a lotus had collected in its cup into the hollow of your hand? King. Tell on, I am listening. Shakuntala. Just then my adopted child, the little fawn, ran up with long, soft eyes, and you, before you quenched your own thirst, gave to the little creature, saying, Drink you first, gentle fawn. But she would not from strange hands. And yet immediately after, when I took some water in my hand, she drank, absolute in her trust. Then with a smile you said, Each creature has faith in its own kind. You are children both of the same wild wood, and each confides in the other, knowing where its trust is. King. Sweet, fair, and false, such women entice fools. The female gift of cunning may be marked in creatures of all kinds, in women most. The cuckoo leaves her eggs for dupes to hatch, then flies away secure and triumphing. Shakuntala, spurned and despondent, is miraculously lifted into the air and carried off to another forest, where she bears her child, that great Bharata whose progeny must fight all the battles of the Mahabharata. Meanwhile a fisherman has found the ring, and seeing the king's seal on it, has brought it to Dushyanta. His memory of Shakuntala is restored, and he seeks her everywhere. Travelling in his airplane over the Himalayas, he alights by dramatic providence at the very hermitage where Shakuntala is pining away. He sees the boy Bharata playing before the cottage, and envies his parents. Ah, happy father, happy mother, who, carrying their little son, are soiled with dust rubbed from his body. It nestles with fond faith into their lap, the refuge that he craves. The white buds of his teeth just visible when he breaks out into a causeless smile, and he attempts sweet wordless sounds, melting the heart more than any word. Shakuntala appears, the king begs her forgiveness, receives it, and makes her his queen. The play ends with a strange but typical invocation. May kings reign only for their subjects' weal. May the divine Sarasvati, the source of speech, and goddess of dramatic art, be ever honored by the great and wise. And may the purple self-existent God, whose vital energy pervades all space, from future transmigrations save my soul. Drama did not decline after Kalidasa, but it did not again produce a Shakuntala or a clay cart. King Harsha, if we may believe a possibly inspired tradition, wrote three plays which held the stage for centuries. A hundred years after him, Bhavabhuti, a Brahmin of Berar, wrote three romantic dramas which are ranked second only to Kalidasa's in the history of the Indian stage. His style, however, was so elaborate and obscure that he had to be, and of course protested that he was, content with a narrow audience. How little do they know, he wrote, who speak of us with censure. The entertainment is not for them. Possibly someone exists or will exist of similar tastes with myself, for time is boundless and the world is wide. We cannot rank the dramatic literature of India on a plane with that of Greece or Elizabethan England, but it compares favorably with the theater of China or Japan. Nor need we look to India for the sophistication that marks the modern stage. That is an accident of time rather than an eternal verity, and may pass away, even into its opposite. The supernatural agencies of Indian drama are as alien to our taste as the deus ex machina of the enlightened Euripides, but this too is a fashion of history. The weaknesses of Hindu drama, if they may be listed diffidently by an alien, are artificial diction disfigured with alliteration and verbal conceits, monochromatic characterization in which each person is thoroughly good or thoroughly bad, improbable plots turning upon unbelievable coincidences, and an excess of description and discourse over that action which is, almost by definition, the specific medium by which drama conveys its significance. Its virtues are its creative fancy, its tender sentiment, its sensitive poetry, and its sympathetic evocation of nature's beauty and terror. About national types of art there can be no disputation. We can judge them only from the provincial standpoint of our own, and mostly through the prism of translation. It is enough that Goethe, ablest of all Europeans to transcend provincial and national barriers, found the reading of Shakuntala among the profound experiences of his life, and wrote of it gratefully, Wouldst thou the young year's blossoms and the fruits of its decline, and all by which the soul is charmed, enraptured, feasted, fed, wouldst thou the earth and heaven itself in one sole name combine? I name thee, O Shakuntala, and all at once is said. 5. Prose and Poetry Their unity in India, fables, history, tales, minor poets, rise of the vernacular literature, 
Chandidas, Tulsidas, Poets of the South, Kabir. Prose is largely a recent phenomenon in Indian literature and might be termed an exotic corruption through contact with Europeans. To the naturally poetic soul of the Hindu, everything worth writing about had a poetic content and invited a poetic form. Since he felt that literature should be read aloud and knew that his work would spread and endure, if at all by oral rather than written dissemination, he chose to give to his compositions a metric or aphoristic form that would lend itself to recitation and memory. Consequently, nearly all the literature of India is verse. Scientific, medical, legal, and art treatises are, more often than not, presented in meter or rhyme or both. Even grammars and dictionaries have been turned into poetry. Fables and history, which in the West are content with prose, found in India a melodious poetic form. Hindu literature is especially rich in fables. Indeed, India is probably responsible for most of the fables that have passed like an international currency across the frontiers of the world. Buddhism flourished best in the days when the Jataka legends of Buddha's birth and youth were popular among the people. The best-known book in India is the Panchatantra, or Five Headings, circa 500 A.D. It is the source of many of the fables that have pleased Europe as well as Asia. The Hitopadesha, or Good Advice, is a selection and adaptation of tales from the Panchatantra. Both, strange to say, are classed by the Hindus under the rubric of Niti Shastra, that is, instructions in politics or morals. Every tale is told to point a moral, a principle of conduct or government. Usually these stories pretend to have been invented by some wise Brahmin for the instruction of a king's sons. Often they turn the lowliest animals to the uses of the subtlest philosophy. The fable of the monkey who tried to warm himself by the light of a glowworm and slew the bird who pointed out his error is a remarkably apt illustration of the fate that awaits the scholar who exposes a popular delusion. A lively war rages in the fields of Oriental scholarship as to whether these fables passed from India to Europe or turn about. We leave the dispute to men of leisure. Perhaps they passed to both India and Europe from Egypt, via Mesopotamia and Crete. The influence of the Panchatantra upon the Arabian Nights, however, is beyond question. Historical literature did not succeed in rising above the level of either bare chronicles or gorgeous romance. Perhaps through a scorn of the Maya events of space and time, perhaps through a preference of oral to written traditions, the Hindus neglected to compose works of history that could bear comparison with Herodotus or Thucydides, Plutarch or Tacitus, Gibbon or Voltaire. Details of place and date were so scantily recorded, even in the case of famous men, that Hindu scholars assigned it to their greatest poet, Kalidasa, dates ranging over a millennium. Living to our own time in an almost unchanging world of custom, morals, and beliefs, the Hindu hardly dreamed of progress and never bothered about antiquities. He was content to accept the epics as authentic history and to let legend serve for biography. When Ashba Gosha wrote his life of Buddha, the Buddha Charita, it was legend rather than history. And when, five hundred years later, Bana wrote his Harsha Charita, it was again an idealization rather than a reliable portrait of the great king. The native chronicles of Rajputana appear to be exercises in patriotism. Only one Hindu writer seems to have grasped the function of the historian. Kalana, author of the Rajatarangini, or Stream of Kings, expressed himself as follows, That noble-minded poet alone merits praise whose word, like the sentence of a judge, keeps free from love or hatred in recording the past. Vinternitz called him the only great historian that India has produced. The Moslems were more acutely conscious of history and left some admirable prose records of their doings in India. We have mentioned Al-Biruni's ethnographical study of India and Babur's memoirs. Contemporary with Akbar was an excellent historian, Muhammad de Kazim Firishta, whose history of India is our most reliable guide to the events of the Moslem period. Less impartial was Akbar's prime minister or general political factotum, Abu el-Fazl, who put his master's administrative methods down for posterity in the Aini Akbari, or Institutes of Akbar, and told his master's life with forgivable fondness in the Akbar Nama. The emperor returned his affection, and when the news came that Jehangir had slain the vizier, Akbar burst into a passionate grief and cried out, If Salim, Jehangir, wished to be emperor, he might have slain me and spared Abu el-Fazl. Midway between fables and history, 
were the vast collections of poetic tales put together by industrious versifiers for the delectation of the romantic Indian soul. As far back as the first century A.D., one Gunadya wrote in 100,000 couplets the Brihatkata, or Great Romance, and a thousand years later, Somadeva composed the Katasritsagara, or Ocean of the Rivers of Story, a torrent 21,500 couplets long. In the same eleventh century, a clever storyteller of uncertain identity built a framework for his Betala Panchavimchatika, the twenty-five stories of the vampire, by representing King Vikramaditya as receiving annually from an ascetic a fruit containing a precious stone. The king inquires how he may prove his gratitude. He is asked to bring to the yogi the corpse of a man hanging on the gallows, but is warned not to speak if the corpse should address him. The corpse is inhabited by a vampire who, as the king stumbles along, fascinates him with a story. At the end of the story, the vampire propounds a question which the king, forgetting his instructions, answers. Twenty-five times the king attempts the task of bringing a corpse to the ascetic and holding his peace. Twenty-four times he is so absorbed in the story that the vampire tells him that he answers the question put to him at the end. It was an excellent scaffold on which to hang a score of tales. Meanwhile, there was no dearth of poets writing what we should call poetry. Abu el Fazl describes thousands of poets at Akbar's court. There were hundreds at minor capitals and doubtless dozens in every home. Poetry tended now to be less objective than in the days of the epic, and gave itself more and more to the interweaving of religion and love, meter which had been loose and free in the epics, varying in the length of the line and requiring regularity only in the last four or five syllables, became at once stricter and more varied. A thousand complications of prosody were introduced, which disappear in translation. Artifices of letter and phrase abounded, and rhyme appeared not only at the end but often in the middle of the line. Rigid rules were composed for the poetic art, and the form became more precise as the content thinned. One of the earliest and greatest was Bartrahari, monk, grammarian, and lover who, before retiring into the arms of religion, instructed his soul with amours. He has left us a record of them in his Century of Love, a Heine-like sequence of a hundred poems. Erstwhile, he writes to one of his loves, We twain deemed that thou wast I and I wast thou. How comes it now that thou art thou and I am I? He did not care for reviewers, and told them, It is easy to satisfy one who is ignorant, even easier to satisfy a connoisseur. But not the Creator Himself can please the man who has just a morsel of knowledge. In Jayadeva's Gita Govinda, or Song of the Divine Cowherd, the amorousness of the Hindu turns to religion, and intones the sensuous love of Radha and Krishna. It is a poem of full-bodied passion, but India interprets it reverently as a mystic and symbolic portrayal of the soul's longing for God, an interpretation that would be intelligible to those immovable divines who composed such pious headings for the Song of Songs. In the eleventh century the vernaculars made inroads upon the classical dead language as a medium of literary expression, as they were to do in Europe a century later. The first major poet to use the living speech of the people was Chand Bardai, who wrote in Hindi an immense historical poem of sixty cantos, and was only persuaded to interrupt his work by the call of death. Sur Das, the blind poet of Agra, composed sixty thousand verses on the life and adventures of Krishna. We are told that he was helped by the god himself, who became his amanuensis, and wrote faster than the poet could dictate. Meanwhile, a poor priest, Chandi Das, was shocking Bengal by composing Dantean songs to a peasant Beatrice, idealizing her with romantic passion, exalting her as a symbol of divinity, and making his love an allegory of his desire for absorption in God. At the same time, he inaugurated the use of Bengali as a literary language. I have taken refuge at your feet, my beloved. When I do not see you, my mind has no rest. I cannot forget your grace and your charm, and yet there is no desire in my heart. Excommunicated by his fellow Brahmins on the ground that he was scandalizing the public, he agreed to renounce his love, Rami, in a public ceremony of recantation. But when in the course of this ritual he saw Rami in the crowd, he withdrew his recantation, and going up to her, bowed before her with hands joined in adoration. The supreme poet of Hindi literature is Tulsi Das, almost a contemporary of Shakespeare. 
His parents exposed him because he had been born under an unlucky star. He was adopted by a forest mystic who instructed him in the legendary lore of Rama. He married, but when his son died, Tulsidas retired to the woods to lead a life of penance and meditation. There and in Banares he wrote his religious epic, the Rama Charita Manasa, or Lake of the Deeds of Rama, in which he told again the story of Rama and offered him to India as the supreme and only God. There is one God, says Tulsidas. It is Rama, creator of heaven and earth, and redeemer of mankind. For the sake of his faithful people, a very God, Lord Rama, became incarnate as a king, and for our sanctification lived, as it were, the life of any ordinary man. Few Europeans have been able to read the work in the now archaic Hindi original. One of these considers that it establishes Tulsidas as the most important figure in the whole of Indian literature. To the natives of Hindustan, the poem constitutes a popular Bible of theology and ethics. I regard the Ramayana of Tulsidas, says Gandhi, as the greatest book in all devotional literature. Meanwhile, the Deccan was also producing poetry. Tukaram composed in the Marathi tongue 4,600 religious songs which are as current in India today as the Psalms of David are in Judaism or Christendom. His first wife having died, he married a shrew and became a philosopher. It is not hard to win salvation, he wrote, for it may readily be found in the bundle on our back. As early as the second century A.D., Madura became the capital of Tamil letters. A sangam, or court of poets and critics, was set up there under the patronage of the Pandya kings, and like the French Academy, regulated the development of the language, conferred titles, and gave prizes. Tiruvallavar, an outcast weaver, wrote in the most difficult of Tamil meters a religious and philosophical work, the Koral, expounding moral and political ideals. Tradition assures us that when the members of the Sangam, who were all Brahmins, saw the success of this pariah's poetry, they drowned themselves to a man. But this is not to be believed of any academy. We have kept for the last, though out of his chronological place, the greatest lyric poet of medieval India. Kabir, a simple weaver of Banares, prepared for his task of uniting Islam and Hinduism by having, we are told, a Mohammedan for his father and a Brahmin virgin for his mother. Fascinated by the preacher Ramananda, he became a devotee of Rama, enlarged him, as Tulsidas would also do, into a universal deity, and began to write Hindi poems of rare beauty to explain a creed in which there should be no temples, no mosques, no idols, no caste, no circumcision, and but one God. Kabir, he says, is a child of Ram and Allah, and accepteth all gurus and peers. O God, whether Allah or Rama, I live by thy name. Lifeless are all the images of the gods. They cannot speak. I know it, for I have called aloud to them. What avails it to wash your mouth, count your beads, bathe in holy streams, and bow in temples, if, whilst you mutter your prayers or go on pilgrimages, deceitfulness is in your hearts? The Brahmins were shocked, and to refute him, the story runs, sent a courtesan to tempt him. But he converted her to his creed. This was easy, for he had no dogmas, but only profound religious feeling. There is an endless world, O my brother, and there is a nameless being of whom naught can be said. Only he knows who has reached that region. It is other than all that is heard or said. No form, no body, no length, no breadth is seen there. How can I tell you that which it is? Kabir says, It cannot be told by the words of the mouth. It cannot be written on paper. It is like a dumb person who tastes a sweet thing. How shall it be explained? He accepted the theory of reincarnation which was in the air about him, and prayed like a Hindu to be released from the chain of rebirth and redeath. But his ethic was the simplest in the world. Live justly and look for happiness at your elbow. I laugh when I hear that the fish in the water is thirsty. You do not see that the real is in your home, and you wander from forest to forest listlessly. Here is the truth. Go where you will, to Benares or to Matura. If you do not find your soul, the world is unreal to you. To what shore would you cross, O my heart? There is no traveller before you, there is no road. There there is neither body nor mind, and where is the place that shall still the thirst of the soul? You shall find naught in the emptiness. Be strong, and enter into your own body, for there your foothold is firm. Consider it well, O my heart, go not elsewhere. Kabir says, Put all imaginations away, 
and stand fast in that which you are. After his death runs the legend, Hindus and Mohammedans contended for his body and disputed whether it should be buried or burned. But while they disputed, someone raised the cloth that covered the corpse and nothing could be seen but a mass of flowers. The Hindus burned a part of the flowers in Benares and the Moslems buried the rest. After his death, his songs passed from mouth to mouth among the people. Nanak the Sikh was inspired by them to, to found his sturdy sect. Others made the poor weaver into a deity. Today, two small sects, jealously separate, follow the doctrine and worship the name of this poet who tried to unite Moslems and Hindus. One sect is Hindu, the other is Moslem. This book is continued on Cassette 4, Side 1. Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 4, Side 1. Chapter 21, Indian Art, 1, The Minor Arts, The Great Age of Indian Art, Its Uniqueness, Its Association with Industry, Pottery, Metal, Wood, Ivory, Jewelry, Textiles, before Indian art, as before every phase of Indian civilization, we stand in humble wonder at its age and its continuity. The ruins of Mahenjo-daro are not all utilitarian. Among them are limestone bearded men, significantly like Sumerians, terracotta figures of women and animals, beads and other ornaments of carnelian, and jewelry of finely polished gold. One seal shows in bas-relief a bull so vigorously and incisively drawn that the observer almost leaps to the conclusion that art does not progress, but only changes its form. From that time to this, through the vicissitudes of five thousand years, India has been creating its peculiar type of beauty in a hundred arts. The record is broken and incomplete, not because India ever rested, but because war and the idol-smashing ecstasies of Moslems destroyed uncounted masterpieces of building and statuary, and poverty neglected the preservation of others. We shall find it difficult to enjoy this art at first sight. Its music will seem weird, its painting obscure, its architecture confused, its sculpture grotesque. We shall have to remind ourselves at every step that our tastes are the fallible product of our local and limited traditions and environments, and that we do ourselves and foreign nations injustice when we judge them or their arts by standards and purposes natural to our life and alien to their own. In India, the artist had not yet been separated from the artisan, making art artificial and work a drudgery. As in our Middle Ages, so in the India that died at Plassey, every mature workman was a craftsman, giving form and personality to the product of his skill and taste. Even today, when factories replace handicrafts and craftsmen degenerate into hands, the stalls and shops of every Hindu town show squatting artisans beating metal, molding jewelry, drawing designs, weaving delicate shawls and embroideries, or carving ivory and wood. Probably no other nation known to us has ever had so exuberant a variety of arts. Strange to say, pottery failed to rise from an industry to an art in India. Caste rules put so many limitations upon the repeated use of the same dish that there was small incentive to adorn with beauty the frail and transient earthenware that came so rapidly from the potter's hand. If the vessel was to be made of some precious metal, then artistry could spend itself upon it without stint. Witness the Tanjore silver vase in the Victoria Institute at Madras, or the gold beetle dish of Kandy. Brass was hammered into an endless variety of lamps, bowls, and containers. A black alloy, bidri, of zinc was often used for boxes, basins, and trays. And one metal was inlaid or overlaid upon another, or encrusted with silver or gold. Wood was carved with a profusion of plant and animal forms. Ivory was cut into everything from deities to dice. Doors and other objects of wood were inlaid with it, and dainty receptacles were made of it for cosmetics and perfumes. Jewelry abounded, and was worn by rich and poor as ornament or hoard. Jaipur excelled in firing enamel colors upon a gold background. Clasps, beads, pendants, knives, and combs were molded into tasteful shapes with floral, animal, or theological designs. 
One Brahmin pendant harbors in its tiny space half a hundred gods. Textiles were woven with an artistry never since excelled. From the days of Caesar to our own, the fabrics of India have been prized by all the world. Sometimes, by the subtlest and most painstaking of pre-calculated measurements, every thread of warp and woof was dyed before being placed upon the loom. The design appeared as the weaving progressed and was identical on either side. From homespun kadar to complex brocades flaming with gold, from picturesque pajamas to the invisibly seamed shawls of Kashmir, every garment woven in India has a beauty that comes only of a very ancient and now almost instinctive art. 2. Music. A concert in India. Music and the dance, musicians, scale and forms, themes, music and philosophy. An American traveler, permitted to intrude upon a concert in Madras, found an audience of some two hundred Hindus, apparently all Brahmins, seated some on benches, some on a carpeted floor, listening intently to a small ensemble beside which our orchestral mobs would have seemed designed to make themselves heard on the moon. The instruments were unfamiliar to the visitor, and to his provincial eye they looked like the strange and abnormal products of some neglected garden. There were drums of many shapes and sizes, ornate flutes and serpentine horns, and a variety of strings. Most of these pieces were wrought with minute workmanship, and some were studded with gems. One drum, the redanga, was formed like a small barrel. Both ends were covered with a parchment whose pitch was changed by tightening or loosening it with little leather thongs. One parchment head had been treated with manganese dust, boiled rice, and tamarind juice in order to elicit from it a peculiar tone. The drummer used only his hands, sometimes the palm, sometimes the fingers, sometimes the merest fingertips. Another player had a tambura, or lute, whose four long strings were sounded continuously as a deep and quiet background for the melody. One instrument, the vina, was especially sensitive and eloquent. Its strings stretched over a slender metal plate from a parchment-covered drum of wood at one end to a resounding hollow gourd at the other were kept vibrating with a plectrum, while the player's left hand etched in the melody with fingers moving deftly from string to string. The visitor listened humbly and understood nothing. Music in India has a history of at least three thousand years. The Vedic hymns, like all Hindu poetry, were written to be sung. Poetry and song, music and dance were made one art in the ancient ritual. The Hindu dance, which to the beam in the Occidental eye seems as voluptuous and obscene as Western dancing seems to Hindus, has been, through the greater part of Indian history, a form of religious worship, a display of beauty and motion and rhythm for the honor and edification of the gods. Only in modern times have the Devadasis emerged from the temples in great number to entertain the secular and profane. To the Hindu these dances were no mere display of flesh. They were, in one aspect, an imitation of the rhythms and processes of the universe. Shiva himself was the god of the dance, and the dance of Shiva symbolized the very movement of the world. Musicians, singers, and dancers, like all artists in India, belonged to the lowest castes. The Brahmin might like to sing in private and accompany himself on a vina or another stringed instrument. He might teach others to play or sing or dance, but he would never think of playing for hire or of putting an instrument to his mouth. Public concerts were, until recently, a rarity in India. Secular music was either the spontaneous singing or thrumming of the people, or it was performed, like the chamber music of Europe, before small gatherings in aristocratic homes. Akbar, himself skilled in music, had many musicians at his court. One of his singers, Tansen, became popular and wealthy and died of drink at the age of thirty-four. There were no amateurs, there were only professionals. Music was not taught as a social accomplishment, and children were not beaten into Beethoven's. The function of the public was not to play poorly, but to listen well. For listening to music in India is itself an art, and requires long training of ear and soul. The words may be no more intelligible to the Westerner than the words of the operas which he feels it his class duty to enjoy. They range, as everywhere, about the two subjects of religion and love. But the words are of little moment in Hindu music, and the singer, as in our most advanced literature, often replaces them with meaningless syllables. The music is written in scales more subtle and minute than ours. To our scale of twelve tones it adds ten microtones, making a scale of twenty-two quarter tones in all. Hindu music may be written in a notation composed of Sanskrit letters. Usually it is neither written nor read, but is passed down by ear from generation to generation, or from composer to learner. 
It is not separated into bars, but glides in a continuous legato which frustrates a listener accustomed to regular emphases or beats. It has no chords and does not deal in harmony. It confines itself to melody with perhaps a background of undertones. In this sense, it is much simpler and more primitive than European music, while it is more complex in scale and rhythm. The melodies are both limited and infinite. They must all derive from one or another of the thirty-six traditional modes or airs, but they may weave upon these themes an endless and seamless web of variation. Each of these themes, or ragas, consists of five, six, or seven notes, to one of which the musician constantly returns. Each raga is named from the mood that it wishes to suggest. Dawn, spring, evening beauty, intoxication, etc., and is associated with a specific time of the day or the year. Hindu legend describes an occult power to these ragas. So it is said that a Bengal dancing girl ended a drought by singing, as a kind of raindrop prelude, the Meghmala Raga, or rainmaking theme. Their antiquity has given the ragas a sacred character. He who plays them must observe them faithfully, as forms enacted by Shiva himself. More strictly speaking, there are six ragas, or basic themes, each with five modifications called ragini. Raga means color, passion, mood. Ragini is its feminine form. One player, Narada, having performed them carelessly, was ushered into hell by Vishnu, and was shown men and women weeping over their broken limbs. These, said the god, were the ragas and raginis distorted and torn by Narada's reckless playing. Seeing which, we are told, Narada sought more humbly a greater perfection in his art. The Indian performer is not seriously hampered by the obligation to remain faithful to the raga that he has chosen for his program any more than the Western composer of sonatas or symphonies is hampered by adhering to his theme. In either case, what is lost in liberty is gained in access to coherence of structure and symmetry of form. The Hindu musician is like the Hindu philosopher. He starts with the finite and sends his soul into the infinite. He embroiders upon his theme until, through an undulating stream of rhythm and recurrence, even through a hypnotizing monotony of notes, he has created a kind of musical yoga, a forgetfulness of will and individuality, of matter, space, and time. The soul is lifted into an almost mystic union with something deeply interfused, some profound, immense, and quiet being, some primordial and pervasive reality that smiles upon all striving wills, all change and death. Probably we shall never care for Hindu music and never comprehend it until we have abandoned striving for being, progress for permanence, desire for acceptance, and motion for rest. This may come when Europe again is subject and Asia again is master, but then Asia will have tired of being, permanence, acceptance, and rest. 3. Painting. Prehistoric. The frescoes of Ajanta. Rajput miniatures the Mogul school, the painters, the theorists. A provincial is a man who judges the world in terms of his parish and considers all unfamiliar things barbarous. It is told of the emperor Jehangir, a man of taste and learning in the arts, that when he was shown a European painting he rejected it summarily. Being in oil he liked it not. It is pleasant to know that even an emperor can be a provincial, and that it was as difficult for Jehangir to enjoy the oil painting of Europe as it is for us to appreciate the miniatures of India. It is clear from the drawings in red pigment of animals and a rhinoceros hunt in the prehistoric caves of Singapur and Mirzapur that Indian painting has had a history of many thousands of years. Palettes with ground colors ready for use abound among the remains of Neolithic India. Great gaps occur in the history of the art, because most of the early work was ruined by the climate, and much of the remainder was destroyed by Moslem idol-breakers from Mahmud to Aurangzeb. The Vinaya Pitaka, circa 300 B.C., refers to King Pasedana's palace as containing picture galleries, and Fa Hien and Yuan Chuang describe many buildings as famous for the excellence of their murals, but no trace of these structures remains. One of the oldest frescoes in Tibet shows an artist painting a portrait of Buddha, the later artist took it for granted that painting was an established art in Buddha's days. The earliest datable Indian painting is a group of Buddhist frescoes, circa 100 B.C., found on the walls of a cave in Sirguya, in the central provinces. From that time on, the art of fresco painting, that is, painting upon freshly laid plaster before it dries, progressed step by step until on the walls of the caves at Ajanta it reached a perfection never excelled even by Giotto or Leonardo. These temples were carved out of the rocky face of a mountainside at various periods from them, the first to the seventh century A.D. 
For centuries they were lost to history and human memory after the decay of Buddhism. The jungle grew about them and almost buried them. Bats, snakes, and other beasts made their home there, and a thousand varieties of birds and insects fouled the paintings with their waste. In 1819 Europeans stumbled into the ruins and were amazed to find on the walls frescoes that are now ranked among the masterpieces of the world's art. The temples have been called caves, for in most cases they are cut into the mountains. Cave number 16, for example, is an excavation 65 feet each way, upheld by 20 pillars. Alongside the central hall are 16 monastic cells. A porticoed veranda adorns the front, and a sanctuary hides in the back. Every wall is covered with frescoes. In 1879, 16 of the 29 temples contained paintings. By 1910, the frescoes in 10 of these 16 had been destroyed by exposure, and those in the remaining six had been mutilated by inept attempts at restoration. Once these frescoes were brilliant with red, green, blue, and purple pigments, Nothing survives of the colors now except low-toned and blackened surfaces. Some of the paintings, thus obscured by time and ignorance, seem coarse and grotesque to us, who cannot read the Buddhist legends with Buddhist hearts. Others are at once powerful and graceful, a revelation of the skill of craftsmen whose names perished long before their work. Despite these depredations, Cave One is still rich in masterpieces. Here on one wall is, probably, a bodhisattva, a Buddhist saint entitled to nirvana, but choosing instead repeated rebirths in order to minister to men. Never has the sadness of understanding been more profoundly portrayed. One wonders which is finer or deeper, this or Leonardo's kindred study of the head of Christ. On another wall of the same temple is a study of Shiva and his wife Parvati, dressed in jewelry. Nearby is a painting of four deer, tender with the Buddhist sympathy for animals and on the ceiling is a design still alive with delicately drawn flowers and fowl. On a wall of cave 17 is a graceful representation, now half destroyed, of the god Vishnu, with his retinue, flying down from heaven to attend some event in the life of Buddha. On another wall is a schematic but colorful portrait of a princess and her maids. Mingled with these, chef d'oeuvre, are crowded frescoes of apparently poor workmanship, describing the youth, flight, and temptation of Buddha. But we cannot judge these works in their original form from what survives of them today, and doubtless there are clues to their appreciation that are not revealed to alien souls. Even the Occidental, however, can admire the nobility of the subject, the majestic scope of the plan, the unity of the composition, the clearness, simplicity, and decisiveness of the line, and, among many details, the astonishing perfection of that bane of all artists, the hands. Imagination can picture the artist priests who prayed in these cells and perhaps painted these walls and ceilings with fond and pious art while Europe lay buried in her early medieval darkness. Here at Ajanta, religious devotion fused architecture, sculpture, and painting into a happy unity and produced one of the sovereign monuments of Hindu art. When their temples were closed or destroyed by Huns and Moslems, the Hindus turned their pictorial skill to lesser forms. Among the Rajputs, a school of painters arose who recorded in delicate miniatures the episodes of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, and the heroic deeds of the Rajputana chieftains. Often they were mere outlines, but always they were instinct with life and perfect in design. There is in the Museum of Fine Arts at Boston a charming example of this style, symbolizing one of the ragas of music by means of graceful women, a stately tower, and a lowering sky. Another example in the Art Institute of Detroit represents with unique delicacy a scene from the Gita Govinda. The human figures in these and other Hindu paintings were rarely drawn from models. The artist visualized them out of imagination and memory. He painted, usually in brilliant tempera, upon a paper surface. He used fine brushes made from the most delicate hairs that he could get from the squirrel, the camel, the goat, or the mongoose, and he achieved a refinement of line and decoration that delight even the foreign and inexpert eye. Similar work was done in other parts of India, especially in the state of Kangra. Another variety of the same genre developed under the Mughals at Delhi. Rising out of Persian calligraphy and the art of illuminating manuscripts, this style grew into a form of aristocratic portraiture corresponding in its refinement and exclusiveness to the chamber music that flourished at the court. Like the Rajput school, the Mughal painters strove for delicacy of line, sometimes using a brush made from a single hair and they too rivaled one another in the skillful portrayal of the hand. But they put more color into their drawings and less mysticism. They seldom touched religion or mythology. They confined themselves to the earth and were as realistic as caution would permit. 
Their subjects were living men and women of imperial position and temper, not noted for humility. One after another these dignitaries sat for their portraits until the picture galleries of that royal dilettante Jehangir were filled with the likenesses of every important ruler or courtier since the coming of Akbar to the throne. Akbar was the first of his dynasty to encourage painting. At the end of his reign, if we may believe Abu el Fazl, there were a hundred masters in Delhi and a thousand amateurs. Jehangir's intelligent patronage developed the art and widened its field from portraiture to the representation of hunting scenes and other natural backgrounds for the human figure, which still dominated the picture. One miniature shows the emperor himself almost in the claws of a lion that has clambered upon the rump of the imperial elephant and is reaching for the royal flesh, while an attendant realistically takes to his heels. Under Shah Jahan the art reached its height and began to decline, as in the case of Japanese prints, the widened popularity of the form gave it at once a wider audience and a less exacting taste. Aurangzeb, by restoring the strict rule of Islam against images, completed the decay. Through the intelligent beneficence of the Mughal kings, Indian painters enjoyed at Delhi a prosperity that they had not known for many centuries. The guild of painters, which had kept itself alive from Buddhist times, renewed its youth, and some of its members escaped from the anonymity with which time's forgetfulness and Hindu negligence of the individual cover most Indian art. Out of seventeen artists considered preeminent in Akbar's reign, thirteen were Hindus. The most favored of all the painters of the great Mughal's court was Dathbant, whose lowly origin as the son of a palanquin bearer aroused no prejudice against him in the eyes of the emperor. The youth was eccentric and insisted on drawing pictures wherever he went and on whatever surface he found at hand. Akbar recognized his genius and had his own drawing master teach him. The boy became in time the greatest master of his age, but at the height of his fame he stabbed himself to death. Wherever men do things, other men will arise who will explain to them how things should be done. The Hindus, whose philosophy did not exalt logic, loved logic nonetheless and delighted to formulate in the strictest and most rational rules the subtle procedure of every art. So early in our era, the Sandanga, or six limbs of Indian painting, laid down, like a later and perhaps imitative Chinese, six canons of excellence in pictorial art. One, the knowledge of appearances. Two, correct perception, measure, and structure. Three, the action of feelings on forms. 4. The infusion of grace or artistic representation, 5. Similitude, and 6. An artistic use of brush and colors. Later, an elaborate aesthetic code appeared, the Shilpa Shastra, in which the rules and traditions of each art were formulated for all time. The artist, we are told, should be learned in the Vedas, delighting in the worship of God, faithful to his wife, avoiding strange women, and piously acquiring a knowledge of various sciences. We shall be helped in understanding Oriental painting if we remember first that it seeks to represent not things but feelings, and not to represent but to suggest, that it depends not on color but on line, that it aims to create aesthetic and religious emotion rather than to reproduce reality, that it is interested in the soul or spirit of men and things rather than in their material forms. Try as we will, however, we shall hardly find in Indian painting the technical development or range and depth of significance that characterize the pictorial art of China and Japan. Certain Hindus explain this very fancifully. Painting decayed among them, they tell us, because it was too easy. It was not a sufficiently laborious gift to offer to the gods. Perhaps pictures, so mortally frail and transitory, did not quite satisfy the craving of the Hindu for some lasting embodiment of his chosen deity. Slowly, as Buddhism reconciled itself to imagery, and the Brahmanic shrines increased and multiplied, painting was replaced by statuary, color and line, by lasting stone. 4. Sculpture. Primitive, Buddhist, Gandhara, Gupta, Colonial, Estimate. We cannot trace the history of Indian sculpture from the statuettes of Mahendradaro to the age of Ashoka, but we may suspect that this is a gap in our knowledge rather than in the art. Perhaps India, temporarily impoverished by the Aryan invasions, reverted from stone to wood for its statuary, or perhaps the Aryans were too intent upon war to care for art. The oldest stone figures surviving in India go back only to Ashoka, but these show a skill so highly developed that we cannot doubt that the art had then behind it many centuries in growth. Buddhism set up definite obstacles to both painting and statuary in its aversion to idolatry and secular imagery, Buddha forbade imaginative drawings painted in figures of men and women. 
And under this almost mosaic prohibition, pictorial and plastic art suffered in India, as it had done in Judea and was to do in Islam. Gradually this Puritanism seems to have relaxed as Buddhism yielded its austerity and partook more and more of the Dravidian passion for symbol and myth. When the art of carving appears again, circa 200 B.C., in the stone bas-reliefs on the rails enclosing the Buddhist stupas or burial mounds at Bodhgaya and Barhut, it is as a component part of an architectural design rather than as an independent art. And to the end of its history, Indian sculpture remained for the most part an accessory to architecture and preferred relief to carving in the round. An exception outweighing this generalization was the copper colossus of Buddha, eighty feet high, which Yuan Chuang saw at Patilaputra. Through Yuan and other Far Eastern pilgrims to India, this may have been one ancestor of the great Buddhas at Nara and Kamakura in Japan. In the Jain temples at Mathura and the Buddhist shrines at Amaravati and Ajanta, this art of relief reached a high point of perfection. The rail at Amaravati, says a learned authority, is the most voluptuous and most delicate flower of Indian sculpture. Meanwhile, in the province of Gandhara in northwestern India, another type of sculpture was developing under the patronage of the Kushan kings. This mysterious dynasty, which came suddenly out of the north, probably from Hellenized Bactria, brought with it a tendency to imitate Greek forms. The Mahayana Buddhism that captured the Council of Kanishka opened the way by rescinding the prohibition of imagery. Under the tutelage of Greek instructors, Hindu sculpture took on for a time a smooth Hellenistic face. Buddha was transformed into the likeness of Apollo and became an aspirant to Olympus. Drapery began to flow about Hindu deities and saints in the style of Phidias's pediments, and pious bodhisattvas rubbed elbows with jolly drunken Silini. Idealized and almost effeminate representations of the master and his disciples were offset with horrible examples of decadent Greek realism, like the starving Buddha of Lahore, in which every rib and tendon is shown underneath a feminine face with ladylike coiffure and masculine beard. This Greco-Buddhist art impressed Yuan Chuang, and through him and later pilgrims, found its way into China, Korea, and Japan. But it had little influence upon the sculptural forms and methods of India itself. When, after some centuries of flourishing activity, the Gandhara school passed away, Indian art came to life again under Hindu rulers, took up the traditions left by the native artists of Barhut, Amaravati, and Mathura, and paid scant attention to the Greek interlude at Gandhara. Sculpture, like nearly everything else in India, prospered under the Gupta line. Buddhism had now forgotten its hostility to images, and a reinvigorated Brahmanism encouraged symbolism and the adornment of religion with every art. The Matara Museum holds a highly finished stone Buddha with meditative eyes, sensual lips, too graceful a form, and clumsy cubist feet. The Sarnath Museum has another stone Buddha in the seated pose that was destined to dominate Buddhist sculpture. Here the effect of peaceful contemplation and a pious kindliness is perfectly revealed. At Karachi is a small bronze Brahma, scandalously like Voltaire. Everywhere in India, in the millennium before the coming of the Moslems, the art of the sculptor, though limited as well as inspired by its subservience to architecture and religion, produced masterpieces. The pretty statue of Vishnu from Sultanpur, the finely chiseled statue of Padmapani, the gigantic three-faced Shiva, commonly called Trimurti, carved in deep relief in the caves at Elephanta, the almost Praxitelian stone statue worshipped at Nokas as the goddess Rukmini, the graceful dancing Shiva, or Nataraja, cast in bronze by the Chola artist artisans of Tanjore, the lovely stone deer of Mamalapuram, and the handsome Shiva of Perur. These are evidences of the spread of the carver's art into every province of India. The same motives and methods crossed the frontiers of India proper and produced masterpieces from Turkestan and Cambodia to Java and Ceylon. The student will find examples in the stone head, apparently of a boy, dug up from the sands of Khotan by Sir Arl Stein's expedition. The head of Buddha from Siam, the Egyptianly fine Harihara of Cambodia, the magnificent bronzes of Java, the Gandhara-like head of Shiva from Prambanam, the supremely beautiful female figure, Prajna Paramita, now in the Leiden Museum, the perfect Bodhisattva in the Glyptotech at Copenhagen the calm and powerful Buddha, and the finely chiseled Avalokiteshvara, the Lord who looks down with pity upon all men, both from the great Javanese temple of Borobudur, or the massive primitive Buddha, and the lovely moonstone doorstep 
of Anura Dapura in Ceylon. This dull list of works that must have cost the blood of many men in many centuries will suggest the influence of Hindu genius on the cultural colonies of India. We find it hard to like this sculpture at first sight. Only profound and modest minds can leave their environment behind them when they travel. We should have to be Hindus or citizens of those countries that accepted the cultural leadership of India to understand the symbolism of these statues, the complex functions and superhuman powers denoted by these multiple arms and legs, the terrible realism of these fanciful figures expressing the Hindu sense of supernatural forces, irrationally creative, irrationally fertile and irrationally destructive. It shocks us to find that everybody in Hindu villages is thin and everybody in Hindu sculpture is fat. We forget that the statues are mostly of gods who received the first fruits of the land. We are disconcerted on discovering that the Hindus colored their statuary, whereby we reveal our unawareness of the fact that the Greeks did likewise, and that something of the classic nobility of the Phidian deities is due to the accidental disappearance of their paint. We are displeased at the comparative paucity of female figures in the Indian gallery. We mourn over the subjection of women, which this seems to indicate, and never reflect that the cult of the nude female is not the indispensable basis of plastic art, that the profoundest beauty of woman may be more in motherhood than in youth, more in Demeter than in Aphrodite. Or we forget that the sculptor carved not what he dreamed of so much as what the priests laid down, that every art in India belonged to religion rather than to art, and was the handmaiden of theology. Or we take too seriously figures intended by the sculptor to be caricatures or jests or ogres designed to frighten away evil spirits. If we turn away from them in horror, we merely attest the fulfillment of their aim. Nevertheless, the sculpture of India never quite acquired the grace of her literature or the sublimity of her architecture or the depth of her philosophy. It mirrored chiefly the confused and uncertain insight of her religions. It excelled the sculpture of China and Japan, but it never equaled the cold perfection of Egyptian statuary or the living and tempting beauty of Greek marble. To understand even its assumptions, we should have to renew in our hearts the earnest and trusting piety of medieval days. In truth, we ask too much of sculpture as of painting in India. We judge them as if they had been there as here independent arts, when in truth we have artificially isolated them for treatment according to our traditional rubrics and norms. If we could see them as the Hindu knows them, as integrated parts of the unsurpassed architecture of his country, we should have made some modest beginning towards understanding Indian art. 5. Architecture 1. Hindu Architecture before Ashoka, Ashokan, Buddhist, Jain, the masterpieces of the north, their destruction, the southern style, monolithic temples, structural temples. Nothing remains of Indian architecture before Ashoka's time. We have the brick ruins of Mohenjo-daro, but apparently the buildings of Vedic and Buddhist India were of wood, and Ashoka seems to have been the first to use stone for architectural purposes. We hear in the literature of seven-storied structures and of palaces of some magnificence, but not a trace of them survives. Megasthenes describes the imperial residences of Chandragupta as superior to anything in Persia except Persepolis, on whose model they seem to have been designed. This Persian influence persisted till Ashoka's time. It appears in the ground plan of his palace, which corresponded with the hall of a hundred columns at Persepolis, and it shows again in the fine pillar of Ashoka at Lauria, crowned with a lion capital. With the conversion of Ashoka to Buddhism, Indian architecture began to throw off this alien influence and to take its inspiration and its symbols from the new religion. The transition is evident in the great capital, which is all that now remains of another Ashokan pillar, at Sarnat. Here, in a composition of astonishing perfection, ranked by Sir John Marshall as equal to anything of its kind in the ancient world, we have four powerful lions, standing back to back on guard, and thoroughly Persian in form and countenance. But beneath them is a frieze of well-carved figures, including so Indian a favorite as the elephant, and so Indian a symbol as the Buddhist wheel of the law. And under the frieze is a great stone lotus, formerly mistaken for a Persian bell capital, but now accepted as the most ancient, universal, and characteristic of all the symbols in Indian art. Represented upright, with the petals turned down and the pistol or seed vessel showing, it stood for the womb of the world, or as one of the fairest of nature's manifestations, it served as the throne of a god. The lotus or water lily symbol migrated with Buddhism and permeated the art of China and Japan. 
a like form used as a design for windows and doors, became the horseshoe arch of Ashokan vaults and domes, originally derived from the covered wagon curvature of Bengali thatched roofs supported by rods of bent bamboo. The religious architecture of Buddhist days has left us a few ruined temples and a large number of topes and rails. The tope, or stupa, was in early days a burial mound. Under Buddhism it became a memorial shrine, usually housing the relics of a Buddhist saint. Most often the tope took the form of a dome of brick, crowned with a spire, and surrounded with a stone rail carved with bas-reliefs. One of the oldest topes is at Barhut, but the reliefs there are primitively coarse. The most ornate of the extant rails is at Amaravati. Here, 17,000 square feet were covered with minute reliefs of a workmanship so excellent that Ferguson judged this rail to be probably the most remarkable monument in India. The best known of the stupas is the Sanchi Tope, one of a group at Bilsa in Bhopal. The stone gates apparently imitate ancient wooden forms and anticipate the pilus or torii's that usually mark the approach to the temples of the Far East. Every foot of space on pillars, capitals, cross pieces, and supports is cut into a wilderness of plant, animal, human, and divine forms. On a pillar of the eastern gateway is a delicate carving of a perennial Buddhist symbol, the Bodhi tree, seen of the Master's enlightenment. On the same gateway, gracefully spanning a bracket, is a sensuous goddess, a yakshi, with heavy limbs, full hips, slim waist, and abounding breasts. While the dead saints slept in the topes, the living monks cut into the mountain rocks temples where they might live in isolation, sloth, and peace, secure from the elements and from the glare and heat of the sun. We may judge the strength of the religious impulse in India by noting that over twelve hundred of these cave temples remain of the many thousands that were built in the early centuries of our era, partly for Jains and Brahmins, but mostly for Buddhist communities. Often the entrance of these viharas, or monasteries, was a simple portal in the form of a horseshoe or lotus arch. Sometimes, as at Nasik, it was an ornate facade of strong columns, animal capitals, and patiently carved architrave. Often it was adorned with pillars, stone screens, or porticos of admirable design. The interior included a chaitya, or assembly hall, with colonnades dividing nave from aisles, cells for the monks on either side, and an altar bearing relics at the inner end. The correspondence of this interior with that of Christian churches has suggested a possible influence of Hindu styles upon early Christian architecture. One of the oldest of these cave temples, and perhaps the finest now surviving, is at Karle, between Pune and Bombay. Here, Hinayana Buddhism achieved its chef d'oeuvre. The caves at Ajanta, besides being the hiding place of the greatest of Buddhist paintings, rank with Karle as examples of that composite art half architecture and half sculpture, which characterizes the temples of India. Caves 1 and 2 have spacious assembly halls whose ceilings, cut and painted in sober yet elegant designs, are held up by powerful fluted pillars, square at the base, round at the top, ornamented with flowery bands and crowned with majestic capitals. Cave 19 is distinguished by a facade richly decorated with adipose statuary and complex bas-reliefs. In Cave 26, Gigantic columns rise to a frieze crowded with figures which only the greatest religious and artistic zeal could have carved in such detail. Ajanta can hardly be refused the title of one of the major works in the history of art. Of other Buddhist temples still existing in India, the most impressive is the great tower at Bodhgaya, significant for its thoroughly Gothic arches and yet dating apparently back to the first century A.D., all in all, the remains of Buddhist architecture are fragmentary, and their glory is more sculptural than structural. A lingering Puritanism perhaps kept them externally forbidding and bare. The Jains gave a more concentrated devotion to architecture, and during the 11th and 12th centuries their temples were the finest in India. They did not create a style of their own, being content to copy at first, as at Ellura, the Buddhist plan of excavating temples in the mountain rocks, then the Vishnu or Shiva type of temples, rising usually in a walled group upon a hill. These too were externally simple, but inwardly complex and rich, a happy symbol of the modest life. Piety placed statue after statue of giant heroes in these shrines, until in the group at Shatrunjaya, Ferguson counted 6,449 figures. The giant temple at Aihole is built almost in Greek style, with rectangular form, external colonnades, a portico, and a cell or central chamber within. At Kajuraho, 
Jains, Vaishnavites, and Shivaites, as if to illustrate Hindu tolerance, built in close proximity some twenty-eight temples. Among them, the almost perfect temple of Parshwanath rises in cone upon cone to a majestic height and shelters on its carved surfaces a veritable city of Jain saints. On Mount Abu, lifted 4,000 feet above the desert, the Jains built many temples, of which two survivors, the temples of Vimala and Tejapala, are the greatest achievement of this sect in the field of art. The dome of the Tejapala shrine is one of those overwhelming experiences which doom all writing about art to impotence and futility. The temple of Vimala, built entirely of white marble, is a maze of irregular pillars, joined with fanciful brackets to a more simple carved entablature. Above is a marble dome, too opulent in statuary, but carved into a stone lacework of moving magnificence. Finished, says Ferguson, with a delicacy of detail and appropriateness of ornament which is probably unsurpassed by any similar example to be found anywhere else. Those introduced by the Gothic architects in Henry VII's chapel at Westminster or at Oxford are coarse and clumsy in comparison. In these Jain temples and their contemporaries we see the transition from the circular form of the Buddhist shrine to the tower style of medieval India. The nave or pillar-enclosed interior of the assembly hall is taken outdoors and made into a mandapam or porch. Behind this is the cell, and above the cell rises in successively receding levels the carved and complicated tower. It was on this plan that the Hindu temples of the north were built. The most impressive of these is the group at Bhuvaneshwara in the province of Orissa, and the finest of the group is the Rajarani temple erected to Vishnu in the 11th century A.D., it is a gigantic tower formed of juxtaposed semicircular pillars covered with statuary and surmounted by receding layers of stone, the whole inward curving tower ending in a great circular crown and a spire. Nearby is the Lingaraja temple, larger than the Rajarani, but not so beautiful. Nevertheless, every inch of the surface has felt the sculptor's chisel, so that the cost of the carving has been reckoned at three times the cost of the structure. The Hindu expressed his piety not merely by the imposing grandeur of his temples, but by their patiently worked detail. Nothing was too good for the god. It would be dull to list without specific description and photographic representation the other masterpieces of Hindu building in the north. And yet no record of Indian civilization could leave unnoticed the temples of Surya at Kanarak and Mudera, the tower of Jagannath Puri, the lovely gateway at Vadnagar, the massive temples of Shashbahu and Telekamandir at Gwalior, the palace of Rajaman Singh also at Gwalior, and the Tower of Victory at Chitor. Standing out from the mass are the Shivaite temples at Kajuraho, while in the same city the dome of the porch of the Kanwar Mat temple shows again the masculine strength of Indian architecture and the richness and patience of Indian carving. Even in its ruins, the temple of Shiva at Elephanta, with its massive fluted columns, its mushroom capitals, its unsurpassed reliefs, and its powerful statuary, suggests to us an age of national vigor and artistic skill of which hardly the memory lives today. We shall never be able to do justice to Indian art, for ignorance and fanaticism have destroyed its greatest achievements and have half ruined the rest. At Elephanta, the Portuguese certified their piety by smashing statuary and bas-reliefs in unrestrained barbarity. And almost everywhere in the north, the Moslems brought to the ground those triumphs of Indian architecture of the 5th and 6th centuries, which tradition ranks as far superior to the later works that arouse our wonder and admiration today. The Moslems decapitated statues and tore them limb from limb. They appropriated for their mosques and in great measure imitated the graceful pillars of the Jain temples. Time and fanaticism joined in the destruction, for the orthodox Hindus abandoned and neglected temples that had been profaned by the touch of alien hands. We may guess at the lost grandeur of North Indian architecture by the powerful edifices that still survive in the South, where Moslem rule entered only in minor degree, and after some habituation to India had softened Mohammedan hatred of Hindu ways. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.